Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and uh, chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves, if you can. Where are we going? Why, today we're going to accompany Mr. Harvey Benson through a fateful 24 hours of his life in a story I call No One on the Line. Our visit with Harvey Benson begins on a Wednesday evening in summer. Harvey, a self-made businessman, is smoking a cigar and reading the paper while his wife, Linda, reads a book. It's really quite a picture of peaceful domesticity. <coughs> well, that's that. Nothing much in the paper tonight, dear. It's too bad your poker game tonight fell through, darling. I know how you look forward to Wednesday evening. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Good book you're reading? Oh, yes. Yes, it's very exciting. It's a new murder mystery everybody's talking about. I would have guessed it was rather dull from the way you've been looking at the same page for ten minutes now. Oh, was I? I must have been wool gathering. Well, I guess I'll go... Oh, phone. I'll get it, Linda. No, sit still, Harvey. You're tired. I'll answer. No, I insist, my dear. <coughs> Hello. 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 That's funny. No one on the line. Well, how strange. Maybe the phone's out of order. No, I heard the click as someone hung up when I answered. Oh, but it's not worth wondering about. It's getting late. What do you say we turn in? And now we join Harvey again at breakfast the following morning. It's getting late, but Harvey lingers over his coffee as if he had the whole day ahead of him. Mmm. Good coffee, this. Pour me some more, will you, darling? Of course, Harvey. But, uh, shouldn't you be leaving for your office, dear? Oh, there's plenty of time. But it's almost 9.30. You seem very anxious to get me to the office, Linda. You're not trying to get rid of me by any chance. Oh, well, of course not. But you said you had an important appointment this morning, oh, and yes, I just thought... Oh, yes, but the fellow will wait. Mmm, my good coffee, this. Harvey. Hmm? Is there anything wrong? Anything wrong? Yes. You seemed a little odd the last day or two, and this morning... And what's the matter with me this morning? Oh, I don't know that anything is, but you do seem a little strange. Strange? In what way, Linda, my dear? Oh, I'm sorry if I've said anything to annoy you, but... Oh, I'll answer it. Still, Linda, I'll answer it. But, Harvey, it's probably... I said I'll answer it. Maybe a call I've been expecting. All right, Harvey. Hello? 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 Strange, there's no one on the line. Same thing that happened last night. Well, how peculiar. Oh, but that phone must be out of order. Yes, I suppose so. And yet I could swear I heard someone hang up when I answered. Oh, you must have been mistaken, darling. I suppose so. You better give the company a ring, Linda. Yes, I will, Harvey, right away. Good, and now I do have to be going. Uh, see you tonight, darling. So now we accompany Harvey Benson to his office. Uh, because we're spending one complete day with him, remember? His office is large and luxurious, reflecting the success Harvey Benson has achieved in the world by hard work and constant vigilance. Once arrived there, Harvey plunges into his work. Until shortly before noon, the sound of the inter-office phone arouses him. Excuse me, Mr. Benson. Oh, uh, yes, Miss Johnson? Uh, Mr. Mungo is here to see you. Shall I send him in? No, ask him to wait. I'd like to see you for a moment first, Miss Johnson. Certainly, Mr. Benson. I'll be right in. Yes, Mr. Benson? Uh, sit down, please, Miss Johnson. Yes, sir. I've brought my book. You won't need it. 
I just want to chat with you for a moment. I don't understand, Mr. Benson. I just want to talk to you, that's all. I don't believe you and I have ever talked before as person to person, have we? No, sir, we haven't. And you've been with me uh, seven years, isn't it? Seven years next month. Seven years, and we've never talked as equals. But then, I've never needed advice before. You've noticed that I never ask advice, I suppose. Well, yes, I have, Mr. Benson. Make your own decision and act upon it, is my motto. And yet, now I'm going to ask your advice, as a woman, not as a secretary. Well, I... I'll try to be helpful if I can. Good. Now then, picture for yourself a woman who has always been very practical and, uh, well, let's say rather cold. Suddenly this woman becomes dreamy and absent-minded. She stands for minutes at the window, looking at nothing. You speak to her. She doesn't hear you. What would you deduce from that? Why, I'd say she was in love. Excellent. Now suppose this woman is married... Suppose on several occasions when her husband is in the room... You're following me, aren't you? Oh, yes, sir. Suppose on these occasions the phone rings and this married woman answers. And each time she tells the party calling he has a wrong number. What then? Why, I suppose that could happen. But now, Miss Johnson, suppose on several occasions the husband answers and the party at the other end hangs up without speaking... Why, it sounds like someone trying to call the wife without her husband knowing about it. Exactly. I felt sure I couldn't be wrong. But it's helpful to have your opinion and back me up. Thank you very much, Miss Johnson. Why, why not at all, Mr. Benson? And now, please send in Mr. Mungo. Yes, sir, right away. Mr. Benson will see you now. Okay, sister. Good morning, Mr. Benson. Come in, Mungo, and close the door. Sure, Mr. Benson. Uh, sit down. Yeah, sure. You have the information for me? Everything's right here in my report. Good, let's have it. I checked thoroughly on the four names you suggested. And which one was she meeting? I only witnessed one meeting, Mr. Benson. The other time, she gave me the slip. Then you don't know your business. Well, what she did was go to Duke and Baker's department store, take a dress into one of the fitting rooms, and then leave by another door. I couldn't very well follow her there. You should have managed it somehow. I... Well, never mind that. What did you learn? I'll give you the general report first before I mention a name. All right, do so, but don't dawdle about it. Yes, Mr. Benson. As you'll see, I've called the four individuals you suggested, parties A, B, C, and D. Yes. Now, party B, Mrs. Benson knew before her marriage, but I found no evidence they have ever communicated since. Yes, go on. Parties C and D, she also knew before she became Mrs. Benson, and from time to time, she's seen both of them since. Uh, but... Those meetings appear to have been accidental. Maybe so. Get on with it. But party A, the architect one, I traced him back to Atlanta. That's his hometown. Yeah? She comes from Atlanta, too. Yes, uh, They went to high school together. Were sweet on each other for a year or two. He used to keep her picture in his room. Oh, he did, did he? Yeah. And since he reached New York three months ago, he's phoned her four or five times, according to the switchboard operator at his apartment house. Yes, of course. I remember how excited she was when they met at the Jennings dance two months ago. And three days ago, get this, when Mrs. Benson was downtown shopping, she dropped into Rass for lunch and she ran into him there. No doubt it was a planned meeting. It was very cleverly done. Then they sat for two hours talking and... Well, that meeting was no accident. No, of course it wasn't. Donald Arkwright. Yes, I was sure of it. Yes, sir. But if you want me to keep on following No, no, him... no. It's time for more decisive steps. I don't understand. You're not supposed to. But if you knew me better, you'd know that the moment my mind is made up, I act. I see, Mr. Benson. And I propose to act now. So send me your bill and forget the whole affair. Very good, Mr. Benson. I'll forget the whole affair. I'm very good at that. Good day, Mr. Benson. Goodbye. Hello, Donald Arkwright speaking. Oh, hello, Arkwright. This is Harvey Benson. You remember me, Linda's husband? Well, yes, yes, of course, Mr. Benson. How are you? Fine, thanks. I'm calling because I need an architect. Oh, and uh, you wanted me yes, to... Yes, I'm, I'm going to put up a summer place out on Long Island, and I wanted you to draw the plans. Well, that's great, Mr. Benson. Uh, 
Now, what kind of sight have you? I'll do better than tell you. I'll show it to you. That is, if you're free to drive out with me this morning. Well, I, I do have an appointment. Cancel but... it. This will be well worth your while, I assure you. Well, all right, I will, Mr. Benton. Good. Then I'll pick you up in my car. Say about uh, 45 minutes. All right, that'll be fine. I'll be looking for you. Good. I'll see you shortly, then. We'll have lunch on the way. Miss Johnson. Yes, Mr. Benson? I'm leaving for the day. Cancel any appointments I may have. Now Harvey Benson leaves his office, and we follow him to the garage where he keeps his car. Well, Joe, you have my car ready? I uh, got it right here, Mr. Benson. But look, uh, don't you want to take the new coupe? No, I said I wanted the sedan. Yeah, sure, but since that little accident Mrs. Benson had, the sedan ain't in too good a shape. It'll do for today. Yeah, but what I'm getting at is it, it ain't safe. I'm not worried. You put in plenty of gas? Yep. Five gallons, Mr. Benson. But look now, don't take no chances with them brakes. They don't hold worth a cent. I'm aware of that. And that right-hand door, it sticks something terrible. What of it? What do you care? Oh, I just thought I'd Well, don't. (laughs) Golly, he's certainly in a hurry. With them brakes the way they are, he'll kill somebody if he ain't careful. At 87th Street, Harvey Benson picks up his passenger, Donald Arkwright. And several hours later, they are far out in a lonely section of Long Island. Just a quarter of a mile more, Arkwright. Up ahead, on top of those cliffs. That's where my lots are. I uh, surely appreciate your asking me to prepare the plans, Mr. Benson. Linda suggested you for the job. Said you were a first-rate architect. Well, that's swell of her. I wasn't even sure she'd remember me. Oh, she remembers you very well. I could see how happy she was to meet you at the Jennings party. Yeah, I was tickled that she recognized me. After all, it's six years since we last met. Well, why shouldn't she recognize you? After all, you were sweethearts, weren't you? (laughs) Well, I suppose you could have called us that. We did have some good times together. Riding, hiking, and dancing. Well, it's plain she still thinks a lot of you. Now, there's the sight. Right up ahead. Oh, yeah. Smack on the edge of the cliff, huh? Well, you'll have a nice view all the way across the sound. Eighty feet sheer to the water. Not another house in miles. Look, you can see all the way down to the rocks from the bend in the road here. Well, those waves sure are kicking up a fuss. A man wouldn't last long down there. No. No, not long. But you don't have to worry. I'll build you a house that'll never slide over the edge. I'm sure you'll never give me any cause to worry. Well, here we are. Have to pull the car a bit off the road, though, to park. Well, oh, pretty steep here. Yes. I'll have to put in a retaining wall. Terrace the ground, I guess. There. Now I got her off the road. Uh, we'll leave her here. Well, we'll have room to turn around when we're ready to start back. Sure hope you have good brakes. I'd hate to slide over under those rocks down there. I'd hate to myself. <laughs> oh, want to get out and block the wheels for me? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Door won't open. Seems to be stuck. That's right. That door does open hard. Never mind. I'll get out on this side and block them. Well, say, aren't you forgetting to set the brakes? Not necessary. But this slope is steep here. I know what I'm doing. But look, the car's moving already. It's starting to roll forward. Yes, it is, isn't it? And it'll keep on rolling. Mr. Benson? I, I can't stop your car. The brakes won't hold. Mr. Benson, it's gone over the cliff. It's gone over the cliff! Harvey stands there watching the car roll toward the edge while his passenger struggles frantically to get out. It only has ten feet to go, five feet, and then on the very edge, the wheels twist against a rock, and the car stops. Harvey runs down the slope and reaches the spot, just as Donald Arkwright manages at last to scramble out. Mr. Benson, you did that on purpose. Yes, Arkwright, I did. You tried to kill me. Exactly, I tried to kill you. But... Why? You... You must be crazy. No, Arkwright, only myself. 
If you knew me better, you'd know that no one tries to take anything away from me without suffering for it. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. What's mine is mine. And everything that's mine, I keep. You are crazy. I can see it. Get away from me. Take your hands off of me. No, I... Get right. You haven't a chance. Yes. Let me go, I say. I'll... I'll... You'll do nothing. In this world, a man has to be strong and ruthless to stay on top. And I'm... Oh, no. No, you're pushing me toward the edge. Let me go. You're going over, Let do me... you hear? You're going over. No. No. For a moment, Harvey stands, glaring down at the white-capped waters that have received his victim. Then he turns to the car. A quick twist of the steering wheel, a push, and the car is gone. Then Harvey turns away back to the road. He walks a mile, two miles, three, until he gets a lift from a driver who takes him to the nearest state police barracks, where State Police Sergeant Thomas hears his story. Mr. Benson, you say you got out of the car to block the wheel and the car started rolling forward? Yes, Sergeant. Arkwright tried to open the door, but it stuck. The car was at the edge by the time he got it open. He he jumped, but he was too late. I see. All right, I have the details straight. Oh, it was horrible, Sergeant. He was my friend. There was nothing I could do to help. Nothing. Yes, I understand, Mr. Benson. You were quite alone at the time? No witnesses? No, we were miles from the nearest house. Why do you ask? Well, because there's a boy scout camp about a mile from there, Mr. Benson. I thought some of the boys might have been within sight. Oh, no, no. There wasn't anyone in sight. I see. Well, I guess that's all, Mr. Benson. It's just about dark now, so we probably won't recover the body before tomorrow. I'll notify you the minute we do so you can identify your friend. And so, late in the evening, Harvey returns home to find Linda waiting for him anxiously. Is that you, Harvey? Yes, my dear, it is. Well, I waited dinner as long as I could, and then I went ahead and ate. Shall I fix you something now? No, thank you. I've eaten. Let's sit down, Linda. I'd like to talk to you. Why, why, of course, Harvey. Do you have the phone fixed? The phone? Oh, no. I-, I called the company, but they said there was nothing wrong with it. I see. Well, they were quite right. I discovered that the trouble was from another source. I don't think I understand you, Harvey. Linda, my dear, do you consider me a fool? What? Well, of course not. Don't you suppose that I've known what was going on for some days now? Just what do you mean, Harvey? When a woman suddenly takes to mooning around the house, staring out the window, not answering when she's spoken to, the signs are unmistakable. Are you speaking about me, Harvey? And when that same woman gets several phone calls while her husband is in the room and each time tells the caller, I'm afraid you have the wrong number. There's no one here by that name. It would be a very stupid husband indeed who failed to notice. Yes. Yes, I suppose it would. But the crowning touch was those calls when there was no one on the line. One several days ago, one last night, and now one this morning. But Harvey... I I... answer and there's no one on the line. But who's there when you answer? That's what I want to know, Linda. Well, what have you to say? There isn't much I can say, Harvey. Oh, then you admit it. Those calls were from someone I wasn't supposed to know about. Someone you're in love with. Yes. Someone I'm in love with. Someone I've been trying to bring myself to tell you about. Someone you've been meeting at Tawdry Rendezvous. Nothing of the kind. We've met, yes. But they've been perfectly innocent meetings, lunch, and a walk in the park. Nothing worse than that. (laughs) You're a fool to expect me to believe that. Yes, I, I suppose I am. And yet it's the truth. Well, it doesn't matter. But may I inquire what your plans are? I want a divorce, Harvey. So that you can marry this unknown who telephones you and then hangs up when I answer. Yes. And I'm sorry that ever happened. It was my fault. I suggested it. You see, I was afraid of you, Harvey. Afraid? Of me? Of your loving husband? I was. But I'm not anymore. I only want to be free of you. Free to marry the man I really love. Very interesting, my dear. But slightly impractical. 
Do you really think I'd let anyone take you away from me? I'm afraid you have no choice. Well, you're wrong. It's you who have no choice. You're penniless, Linda. You have no family, no money, no training. You have only me. What are you trying to say? I'm just leading up to a story I have to tell you, Linda. A very tragic story which occurred only this afternoon. And so Harvey tells Linda the story of the afternoon's uh, events. Well, not the true story, of course. But she guesses the truth as he speaks and recoils in horror when he is finished. Oh, you've killed him. You deliberately murdered him. Nonsense. It was a tragic accident. The police have already exonerated him. You me. killed him? Oh, no. No, I don't believe you. You're just trying to torture me. You know me better than that. You know that what I have, I keep at any cost. Then you did kill him. You're a murderer. Don't be hysterical, my dear. I shall be forced to discipline you. I'm going to the police. I'm going to tell them the truth. Linda, come back here. No, no, you can't stop Linda, me. Linda, come back. Come back, I say. Linda is gone before Harvey can get to the door. Harvey pauses, irresolute. Then he shrugs, turns back, sits down, lights a cigar. Hmm. Good cigar. I must remember to order another box. And so, Linda, you've rushed off to the police. In your heart of hearts, you hope that I'm lying. Your first move will be to rush to a telephone. You'll put a nickel and dial with trembling fingers. You'll hear the phone at the other end ring. And with beating heart, you'll wait. Hoping against hope that Donald Arkwright will answer. <laughs> but he won't. And then you'll know I've told the truth. Then... Hmm. Will you come back first? Or will you go on to the police? I rather think you'll go to the police. For you are excited just now. And you'll return with a detective or two. I shall have to explain to them... Tell them of your hysterical spells. Then you and I will be left alone. And in a day or two, I think we'll leave on a little trip. Yes, up to my hunting lodge, where we can be alone there. And we'll get to know each other well again. Very well. And in the future... I... Oh, the bell. So you're back already, Linda. I guessed wrong. Just a moment, my dear. I'm coming. Harvey crosses to the door, opens it, and recoils in surprise. Good evening, Mr. Manson. Well, if it isn't Sergeant Thomas. And I see my wife is with you. Yes, we met in the lobby. She came back up with me. I'd like to come in. Why, of course. After you, Mrs. Manson. These other men will wait out here. Thank you, Sergeant. And now do sit down, Linda. And you too, Sergeant. Oh, uh, cigar. No, thanks. We might as well waste no time, Mr. Fenton. We've recovered your friend's body. Already? But surely you didn't come here to tell me that. They know you killed him, Harvey. They know. Please, Linda. You must forgive my wife, Sergeant. She's overwrought. I, I suppose she's been babbling some nonsense rather to you. She told me a story. I don't think it's nonsense. Of course it is. She's hysterical. But there were witnesses, Harvey. There were witnesses. What? That's absurd. There was no one within miles. Except a camp of boy scouts. Four of them with a scoutmaster were lying in the grass half a mile away when you drove up. They were watching for birds with field glasses. You're lying. And with natural curiosity, they turned their glasses on you. They saw your struggle on the cliff. No, no. You're lying. They went to another police barracks to report or I'd have been here sooner. Here are copies of the affidavits they signed. Affidavits? Yeah. Look them over. Affidavits. Five of them. Yes, they seem to be in order. So, there were witnesses. I dare say their evidence is unshakable. You haven't a chance, Benson. Well, those men outside are city detectives. Are you going to come quietly? Yes. Why not? What else? Is there to do? You're caught, Harvey, and I'm glad, glad. Yes, I'm caught. 
But precious little good that'll do you, Linda, because he's dead, do you hear? Donald Arkwright is dead. Donald Arkwright? Yes. You wonder how I knew it was he, don't you? Well, I hired a private detective. Oh. And he discovered that Arkwright had been phoning you. That oh, you'd been no. slipping away to meet him. He managed to follow you to one of those innocent luncheons. Oh, that luncheon? But that meeting was an accident. A very clever accident. But not clever enough to save Arkwright because he's dead, do you hear? And no matter what happens to me, I've beaten you. You're insane. You always have been with your lust for power. And I never guessed it till now. Fine words. But they won't change the fact that your beloved is dead and that I've taken him from you. You killed Donald Arkwright because you thought I was in love with him. <laughs> You've killed the wrong man. No, I didn't. It was Arkwright. I know it. Oh, no. Don Arkwright was just an old friend. The man I love is someone you've never met, whose name I see now you don't even know. I don't believe you. You've committed murder and you've been caught, and all for nothing. No. And that knowledge is worse to you than any punishment the law can inflict. You're lying. It was Arkwright who phoned and hung up when I answered. I tell you, it was. It couldn't have been anybody else. It... No. No. Better answer it, Mrs. Benson. No, I'll answer it. Hello? 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 again. Well, that was rather a hectic 24 hours for Harvey Benson, wasn't it? He shouldn't have been quite so sure of himself. It never pays. Those phone calls now. If you get any calls and find there's no one on the line, uh, don't be quite as hasty as he was. You might get into a bad jam. I know someone else who didn't wait to make sure of his facts, and he... Oh, you're getting off here. Oh, I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Ted Osborne, Mary Jane Higby, Jack Manning, and James Van Dyke. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. The Mysterious Traveler is written and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week over most of these mutual stations to a tale titled... Death Whispers Softly. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by the Mutual Network from our New York studios. Russ Dunbar speaking. What could have been in the little black box that led intelligence men, Nazi agents, and Mike Waring, the Falcon on a chase of mystery and intrigue over two continents. You'll learn the answer when you hear Death Comes in Boxes, this Tuesday night's mystery on the adventures of the Falcon. Tune in Tuesday for The Falcon. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
This is Studio One at CBS. The Columbia Broadcasting System invites you to Studio One for the sixth broadcast in a new series of hour-length versions for listening of celebrated stories, novels, and plays. We introduce the director of Studio One, Fletcher Cole. First, as to our story, tonight it's a comedy. You're going to spend a weekend with the Bliss family, four of the most improbable people you've ever met. Judith, the mother, who used to be a great actress, and still is. David, the father, who used to write bad novels, and still does. And their grown-up, but not very, offspring, Sorrel and Simon, who never got used to doing anything and still haven't. There are a few well-authenticated examples of the Bliss family to be found in England's reluctantly picturesque countryside and the wilds of darkest Long Island or out in Carmel, California. But the race is vanishing. We have these peculiar people with us tonight, however, and also their startled weekend guests. The whole affair is called Hay Fever. No one quite knows why. And our author, who assembled it from pure froth and tinsel, is Noel Coward. And now our players. Listeners, meet the Bliss family. Judith. Evelyn Varden. David. Everett Sloan. Sorrow. Ann Burr. Simon. William Woodson. Please to begin. From Studio One, CBS presents Hay Fever by Noel Coward. Right here, I've been drawing. Why do you always kneel on the floor when you're drawing, Simon? Does it look better, slouching over the paper that way? Of course. I'll watch you from the armchair. Oh, I'm absolutely exhausted. What have you oh. been doing? Reading poetry. But it gets so hot up there in my room. Uh, I loathe Saturday afternoons, don't you? They're so tentative. It's the weather. June is a tentative month, Sorrel, dear. You didn't shave this morning. I'm going to in a minute when I finish this caricature. Well, hurry. Finish it and talk to me like a nice brother ought to. Well, what do you want to talk about? Simon, I wish we were more normal and bouncing. Why? I'd like to be a fresh, open-air girl with a passion for sporting oh, things. thank goodness you're not. It would be so soothing. Not in this house. Where's Mother? In the garden, practicing. Practicing? She's practicing learning the names of the flowers by heart. I always distrust Mother when she becomes the well-informed, out-of-doors lady. Mm. She's been at it hard all day. She tapped the barometer this morning, twice. <laughs> She's probably got a plan about impressing somebody. I wonder who. If I know Mama, some dreary, infatuated young man will appear soon, I expect. Not today. You don't suppose she's asked anyone down today, do you? I don't know. Has Father noticed anything? No, Father's much too deep in work on his new book. Well, perhaps Clara will know. She usually knows everything. Yell yeah, for her. <clears throat> Clara? Clara! Oh, Simon, I do hope she hasn't invited a guest. Why, have you? Yes. Well, who is it? Richard Gratham. He's a very well-known diplomat. He's English. Oh, Mother will like that. I met him at the Webster's. He'll need all his diplomacy in this establishment. I warned him not to expect good manners, but I hope you'll be as pleasant to him as you can. I've never met any diplomat, Sorrel. Will he have the papers with him? What papers? Oh, any papers. Diplomatic secrets and all that. I wish you'd confine your biting irony to your not very good caricature, Simon. And I wish you'd confine your girlish infatuations to New York and not force them on your defenseless family. I'll keep him out of your way as much as possible. Please do, darling. You were shouting for me, Mr. Simon. I was calling, Clara. Has Mother asked anyone here this weekend? I don't know, dear. There isn't much food in the house, and Amy's got a toothache. I've got some oil of clove somewhere. Well, she tried that, but only burned her tongue. You haven't forgotten to put those flowers in the Chinese room, have you, Clara? Oh, the room looks lovely, dear. You needn't worry. Just like your mother's dressing room on the opening night. Oh, how restful. Uh, have you told her about your boyfriend, Miss Sorrel? Not boyfriend, Clara. Oh, well, whatever he is. I think Sorrel's beginning to be ashamed of us all, Clara, and I don't altogether blame her. We are very slapdash. Well, whatever you are, there isn't much food in the house for guests. Thank you, Clara, dear. You're right about us being a slapdash family, Simon. I wish we weren't. That's not our fault. It's the way we've been brought up. We're so awfully bad-mannered. Not to people we like. The people we like put up with it because they like us. 
We never attempt to look after people when they come to our home. We've never once asked anyone if they've slept well. I consider that an impertinence anyhow. I'm going to try to improve my manners. You're only going on like this because you've got a mania for a diplomat. You'll soon return to normal. Abnormal, Simon. That's what we are. Abnormal. People stare in astonishment when we say what we consider perfectly ordinary things. They all think we're mad. Well, it's no use worrying, darling. We see things differently, I suppose. And if people don't like it, they can lump it. Hello, you two. Here's Mother. Hello, dear. Hello. You look awfully dirty, Simon. What have you been doing? Not washing very much. Look at all the flowers. Such an armful. Yes, aren't they lovely? I just put them down here till I get things to put them in. You you should wash more, Simon, really. It's so bad for your skin to leave things about on it. Clara says Amy's got a toothache. Poor dear. There's some oil of cloves in my medicine cabinet. Who's Amy? The new kitchen maid, I think. Really? Delphiniums are those stubby red flowers, aren't they? No, darling mother. They're tall and blue. Yes, of course. The red ones are somebody's name. Asters? Asters. That's it. I knew it was something opulent. Well, I'm going to sit down for a while. Well, that's about all there is to do on Saturday afternoon. I do hope Clara has remembered about the Chinese room. What about the Chinese room? I told her to put some flowers in it and Simon's underwear out of the wardrobe drawer. So did I. Why? I've asked Richard Gretham out for the weekend. I didn't think you'd mind. Mind? Sorrow? How dared you do such a thing? He's a diplomat. That makes it much worse. you better phone and put him off at once. It's too late. Oh, well, we'll tell Clara to say we've been called away. That would be very rude. Anyhow, I want to see him. You mean to sit there in cold blood and tell me you've asked a complete stranger out for the weekend and that you want to see him? I've often done it before. I fail to see how that helps matters. Where's he going to sleep? The Chinese room. Oh, no, he isn't. Sandy Tyrrell is sleeping there. There now, Sorrel. What did I tell you? Sandy what? Tyrrell, dear. He's a perfect darling and madly in love with me. At least it, is, it isn't me, really. It's my celebrated actress, Glamour. But it gives me a wonderfully cozy feeling. I met him at Olive Scott's. Mother, I wish you'd give up this sort of thing. What exactly do you mean by this sort of thing, Zorro? You know perfectly well what I mean. Are you attempting to criticize me? I know. I'd have thought you'd be above encouraging silly, callow young men who are infatuated by your name. Everybody would think I was 80 the way my children go on. It was a great mistake not sending you to boarding schools and you coming back and me being your elder sister. Well, it wouldn't have been any use, darling. Everyone knows where your son and daughter... Only because I was stupid enough to dandle you about in front of cameras when you were little. I knew I should regret it. Well, I don't see any point in trying to be younger than you are. At your age, dear, it would be indecent if you did. You will be nice, Sandy, won't you, both of you? Can't he sleep in little hell? My dear Sorrow, Sandy's very athletic, and all those water pipes in that dreadful little room would sap his vitality. They'll sap Richard's vitality, too. He won't notice them. He's probably used to scorching tropical embassies with poom cars waving and everything. Anyhow, the Chinese room's a woman's room, and a woman ought to have it. I promised it to Sandy. He loves anything Chinese. So does Myra. Myra? Myra Arundel. I've asked her out. You what? I've asked Myra out for the weekend. She's awfully amusing. Do you mean to tell me, Simon... I do, Mother. I do indeed. You've always brought us up to be free about things. Myra Arundel is straining freedom to its utmost limits. You know perfectly well I dislike her. That's why you never told me she was coming to a too late to stop her. That's, that's very naughty of you. Whether she's here or not is a matter of extreme indifference to me. But I'm afraid Richard won't like her very oh, much. You're afraid he'll like her too much. Oh, you both upset me thoroughly. I wanted a nice, restful weekend, and now the house is going to be full of discord. I wish I were dead. Well, well you needn't worry about Myra and me. We'll keep out of everyone's way. I'll take Richard out on the sound all day tomorrow. In what? The boat. I absolutely forbid you to go near the boat. It's sure to rain anyway. What your father will say, I tremble to think he needs complete quiet to write. He's finishing off the new book, you know, The Sinful Woman. I see no reason for there to be any noise, unless Sandy, what's his name, is the boisterous sort. If you're rude to Sandy, I'll be very angry. No, oh, look, he's coming all the way out to the door. Oh, 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 hello. Here's Father. And why not? David, dear. Please tell me why you're all making such a noise. I think I'm going mad. Why hasn't Clara brought me my sandwiches? I don't know. Where is Clara? Do stop firing questions at me, David. Why are you all so irritable? What's happened? Oh, Mr. Bliss, here you are. I went to your room. Here's your beer and sandwiches. I'm sorry I'm late. Amy's got a terrible toothache. Poor girl. Give us some oil of cloves. If anyone else mentions oil of cloves, I'll do something desperate. Uh, here, Clara, I'll take the tray. Yes, Mr. Bliss. Thank you. I'll take it upstairs with me. And uh, don't anybody disturb me, please. 
Oh, I forgot, Simon. There's a perfectly sweet little girl coming out on the 4.30. Huh? Will you go and meet her and be nice to her? Me? She's an abject fool, but an interesting and useful type. I want to study her a little in domestic surroundings. She can sleep in the Chinese room. See you all later. Oh. Oh. I should like someone to play something very beautiful to me on the piano. What does Father mean by going on like that? In view of our prospective press meeting, you better go and shave, Simon. It's just awful. Whenever I make any sort of plan about anything, it's always done in by some member of the family. I wish I were earning my own living somewhere, a free agent, able to do what I like without being cluttered up and frustrated by relatives. It grieves me to hear you say that, Sorrow. Don't be infuriating, Mother. A change has come over my children of late. This is going to be the blackest weekend we've ever spent. Sorrow, you mustn't cry. Don't sympathize with me. It's only temper. There, there, dear. Richard will have to sleep in little hell, and Father's silly guinea pig, whoever she is, will get the Chinese room over my dead body. Mother, what are we to do? We must all be very, very kind to everyone. <sighs> You know, I, I'm going to forget entirely all about these dreadful people arriving. My mind henceforth will be a blank on the subject. It's all very fine, Mother, but you're their hostess. I made a great decision this morning. What kind of decision? It's a secret. Aren't you going to tell us? Oh, of course, I meant it was a secret from your father. Hmm, what is it? I'm going back on the stage. I knew it. I knew it. I'm stagnating here. Do you think it's wise... You retired so very finally last year. What excuse will you give for returning so soon? My public, dear. Letters from my public. They demand it. Have you had any? One or two. That's what decided me, really. I should have had hundreds. You will be dignified about it all, won't you, darling? Oh, I'm much more dignified on the stage than out here on Long Island. Think of the thrill of a first night and the critics the morning after, the satisfied grunt of the times, the disciplined gurgle of the Herald Tribune, and the shrill, enthusiastic scream of the Daily Mirror. Oh, I can distinguish them all. Have you got a play? I think I'll revive Love's Whirlwind. Oh, Mother. <laughs> uh, father will be furious. I can't help that. It's such a terrible play. I know, but it's a marvelous part, Father, <laughs> and the public love it. Remember this? You're a fool, a blind, pitiable fool. You think because you've bought my love that you have bought my soul. <laughs> now, you must say that's dramatic. Oh, it makes me laugh. And remember this, <laughs> I've dreamed of love like this, but I never realized how beautiful it could be. Oh, that line always brought a tear to my eye. Well, the second act is the best. There's no doubt about that. From the moment Victor comes in, it's strong, tremendously strong. Be Victor a minute, Sorrow. You mean when he comes in at the end of the act? Yes, you know. Is this a game? I know, but... I know. Is this a game? Yes, and a game that must be played to the finish. Sorrow, what does this mean? So many illusions shattered, so many dreams trodden in the dust. I'm George now. I don't understand. You and Victor... Oh, no. Isn't that little Pam crying? Ah, she'll cry more, poor mite, when she realizes her mother is... No, uh... don't say it! <laughs> Wouldn't you know, there's the front door. Ah, I look hideous. Yes, uh, where's Clara? Oh, here she comes. Clara, before you open the door, we shall be eight for dinner. Eight? It's impossible. And for breakfast, lunch, and dinner tomorrow. Will you get various rooms ready, Clara? I'll have to. They can't sleep in the hall. <laughs> Well, hadn't you better let them all in? Yes, yes. Please come in, sir. Thank you. Why, it's Sandy Tiro. Hello, Judith. It's good to see you. It's wonderful of you to let me come out. Are you alone? Uh, yes. I mean, you didn't meet anyone else at the station? I drove up. My car's outside. Would you like me to meet anybody? Oh, yes, I, I must introduce you. Uh, this is my daughter, Sorrow, and my son, Simon. Oh, uh, how do you do? Mm -hmm. I'm extremely well, thank you, and I hope you are. So do I. I do indeed. Well. <laughs> you uh, must forgive me for having rather peculiar children. <laughs> yes. uh, would you like a drink? Uh, no, thanks. I'm in training. How lovely. What for? I'm boxing again in a couple of weeks. I must come to your opening night. Uh, do sit down here beside me. All right. Oh, you look fine. I'm so glad. You know, you mustn't mind if Simon and Sorrel insult you a little. They've been very bad-tempered lately. Oh, it's very funny you having a grown-up son and daughter. I... I never did until last week. I liked you from the first, really, because you're such a nice shape. Am I? Oh, lovely broad shoulders and small hips. 
I, I wish my son had smaller hips. Do you think you could teach him to box? If he likes. Well, that's just the trouble I'm afraid he won't like. He's so dreadfully on that sort of thing. You must uh, use your influence subtly. I I'm sure David would be pleased. Who's David? My husband. Oh. Why do you say, oh, like that? Didn't you know I had a husband? I thought he was dead. No, he's not dead. He's upstairs. You know, you're quite different from what you were the other day. I've been pruning the calcularias. Have you? I love my garden. You know, it's so peaceful and quaint. I've always longed to leave the brittle glamour of cities and theatres and find rest in the country. That's why we came to Long Island. I see. But it's not far. Have you ever but... seen me on the stage? Oh, sure. What in? Uh, that thing when you pretended to cheat at cards to save your husband's good name. Oh, the bold deceit. Yes, but yes. that play was never quite right. Oh, you were swell. That was when I first fell in love with you. Was it really? Yes, you were so very pathetic and brave. Was I? You sure were. Well, go on. Oh, well, I, uh... Oh, I feel like a fool telling you what I think, as though it mattered. Of course it matters to me, anyhow. Does it? Honestly? Certainly. Well, it seems too good to be true, sitting here and talking as though we were old friends. We are old friends. We've probably met in another life, a reincarnation, you know. Fascinating. You do say wonderful things. <laughs> do I? May I have a cigarette? Oh, of course. I'm sorry. There you are. Thank you. And let's put our feet up. All right. Light. Thank you. Can you sail a boat, Sandy? Sort of. Oh, you must teach Simon. He always gets hit by the boom. I'd rather teach you. <laughs> oh, dear. Was anyone else coming to stay? Anyone else? You don't know. You just don't know. Clara. All right, dear. All right. You said it would be quiet. With nobody at all. I was wrong. It's going to be very noisy with herds of angry people stamping about. Judith! Myra! <laughs> My dear, isn't this divine? Too, too lovely. Where are the others? What others? Did you come at the 4.30? Yes. Didn't you see anybody at the station? Yes, several people, but I didn't know they were coming here. Well, they are. <clears throat> well, how do you do? It's useless to wait for introductions with the blisses. My name is Myra Arundel. Uh, how do you do? Sandy Tyrrell, Myra Arundel, Myra Arundel, Sandy Tyrrell there. Is that your car outside? Oh, yes. Well, Judith, I do think you might have told me someone was driving down. A nice car would have been so much more comfortable than that horrible train. I never knew you were coming a little while ago. Oh, it's heavenly here after New York. Mm -hmm. Personally, I feel I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. My dear, how awful. What's the matter? Nothing's the matter yet, Myra, but I have presentiments. Come upstairs, Sandy, and I'll show you your room. All right. I'll send Simon down to you, Myra. He's shaving, I think, but you won't mind that, will you? <laughs> Myra, this is marvelous. I've never seen anybody so worthy of being kissed. No, Simon, dear. Now, don't. It's too hot. You look beautifully cool. I'm more than cool, really. But it's not climatic coolness. I've been mentally chilled to the marrow by your mother's attitude. Oh, why? What did she say? Nothing very much. She was bouncing about on the sofa with a hearty young thing in flannels and seemed to resent my appearance entirely. Oh, you mustn't take any notice of Mother. I'll try not to, but it's difficult. She's annoyed today because Father and Saul have been asking people down without telling her. Oh, poor dear. I quite see why. Oh, you look enchanting. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Are you pleased to see me? Of course. That's mm. why I came. Oh, darling. Now, now. Oh, I feel most colossally temperamental. I should like to kiss you and kiss you and break everything in the house and then jump into the sound. <laughs> Dear Simon, you are so colorful. You're everything I wanted to be. Absolutely everything. Marvelous clothes, marvelous looks, marvelous brain. Oh, it's terrible. Darling, I adore you. That's right. Oh, but you're callous. That's what it is, callous. You don't love me a bit, do you? Love is a very big word, Simon. It isn't. It's tiny. What are we to do? What do you mean? We can't go on like this. I'm not going on like anything. Yes, you are. You're going on like Medusa. There are awful snakes popping their heads out at me from under your hat. I'll be to turn to stone in a minute, and then you'll be sorry. <laughs> You're very sweet, and I'm very fond of you. Well, tell me what you've been doing, everything. Nothing. Come and kiss me. Ah, uh, you're only playing up to me now. You don't really want to a bit. I'm aching for it. I 
love you. This weekend's going to be strenuous. Torture. Fifteen million people in the house. We'll get up at seven and go sailing. The idea's repulsive. No, don't let either of us agree on anything. We'll both be difficult. I love being difficult. You certainly do. But I'm in the most lovely mood now. Just seeing you makes me feel grand. Is your father here? Yes, he's working on a novel. He writes brilliantly. Yeah, doesn't he, though? Who is Sandy Tiro? Never heard of him. He's here as your mother's guest. Ignore him. You smell heavenly. What is it? Borgia of Rosine. How oh, appropriate. Kiss me again. Oh, such timing. Here we go again. Not more people. More and more and more people. Is this Mrs. Bliss's house? This is it. Is Miss Sorrel Bliss in? She's around somewhere. I'll see if I can find her. It's Richard Gretham, the diplomat, and some girl father wants to scrutinize. Good afternoon. You're Sorrel's brother, I presume? Hello. Did you have a nice journey? Yes, thank you. Very nice. This is Miss Carriton. We met at the station and introduced ourselves while we were waiting for the only taxi to come back. Hello. Oh, I took the only taxi. Mrs. Arundel, how did you do? I never recognized you. I did. Why? Have we met somewhere? No, I meant I recognized you as the one who took the taxi. Sorrel will be down in a minute. Just make yourselves at home. Let's go out into the garden, Myra. But, Simon, we can't Yes, go we can, and we're going. I shall go mad if I stay in the house a moment longer. See you later. Well, how do you like that? Strange young man. Very rude, I think. Have you ever met him before? No. I don't know any of them except the older Mr. Bliss. He's a wonderful person. I wonder if he knows your hair. Well, perhaps that funny woman who opened the door will tell him. Well, let's hope so. Now, allow me to take your coat. I was fortunate that we met at the station. Oh, I'm glad. I'd have been scared stiff arriving all by myself. I do hope the weather will keep good over Sunday. The country around here is delightful. Yes. Nothing like the summertime, is there? No, there isn't, is there? There's a sort of quality about summer. You're a diplomat. Have you traveled a lot? A good deal. How nice for you. Mexico is very beautiful. Yes, I've always heard Mexico was awfully nice. Except for the bullfights. No one who ever really loved horses could enjoy a bullfight. Nor anyone who loved bulls, either. Exactly. What about Europe? Uh, Italy's awfully nice, isn't it? Oh, yes, charming. I've always wanted to go to Italy. Rome is a beautiful city. Yes, uh, I've always heard Rome was lovely. And Naples and Capri. Capri's enchanting. It must be. Have you ever traveled at all? Oh, yes. I went to Niagara Falls once. Pleasant place, Niagara Falls. Oh, yes, it was lovely. <laughs> fun is sprawling about in the garden on a day like this. It's certainly a day for it. Oh, hello there. Oh, let me hold the door for you, Judith. Well, was that her? Who? Judith Bliss. Yes, I expect it was. She just walked right through the room and out and she didn't even look at us. Oh, I wish I'd never come. Oh, you mustn't worry. They're a very bohemian family, I believe. I wonder if Mr. Bliss knows I'm here. I wonder. Oh, I feel awful. It's always a little embarrassing coming to a strange house for the first time. You're like Sorrel. She's charming. Oh, but where is she? I don't know, I'm sure. Would you like a cigarette? Yes, please. There you are. Thank you. My light is out of fuel and I... I have not match, I'm afraid. Oh, Richard, have you been waiting? Sorrel. I didn't know you were here. We arrived quite some time ago. Please forgive me. I, I, I was upstairs. This is Miss Corriton. Oh, how do you do? Have you come to see Father? Yes. He's in his study. You better go up. I I don't know the way. Oh, oh well, I'll take you. Come oh. on. Wait a minute, Richard. It's along the hall up there and the third door on the right. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. You know, that poor girl looks half-witted. She's shy, I think. I hope Father will find her a comfort. Do sit down, Richard. Uh, tell me one thing, Sorrel. Did your father and mother know I was coming? Oh, yes. 
They, they were awfully pleased. A rather nice-looking woman came down in a big hat and went into the garden with a young man without saying a word either to me or Miss Corriton. That was Mother, I expect. We're an independent family. We entertain our friends sort of separately. Oh, I see. It was sweet of you to come. I wanted to come. I've thought about you a lot. Have you really? That's thrilling. I mean it. You're so alive and vital and different from other people. I'm so frightened that you'll be bored here. Bored? Why should I be? Oh, I don't know, but you won't be, will you? If you are, tell me at once and we'll do something quite different. You're rather a dear, you know. I'm not. I'm devastating, entirely lacking in restraint. I'd love to be beautifully poised and carry off difficult situations with a lift of the eyebrows. I'm sure you could <laughs> carry off anything. There you are, you see. Saying the right thing. You always say the right thing and no one knows a bit what you're really thinking. That's what I adore. I'm afraid to say anything now in case you think I'm only being correct. But you are correct. I wish you'd teach Simon to be correct, too. It'll be uphill work, I'm afraid. Why? Don't you like him? Uh, I've only met him for a moment. Hmm. What shall we do? I'm quite happy talking to you. Can you play gin rummy? No, I, I'm afraid I can't. I'm so glad. I do hate it so. It's starting to rain, I think. Oh, dear, everyone will come dashing into the house now. How awful. Are you sorry you came, Richard? Not at all. Do you know where to wash if you want to? No, but I'm all right. Hello, Sorrel. How are you? I'm fine. Myra, do you know Mr. Gradham? Oh, yes. We've met several times. Come and tell Myra. Well, 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 look at all the people. Does everybody know everybody? I don't. Simon, come and be nice to Miss Corrigan. We've met already, Father. Well, that's no reason for you not to be nice to her. How do you do, Mr. Bliss? How do you do? Are you staying here? I hope so. You must forgive me for being rather indefinite, but I've been working hard. Father, this is Mr. Gretham. How are you? When did you arrive? This afternoon. Good. Uh, where's your mother, Simon? In the garden. Sandy Turles with her. Oh, well, she's all right then. Uh, who is he? I, I... I don't know. Oh. Well, do sit down, everybody. Of course there would be rain. I felt sick this morning. Oh, here's Mother now. This is Sandy Tyrrell. Sandy, everybody. Uh, uh, Mother, I, know you. I want you to meet Mr. Gratham. Oh, yes, you were here before, weren't you? Before what, darling? Before we went out in the garden. There was somebody else here, too. A fair girl. Oh, there you are. Hello. How do you do? Well, do sit down, Sandy. Oh, uh, sure. <clears throat> uh. What a pity it's raining. We might have had some tennis. Oh, I'm sorry. Not at all. The train I got was the door shaped coming the down. Don't you? <laughs> mm. Well, I guess we're all here now. Aren't we? Yes. Isn't it exciting? I'm very fond of weekends. Aren't you? This is Studio One at CBS, presenting its sixth broadcast in a new series of hour-long feature productions, Hay Fever by Noel Coward. Our story will resume after a pause for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Continuing Columbia's new full-hour feature series, Studio One, we present the second half of Noel Coward's comedy of country life, Hay Fever. Stop, stop, please, let's stop 
Jack, all this. It's too soon after dinner for word games. Any time is too soon for word games. What's the use of playing at all if people won't do it properly? It's much too strenuous. I can't digest my dinner. It's so simple. It's very difficult if you haven't done it before. You're so right, Mr. Tyrrell. Never mind. Go on to the next one. Unless everyone's in it, we won't play at all. Now, don't lose your temper, dear sister. Lose my temper? I like that. No one's given me the slightest indication of what the word is. You all argue and squabble. Oh, talk, talk. Everybody talks too much. Well, yes. it's so surprising to me when people won't play up. After all, it's only a game. Well, it's a silly game anyhow, and I don't want to play it anymore. You haven't played it at all yet, Miss Carleton. Don't be rude, Sorrow. Really, Simon, the way you go on is infuriating. Oh, it's always the same. Whenever Sorrow is it, she gets quarrelsome. Quarrelsome? Don't, don't worry, Jackie. You needn't do anything you don't want to. I think for the rest of the weekend, we better confine our efforts to social conversation and not attempt anything in the least intelligent. Oh, how can you be so unkind, Mother? Simon, don't speak to me like that. It's all my fault. I know I'm silly, but it embarrasses me doing anything in front of people. I beg your pardon, Miss Corriton. Oh, why Miss Corriton all of a sudden? You've been calling her Jackie all evening. You're far too grand, Sorrow. And you're absolutely maddening. I'll never play another game with you as long as I live. Oh, that won't break my heart. Stop, stop, stop. Come on out into the garden, Jackie. I'm sick of all yes, this. Yes, so am I. Don't let him take you out sailing, Jackie. He isn't very good at it. Ha, ha. Very funny. Sorrow, you're behaving disgracefully. Always happens whenever we play a game. We're a lousy family and I hate us. Speak for yourself, dear. I can't. Without speaking for everyone else, too. We're all exactly the same and I'm ashamed of us. Come on into the library, Sandy. Whatever you say, Sorrow. <laughs> charming. It's all perfectly charming. <clears throat> uh, there, there, my love. You know, uh, I think it would be better, Judith, if you exercised a little more influence over the children. You ought never to have married me, David. It was a great mistake. The atmosphere of this house is becoming more unbearable every day. And all because Simon and Sorrow are allowed to do exactly what they like. You sit upstairs all day writing your silly novels? Silly novels which earn us our daily bread. Daily bread? Nonsense. We've got enough money to keep us in comfort till we die. Yes, and that will be very soon if we can't get a little peace. Go out into the garden, Myra. Practically everybody is in the garden. I sincerely hope the night air will cool you. I don't know what's happened to you lately, Judith. Nothing's happened to me. Nothing ever does. You're far too smug to allow it. Smug? Thank you. Yes, smug and pompous. I hope you haven't been drinking, dear. Drinking? <laughs> That's very amusing. I think it's rather tragic at your time of life. Come along, Myra. <laughs> Gretham, I'm sorry you've had to sit through all this. Oh, please don't be sorry. I... David's been a good husband to me, but he's wearing a bit thin now. Marriage is a hideous affair altogether, don't you think? I'm really hardly qualified to judge, you see. You I... stop being the non-committal diplomat just for once. Oh, I'm sorry. There's nothing to be sorry for, really, because after all, it is your particular thing, isn't it? I suppose it is. You'll get used to us in time, and then you'll feel cozier. Well, why don't you sit down? I'm enjoying myself very much, you know. Mm, it's very sweet of you to say so, but I don't see how you can be. <laughs> oh, but I am. Well, now, that was quite a genuine laugh we're getting on. Are you in love with sorrow? In love? With sorrow? I? Now I've killed it. I've murdered the little tender feeling of comfort that's stealing over you by sheer tactlessness. Did you really think I was in love with sorrow? It's so difficult to tell, isn't it? I, I mean, you might not know yourself. She's very attractive. She is, very. It's awfully sad for a woman of my temperament to have a grown-up daughter, you know, who will eventually cut me out altogether. That wouldn't be possible. I do hope you mean that, because it was a sweet remark. Of course I meant it. <laughs> no, then, tell me all about yourself and all the things you've done. I've done nothing. What a shame. Why not? I never realize how dead I am until I meet people like you. It's depressing, you know. What nonsense. You're not a bit dead. Do you always live here? I'm going to from now onwards. I intend to sink into a very beautiful old age. You're far too full of vitality to sink into anything. It's entirely spurious vitality. If you trouble to look below the surface, you'd find a very wistful and weary spirit. I should like to know exactly what you're thinking about. Really. I was thinking of calling you Richard. It's such a nice, uncompromising name. I should be very flattered if you would. I won't suggest you calling me Judith until you feel really comfortable about me. But I do, uh, Judith. I'm awfully glad. Will you give me a cigarette? Oh, certainly. Oh, what a divine case. It was given to me in the Orient. All those little designs mean things. What sort of things? Well, charms for happiness, luck, and love. Which is the charm for love? That one. 
What a dear. Well, Richard, you mustn't oh, kiss me. I, 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 I'm afraid I, I, I couldn't help what it. What are we to do? What are we to do? I, I don't know. David must be told everything. Everything? Yes, yes. There come moments in life when it's necessary to be honest. Honest? Absolutely honest. Oh, no. I've trained myself always to shun the underhand methods other women so often yes, employ. But... The truth must be faced fair and square. The truth? I don't quite understand. Dear Richard, you want to spare me, I know, but it's no use. No, After no. all, David has been a good husband to me. This, this may, of course, break him up rather, but it, it can't be helped. Look, please. They say something's uh, good for writers. It strengthens their psychology. You, you better go out into the garden and wait. Wait? What for? For me, Richard, for me. I will come to you later. Wait in the I'm... summer house. I had begun to think that romance was dead, that I should never know it again. Before, of Look. course, I had my work and my life in the theatre, but now... Look here, Judith. But I, I apologize for you what I did. have come and I... it's all changed. It's magic. Oh, I'm no. under a spell that I never thought to recapture again. Go along, out to the garden. But you Don't guess. make it any harder for me. It's the only possible way. Go! Sorrow? Sorrow, where are you, dear? Are you in the library, dear? Sorrow, are you... Oh, my sorrow! Really? But now, look here, Mother. We, we were only... Sorrow! What am I say to you? You know, Mother... Neither do I. It was my fault, Mrs. Bliss. Uh, uh, Judy. What a fool I've been. What a blind fool. Mother, are you really upset? I'm stunned. There was nothing, really, for heaven's sake. Nothing. I opened the library door casually, and what do I see? Uh, I'm very sorry. It has gone beyond superficial apology. Mother, be natural for a minute. I don't know what you mean, Sorrow. I'm trying to realize a very bit of truth. As calmly as I can. There's nothing so very bitter about it. My poor child. Very well, then. I love Sandy and he loves me. That's the only possible excuse for your behavior. Why shouldn't we love each other if we want to? Sandy was in love with me this afternoon. Not real love. You know it wasn't. I know now. Look, I'm really very sorry. There's nothing to be sorry for. It's my fault for having been so ridiculous. I'm getting old, and the sooner I face it, the better. But, darling... It's far from easy at my time of life to simply accept... Oh, that uh, stuff. Here we go again. Uh, Mother, Mother, say you understand and forgive me. Understand? You forget, dear. I am a woman. I know you are, Mother. That's what makes it all so poignant. Sandy, if you want sorrow, truly, I give her to you unconditionally. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mrs. Bliss. You are splendid, Mother. Nonsense. I just believe in being honest with myself. It's awfully good for one, you know. So cleansing. Well, I'm going upstairs now to have a little aspirin. Oh, youth, youth, what a strange, mad muddle you make of things. <laughs> All right, Sandy, don't look so gloomy. I know you don't love me, really. But honestly, Sorrow... Don't Sarah... protest. You know you don't any more than I love you. But you told Judith. I was only playing up. One always plays up to Mother in this house. It's a sort of unwritten law. Didn't she mean what she said? No, not really. We none of us ever mean anything. Well, she seemed awfully upset. It must have been a slight shock for her to discover us clasped tightly in each other's arms. I believe I do love you, Sorrow. You kissed me because you were awfully nice and I was awfully nice and we both liked kissing very much. But, Sandy, you're under absolutely no obligation to me at all. I wish I understood you better. Never mind about understanding me. Let's go back into the library. Oh, all right. And, you see, he comes in and finds her there waiting for him. She hadn't been away at all. No, and that's psychologically right, I'm sure. No woman under those circumstances would. It's brilliant of you to see that. I do think your book sounds excellent. Well, I got badly stuck in the middle of the book when the boy comes down from Dartmouth, but it worked out all right eventually. <laughs> when shall I be able to read it? I'll send you the proofs. You can help me to correct them. How divine. I'll feel most important. Uh, would you like a cigarette or anything? No, thank you. Well, I, I think I'll have a drink. Very well. Give me some plain soda water then, will you? Oh, there isn't any ice. Do you mind? Not at all. I never care for ice. In any form. All right. Here you are. Thank you. Hmm. I wonder where everybody is. <laughs> Not here, thank heavens. It must be dreadfully worrying for you, having a house full of people. Never give it a thought. I have a confession to make. Confession? Mm-hmm. 
I was invited here once before, you know, last September. Oh, I was in California then. Exactly. How do you mean exactly? I didn't come. I'm a very determined woman, you know, and I made up my mind to meet you ages ago. Oh, that was charming of you. I'm not much to meet, really. You see, I'd read your broken reads. Did you like it? Like it? I think it's one of the finest novels I've ever read. Uh, why are you being so nice to me? Have you got a plan about something? <laughs> How suspicious you are. Well, I can't help it. You're very attractive, and I'm always suspicious of attractive people on principle. Not a good principle. I'll tell you something. Strictly between ourselves. Please do. You're wrong about me. Wrong? In what way? I write very bad novels. Don't be so ridiculous. And you know I do because you're an intelligent person. I don't know anything of the sort. Tell me why you're being so nice to me. Because I want to be. Why? You're a very clever and amusing man. Oh, splendid. And I think I've rather lost my heart to you. Shall we elope? David. There now, you've called me David. Do you mind? Not at all. I'm not sure that you're being very kind. What makes you think that? You're being this little author, laughing up his sleeve at a gushing admirer. I think you're a very interesting woman and extremely nice-looking. Do you? Yes. Would you like me to make love to you? Really? I wish you wouldn't say things like that. You're magnificent. You're tawny. I'm not tawny. Don't argue. Oh, this is sheer affectation. Affectation's very nice. No, it isn't. It's odious. It's, it's literary. You mustn't get cross. I'm not in the least cross. Yes, you are. But you're very alluring. Alluring? Terribly. I can hear your brain ticking. It's very funny. <clears throat> that was rather rude. You've been consistently rude to me for hours. Never mind. Why have you? I'm always rude to people I like. You like me? Enormously. How sweet of you. But I don't like your methods. Methods? What methods? You're far too pleasant to occupy yourself with the commonplace. And you spoil yourself by trying to be clever. Thank you. Anyhow, I don't know what you mean by commonplace. Do you want me to explain? Not at all. Very well, I will. I shan't listen. You'll pretend not to, but you'll hear every word, really. No, oh, you're so inscrutable and quizzical. Just what a feminine psychologist should be. Yes, aren't I? You frighten me dreadfully. Darling. Don't call me darling. That's unreasonable. You've been trying to make me call you darling all evening. Your conceit is outrageous. Oh, it's not conceit at all. You've been firmly buttering me up because you want a nice little intrigue. How dare you? Sit down now. It's true. If it weren't, you wouldn't be so angry. I think you're insufferable. Myra, dear Myra. Don't touch me. Let's have that nice little intrigue. The only reason I've been so annoying is that I love to see things as they are first and then pretend they're what they're not. Words. Masses and masses of words. Well, they're great fun to play with. I'm glad you think so. Personally, they bore me stiff. Myra, don't be statuesque. Let go my hand. You're charming. Let go my hand. I won't. You will. For that, my dear, you shall be kissed. Dave. You're perfectly <clears throat> sweet. Oh. Dave. <clears throat> you must say it's an entrancing amusement. <laughs> interrupting. Uh, Judith. Oh. oh, hello, Judith, dear. This is a very unpleasant situation, David. Terrible. We'd better talk it all over. I shall do nothing of the sort. Please, please, don't be difficult. I apologize, Judith. June has always been a lucky month for me. Look here, Judith, I'd like to explain one thing. I don't want to hear any explanations or excuses. They're so cheapening. This was bound to happen sooner or later. It always does to everybody. The only thing is to keep calm. I am, perfectly. There is such a thing as being too calm. Oh, sorry, dear. Yeah. Life has dealt me another blow, but I don't mind. What did you say? I said life had dealt me another blow, but I didn't mind. Rubbish. <sighs> David, I've known for a long time, I've realized subconsciously for years that you've stopped caring for me in that way. What do you mean, that way? Just that way. Rather tragic, but quite inevitable. I'm growing old now. Men don't grow old like women, as you'll find your cost, Myra, in a year or two. This is all ridiculous hysteria. No, Myra, Judith is right. What are we to do? Do nothing. Do you love her truly, David? Madly. David! You thought just now that I was joking. Couldn't you see that all my flippancy was only a mask, hiding my real emotions, crushing them down desperately? But David, I, I really... knew it. The time has come for the dividing of the way. What on earth do you mean? I mean that I am not the sort of woman to hold a man against his will. David doesn't love me madly, and I don't love him. You do I... love him. I can see it in your eyes and your every gesture. David, I give you to her. Really. 
We must all be good friends, always. Judith, do you mean this? You know I do. Well, how can we ever repay you? Just by being happy. But what about the children? Oh, really? We must share them, dear. I'll pay you exactly half the royalties I receive from everything, Judith. That's very generous of you. You behave magnificently. This is a crisis in our lives, and thanks to you... Judith, I will speak. I will. Myra, darling, we owe it to Judith to keep control of our emotions. A scene would be agonizing for her now. Come, we'll go out in the garden. I will not go out into the garden. Please go. I don't think I can bear any more just now. So, uh, this is the end, Judith? Yes, my dear. The end. Mother! Mother, I've got something very important to tell you. Very well, dear. Where's Sorrow? In the library, I'm afraid. Sorrow, come out. I've got something vital to tell you. Oh, you seem excited, my boy. What's happened? What on earth's the matter? I wish you wouldn't all look so depressed. It's good news. Good news? I thought perhaps Jackie had been drowned. Oh, Jackie hasn't been drowned. She's been something else. Simon, what do you mean? Jackie! Jackie, come on in! Yes, Simon, you calling me? Jackie has become engaged to me. Simon! Good heavens! Simon, my dear, oh, this is too much. <laughs> well, what on earth are you crying about, Mother? Oh, my chicks leaving the nest. Jackie, come and kiss me. Oh. You must promise to make my oh, son but Mrs. Happy. Bliss, I... I understand I have not been a mother or nothing. But it's not true. We don't, Simon, You're trying just... to I... spare my feelings, I know. Well, I'm not going to spare your feelings or anyone else's. You are the most infuriating set of hypocrites I've ever seen. Myra! Don't speak to me! I've been working up to this, only every time I open my mouth, I've been mowed down by theatrical effects. You haven't got one sincere or genuine feeling among the lot of you. It's a great pity you ever left the stage, Judith. It's your rightful home. You can rant and roar there as much as ever you like. Rant and roar. May you be forgiven. And I'm not going you to allow you to say enough words. Oh, no, 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 Is this another game? Yes, Richard, yes. And again, I must be played to the finish. Zara, what does this mean? So many illusions shattered, so many dreams trodden in the dust. Ah, it's love's whirlwind. <laughs> Dear old love's whirlwind. I don't understand. You and Victor? Oh, no. Isn't that little Pam crying? She'll cry more, poor mite, when she realizes her mother is her. Don't say it, don't say it. There, her, I've given you all that makes life worth living. My youth, my womanhood, and now my child. Would you tear the very heart out of me? I have nothing left, nothing. Where am I to turn for help? Is this true? Answer me, is this yes, true? Yes, yes. You curse. Don't strike. He is your father. Well, Mother, don't carry this too far. She's fainted. How lucky she is. Oh, uh, good morning, Jackie. Good morning, Sandy. I guess we're the first down, hmm? It looks like it. Is there any food? Yes, it's on the sideboard. Lots of things. Well, what's the matter? Nothing. Oh, gosh, don't cry. It's this house. I've been sitting at the breakfast table for nearly half an hour, and there's nobody around at all. Oh, well, they're sleeping late, I guess. I wish I had never come. I had horrible nightmares with all those fearful dragons crawling across the walls. Dragons? Yes. I'm in a Chinese room. Everything in it is Chinese, even the bed. How awful. I think they're all mad. The blisses? Yes. I must be. I've been thinking that, too. Do you suppose they know they're mad? No, 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 no. People never do. Are you really engaged to Simon? Oh, no. I hope not. Well, you were last night. Well, so were you to sorrow. Uh, not really. We uh, talked it over. I don't know what happened to me. I was in the garden with Simon, and he was being very sweet. And then he suddenly kissed me and rushed into the house and said we were engaged, and that terrible mother of his asked me to make him happy. Well, that's exactly what happened to me and Sorrel. Judith gave us to one another before we knew where we were. Oh, how awful. I like Sorrel, though. She was wonderful about it afterwards. Oh, I think she's a cat. Why? Well, look at the way she lost her temper over that game. Well, all the same, she's better than the others. Well, that wouldn't be hard. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Oh, gosh. I've got the hiccups. 
people have died from hiccups, you know. Have they? Yes, an aunt of mine had them for three days without stopping. Gosh. She had to have the doctor and everything. Uh, I think mine will stop soon. Oh, I hope they will. <laughs> oh. Drink some water the wrong way around. Well, how do you mean the wrong way around? Well, the wrong side of the glass. I'll show you. Oh, there isn't any water. Well, perhaps coffee would do as well. I've never tried coffee, but it might. <laughs> Here, I'll pour you some. What do I do? Well, tip it up and drink from the opposite side, sort of upside down. <laughs> oh, look out. Somebody's coming. Bring it into the library, quick. All right. <laughs> oh, God. Good morning, Richard. Myra, good morning. Are we the first down? No, I don't think so. Some things have been used on the table here. Isn't this rain miserable? Falling. Can I pour you some coffee? Yes, please. Have you seen anybody? No. Good. We might have a little peace. Have you ever stayed here before? No, and I never will again. I feel far from well this morning. I'm so sorry, but not entirely surprised. You see, I was assigned to sleep in the boiler room. How terrible. The window stuck, and I couldn't open it. Nearly suffocated. And the pipes made peculiar noises all night as well. Do the whole family have breakfast in bed? I neither know nor care. What's that? It came from the library. Oh, what was that? What happened? It's someone in the library, I think, Clara. In the library? Let's have a look. Here, what's going on? What are you doing? Oh, good morning. I'm afraid we've broken a coffee uh, cup. Was there any coffee in it? Uh, quite a bit, I'm afraid. Oh, let me look. Uh, oh, dear, all over the cup. Uh, it was my fault. I, I'm very sorry. Oh, how did you come to do it? Well, you, you see, he had the hiccups, and I was showing him how to drink upside down. How ridiculous. Well, thank goodness it wasn't one of the crown darlings. They've gone now, anyhow. My hiccups, I mean. It was the sudden shock, I expect. Mrs. Arundel? Yes? What are you going to do about... about today? Oh, nothing, except go to New York by the first train possible. Do you mind if I come, too? I don't think I could face another day like yesterday. Oh, neither could I. Well, let's all go away, quietly. Won't it seem a little rude if we all go? Yes, it will. You and Miss Corriton must stay, Mr. Tyrrell. I don't see why. Well, I don't think they'd mind very much. Listen, Jackie, I'll take you up in my car as soon as you like. All right, fine. Oh, you have got a car, haven't you? Yes. Oh, uh, will it hold all of us? You said it would be rude for us all to go. Hadn't you and Mr. Gretham better go on the train? Certainly not. If there is room, we should be very, very great. I think I can squeeze you in. Then that's settled. Well, when shall we start? As soon as you're ready. Come on, Jackie. We'll finish our packing. All right. Here, don't leave me. I'll come with you. I'll just go out and look at the car. Will you all be ready in five minutes? Yes, in five minutes. <laughs> Papers come. They're at your place on the table, dear, as usual. Thank you. You haven't forgotten my orange juice, have you? No, dear. It's in the ice box. I'll get it. Oh, the lovely Sunday papers. Morning, Mother, darling. Morning. How are you? Lovely, dear. And you? Hmm. Well, listen to this. We saw Judith Bliss in a box at the ballet last Thursday, looking as beautiful as ever. <laughs> oh, there now. I thought I looked hideous on Thursday. You looked sweet. Here's your orange juice, dear. Thank you. Oh, I wish I was sitting on a lovely South Sea island with masses of palm trees and coconuts and turtles. Would be divine, wouldn't it? I wonder where everybody is. I wonder. Oh, this is interesting. Mary Saunders has got another thing. <laughs> Look at my new drawing. Simon, how lovely. When did you do it? This morning. I woke early. L let's see. I'm going to alter Helen's face. It's too pink. <laughs> it's exactly like her. What a clever son I Oh, have. now then, Mother. It's too <laughs> wonderful. When I think of you both in your perambulators. Oh, dear, it makes me cry. I don't believe you ever saw us in our perambulators. I don't believe I ever did. <laughs> Hello, good morning, dear. Sorrow, Simon. David, dear. My book's finished. Look, these are the last pages. Splendid, dear. Read it to us now. Yeah, this is the last chapter. Go on, then. Who's that at the front door? Oh, good morning. Oh, it's Sandy. Excuse me, I'm expected upstairs. I seem to know that boy's face. Well, never mind. Uh, listen now, you remember that bit when Violet was taken ill in Paris? Yes, dear. Marmalade, please, Simon. Well, I'll go on from there. Do, dear. Paris in spring, with the Champs-Élysées alive and dancing in the sunlight. 
Lightly dressed children like gay painted butterflies. Here's the marmalade, Mother. Simon, keep quiet or go away. Sorry, Father. Well, don't interrupt again. Gay painted butterflies. The streets were thronged with hurrying vehicles. The thin peak peak of taxi horns I love seemed peak, to peak. merge in with the other peak, vivid peak. noises, weaving a vast <laughs> pattern of sound, which was Paris. What was Paris, dear? Which was Paris? You can't say a vast pattern of sound. What was Paris? What was Paris? A vast pattern of sound, which was Paris. Oh, I see. Jane Septon, in her scarlet hispano, swept out of the Rue Saint Honoré into the Place de la Concorde. She couldn't have. Why? The Rue Saint Honoré doesn't lead into the Place de la Concorde. Yes, it does. You're thinking of the Rue Boissy d'Anglais, Father. I'm not thinking of anything of the sort. David, darling, don't be obstinate. Do you think I don't know Paris as well as you do? Never mind. Father is probably right. He isn't right. He's wrong. Go on with your food, Sorrow. Don't be testy, David. It's a sign of age. Jane Septon, in her scarlet hispano, swept out of the Rue Saint Honoré into the Place de la Concorde. That sounds absolutely ridiculous. Why don't you alter it? It isn't ridiculous. It's perfectly right. Very well, then. Get a map and I'll show you. We haven't got a map. You've got it all muddled. Look here, Father. Mother's right. Here's the Place de la Concorde. Oh, shut up, Sorrow. Shut up yourself, you pompous little beast. You think you know such a lot about everything and you're as ignorant as a frog. Why a frog? I'll never attempt to read of you anything again as long as I live. You're not a bit interested in my work and you don't care a minute whether I'm a success or a failure. Well, you're dead certain to be a failure if you cram your books with inaccuracy. I am not inaccurate. Yes, you are. And you're foul-tempered and spoiled. Spoiled? I like that. Nobody here spoils me. You're the most insufferable family to live with. Now, why in heaven's name don't you go and live somewhere else? Mother, keep calm. Calm? I'm furious. What have you got to be furious about? Everyone rushing around adoring you and saying how wonderful you are. I am wonderful. Heaven knows who stood for you for all these years. Mother, do sit down and be quiet. How dare you speak to Mother like that? Oh, to think my daughter should turn against me. I'm wounded to the heart. Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. Don't you say rubbish to me. I will say rubbish. Mother. All right, you sit to me, daughter. Well, now, what was that? Oh. Is that the welcome sound of departing guests? Yes, they've all gone. All of them. How do you know, dear? I can see the window. The car's full. Fine. How very rude of them. People do behave in the most extraordinary manner these days. Come back and finish your breakfast, Zorro. I haven't started it yet. Well, start then. Go on, David, darling. I'm dying to hear the end. <sighs> Jane Sefton, in her scarlet hispano, swept out of the Rue Saint Honoré into the Place de la Concorde. <laughs> Columbia Broadcasting System has brought you Studio One, a new series of hour-length versions for listening of celebrated stories, novels, and plays. Tonight from Studio One, you have heard Fletcher Markle's script and production of Hay Fever by Noel Coward. The original music was composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. Now, a uh, brief who was who. May a producer identify the principles of tonight's cast. In the Bliss family... Judith. ...was Evelyn Varden... David. Everett Sloan. Sorrow. Was Ann Burr. Simon. William Woodson. The guests were Joan Alexander, Susan Douglas, Donald Buker, and Hedley Rennie. Eva Condon was Clara. Next Tuesday night from Studio One at CBS, a very powerful story of man in conflict. Long praised and much neglected, Stephen Crane's magnificent masterpiece, The Red Badge of Courage. A portrait of a long ago time of war with an important point for our time of peace. And now, until next week, until the Red Badge of Courage, this is Fletcher Markle with a good night and thank you from all of us in Studio One. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
suspense. Tonight, Columbia brings you as guest star, Hollywood's genial character actor, Stuart Irwin. The story is by the author of The Thin Man and the Maltese Falcon, Dashiell Hammett, one of America's acknowledged masters of the art of suspense. Suspense is compounded of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. In this series are stories calculated to intrigue you to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. Tonight, for instance, Stuart Irwin plays for us a pleasant, easygoing assistant chief of police in a small town who, to everyone's surprise, was instrumental in solving a murder. We trust that with this tale we shall keep you in... Suspense. For suspense tonight, CBS presents Stuart Irwin in Two Sharp Knives by Dashiell Hammett. Shortly after 2 a.m., a poker game had just broken up at Ben Camdeley's, the doctor coroner of Deerwood City. Scott Anderson, Deerwood's chief of police, and Wally Shane, his assistant, were standing. Where are we heading for, Scott? Let's walk across the street, Wally. Railroad station. Gee, aren't you afraid of the excitement, Chief? Don't you think that watching the 211 come in is apt to be too much for your blood pressure? Well, if it is, Wally, you can always carry on. You've been a pretty good imitation of an assistant to me for some time now. Yeah? Yeah. If anything happens to me, you'd be the chief. Don't worry. It won't be any harder for you to fool the public as chief. Hi, Elmer. Uh, howdy, Scott. Uh, hi, hello, Wally. Kind of late for you boys to be around, ain't it? No, I don't know. We sort of figured we'd put the town to bed tonight. How's the 211? On time? Right on the nose. She ought to be blowing for the bend in just about three seconds now. Yep. What'd I tell you? It's her now. You expecting anyone on her, Scott? No, Elmer, I'm not expecting anyone. Wally and I just thought we'd come over and watch you come in, that's all. You know, Elmer, you never can tell who might get off, though. Dick Turpin, Henry Morgan, Jesse James, Jake, Jack the Ripper, or six officers of Murder Incorporated, or even your Aunt Gussie. I guess you're right, Wally. Well, here she be. Pardon me, Jinx, but I gotta be rolling the wagon out to the baggage car. Well, can't complain. Can't complain, Cap. Well, maybe you can, Elmer, but I sure can if you hold us up with that freight there. You got much more? Nope. This is the last piece now. There you are, Cap. All done. Okay. See you tomorrow, Elmer. Hey, Scott. Do you see what I see? I mean, do I see the man who just got off that train? The answer's yes. Well, he's a ringer for the guy we got a picture of. That is the guy. Well, then, what do we do now? We take him, Wally. My car's at the corner of the alley. Oh, but, Scott... We'll tail him up the street. Okay, Scott. There he goes now, over toward the taxi stand. Come on. Let's follow him. Hello, Furman. Huh? Why? Oh, I, I don't believe You're I... Mr. Furman, aren't you? Yes, I am. Philadelphia? Yes. I'm Scott Anderson, Chief of Police. What? Chief of... What's happened to her? Happened to who? Oh, oh no, you don't. No. Let me go. Oh, no. You think you can pull that sort of stuff okay. with me? You're very much mistaken. Let me get a crack no. at that no. mug. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. No. Wait a minute, Hold gentlemen. It, well, Furman? Well, I... I am sorry. For a moment there, I thought you weren't really a policeman. Thanks. Nice to know I look almost human. Yes, it... It was silly of me. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, let's get going now before anything else happens. Okay, Furman, get in the car. I'll drive, Scott. Anyhow. I'll, uh, are you taking me to police headquarters? That's right. What for? Philadelphia? I, uh, I don't think I understand. You understand that you're wanted in Philadelphia for murder, don't you? Murder? Why, 
That's ridiculous. That's... Who told you that? Well, it's a cinch he didn't make it up. But wait, there, there must be... Take it easy to... now. This wait will get down to headquarters. And I'll show you what I mean. Now then, here's the circular on Lester Furman. It was sent out by the Transamerica Detective Agency in Philadelphia. Take a look at it. Oh, uh, $1,500 reward for the arrest and conviction of Lester Furman, alias Lloyd Fields, alias J.D. Carpenter, for the... for the murder of Paul Frank Dunlap in Philadelphia on December 8th, 1942. Well... Uh, it's a lie. You're firming, aren't you? Oh, yes, but... That's your picture on the circular, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, but I... Well, I... Scott, I see you and Wally got firming, huh? Oh, hello, George. Uh, you lucky stiffs. Now you two split a grand and a half reward. i uh, never seen nothing like it. You know, if it ain't vacations in New York at the city's expense, it's reward, though. Judge, someday, if you don't remember you're the jailer around here, not the D.A., Hmm? You're going to be wearing your teeth on the outside of your lips, and I'll be the guys who arrange them that way. Savvy? Uh, just because you caught a guy who's hot in Philadelphia. It's a lie. It's a frame-up. You can't prove anything. There's nothing to prove. I never killed anybody. I won't be framed. Take it I easy, won't be framed. Furman. Take it easy. You're wasting your breath on us. Save it for the Philadelphia police. We're just holding you for them. But it's not the police. It's the Trans-America Please detective. turn you over to the Philadelphia police. Mr. Anderson, I... I... Well... Then, then there's nothing I can do now? There's nothing any of us can do till morning. We'll have to search you now, then we won't bother you anymore till they come for you. But I... Wally, you look through his bag. I'll see what he's got in his pockets. Okay, Scott. Well, all he's got on him are some business cards, a few letters, a hundred and... $160, a book of checks in the Philadelphia bank, and a few odds and ends. What's with the bag, Wally? Not much. A couple of changes of clothes, some toilet articles, and... Oh, here's a 38. Loaded. Pretty little thing, isn't it? Okay, put those things in what I got in the vault. All right, George. You can take Furman now and lock him up. This is the most ridiculous come thing Come on, I... darling, come on. We ain't had nobody in our little hoosco for three days running. Hey, yeah? Uh, you'll have it all to yourself. Just like a sweet of the Ritz. But I... Go on, in you go. I tell you, 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 you're making a mistake. I demand to be allowed to get in touch with my lawyer. I, I won't hey, how about you boys cutting me in on a little of that blood money, huh? Oh, sure, George, sure. I'll forget all about that two and a half you've been owing me for three months. Mm -hmm. Make Furman as comfortable as you can, George. Take good care of him. He's valuable, huh? Yeah, now, if it was some bum that didn't mean a nickel to you... George... Any day now, I'm going to forget that your uncle is county chairman and throw you back in the gutter just to see how high he'll bounce. Remember that. Oh, Scott, I, I didn't mean nothing. That's I... all, George. Never mind the rest. I'm going home now. If anything's urgent, I can reach there. But get this. I don't want to be disturbed. Unless it is urgent. <laughs> What time is it? It's five after six in the morning, and you'd better come right down, Scott. That fellow Furman's hung himself. What? Furman hung himself? Yep, by his belt, from a window bar. Dead in a mackerel. I'll be right in, Wally. Phone Doc Camsley and tell him I'll pick him up on my way down. No doctor's going to do Furman any good, Scott. Well, it won't hurt to have him looked at. You'd better phone the chronic court at Douglasville, too, and file a routine report. Already did that. And what's more, hold on to your seat. The DA's on his way over, in person. The DA? Yeah. I'll be there before you hang up, Wally. <laughs> Chief, Ted Carroll, the DA, is here, and he's plenty hot under the collar. What's he burning about? Oh, he's just mad, running up quite a phone bill on us, too. Been calling Philadelphia every couple of minutes since he got here. What kept you so long? Oh, I couldn't get my car started. Well, right, let's go in and see the old buzzard. Oh, Ted? Listen, Scott, what is all this? Oh, what? There's some funny business going on here. What's funny about it? 
Man hangs himself. Just another case of suicide. Sure, it was suicide. But I just telephoned Transamerica. Dug a guy out of bed there. And he said they'd never sent out circulars on Furman. Didn't know about any murder he was wanted for. All they could tell me about him was he used to be a client of theirs. You don't know what to say, Ted. I don't either. Oh, a fine chief of police you are. What on earth kept you so long? Castor. Came as quick as I could. Ain't you so crabby, Ted? Nothing. I guess it's just the district attorney and... Ah, now, come, come, gentlemen. Nobody'd know you two are staunch admirers of each other. (laughs) Okay, Wally. Tell me, what do you make of it? Well, there's plenty wrong, Scott. First, that Trans-America thing. They never send out circulars about Furman. And now, get this. I talked to the Philly police just before you came in. There wasn't even any Paul Frank Dunlap murdered. There wasn't? No. What did you get out of Furman before you let him hang himself? That he was innocent. Didn't you grill him? Didn't you find out what he was doing in town? Wally, didn't you? What for? He admitted he was Furman. The description fitted him. The photograph was him. The Trans-America Detective Agency is supposed to be on the level, ain't it? Philadelphia wanted Furman. We didn't. But Scott... I sure, Ted. If I'd have known he was going to hang himself. Yeah, but then if your aunt wore pants, you'd be your uncle. You said Furman had been a client of Trans-America. They tell you what the job they did for him was? His wife left him a couple of years ago, and he had them hunting for her for five or six months. But they never found her. They're sending a man up here tonight to look things over. Yeah, huh? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going out and grab a quick bite. But I might as well tell you, Scott, there's going to be trouble over this. I know that, Ted. There usually is when somebody dies in a jail cell. <laughs> Become of that 1,500 fish now, huh, Scott? What happened there last night, George? Nothing. Furman hung himself. Did you find him? Uh-huh. Wally took a look in here to see how things was before he went off duty, and he found him. You're asleep, I suppose. Well, uh, I was catching a nap, I guess, but everybody does that sometimes, Scott. Even Wally sometimes when he comes in off his beat between rounds. Yeah, but I always wake up when the phone rings or anything. Oh, sure. Well, suppose I had been awake. Can't hear a guy hanging himself, can you? Did Doc Campbell say how long Furman had been dead? Yeah, he done it about five o'clock, he said he guessed. Oh, you want to look at the remains, Scott? They're over at Fritz's undertaking parlor. Not now. Hey, and speaking of Furman, what are you going to tell the guys from Transamerica when they show up here tonight? <laughs> Come in, come in. Oh, uh, they, they told me I'd find you here. You're Chief Anderson, aren't you? Yes, that's right. I'm Carl Reising, assistant manager of the Trans-America Detective Agency in Philadelphia. This is Mr. Wheelock, who is Lester Furman's personal attorney. Glad to know you, Mr. Reising. How do you do, Mr. Wheelock? Hmm. How do you do? I know you gentlemen are already in possession of most of the details concerning Mr. Furman from the time he arrived in Deerwood until the time of his death. But perhaps you don't know that the police of most towns in our corner of the state have also received copies of this same reward circular. Take a look at it. Oh. oh. I must say this circular is an excellent forgery. You're sure it's a forgery, Mr. Reesing? Oh, yes. There's no doubt about it. But it's an excellent forgery. Tell me, Mr. Wheelock, was Mr. Furman a native Philadelphian? Oh, my, yes. He was a well-known, respectable, and prosperous citizen of Philadelphia. Married, I believe? In 1934, he married a 22-year-old girl named Ethel Bryan, daughter of a Philadelphia family. And the Furman's had a child? Isn't that right, Mr. Wheeler? Yes, born in 1936, but the child lived only a few months. Mr. Furman's wife disappeared after the child's death. Uh, what year was it that she disappeared? Mr. Reesing should remember that. His agency worked on the matter. Oh, I remember it well. Uh, Mrs. Furman disappeared in 1937. We never heard anything of her again, although Furman spent a lot of money trying to locate her. What did she look like, Mr. Tracy? Oh, in just a moment, uh, I have a picture of her right here in my briefcase. Ah, uh, here it is. Quite pretty, isn't she? If you care for that type. Oh, you see what you mean, Mr. Wheeler. Well, she's attractive as that. Judging by this photo, I'd say that she was a small-featured, pretty blonde, with a weak mouth and large, somewhat staring eyes. Oh, that's an accurate enough description, all right. 
If you don't mind, I'd like to have a copy made of that photograph, Mr. Reesing. Oh, you can keep that one if you like. It's one that we had made up at Transamerica. Uh, her description's on the back. Thanks. Did uh, Furman ever divorce her? No, sir. He was a lot in love with her, and he seemed to think that the child's dying made her a little screwy so that she didn't know what she was doing. Uh, that's right, isn't it, Mr. Wheelock? That is my belief, Mr. Reesing. Uh, you said Furman had money, Mr. Wheelock. Uh, about how much did he have? And who gets it? I should say his estate will amount to perhaps a half a million dollars left in its entirety to his wife. Mm -hmm. It's quite a handy sum for anyone to have, I'd say. Mr. Wheeler, everything shows that somebody framed Furman into the Daywood jail. And that frame-up drove him to suicide. But there has to be something else. A lot else. Well, then, what are you going to do? I'm going across the street to the undertaking parlor and have a look at Furman. I'll see you later. Hello, Doc. Hi, Scott. I figured you'd come over here to the undertakers pretty soon. What's in your mind, Doc? Uh, let's uh, get out of this crowd. I, I want to tell you something. I just got rid of two guards in my office. Let's go back there. Suits me. Two of those uh, bruises uh, showed, Scott. What bruises? Furman. Well, up under the hair, there were there were two bruises. Well, why didn't you tell me? I'm telling you now, Scott. You weren't here when I made my examination. This is the first time I've seen you since then. Why didn't you spill the stuff about Furman's bruises when you were testifying at the inquest, then? Uh, I'm a friend of yours. Do I want to put you in a spot where people can say you drove this champ to suicide by third-degreeing him too rough? Ah, you're nuts. How bad was Furman's head? Well, Scott, uh, that didn't kill him, if that's what you mean. Yeah, there's nothing the matter with his skull. Just a couple of bruises nobody had noticed, and unless they parted the hair. I thought you ought to know, though. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Yes, who is it? This is Fritz, the undertaker. Listen, Scott, there's a couple of ladies over here that want to take a look at Furman. Is it all right? Who are they? I don't know them. Strangers. What do they want to see him for? I don't know. Wait a minute. God, I please see him. Why do you want to see him? Well, I... I'm... his wife. Herman's wife? Yes. Oh, 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 certainly. I'll be right over. So long, Ben. I've got to go back to the undertakers. So long, Scott. Hey, Scott. What do you want, Wally? I want to talk to you a minute. Over here where we won't be seen. Okay, what is it? A couple of dames came into Fritz's undertaking place just as I was leaving. One of them's Hotshaw Randall, a babe with a record as long as your arm. She's one of that mob you had me working on in New York last summer. Does she know you? Sure, but not by my right name. She thinks I'm a Detroit rum runner. I mean, did she recognize you just now? I don't think she saw me. Anyway, she didn't give me a tumble. You don't know the other one? No, she's a blonde, kind of pretty. Okay, Wally. Stick around a while, but stay out of sight. Maybe I'll be bringing these dolls back with me. Whatever you say, Chief. Oh, there you are, Scott. I wondered when you were coming. Uh, this is Mrs. Furman, and this is Mrs. Crowder. How do you do? Hiya, Chief. They just saw the body. Mrs. Crowder? I thought your name was Randall. What do you care, Chief? I'm not hurting your town any. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me Chief. You city slickers, I'm the town whittler. Thank you for letting me see him. It's all right, Mrs. Furman. But I'll have to ask you and your friends some questions. So if you'll just come across the street to headquarters, we'll get on with the routine. <laughs> any questions, I want to tell you something. Mrs. Furman, your husband didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. Murdered? Ah, oh, Chief, we got alibis. We were in New York, and we can prove it. And you're likely to get a chance, Tim. What brought you down here, anyway? Murdered? Well, who's got a better right to come down here? She was still his wife, wasn't she? She's got a right to look out for her own interests, hasn't she? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, it reminds me of something. Uh, excuse me a second. Uh, I've got to make a phone call in the next room. Officer Hamill speaking. This is Scott. Yes? Is Wally around? No, he's not here. He said you told him to keep out of sight. I'll find him for you, though. Right. Uh, tell Wally I want him to go to New York tonight. Send Mason home to get some sleep. He'll have to take over Wally's night trick. Oh. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson, do you think I had, had anything to do with Lester's... with his death? I don't know, Mrs. Furman. I know he was killed. I also know he left you something like half a million. Wow. Dollars? Dollars. All right, Chief. Let's stop clowning. The kid here didn't have a thing to do with whatever you think happened. No? No. We read about Lester Furman committing suicide in yesterday morning's paper. And about there being something funny about it. And I persuaded her she ought to come down to Mr. deal with Mr. Anderson, I wouldn't have done anything to hurt Lester. I left him because I wanted to leave him. I wouldn't have done anything to hurt him for, for money or anything else. Had I wanted money from him, I would only have had to ask him for it. That's the truth, Chief. For years I've been telling Ethel she was a chump not to tap him. But she never would. I wouldn't have hurt him. Why'd you leave him then? Oh, I don't know how to say it. The way we lived wasn't the way I wanted to live. I wanted... Oh, I don't know what. Anyway, after the baby died, I, I couldn't stand it anymore. Excuse me. Hello? Oh, yeah, Hammer? Hmm? You gave Wally the message? Yes, yes, I want him to go to New York tonight. Okay, where is he? Home? He is home, huh? Okay, thanks. This is uh, Furman. Uh, this circular that got your husband in the jail. Did you ever see that picture before? No. Well, that's... It can't be. It, it's a snapshot I have. It's an enlargement of it. Who else has one? Nobody that I know of. I don't think anyone else could have one. You've still got yours? Yes. I don't remember whether I've seen it recently. It's with some old papers and things. But I must have it. Well, Mrs. Furman, it's stuff like that that's got to be checked up. Neither of us can dodge it. Now, there's two ways we can play it. Yes. Mrs. Furman, I can hold you here on suspicion until I've had time to investigate things. Or I can send one of my men with you to check up in New York. Yes. I'm willing to do that if you'll speed things up by helping them all you can. If you'll promise you won't try any tricks. I promise. I'm as anxious as you are. All right. Water. All right. How'd you come down? We drove down. We got a great big car. That's my car, see? That big green job across the street. Yeah. yeah. And my man can ride back with you, but no funny business. Oh, I don't worry, Chief. Come on. We're going to see Wally Shane. The man is going to drive to New York with you. <laughs> Scott, Molly. Come in. Ladies first. Harry. Harry. Ethel. No, you don't. No, you don't. No use reaching with that gun, Molly. Already got you covered. I guess you win, Scott. Yeah, I guess I do. Come along back to headquarters with me like a good little boy. Molly, you're under arrest for murder. <laughs> those two dames going into Fritz's. Then when I was ducking out of sight, I ran into you, and I was afraid you'd take me over there with you, so I had to tell you one of them knew me, figuring you'd want to keep me undercover for a little while anyhow, long enough for me to get out of town. Why didn't you get out, Wally? Well, I dropped in home to pick up a couple of things before I scram, and that phone call of Hamels catches me, and, and I fall for it. You see, Scott, I figured you're not on to me yet and are going to send me back to New York to see what dope I can get out of the dames. Well, you fooled me, brother. I never thought you'd fall for that. Then you didn't just stumble into all this accidentally, did you? No, I didn't, Wally. I figured Furman had to be murdered by a copper. To no reward circulars well enough to make a good job of forging one. Incidentally, 
Who printed that permanent circular for you, Wally? Now, I'm not dragging anyone in with me. It was only a poor mug that needed dough. Okay, Wally. You see, I knew only a copper would be sure enough of the routine to know how things would be handled. Only one of my coppers would be able to walk in a permanent cell, bang him across the head, and string him up on the... Those bruises showed, you know, Wally. They did? I guess I should have wrapped two towels around that blackjack. No, oh, gee, Scott. I seem to have slipped up on a lot of things. So that narrows it down to my coppers, and... Well, you told me you knew the Randall woman. There it was. Only I figured you were working with him. What got you like this, Wally? Same thing that gets most saps into jams, a yen for easy dough. And I was in New York, see, Scott, working that Dutton job for you, palling around with big shot racketeers, passing for one of them, and... Yes? Well, I got to figuring that my work takes more brains than theirs, and they're taking in big money, and I'm working for coffee and cakes. That kind of stuff gets you, Scott. Anyway, it got me. Mm-hmm. Then I ran into this Ethel Furman, and she goes for me like a house of fire. I liked her, too, see? So that's dandy. But one night, she tells me about how much dough her husband's got and how he feels about her, and I get to thinking... Thinking what? I think she's nuts enough about me to marry me. So I get to thinking, suppose he died and left her his role. Mm-hmm. I see. So I run down to Philly a couple of afternoons and look Furman up, and everything looks fine. I took my time working out the details, meanwhile writing to her through a fella in Detroit. Go on. Finish one. Well, I decided to do it. I sent those circulars out to a lot of places, not wanting to point too much to this one. And then when I was ready, I phoned Furman, telling him to come to Deerwood Hotel that night. And sometime before the next night, he'd hear from his wife, Ethel. I knew he'd fall for any trap that was baited with her. Only I guess I'm not as sharp as I thought I was, Scott. Maybe yeah, Wally. Maybe yeah. That doesn't always help. Old man Camsley, Ben's father, used to have a saying. To a sharp knife comes a tough steak. Well, it's how you did it, Wally. I always liked you. I know you did, Scott. I was counting on that. Dashiell Hammett's Two Sharp Knives, starring Stuart Irwin. Tonight's story of... Suspense. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next week, suspense will not be heard because of a special holiday broadcast. Columbia's review of the events of the year. Twelve crowded months, which has been scheduled. On the following Tuesday, January 5th, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, and Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, are collaborators on Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. G. Marshall. Once again, it's open house here on your dial for mystery and suspense and the excitement of the unknown. 
They say, whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. Yes, they do say that. But these days, it would be quite possible to take the opposing view. One could also say, whom the gods would preserve, they first make mad. More and more, we find our world dominated by the senseless, the irrational, the incongruous, the incredible. And if this is the way things are truly headed, perhaps a touch of madness may be absolutely necessary for survival. I'm, uh, I'm sorry I crashed in on you like this, sir. Oh, uh, I hope you're not injured. No, 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 I'm, I'm fine. You're plain? I'll examine it in the morning. Then you'll join us for dinner, won't you? Well, thank you. If you'd like to go to bed early, we have a room ready for your convenience. You're very kind. Well, we don't usually have much here in the way of entertainment. We're so far away from everything, but if you care to stay up tonight, uh, you're very fortunate. Really? Yes, you might enjoy it. Enjoy what? Tonight's uh, entertainment. Oh, what is it? It might turn out to be a hanging. <laughs> Our mystery drama, A Scaffold for Two, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars John Beale and Brett Morrison. It is written, Where men are innocent, laws are unnecessary. Where men are corrupt, laws are useless. It stands to reason, therefore, that laws are intended for that great mass of us who are in the middle, neither completely innocent nor entirely free of corruption. It's a subtle philosophical point, and there are times when Charles Farnsworth would enjoy discussing it over a drink and a roaring fire. However, this is not one of those times. For the last two hours, Charles Farnsworth has been fighting for his life. His tiny single-engine plane is being buffeted without mercy by a ferocious thunderstorm. His radio has gone dead. His instruments are useless. He has been blown off his course. He has no idea of where he can be. And the needle of his gas gauge is hovering at empty. Suddenly has interrupted, the storm subsides. There is brilliant moonlight, a bright, twinkling star. And just below him, he can make out a long, gently rolling meadow. He has no choice. He directs the faltering flame downward. I'm all right. Uh, I guess everything's all right, but where am I? Easy, boy. Okay. All right. Who's that out there? Oh, sir. I, I need help. Come on, Alexander. Down, see. Be quiet. Quiet! Down, sir. Move this way. Very slowly. That's fine. I, uh, I assure you, sir, there, there's no need of that rifle. Far enough. Now, sir, what are you doing on this island? Is this an island? I, I didn't even know How'd that. How'd you get here? I was driven off course by the storm. What storm? Well, it ended a few miles north of here, or south of here, or even east or west. I, I couldn't tell you. I, I was forced down in a, in a meadow, but... You all right, sir? Oh, yeah, no, I'm fine. And your plane? It, it seems to be okay. I, I need gasoline. Are you, you alone? Yes, sir, all alone. I see. I, uh, 
I wonder if I may impose upon your hospitality. It's yours, sir. Thank you. Um, step this way, won't you? Oh, my name is Bennett. Franklin Bennett. Welcome to Bennett's Island. Uh, my name is Charles Farnsworth. Oh, you're just in time for dinner, Mr. Farnsworth. This is Mr. Farnsworth, who will spend the night with us. My daughter, Mayetta. How do you do? What is your sign, Mr. Farnsworth? Sign? Well, um, uh, Taurus, I think. Mayetta. But it's vital, Father. How's a man to be saved if he's unaware of his son? <laughs> and uh, uh, this is my nephew, Conrad. How do you do, sir? Hello. Uh, Mr. Farnsworth was forced to land his plane in the South Meadow. I knew it. I could tell he had the earth sound. Um, May yes, that's enough. Conrad. <coughs> sir? Is there gasoline in the garage pump? It's full, sir. Good. In that case, we can have Mr. Farnsworth up and away tomorrow morning. May I just set another place at the table, please, for Mr. Farnsworth? Yes, Dad. Conrad? You, sir? Yes, Uncle Frank. Uh, mix yourself, whatever you like. Everything's on the side, boy. Excuse me. Frank Bennett here? Oh, uh, yes, Wayne. Yes, it's this evening, as we agreed. Midnight, officially. But get here before that. Good. I'll see you then. Good. You all right there, Mr. Farnsworth? Oh, yes, just fine. I'm afraid you'll have to excuse me. For what, Mr. Bennett? Well, I can offer you dinner and a bed, but regrettably, I'll be unable to entertain you. Oh, that's quite all right. No, no, it's not, not all right. I, I realize I shall be remiss in my duties as a host. But I have a previous engagement, a matter of great importance. Well, I, uh, I, I hope I won't be in the way. Oh, not at all, sir. You won't be in the way at all. Well, if everyone's had enough, Conrad may have to clear the table. Charles Farnsworth. Where have I heard that name before? Well, I'm an attorney. Oh, yes, you, you're you that, Farnsworth. You're the lawyer that gets all those guilty people acquitted. <laughs> oh, that's impossible. Impossible? If a person is acquitted, it's proof that he's innocent. Oh, oh now you know what I mean. <laughs> no, I'm afraid I don't. Why, you usually get these people rabble-rousers, mostly. They, they go around, they commit murder. How they... do we know that? Because... Because we know it. We just know it. It's a, it's a matter of pure common sense. Guilt or innocence is a matter of law. Uh, most of these people you defend are against the law. Most of them are out to overthrow the government. And anyway, they're, they're dirty. They're, they're unkempt. No, I wouldn't say that. Well, I would. Mr. Bennett, I defend a great many people. Some of them happen to be associated with unpopular causes. <laughs> and some of them, I admit, are... Personally, quite unappealing, but, yeah. but what would you have? Everyone's entitled to counsel. I know, I know. It's just that I hate to see people get away with murder. If they don't get away with it. If a judge and a jury acquits them, that means they didn't commit murder. That's what's wrong with the system. Well, you could also say that's what's right with the system. Well, well, well I'm doing something wrong right now. I'm having an argument, a serious argument with a man who's a guest under my roof. I apologize. Oh, no, please, I, I don't feel in the well, least. I'm a deep believer in the law, Mr. Farnsworth. And to me, the most sacred of all laws is hospitality. When a man is your guest, in no way should he be made to feel uncomfortable or under a strain. I, forgive me for what I said to you before. No, I felt in no way insulted. That's very kind of you. Conrad, may I come in here, please? Mr. Farnsworth, I, I'll have to excuse myself for the night. I, I hope you understand. Yes, of course. Con Conrad, my guests are beginning to arrive. Show them into the library, will you? Yes, sir. And may I conduct Mr. Farnsworth to the guest suite? Now, Mr. Farnsworth, you must excuse me. I hope to see you at breakfast in the morning. Good night, sir. Good night. You want some more coffee? Oh, no, no, thank you. When I asked you your sign, I didn't mean the signs they have in the Zodiac, you know. 
I think so. There are the four basic signs, and they're earth, air, fire, water. Oh. Is this some uh, new kind of science? Oh, no. It's an old kind of religion. I see. It's mine. I'm the head priestess. Are you? Yes. I am maybe the only one. You see, I don't know anyone else who's a member. Oh. No. Most of the folks we have around here are Methodists. We also have some Congregationalists and some Catholics and some Jews. But I can't find anyone who's a member of EWAF. EWAF? Yes. The four elements. <laughs> Earth, water, air, and fire. So far, all we've got is Conrad and me. Well, you can never tell. Maybe uh, there will be more one day. Oh, it's very nice of you to say that. Most people just laugh at me. I'm sure they don't mean any harm. I don't mind. You're a very nice person. You're not at all like most of the people who come to see Daddy. Why do you say that? Because you're a perfect example of the balanced EWAF. I see now you don't have any son. You have all four of them. Oh, is, uh, is that good? Oh, that's perfect. You're in heavenly balance. Your fire and water, your earth and air, they don't fight each other. They work together in harmony. Didn't anyone ever tell you that before? No. No, not that I can recall. Well, as I was saying, most of the folks who come to see Daddy are unbalanced. They're usually too much of one thing. Now, Daddy himself, he's too much fire. And poor cousin Conrad, he's mostly earth. Earth? Yes. You know, it's like he's just... There. Well, Daddy said to show you to the guest suite. Yes, I, uh, I believe so. Now? I suppose now's as good a time as any. Your, your father, as I understand, has other guests. Yes. If we weren't on the island, you could go to a movie in town. I think I'll, uh, I'll just turn in. All right. Come with me. Well, this is quite a place you have here. Daddy built it for Mother. Daddy fought in France during the war, and that's where he met Mother. She was French, you know. And he built her this chateau. That's what they called them in France. I can see. It's lovely. This is your suite. <laughs> I can only say it, it's magnificent. You'll find everything you need. You have your private bath through there, pajamas and a robe in the closet. Thank you very much, Mayetta. That's all right. I rarely meet a person who's in full balance. Good night. Look, if you're not sleepy, you could come with me later and watch. That is, if you'll promise to be very quiet. Oh? Um, what is there to watch? Well, I'm not supposed to see it either. I'm not even supposed to know about it. Know about what? Why, the hanging. The what? The hanging. You know, when they hang a person. We're going to have one here, tonight. Just like that. How would you like to blunder into this kind of lodging for the night? Charles Farnsworth looks at Mayetta. She's young, but not a child. It's true she babbles a bit and has several, uh, well... Uh, offbeat ideas but she seems sane enough what's this about a hanging well you'll just have to wait until I return shortly with act two what we consider solid reality is usually on close examination a very thin crust. Civilization, rules, laws. We think these are the powerful defenses that protect our lives from anarchy. We rarely consider how quickly, how easily, all the laws and rules can suddenly be suspended. Now, uh, just a minute, Mayetta. Do you mean to tell me somebody's going to be hanged here? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. 
But who? How? Why? Well, who, that I don't know yet. But how? Well, they use a rope, you know, and a scaffold. But, but why? Well, they're holding a trial. Daddy summoned all those people here for a trial. But what kind of a trial? I'm not sure I know. But the idea of a trial is to hang someone. No, no. The idea of a trial is to find out... But they've if... already got the scaffold filled. How do you know? Because I've seen it. You've seen it? Yes. But how can they hold a trial? This this isn't a court of law. That's Daddy's business. I would never question him about anything like that. Mieta, do you realize what you're telling me? What did I tell you? About the hanging. I wasn't supposed to say anything about that. But I... And since I wasn't supposed to say it, I didn't say it. Mieta, please, now listen. And since I didn't say it, then you don't know anything about it. But I do. And since you don't know anything about it, then... It's not going to happen. But you did tell me. That's what EWAF is truly about. What you don't know about does not exist. But you specifically said someone is going to be hanged here tonight. I said it before I realized I shouldn't have said it. So, so no, I will unsay it and it won't happen. <sighs> Mieta, this is... Uh, I, I don't know what to think. It... That's why I like you, Mr. Farnsworth. You don't know what to think. Other people, unbalanced people, they know what to think. And they think I'm crazy, but I'm not. Ah, all squared away, I see. Is everything satisfactory? Uh, uh, yes, yes, I, uh, I've been having a most intriguing conversation with your daughter. Oh? And she takes up her mother. Her mother was French, and they... They like to talk in riddles, you know. Mm, do they? Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Bennett, I uh, I feel I must discuss this matter with you. Oh? Huh? What matter? Mr. Bennett, do you intend to hang somebody tonight? <laughs> I realize as I, as I said it just how that must sound, but I... Why do you ask? Well, why is unimportant? May I have your answer? Oh. Whatever could have given you such an idea? Well, your... Your daughter mentioned it. Oh. Well, so, uh... Mayetta said... We're going to hang someone tonight. Yes, sir. Well... She thinks so. May I ask why? I... I love my daughter, Mr. Farnsworth, but I... I'm not blind to what is obvious to everyone else. And what is obvious? Oh, you've seen it yourself. She's, she's not like everyone else. You're not like everyone else, are you, Mayetta, honey? No, Daddy. And you see things and hear things and believe things that, uh, well, that other folks don't. Now, isn't that true, darling? Yes, Daddy. Yes. You just run along to bed now. Yes, Daddy. Good night, Mr. Farnsworth. Good night. She, she has a problem, Mr. Farnsworth. She was born that way. I, uh, I, I'm sorry. And I, uh, I realize I'm in a very embarrassing position. Well, let's, let's say no more about it. Well, you're probably wondering now what this gathering is about. Well, we're having a reunion tonight. My old army outfit. Each year, we... We become fewer and fewer. <laughs> well, I hope you have a good time. Oh, we will. Uh, sir, you uh, you spoke of the law of hospitality. Yeah. All the obligations are not centered on the host. The guest is also obliged to make things easy. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I'll see you in the morning. Sleep well. Good night. Good night. Quite a day. I thought I'd sleep the moment my head touched the pillow, but for some reason I was wide awake. I kept wondering why sleep was eluding me so completely. Of course, I knew. I knew there was something mysterious going on in this house. Something was wrong. Maybe it wasn't as deadly as Mayor had claimed. But I felt certain it wasn't as innocent as her father had asserted. 
And I also knew that I wasn't going to rest until I found out. And so I... I fought it no longer. I got out of bed and dressed myself. And I walked quietly to the door. And I turned the handle. And that's when I discovered that it was locked. Locked from the outside. I walked to the window. And I discovered that I couldn't open it. It was a large casement window made up of many small panes. And as I examined them closely, I discovered that they were made of very heavy, leaded, apparently unbreakable glass. And now I knew with crystal clarity, I was a prisoner. In the distance, I could hear the sound of approaching cars and men's voices. Something was about to happen. But if it were only an army reunion, why was I locked in this room? And then I heard it. A key was being inserted in the lock. And I could hear it turn. And the door opened slowly. Was someone coming after me? Who? And for what reason? Mr. Barnesworth. Yet? You just have to help. What is it? Why have I been locked in here? They're going to have a hanging. But I thought you said... That's before I knew who it was going to be. Well, who is it going to be? Cousin Conrad. Conrad? But but why? Because they're holding a trial for him. I have to keep asking why. Because they held one over at Maple City six months ago. Conrad was tried? What for? Murder. Murder? Whom did he kill? Cousin Bertram. And you see, the jury said he was innocent. Well, then what's this trial about? Daddy didn't like the verdict, so he's holding a trial to get a different one. We have to do something, but what? Well, I was thinking you could take Cousin Conrad away from here. How? In your airplane. Take off at night from that field? They'll hang him. Gas. I need gas. We've got plenty of gasoline in the garage. Where's Conrad? He's waiting for the trial to start. Then we'd better hurry. Conrad? Does Uncle Frank want me to come to the library now? Uh, he said he'd sent for me. No, it's me and Mr. Farnsworth. Conrad, what's supposed to be happening here tonight? I'm to be tried for murder. But I understand you, you've already stood trial in a court of law. Yes, sir, but... Uncle Frank doesn't think it was a fair trial. Well, you were acquitted. I know, sir, but... Well, he doesn't think the people of the state got a fair trial. But I... There's something to what he says. What are you saying, Conrad? Well, sir, I had a very smart lawyer. But the lawyer for the state, he really wasn't much good. Well, are you innocent? Oh, I... <sighs> well, are you or aren't you? Did you kill him or didn't you? I wanted to kill him. And that's the worst kind of imbalance. But well, that's really the worst kind of all. That's right, because that's when all of your signs are just completely out of control. No, but there, there's a difference between wanting to kill and killing. Is there? I wanted him dead. I wished him dead, and he died. All right, all right. Why did you wish him dead? Well, sir, because Uncle Frank wanted him to marry Cousin Mayetta. Oh, and you were jealous? Oh, no. No, no, jealousy. That, no, that's not it. That, that, that's against our religion. Well, what were you? Sir, I knew he would be mean to her. Just tell me this. How did Cousin Bertram die? Poison. He was poisoned. And uh, if I may maintain my sanity, I would assume that you were accused of the crime. Now, is that it? Yes. How was he poisoned? Well, someone put poison into his iced tea. You see, we were all sitting around drinking iced tea. Who we... is all? Let's see, me, Mayetta, Cousin Bertram, and Uncle Frank. We'd better hurry. They'll be looking for Cousin Conrad soon. I'll go see if the coast is clear. Well, you see, sir, Cousin Bertram was sipping on his drink. And suddenly, suddenly he fell forward dead. And they accused you of putting the poison in the drink. Well, did you? 
Probably. But please, Conrad, I have to know well, You if... see, sir, I did direct poison thoughts against but it. But you can't kill a man with poison thoughts. Now, that's not true. You and me, what, what are we? We better get out of here. But <laughs> I'll take my punishment. But Cousin Mayetta, well, she says she doesn't like the way people look after they've been hanged, sir. They're still in the library. Come No, wait, wait. Just, just one minute. What is it, Mr. Farnsworth? Look, you realize what you two have said to me about a hanging. It's... Well, it's unbelievable. But that doesn't mean that it isn't true. Do you want proof? Well, it would help. We're headed that way anyhow. It's just in back of the garage. What is? Proof. <laughs> Daddy's friends were here this afternoon. They put it together. I can't believe it. It's a scaffold. Yes, sir. See, there's the platform. And you walk up those steps. And they've already got the rope hanging from that crossbar. I heard Daddy say that was made out of mahogany. And you stand on a trap no, door. No, that's enough. That's I... enough. Now, hurry. Let's get the gasoline. I'm going to fly you out of here, Conrad. One moment, please, <gasps> Mr. Farnsworth. Daddy. My associate's here, and I have... As you can see... We're on. Mr. Bennett, I intend to take Conrad to my plane. Now, if you want to stop me, you'll have to shoot. That's exactly what I'm prepared to do, Mr. Farnsworth. Well, something has got to give. We already know enough about both men to realize that each is a person to be taken seriously. What we have here is the old story about the irresistible force and the immovable object. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Right now, on remote Bennett's Island, we are having what can be considered a confrontation. On one side, we have 12 men with guns. On the other, we have two men and a young lady who are completely unarmed. At first glance, the advantage would seem to be with the group that has the weapons. And a very grim and determined looking bunch they are, too. But there are times when you may need more than a gun to win a fight. Mr. Farnsworth, I said I would shoot you down if you took one step toward your airplane. Yes, I heard you. But before you take that first step forward, Mr. Farnsworth... Yes? You have to realize that you're committing each of us to a position he doesn't want to be in. Well, what do you suggest? Let's discuss it. You intend to hold a lynch. I don't see what's negotiable. It's a trial. You can't do it. This is to be a real trial. What he had before was just a farce. The law of this country has clear procedures for trials. You're obviously interfering with his civil rights. We have a federal involvement. Tell me more. Each one of you who is involved in this activity will be arrested. All right, I listen to you. Now, you listen to me. You leave here. You tell that story, and who do you think is going to believe you? Who? Oh, I see. Yes. I'm the biggest taxpayer in the county. I own a mill that's the largest employer in Maple City. Yes? Well, I hope that you're beginning to get the picture. The people here with me... All upstanding, law-abiding citizens? Law-abiding. Law-abiding. We're interested in seeing that the laws aren't twisted and perverted. We want laws that punish the guilty. We'll deny every word you say. Upstanding, law-abiding, respectable citizens and willing to commit perjury. Who's going to believe? Is this what you wanted to discuss? You, you give me your word of honor, Farnsworth. Your oath as a gentleman. That you'll never mention any of this to a living soul. And I thought you didn't have to worry about all that. Well, why take chances? Give me your word. And you can gas up and fly out of here. Alone? Alone. You know I can't do that. Oh. Then I'm afraid you can't leave this island. Wayne. Bob. A oh. couple of you. Get some rope. Tie him up. Mr. 
Farnsworth. Well? I want you to understand my position. Yes, I understand it. I just don't agree. Well, it's, it's a, a little complicated. This, uh, this whole business has become more complicated than I guess most of us bargain for. What business? The redressers of injustice. The redressers of injustice? That's the name of our organization. We felt, a group of us felt, that there were people who were getting away with murder. And so we decided... You decided to take the law into your own hands? Yes. Where it would be safe. Where it would be honored. Mr. Bennett, we really have nothing to discuss. Well, then, just a minute. Tell me why you want to lynch your nephew, Conrad. I said you didn't understand, and obviously you don't. I love that boy. Huh. And you have a remarkable way of showing it. Listen up. We formed this organization, as I said. And this is the second time we've met. Oh. So that scaffold has been used before. Yes, it has. You remember reading about a man who murdered a farmer and his wife and their four children? Just murdered them for no reason. You remember that, don't you? Yes, yes, I think so. Well, everybody knew he did it. He was seen there. He even bragged about it later on. And he was tried. And he was freed. Finally. And you know why? No. Because of some legal mumbo jumbo. Oh, come, Mr. Bennett, I'm sure you can do better than that. It all had to do with the fact that he wasn't arrested properly. That his confession hadn't been obtained properly. Nonsense like that. Well, it's hardly nonsense. He killed six people in cold blood. And a court of law said, go free. And therefore you took the law into your own yes, hands. Yes, we did. And before you say another word... Let me ask you if you remember that man's name. No. It was Wayne. George Wayne. And his cousin, Gordon Wayne, is a member of this committee. That should prove something. Well, it proves that some of the greatest crimes can be committed in the name of sincerity. Mr. Farnsworth, I... I need your help. My help? Yes. Let, let me tell you the situation here. You see, we started something that looked very good. In the beginning, you, you know. Yes, yes, I know. But now, some of the gentlemen, well, I guess it's like everything else. People lose interest, change their minds, and then there's you. Me? Yes, what to do about you? Unless we kill you. And there's not an awful lot of stomach for that. We're not just murderers, you know. <laughs> well, you do have a good opinion of yourselves. We're law-abiding citizens, and we want to protect... Yes, I know. You said it so often, you actually believe it. Now, the reason we're trying my nephew, Conrad... Yes? Well, I admit that there was no love lost between Conrad and Bertram. And Conrad could have done it. Actually, he had the motive. They were both in love with my daughter, Mesa. And Conrad was going to lose out. You're sure of this? She seems quite fond of him. Well, I had decided in Bertram's favor. And that was the end of that. Well, why had you favored Bertram? You mean... You mean it's not obvious? How could Conrad take care of her? He's as... Well, I may just as well say it. He's as crazy as she is. But Bertram was sane. Practical. True, he did have a heart condition, but with care you can live with those things forever. Well, Conrad may have had a motive, but that doesn't mean he was guilty. Well, well what happened was he was acquitted at the trial. And uh, a lot of people kicked up a fuss. They, they uh, Yes? Well, they said it was my wealth, my influence that got him off. <laughs> Pardon me if I uh, enjoy this irony. Well, was your wealth and influence a factor? Never. But you know how it is. When a rich man's relative gets a murder charge, people talk. and uh, discontent. Yes, I see. And I, I had helped organize this... Uh, this organization. Oh, yes, yes. The uh, redressers of injustice. Yes, the, the redressers held a meeting and demanded action. Now, what, what, what could I say? It would look as if I were trying to make an exception out of Conrad and Gordon Wayne. He said that if, if the redressers could try his cousin, they could try my nephew. Well, you're in quite a position there. I tell you, I wish I were out of it. Finished and done with the whole thing, and, and so do most of the others. But, but Gordon Wayne demands that if we... Well, I, I can see his point. 
And so you will sacrifice Conrad. Oh, no. He's going to get a fair trial. Why do you say that? Because you're going to represent him. But I can't. I, I can't legitimize a lynching session. Please, Mr. Farnsworth. Don't give me all that law. Just find us a way out. No. No, I don't see why Conrad should have a lawyer. Just a minute, Wayne. Just a minute. Now, you wait a minute. I thought the reason this committee was to get together was to get away from lawyers and their shenanigans. A man's entitled to counsel. I object to that. All right, we'll put it to a vote. All in favor of Conrad's having counsel, raise your hands. All opposed? The vote's nine to three in favor, counting mine. All right, why don't we proceed? Who wants to speak against Conrad? What's to speak about? And we know Conrad hated Bertram. Did you, Conrad? It was my one weakness, sir. Now, the idea of losing Mayetta drove him wild. Didn't it, Conrad? Yes. Okay, now, Conrad, did you or did you not poison Bertram's drink? I did, sir. <laughs> well, then, why isn't that the whole ball of wax? Uh, just a moment. Here comes the lawyers to steal it. Now. What do you mean by poison? I, I poisoned him. Do you mean you poisoned him with a drug or a chemical of some sort? I understand a heavy dose of poison was found in his system. Did you administer it? Yes, sir. How? Does that matter for crying out loud the man admits he did it? How, Conrad? Well, my poison thoughts toward him, sir. It, it, it turned into actual poison. Did you at any time place into his glass a pill, a powder, a liquid, a substance of any sort? Did you? Uh, no. I, I can do that. How did the poison get into Bertram's glass? Conrad, put it there! How? When? Where? Now, where did the iced tea come from? The kitchen. Bertram said, I'd like some iced tea. We were all sitting out on the patio. Yes, and I said, uh... I'll tell the cook to make some. And Bertram said nobody makes better iced tea than I do. And he went inside. And a couple of minutes later, he called for Mayetta to come in and help him serve. We heard all this at the trial. But it is important, Mr. Wayne. So Mayetta went inside and came back carrying the tray. She set it down. And uh, Bertram set a glass in front of everyone's place. And then what happened? Well, oh, oh there was a sound of an explosion from the rear of the house. So we ran back to see what it was. Who ran back? All of us. In any particular order? I remember. Uncle Frank first. Yes, and then Conrad, and then Bert and Mayan. And what was the explosion? Oh, the cook's little boy. He, he'd found a firecracker left over from the 4th of July. I see. And then what did everybody do? Well, we all went back to the patio. And everyone picked up his glass and started to drink. And then, in a few minutes... Bertram just keeled over. Then how did the poison get into Bertram's glass? Conrad put it there. He admitted it. But when? And how did he have a chance? He couldn't do it in the kitchen. Only Bertram and Mayetta were there. He couldn't have done it on the patio because someone would have seen him. He did it when they went out to investigate the noise. How? He was second man out. Bertram and Mayetta were still on the patio. When they came back! Did you all come back together? Yes, yes, we did. This is the same kind of hocus-pocus the lawyer pulled at the trial. Now, Conrad admitted it. He can admit anything he pleases. It doesn't work unless and until we can show he put the poison in the glass. The thing was put into the drink after the glasses were set out. No, it wasn't. Mayetta, what are you saying? Yes, Mayetta? Well, you all should have asked me. Nobody ever asked me before. As I came into the kitchen, I saw Cousin Bertram place the pill into one of the glasses. A pill? Well, he always took pills for his heart. I didn't think anything of it. But then we set the glasses down. I saw him put the one with the pill in it in front of Cousin Conrad. Uh-oh, I thought. He made a mistake. So I just put the glass with the pill in it back in front of his chair. You changed the glasses? Oh, yes. I was going to call it to his attention, but everybody started to run to the back of the house, so I just changed him myself. But, Mayetta, that was not a pill. That was the poison that killed him. Oh, no. No, Conrad is right. The poison that killed him was Conrad's mean and unbalanced thoughts. 
But Conrad has the phone. It's balanced now. Mayetta, why would Bertram want to kill Conrad? Oh, Bertram. Bertram was unbalanced. Everyone knew that. He was so angry because I told him I could never marry him as long as Conrad was alive. What? We love each other so much. Gentlemen, the defense rests. <laughs> Tempting to consider people like Mayetta and Conrad as being somewhat out of focus. But how clear, how sharp are your motivations and mine? I may tell you that the redressers of injustice have been disbanded. That is, I think they have been. The weirdest of urges and desires and motivations can still make any number of people go bump in the night. Be sure of nothing, except that I shall be back in a few moments. As they say, you take the law in your own hands only to manhandle it. We hope Mr. Bennett has learned his lesson, as have Mr. Wayne and the rest of the redressers of injustice. Mr. Farnsworth won what he considers his most important case, but it's a secret between him and us, since he doesn't talk about it in public. You'll learn a great many more fascinating secrets when you visit with us again. Our cast included John Beale, Brett Morrison, Denise Alexander, and Casey Kasem. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. What do you think about witches? Not the bony hags and atrocious crones of Shakespeare and legend, or the poor unfortunates of Salem, but witches who are young, witches who are beautiful, witches who even fall in love. Excuse me. Who let you in here? Well, I hope I'm not disturbing you. I'm only trying to make a deadline. Well, if you're in the news business, I've got something for you. It better be good. I... I'm going to have to kill my wife. That won't be news till you do it. I know. I want you to know why. Okay. Why? Because she's a witch. Our mystery drama, I Warn You Three Times, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Joan Loring. I'll be back shortly with Act One. One of those miserable stormy nights in the dead of winter. 
A thick, clinging, wet snow seems determined to smother the entire earth and everyone on it. You'd think that most people would choose the cheerful indoors, a warming fire, a relaxing drink, a comfortable bed. That's the problem with most people. You can't figure them. For instance, consider that line of cars crawling down Main Street, bumper to bumper, skidding, sliding. Where is everybody headed on a night like this? Have we become a race of lemmings? Do we follow some mysterious, unconscious drive? An interesting speculation, but we won't pursue it. We'd better consider the traffic, which has come to a complete standstill. A car seems to be stuck at the intersection. Let's go, sister. That light's green. Oh, officer. Well, what are you waiting for, lady? Uh, my, my husband. Your husband. That, the, the light was red, and he said he wanted to step out and clean off the rear window. Uh, hey, mister, you finished back there? He just stepped out. It was a moment ago. Tom? Well, maybe he slipped in the snow. Tom, are you all right? Lady, there ain't nobody around the back. But he just went out. Yeah, 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 the... yeah, yeah, to clean the rear window. Uh, that's what you said. But what could have happened? Just sit there a minute, lady. Hey, lay off of that horn. I know you got one. Now what's wrong, officer? Did you see a guy get out of that car up? Did I see a guy get yeah, out of yeah, the car? Yeah, 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 did you? Huh? Are the police after someone in the skate car? Oh, come on, Buster. Just tell me. Did you see a guy cleaning off the rear window of that car up front? Well, I'll tell you the truth. I wasn't paying any attention. I was listening to the radio. Now, there could have been somebody, but then again, I, I couldn't say there was. It's not that I'm not trying to get involved, yeah, officer. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a citizen. I know my duty, but... but yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. Officer, where is my husband? He was just there. Lady, he uh, disappeared. How could he disappear? I don't know. I do know he ain't here. What am I going to do? Well, you can't keep blocking traffic, lady. you got to move on. Where? Well, I... it beats me. But you must find him. Look, you got troubles with your husband. That's your problem. But when you hold up traffic, that's my problem. Will you feed her a little gas, please? Come on, let's go. Let's but go. I can't. Lady, you got to go somewhere. I can't go anywhere. I don't know how to drive. Desk, Lieutenant Carroll. Yeah. Nobody wants this guy, you say? Well, technically, that isn't true. His wife wants him. Okay. Well, look who's here. Lieutenant? You won't win any Pulitzer Prizes around this joint tonight, Peterson. I was hoping you might have a little bone to throw me. Page one? I'll settle for two inches on the bottom of page 38. If you promise to remember two R's and one L. First name, Irvin. Not Irving. Lieutenant Irvin Carroll. We may have something shaping up. Ah. I don't know where it can go. Everywhere or nowhere. What have I got to lose? Sitting over there on the first bench. Ooh. That's nice. And married. Well, you win, you lose. A very, very weird story. Tell me about it. No. Let her tell you about it. Why don't you ask her? Excuse me. Oh. My name is Fred Peterson. I... I'm a reporter for the Union Messenger. Oh, no. I don't want to talk to a reporter. Why not? Because I... Because you're afraid? Why? Could you put Tom's picture in the paper? Well, that depends. Has Tom done anything? He's disappeared. Well, we need the how, the when, the where. The when. About an hour ago. Where? On Route 986 at Main Street. How? I don't know. You see, we were driving south. It was snowing hard, and he said, I can't see out the rear window. The light was red. He stepped outside to wipe it off. He didn't come back. Where, where did he go? I don't know. Well, where could he go? I don't know. In that snow. And, and there's nothing around there? Could, could you give me a why? I... I can't imagine. I don't know what to do. I sit here waiting. Look... My name is Hetty Parsons. Tom and I, we've been married five years. We don't have any problems. I mean, we're very happy. If you print his picture in the story, maybe someone will see it who can help us. Excuse me a minute. Well? Yeah, I think I'll run with it. I don't blame you. 
I was always partial to girls with honey-colored hair and baby blue eyes. Ah, so you noticed, too. Have you run a check on her husband, Tom Parton? Well, he's not one of the known bad boys. No record at all. And what did she say he did? He's an accountant. He has his own business in the Barstow building. You looked him up in the phone book? Checks out. They were headed south, huh? That's what she says. If it was a trip, there should have been bags. There were. His and hers? His and hers. How does it look? What do you want from me? I don't solve crimes. I sit here behind the desk. Come on, Lieutenant. Now, this is one for you, Fred. How could a guy disappear just like that? In that storm. Hmm. There's no place to go. He could have had a car following in back of them. A friend was driving it, maybe. Well, he had to go somewhere. But why? Right now, we're treating it as missing persons. It's all we can do. He's not wanted for anything. He's a legitimate citizen, as far as we know. He hasn't even done anything to her. At worst, he left her in a car. He hasn't even deserted her. Yet, who was driving? He was. She can't. Well, that's abandoning her, isn't it? No. At best, we'd have him for abandoning the car. Yeah. Yeah, excuse me a minute. Listen, Mrs. Parsons. Yes? Why, why don't you go home? I've got my oh. car outside. Oh, no, no. I, I, I want to be here in case they find time. They'll let you know if they find No, I don't want to be home alone tonight. I... I... Just want to stay yeah, here. But it may be hours. It may be even days. Don't say that. I'm sorry. I. I'm just so jumpy and so nervous. I can't believe what's happened to me. Well, if you're going to sit here, you should have some coffee and a sandwich. Oh, I couldn't think of food. I'll be right back. <laughs> Officer Dennis. Well, look who's here. The friendly reporter. Yeah, listen, that girl. Yeah, I was going to ask what girl, but yeah, I won't. Yeah, I, I, I want to start at the beginning. Oh, well, you know, Lieutenant Terrell's got two R's, but Patrolman Dennis got two yeah, 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 yeah. What did happen? Well, like she said, he went out to clean the rear window and he was gone. Did anybody see him? Uh, I checked the car in back, but who looks? Who notices? Now, where could he have gone to around here? Well, on the south side, you got open fields. On this side... A couple of warehouse buildings locked up. Night watchman? Yeah, he's a retired cop. No sign of anybody trying to break in, to hide, or whatever he may have wanted to do. Okay, so what could have happened to the guy? Well, it's all very interesting, but in 15 minutes I go off duty, and I won't have to worry about it. I didn't think I could touch a thing, but I must have been starving. Has there been any word? Yeah, you'll hear the minute they know. Now, listen, Hetty. I can help you, but you have to help me. I'll do whatever I can. We have two basic roads to explore. One, somebody was out to get your husband. Oh, no. No! Tom is the mildest, sweetest, most obliging guy on earth. He has absolutely no enemy. That you know about Tom and I have no secrets from each other. Everybody has at least one enemy. Tom is incapable of hurting anyone in any way. He sounds too good to be true. If he does have a problem, that's it. All right. The second road to explore. He wasn't pushed. He jumped. What does that mean? It means he walked out on you. Oh, it's it's, it's inconceivable. Why? Why? I've had a liberal education tonight, Mr. Peterson. Call me Fred. No, not yet, or maybe never. I've been introduced to a new world. I've been thrown in with people who basically don't believe in anyone, don't trust anyone, and perhaps they have good cause. Perhaps that's how life is in their world. Perhaps their world is the real world, but it isn't my world. May I ask, do you come from another world? It's entirely possible. I won't call you Fred unless and until we become friends. But that's just a little thing. The policeman who brought me here is a confirmed cynic. So is the lieutenant. And so are you. I must plead guilty as charged. All of you propose two basic hypotheses. A, my husband was ambushed by enemies. B, my husband abandoned me. You can't conceive of people who... They simply don't make or have enemies. You can't conceive of people who are completely in love. I'm not a fool, Mr. Peterson. I read these attitudes. What a wonderful world you live in, Mrs. Parsons. I hope you can stay there always. We're so dependent on each other, Tom and I. 
We need each other. We're... We're so complete together. But we still have the basic fact of his disappearance. Yes, but all you can see are two alternatives. There is a third, you know. Really? Perhaps he was taken ill suddenly and he just wandered off. Oh, maybe I should go back there. Uh, I've already been back there. There's no place he could have wandered off to. Tell me, does he have a history of any sort of illness, amnesia, anything like that? No, nothing like that. Well, then, where are we? Nowhere. Perhaps you are nowhere, Mr. Peterson. Okay, tell me where you are. I have faith. I believe Tom will be found, or he will find himself, and he will have an absolutely reasonable and rational explanation. I hope so. Hey! Oh! Hey! Tom! Oh, Tom, darling. Tom, what happened to you? I was so scared. Oh, darling, you're all right. Hey, are you all right? Yes. I don't understand. I happened to tune in the news, and there it was. Tom Parsons' accountant with offices in the Barstow building had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Oh, Tom, I was so worried. Mr. Parsons was driving with his wife. He stepped out of the car to clean off the rear window, and... Hetty, what did you tell them? I wasn't in the car with you. I was at home. <laughs> Well, here we have the story of two people who love each other deeply, who trust each other completely. It sounds like the Garden of Eden. But we all know what happened back there in the traffic and the snow. We shall return shortly with Act Two. seen these couples, or rather heard of them, they dwell in a sea of perfect harmony, never a ripple of discord. But when they do have a disagreement, well, it's a beaut. Here we have Fred Peterson listening to Hetty and Tom Parsons having a fantastic difference of opinion. Tom, Tom, how can you say that? Hetty, darling, I was not in the car with you. I was home. Home. You said, let's get out of this miserable cold and snow. Let's head south for a couple of weeks. Hetty, when did I say that? How could I say that? Uh, you know I'm swamped with work at the office. You came home this afternoon, Tom. You said, how would you like to leave for Florida tonight? And I said, give me an hour to pass. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who's he? Oh, he's just... A... I'm just Fred Peterson of the Union Messenger. A reporter? Oh, please, 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 don't be alarmed. I assure you it's a thoroughly respectable profession. Well, I... I see no point in... Well, emblazoning this all over the newspapers. Is there anything to emblazon, as you put it? This is a private affair. Tom, tell me what happened. What happened to you after you left me? Eddie, I told you I never left. Tom. How could I have left you? I wasn't with you. Oh, no, Tom. This time I have witnesses. The police officer, he knows you went out to clear the rear window. How does he know? Because he... Because you told him. Mr. Parsons. Now, obviously, your wife seems distraught. I would suggest... Keep your suggestions to yourself, Mr. Peterson. Don't you dare imply that I'm overwrought or nervous or hysterical. I am completely calm, extremely rational, and absolutely in command of myself. I know what happened this evening. Mr. Peterson, this is obviously a private matter between my wife and me and nobody's business but ours. What did you mean, Mrs. Parsons, when you said that this time you had witnesses? Have there been other times when... Hetty, it doesn't do us any good to air this in public. All right, Tom. Take me home. Uh, Let me talk to that officer at the desk there. Find out if there's anything we have to do. Well? Well what? Friend, husband, Tom. He didn't turn out to be quite as advertised. And what is that supposed to mean? He isn't quite the sweetest, mildest, most obliging guy on earth, is he? He is to me. I guess it's all a matter of how these words are defined, isn't it? And about this oh-so-complete understanding between the two of you. Won't you at least admit you're having a difference of opinion right now? I don't have to admit anything. Okay, okay, don't shoot. I'll go quietly. Are you sure you really want me to go? Please. Regardless of what you say to me, you are in trouble. No, no, don't deny it. Well, what if I am? I'd like to help you. Why? Because... Would you want to help me if I were 
Middle-aged and fat and sloppy and ugly? It isn't ten minutes ago. You accused me of living in a world where no one trusted the next fellow or believed in him. You accused me of being a confirmed cynic. Is it possible you don't remember what you say from one minute to the next? I'm sorry. Don't be. There's a great deal to what you said. You're kind, but no one can help you. I could try. And no one should try, either. Why not? It's too dangerous. That was the wrong thing to say to me. I'm warning you. You're only getting me in deeper. Please, Fred. For openers, my business is to take chances and get myself into... Hey, you know what happened? What? You called me Fred. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. But you did. And that means we're friends. Look, I only want... You're the one who set up the ground rules for this thing. First names are for friends only. Please, forget what happened here tonight. I warn you... You already warned me twice. It won't work. I can only warn you three times. You mean you keep score? Please don't joke, Fred. You keep saying the wrong word. Or I should say the wrong name. The wrong name is Fred. You can't call me Fred and expect me to forget everything. I warn you. I warn you for the third time. Forget all about tonight for your own sake. For your own safety. And after saying all that, you still expect me to forget about it. I... Tell my husband I'll wait for him outside in the car. Wait a minute, Hetty. I warned you, Fred. I warned you three times. Now, goodbye. Where's my wife? She said she'd meet you in the car. Uh... Mr. Peterson, if I were you, I'd forget everything that happened tonight. Is that a threat? No, a warning. That's all I've been getting around here, warnings. Well, for your own good, take them seriously. And if I don't? You'll regret it for the rest of your life, which may not be a long one. You still insist that you're not threatening me? I'm only trying to help you. Really? And why should you do that? Why? (laughs) I don't know why. Maybe it's because the last guy tried to help me. What last guy? I didn't listen to him. The last guy? What do you mean? Uh, Nothing. Forget it. You know, with you and your wife, it seems, everything turns out to be nothing and forget it. I don't think it matters now. I have an idea. It's already too late for you. I'm sorry. Good night, Mr. Peterson. Hey, Fred. Fred. Yeah, Lieutenant, I'm coming. Well? Well, what? There's nothing there for us boys in blue. What's in it for the fourth estate? Looks like he's trying to drive her nuts. It could also be the other way around. I don't think so. Because of that honey-colored blonde oh, hair? Lieutenant, Lieutenant, you always know where the exposed nerve is. Just stop and figure it. Couldn't this also be her way of trying to drive him nuts? As a reporter, I would have to say yes. But, uh... As a man? I don't know. Well, you got a problem, Fred. How are you going to tackle it? As a reporter? Or as a man? Good morning. Oh, Fred. What are you doing here? Won't you ask me to come in? Well, I... You could also offer me a cup of coffee. It's been a long drive on a cold morning. Oh, well, I suppose you might as well come inside. How gracious. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, well, I'm I'm still upset and you should know why. Come into the kitchen. I was just pouring myself a cup. Thanks. Charming place you have here. Thank you. I suppose Tom is generous enough when it comes to money and things. The implication being that he is not generous when it comes to what? Fred, if you insist on talking about Tom, I'll have to ask you to leave. Okay, let's talk about you. No. We can't talk about me either. What can we talk about? The weather, politics, sports. You'd be surprised I'm a very well-informed person. We could talk about art. Or literature? I didn't come here to talk about those things. I know why you came here. Do you? Fred, I'm a married woman. But you're not a happily married woman. I'm happy enough. Okay. Let me tell you why I'm here. As a reporter, that is. It doesn't happen very often that you get a chance to be in on a story before it's a story. You follow me? No. Last night, all I could have gotten out of it might have been a squib on the back page. Or maybe nothing. But something's happening here. Something's building. I don't know what it is. 
But one of you is lying. One of you is trying to destroy the other. And you think you can stop it? Oh, no, that's not my job. But there's going to be an explosion. And I want to be there when it blows. Because then I'll have a story. And that's all this is. That's all I am to you. A story. I was talking as a reporter. But as a man... Yes? As a man, I'd... I'd like to help you, Hetty. Even if it meant losing your story? Yes. I'd like to believe that. Why can't you? I tried to warn you, Fred. Look, we had all that last night. I can't warn you anymore, but remember, I did warn you. Yeah, sure. Don't brush it aside, Fred. Hetty, on the general subject of warnings... I've had a few in my day. From gangsters, from politicians. I mean from people who had clout. But I did warn you... Look, if you want me to, I'll sign a receipt. Let the record show that you warned me. You were right. He is trying to destroy me. Ah, finally. Why? I don't know. Okay, let's go through the standards. Is he after your money? I don't have any... Another woman? I don't think so. Is he tired of you? I don't know. Well... None of this is very helpful. I'm sorry. What was this business you were giving me back in the station house about your perfect marriage, about your perfect husband? Because he is. It's just... Well, now and then he he imagines things like last night. What's now and then? Oh, every few months. One time he stranded me up in Maine. Another time we were supposed to go to Europe. He told me he would be delayed and to get on the plane he would make the next one. And there I was, all by myself in Paris. He denied everything. Has he seen a doctor? Yes. And? It hasn't done any good. Is he overworked? Oh, yes. Well, maybe he needs a long vacation. I'm sure of it. It all sounds pretty simple to me, except for one little item. Why have you insisted on warning me? Because it was the right thing to do. I don't understand. First, you imply that everything is so simple. Then when I start to believe it, you drop a little suggestion that throws me off balance. I I can't seem to get anything definite out of you. Oh, but you did. What was that? A warning. Lieutenant Carroll. Hey, Lieutenant. How did you know I was going to ask you about the past? That honey blonde hair. Does it really show that much? Pal, you are hooked. You know something? That's true. And she may even be playing me like a fish. So what can I do for you? Well, no crime has been committed yet. But you can bet there's one on the way. Well, till then, we're handcuffed around here. Sure, but you got all the facts. What facts? I mean, I mean, you can get at them in a routine way. Work up both of them. Some past histories. That's spending the taxpayers' money. You spend the taxpayers' money every day. Something's ready to blow up there. Just be ready for it. That's all I'm asking. Actually, Fred, if you want the truth, we've already started. And? Keep in touch. Yeah? They said you're in this office. Well, look who's here. Tom, Tom, the Piper's son. Come on in, sir. Mr. Peterson, I've decided to tell you everything. Because, because I know you're in love with my wife. Wait a minute. Now, there are all kinds of meaningless expressions. Wait a minute, see, here, hold on, or a few. Let's dispense with them. You can't accuse me. I don't accuse you. I state a fact. Well, now, let's be fair. I only met your wife last night. I I admit she's attractive. Uh, I don't even know her. (laughs) That's what I told him. That's what you told who? The last guy. The last guy she was married to? Uh, I wish I knew how to start this. Well, start at the beginning. Okay. I'm an accountant. You're a reporter. Both of us are men of the world. I I mean this world. You live on facts. I live on figures. So how can I tell you? How can I expect you to believe me when I say that Hetty... Isn't a human being at all. She isn't? No. She's a witch. A witch. Yes, that's what he said. A witch. But how can it be? 
Wasn't all that witch business over and done with more than 200 years ago? Well, that's what we intend to find out shortly when I return with Act Three. Tom Parsons and Fred Peterson sit in a newspaper office. Both are young, alert, stylishly dressed, every bit the modern, sophisticated men of today. And yet, the subject, the very serious subject under discussion is witchcraft, of all things. Well, it isn't every day a man accuses his wife of being a witch. It isn't every day a man finds out he's married to one. I can only say... It's incredible. I know. That's what I said when he told me. When who told you? The last guy. Tell me about the last guy. I met Hetty on a cruise ship about five years ago. She said her husband had just somehow disappeared. She was distraught. <laughs> you know, she does the distraught bit to perfection. I know nothing of the kind. What happened? Had he, had he fallen overboard? Well, that's... That's what she made everybody think. Till we got a radiogram from shore. He claimed he knew nothing about the trip. Well, either he had boarded the boat or he hadn't. Okay, let's get all of that cleared away. There was a ticket in his name. There were some people who claimed they had seen him. The trouble is, there was a pretty drunk bond voyage party. Most everybody was in no shape to remember anything. Oh, yes... Yes, the steward did claim to have seen him aboard, but... But? I'm convinced the steward was bribed. So I bought her story. I fell in love with her. Just as you did. And I helped her kill him. Just as you're going to help her kill me. You know what I think? I know what you think. You think I'm a nut. You could look it up. Five years ago, Stacy's Mountainville Lodge in the Adirondacks. She called me. She was desperate. Come up here. He's going to kill me. I flew up. I found them. They were near a cliff. She was screaming for help. I started fighting him off. I I guess he slipped. He, he fell over the side. He was killed. Look it up. Coroner's office. You'll see. An accident. Let's assume I buy all this. How does it make her a witch? Oh. She told me. She'll tell you afterwards. She's a witch. She falls in love with men, gets tired of them, and destroys them. I think you must I know. be... I know. I'm here to warn you. But I'm going to kill her first. Let me get you a cup of coffee. You're a fool... I'm here to save your life. Sure, sure. Okay. Look her up. I mean that. See if you can find a trace of her. See if you can find out where or when she was born, who her parents were. She has absolutely no background. I tell yeah, you... Don't, 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 don't oh, get excited. Lord, this is all so familiar. All of this is what he said to me. And what I said to him. Back there, before I killed him. Now, nobody's going to kill anybody. I don't know you. But you look like a nice guy. Take my advice. Save yourself. Save yourself. I'm not sure I should be here with you tonight, Fred. Well, you wouldn't let me visit you at home. Oh, it just wouldn't look right. Yeah, but it's all on the level. I'm a newspaper man. It's business. I'm doing a story. I had a very proper upbringing. Where were you raised, Hetty? I'd rather not talk about it. Why? Well, I told you it was proper, but it wasn't happy. I shouldn't say this, but there were times when I thought my parents were ogres. <coughs> Fred, is something wrong? No, 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 no. See, I, I just hope I, I, I didn't spill anything on you. No. I didn't have a happy childhood. I, I don't like to discuss it. Here's something we should discuss. I spoke with Tom this morning. I think I know what he told you. So far out, I even hesitate to mention it, but... Ah, 
Obviously, he believes it. I insisted that he see a psychiatrist. In fact, we both went. And it's the doctor's opinion that Tom is riddled with guilt. You see, he thinks he murdered Larry. Larry? My first husband. But Larry was a brute. I was very young and... We're really too young to know anything about people. Larry was a drunk. I didn't know that either. And when he had a few, he would abuse me. Well, I shouldn't have done it, but I was terrified. I called Tom, and he came up and got into a fight with Larry, and... Well, there was that accident. But why should he get that far-out notion about you? According to the doctor, it had to be something... Well, something he could live with, something that could justify what he did. And he really has a vivid imagination. Strikes me as a very sober-minded person, aside He was from... a lit major at college. He became an accountant because he had to make a living. I... I don't know what I'm going to do about him, Fred. I've had so much trouble in my life, and... He's really a wonderful guy, and I love him. Why does he want to destroy us? Why should he have a guilty conscience about Larry? Whatever happened was in self-defense. Well, look, everything will turn out all right. Oh, you're only saying that because you have to say something. No, I believe it. Hello? Tom? Yes, it's Tom. But you said you were working late. Well, I am. I just took a break for dinner. Join you? Please. Fred, you obviously didn't hear a word I said this morning, did you? I heard every word. Heard them all and listened to none? Tom, you're not well, and I think we... Oh, I know what you think. You think we should go away for a rest and all that. Forget it. I know what I have to do, and I'm going to do it. (laughs) Poor Fred. I feel sorry for you. You're in love with her. To keep the record straight, I'm a reporter. There's a story here. I aim to get it. Sure, sure. That's what you tell yourself. Let's go along with you, Tom. Suppose what you say is true. Suppose she's what you say she is. Why not walk out? Get a divorce. I can't. Why? I hope you never find out. You see, she destroys you. She takes away your capacity to love. Your feelings, your mind. It's as if you're only just nourishment for her. And when everything you have to give is gone, she discards you for someone else. Tom, for your own sake, I think you should be under a doctor's care in a hospital. I suppose I should. But I want to save you. It'll make up for Larry. I must apologize, Fred, for exposing you to all this. I shouldn't have come here. But you wanted to expose him to all this. That's why you came here. You knew I always eat here when I work late. Tom, I'll do anything you want. Just tell me. (laughs) Disappear. As a supernatural person, you can arrange that without any problem. Please, Fred, go now. Leave us alone. But I don't want to... He's my problem. I have to live with it. And if you stay, well... An audience always excites him. Ah, now, look who finally showed up. What happened to that Nobel Prize for Journalism you were working on? Tenet, there is no Nobel Prize for Journalism. Oh. Well, what happened anyhow? I got off it all. Couldn't make heads or tails. Well, we're still on it. As a matter of fact, information keeps pouring in all the time. On her? On him. Funny duck. He was always interested in spirits, that kind of thing. He wrote his master's thesis on something called uh, demonology. Well, there's nothing there for me. As a man or a reporter? Both. You know, I've been married ten years, and I've never been tempted. But if I could be, she could do it. Oh, that dame or something. I'm surprised at you, Lieutenant. But there's hope for you. If what you say about the husband is true, he winds up uh, in the loony bin, and after a respectable interval, she could be yours. That's what's in your mind, right? You are the most cynical person I know. Come off it. We're two of a kind. I'd even wait for her myself. Lieutenant Carroll. Is uh, Fred Peterson there, please? Hold on, I'll see. It's uh, the girl you love. Cut it out. Okay, the girl we love. You here? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm here. Take it. Hello? Fred, I'm scared. What's the matter, Hetty? Don't ask any questions. Just come to my place. Quickly. Come 
darling, Fred. Oh, darling, I'm so glad you're here. Hetty, Hetty, why are you shaking like that? I'm frightened. I'm so frightened. Please, please, Hetty, calm down. I'm here. Everything is going to be all right. I know it. I know. It's wrong for me to talk to you like this. To feel like this. But I... I can't help no, it. No, no, we'll work it out. Somehow we'll work it out. No, no, no. Why are you scared? I... He asked me to take his suit to the cleaners this morning. And I found this in his pocket. It's a receipt. Read it. From Carrington's one double action Danforth Wilson revolver, caliber 32. He bought a gun. Don't you see? He bought a gun. All right. Why would he buy a gun if he didn't want to kill me? Well, I think we have enough to interest the police now. Are you sure about that? Stop. Well, answer the question, Fred. What do you expect from the police? I have a permit for this gun. I have every right to own it. Look, Tom, I get very nervous when people point guns at me. Maybe it's unreasonable, but do you, uh, do you mind putting that, that thing away? Well, I will. After I use it. No, Tom. Don't be a fool. You're not a killer. I always thought that. Till just now. Tom, listen. Let's say you're right. That she is a witch, okay? Don't you see? You couldn't kill her anyhow. You'd empty the gun at her. It wouldn't mean a thing. Fine. Why don't we find out? I won't no. let you. Get away from me, Fred. No. Come on, step no. away. Get behind me. 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 Did it again? Call a doctor, Eddie. Oh. Oh. What for? Oh, you poor sucker. You think she... Oh, she's not worth it. Oh. You think she's paradise? She is. Oh, she is. But it doesn't last... It doesn't last. And then... She'll kill you. She'll kill you, too. Tom. He's... He's dead. Tom. You saw, you saw there was nothing I, I could do. I know. I know. Better call her, please. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Carroll. Lieutenant, it's Fred. Hey, Fred, I got news for you. What I mean is I have absolutely no news for you. Lieutenant, listen to me. You know, we, we drew a complete blank on that dame. We trace her back to St. Louis City Hall, where she married a guy named Larry Bellows. She gave her home address as Charterville, Illinois. But there's no such place. Listen, Lieutenant. It's as if this dame just materialized out of thin air. No background at all. Wait a minute. Hetty, who are you? Hello? Oh, Fred. Fred, why did you call? Who are you, Hetty? Fred, what's on your mind? Hetty. I warned you three times, Fred. I warned you three times. <laughs> And how many warnings would you have needed? Or heeded? That's the trouble. When they have honey blonde hair, it's so hard to take them seriously. A mistake. You should always take every woman seriously. We'll be back shortly. Are there really witches? Everyone must keep his own counsel on the matter. However, if you should happen upon a damsel in distress, and she has honey blonde hair and baby blue eyes, remember, we warned you three times. Our cast included Joan Loring, Mason Adams, Tom Keener, Alan Manson, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time.
pleasant dream? Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight... We escape to a lonely lighthouse off the steaming jungle coast of French Guiana and a nightmare world of terror and violence as we bring you again in response to hundreds of requests Three Skeleton Key, starring Vincent Price. <laughs> Picture this place. A gray tapering cylinder welded by iron rods and concrete to the key itself. A bare black rock, 150 feet long, maybe 40 wide. That's at low tide. At high tide, just the lighthouse rising 110 feet straight up out of the ocean. And all about it, the churning water. Gray green scum dappled, warm as soup and swarming with gigantic bat-like devilfish, great violet schools of Portuguese man-o-war, and yes, sharks, the big ones, the 15-footers. And as if this weren't enough, there was a hot, dank, rotten-smelling wind that came at us day and night off the jungle swamps of the mainland. A wind that smelled like death. A wind that had smelled the slow and frightful death that came one night to this bare black rock. Set in the base of the light was a watertight bronze door. And in you went. And up. Yes, up and up and round and round, past the tanks of oil and the coils of rope, casks of wicks, racks of lanterns, sacks of spuds and cartons and cans, and up. And up and up, round and round. Over the light storeroom was the food storeroom, and over the food storeroom was the bunk room where the three of us slept. And over the bunk room was the living and cooking room, and over the living and cooking room was the light. She was a beauty, big steel and bronze baby with the sun gleaming through the glass walls all about, bouncing blinding little beams off the big shining reflectors, glittering and refracting through her lenses, the whole gigantic bulk of her balanced like a ballerina on the glistening steel axle of her rotary mechanism. She was a sweetheart of a light. And at night, she'd lie there on the stone deck of the gallery with her revolving smoothly and quietly over your head, easing her bright white eye 360 degrees around the horizon. You'd lie there watching to see that the feeders kept working, that everything ran right. And it wouldn't be bad, the other two fellows snoring in their sacks two levels down. You'd smoke your pipe to kill the stink of the wind, and it wouldn't be bad. About those other two, Louis and Auguste, what a pair. 
Louis, he was head man, was a big fellow from the Basque country. Black beard, little hard black eyes, and a pair of arms that I tell you those arms were as big around as my legs. Yes, head man he was, and what word he let go was law. A silent fellow, and although I spent my first two weeks trying to strike up a real conversation, the most I could ever get out of him was... Jean, I took up this profession because I don't like people. They want to talk too much. It's quiet work, light tending. Let's keep it that way. You, you're getting to be as bad as August. I thought maybe for once they send me somebody. Who that was Louis. And when he accused me of becoming like August, I quieted down because August was the talkingest man I'd ever met, the talkingest and the ugliest. He was hunchbacked, stood four feet high, had red hair and big blue eyes. It seems he'd been an actor in Paris. Yes, indeed. Played in over 200 different productions, dear boy, at the Grand Guignol. Oh, but it was monstrous horrible, the way we used to scare the audiences. I, I was hated. Yes, yes, they used to throw things and hiss and bare their teeth at me. Finally, it got too bad. I couldn't stand it any longer. I gave up the theater. My nerves, you understand. Yes, gave it up completely. I really did. Couldn't stand it any longer. It all started one morning at 2.30. I was on watch, lying on the cool stone deck, pulling on my pipe, staring out at the blackness, the phosphorescent combers, and the big yellow stars, when out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something show up for a second, something the light had touched far off. I waited for her to come around again, and when she did, there it was. Master, a big one, about a half mile off and coming down out of the north northwest, coming straight for us. You must understand, our light was where it was for a very good reason. Dangerous submerged reefs surrounded us and ships kept clear. But this one, this sailing vessel, was coming straight on. I went over to the gallery door and yelled, Louis! Louis! Couldn't understand it. I waited for the light to come around again. Why is that? Ship headed for the reefs. Coming right up. I had the glasses out now. I couldn't read her name, but I could see her quite plainly. All sails set, the foam creaming away under her bow, her beautiful lines. A Dutch ship, I guessed her. But why didn't she turn? Every time it passed, our light hit her with the glare of day. Ship? Where? North, northwest. The light will touch her in a moment. Can't they see? Look at her. She just keeps coming on. Yeah, the square head. What is it? What is it? Watch north, northwest. I know. I know what it is. Huh? What? The Dutchman, the flying Dutchman. We did a play about her once. Oh, what a performance. You ghastly galleon, hag-ridden, cursed ribbon. Must on. Shut up, will you? She's laughing. Yes. Sloppy way to come about. She's derelict, that's it. Derelict? Abandoned. The crew left her for some reason or other. But instead of sinking, she's gone on, running before every wind. She'll not run long. Not with these reefs to break her up. A beautiful ship. Now, why would men leave a beautiful ship like that? She didn't ram us, although we all expected it. But as we waited for the crash, she luffed again, caught some odd gust, and went about. We watched her the rest of those black hours, heeling and rocking, pushed and pulled by every stray wind, every freak current. Watched her until the dawn came, till the sea turned from black to a pearly gray. And on she came again, heading for us. We all had our glasses trained on her now. August. You can kill the light. Right, Chief? Yeah, she doesn't look so good by daylight. Think she'll ground this time? What? I say, do you think she'll ground this time? Huh? This is impossible. Huh? Absolutely impossible. What? Here. Take my glasses. They're better than yours. All right. What is it you... I had to focus, and then my breath froze in my throat. 
The decks were swarming with a dark brown carpet that looked like a gigantic fungus, but undulating. And on the masts and yards, the guys and all were hundreds, no thousands, no mi- I don't know, an endless number of enormous rats. See them? Yes, I see them. Now we know why she's derelict. Yes, now we know. What are you two doing? Here, give me a look. Yes, give him the glasses. Take a good look, chatterbox. Give you something to talk about. She's still heading for us. Yes. Uh, She's going to turn. She'd better turn soon. Suppose she doesn't. You mean suppose she piles up on the key? It's low tide. Yes. Yes, it is. Where's all the conversation, August, huh? Here, want the glasses again? Want another look? No, no. She's still coming on. Go away! Go away! Turn, will you? Turn, I say, I pray you, turn! She's cracking up. The rats. Look, on the water. Like a carpet. They're swimming. Sure, they're swimming. Those are ship's rats. But they're swimming for the rocks. The door below. It's open. Come on. Down we went, racing down the stone stairs, taking them three and four at a time. Scared? You bet we were scared. August, you get the windows. Maybe they can climb. We don't know. Right, Chief. But hurry, hurry! Look. See them? No. Oh, yes, I do. Up at the other end of the rock. Look at the millions. They smell us. Here they come. Uh, Close the door. Can't, I can't. It's stuck. Here, let me. me. Oh, move, you move. He made it. Holy. That was close. One got in. Look, there. Get him. Watch him. He's kicking. He was as big as a turtle. Bigger. And his eyes were wild and red, his teeth long and sharp and yellow. He went for us, starving, ravenous, and we fought him, fought that one rat all over the room. It was, oh, believe me, I do not exaggerate, it was like fighting a panther. Got him. We better get aloft. As we ran up the winding staircase, we passed the tiny windows of the various levels, and at every one was a thick, wriggling, screaming curtain of brown fur. I was ahead of Louie, and I dreaded each successive level. Suppose they had found a way in. Look at them. Will you look at them? It's a nightmare. Will you look at them? The air of the gallery was thick and fetid with the stink of them. The light was dim, brown, filtered through the crawling mass that swarmed over the glass all about us. We could not see the sky. Nothing, nothing but them. Their red eyes, their claws, their wriggling, hairy snouts, and their teeth. The rats. They screamed and howled and threw themselves against the glass. They were starving. And we three, we stood very quietly. Oh, very, very quietly in the center of the classroom under our beautiful light. And we waited. What can we do? What can we do to you? Take it easy, old man. Take it easy. I can't. I it just can't. It won't do any... It won't do any good to stand here and shake. Uh, that's right. Anybody want a cigarette? Yes, yes, I have one. Thank you. Good boy. We've got to keep calm about this thing. Here's a light. <laughs> yeah, they don't light like the fire, do they? <laughs> Guess not. Give me another match. <laughs> you don't like that much, do you? I say. Don't rile them, August. Give me some more matches. I'll strike them and strike them and strike them until they get scared and go away. They won't go away. <laughs> Not until... When is it, Chief? Not until what? Not until they've been... fed. You can take just so much horror and then you get used to it. And they were interesting to watch, you know. They couldn't understand the glass. They could see us and they could rush at us, but that thin, invisible barrier held them off, stopped them. 
From time to time, we caught a glimpse of the rocks below. More rats down there, swarming brown velvet in the bright tropical sunlight. And then the tide began to rise. If only it had drowned some of them. Ships rats don't drown. <laughs> No, sir, you cannot drown one of them. They're all climbing up the tower. This bunch around us is getting thicker. Yeah. Say, what's the time? Quarter of six. Uh, you've got first watch, John. Right. Uh, wake me at ten. I will. Come along, August. It was getting dark. One side of the room was lit a soft, filtered red. Sunset through the rats. Oh, very pretty. I set the wicks, checked my fuel, and then lit the lamps. It caught them. Lit them in their gigantic wriggling web of pale, hairless bellies, twitching red tails, bright eyes. Then I started the rotary motor. Light drove them mad as she swung slowly and smoothly about. She blinded them in the fierce stabbing bar of light, moving continually about, ever turning, ever touching, ever moving around and around. And they twitching and shuddering, eyes flaming when they were struck by the light. The bright light moving and behind on the dark side of the room, so close, so close, I dared not turn my back, but you cannot help turning your back when you're in a room made of glass. On the dark side of the room, you could not see them, but only their eyes. Thousands of points of blank red light, blinking and twinkling like the stars of hell. Louie relieved me at ten, but I didn't get much sleep that night, and when I came up into the gallery early next morning... There stood August, his back to me. He was bowing to the rats, waving his arms and making a speech. I am going to play once again that magnificent role which made me the toast of the Paris theater. Prelate, the evil genius of the medieval underworld. I am he who did guide the dark soul of the Marechal into the nether parts. <laughs> Do not be frightened, little children. I will he not hurt turning. you. I much. stood staring at him hard struck, but he didn't notice me. The man had gone mad. He kept turning, telling his stories to all the rats, leaving no one out. August! August! Ah, another one. A late comer. Take a seat on the aisle, dear patron. August, Move stop over it, there. Stop it. Let the gentleman be seated. But he didn't come, stop. Come, he went on, bowing and scraping to the rats, his big blue eyes rolling and winking, his wild red hair waving about him. I grabbed him by the arms and his face. He looked at me like a child. And then his face screwed up. He looked as though he were about to cry. Go below, go on. Oh, very well then. Later, my dear audience, later. Matinee today. Sure, he was crazy. But I guess we all were. A few hours later, he came back up and caught Louie and me teasing the rats. Yes, sounds horrible. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> We could get right up against the glass and make faces at them. It drove them crazy. They would scratch away trying to get at our eyes. Louis was even cuter about it. He'd pull a piece of bread out of his pocket and press it against the glass. The rats would scramble into a solid ball, biting each other, clustering like grapes. From time to time, a whole knot of them would slip and fall 110 feet to the surf below. Look at the sharks! They're eating them. Yeah, the sharks are our friends. Here, here, I'll get another bunch together. Here, my beauties. That's it. Pile of kill each other. There they go! Auguste joined in, too. Oh, very ingenious, Auguste. He learned that if he spread-eagled himself against the glass, they'd bunch and bundle against his figure. Then he'd leap back. Look! My portrait in rats! It went on all day. And then 
I was lying in bed. It was about midnight. I was very tired, and I was just beginning to fall off to sleep when I became conscious of a new sound. Couldn't figure it at first. I got up, lit the lamp, and went to the window. Even as I looked at it, I saw one of the panes begin to sag in. They had eaten the wood away. Louis, Louis, come huh? quick. What? Well, what is it? They found a way in. I held the glass with my hand. Now they were all going crazy, and assured of the success of this maneuver, were all nibbling away at the wood. Louis ran below and then returned with a large sheet of tin. We spread it against the window and hammered it into place. Even as we did so, we felt the heavy body scudding against the other side as the window gave way. That ought to hold. If it doesn't, we're done for. Rats can't eat tin. No, they can't. What was that? I don't know. It came from below. The storeroom window. Oh. They're in. They're swarming up the stairs. Drop the trap. Right. Two of them got in. Let's go after them. We didn't have to go after them. They came at us. I leaped to one side and grabbed a marlin spike, swung and smashed one in midair. No! I whirled to see Louie with the other. It had ripped his hand open and the blood was pouring all over the place. He held his hand aloft and kicked at the snarling rat. I stepped and swung and got him. My hand! He got my hand! That's both of them, Louie. I'll, I'll get you something to tie that up. Blood! Look at it, my... My blood! I'm bleeding! Now, don't worry about it, Louie. Here, look. I'll, I'll wind this kerchief around it. It'll be okay. Blood! Uh, there, now. It's not bad. Just the flesh. And then I became conscious of another new sound. They were gnawing their way through the wooden trap door. I watched the wood fascinated. Even as I did, it began to give way. And a bristling, whiskery nose showed through... Louis, Louis, we've got to go up. Next level was the middle quarters in the kitchen. I slammed the trap door there, too. But it, too, was wood. Uh, my blood. What are we going to do? I don't know. We'll be through this one in a moment. The gallery. The trap door in the gallery is metal. Good. Come on. We made it. <laughs> across the trap door exhausted. While below us, the rats took over the entire tower. I could hear them howling and fighting over our food supply, our water, our leather. And all about us, the others screamed and glared in at us, swayed in a tangled mass, hypnotized by the ever-turning light. By morning, the air in the little room was horrible. Until now, we'd been getting air from the tower below. Now that was sealed off. And so was all our food and water. We lay exhausted, panting, waiting, waiting. And the hours crawled on. I was almost dozing from fatigue when I saw a sight that brought me too fast. <laughs> Would you like to come in, my beauties? Would you? I hold the powers of life and death, and I can let you in, you know. August was standing <laughs> by the glass, and in one hand he held a wrench. He was tapping the glass gently, not quite hard enough to break it. I eased myself to my feet and slowly, very slowly, tiptoed toward him. All I have to do is tap just a little harder huh? as a... I found a coil of wire in the tool kit and I trussed him up, fastened him to a stanchion in the center of the room. Louis was of no help. He lay on his side looking at his bloody hand, weak and sick as a baby. So there I was, a lunatic and a coward for company and all about watching our little drama, The Rats. <laughs> the day dragged by. The supply boat wasn't due for another 12 days. I don't know what they could have done if they had come. We had only one way of summoning them, and that was to shoot off distress rockets, but the rockets were four floors below. And even if they'd been right there in the gallery, I couldn't have opened a window to fire them. 
At night, I tended the light, but its flame was devouring our oxygen. The following day, we lay, thirst-tormented, starving, waiting, waiting, and the following night, I again tended the light, but the small supply of spare wicking we kept in the gallery had become exhausted, and quite suddenly, about midnight, the light went out. Nothing I could do. Wicks were stored three levels below. Nothing I could do. Nothing. From time to time, I'd strike a match to see the clock. And when I did, it lit up the million red eyes about us. All about us. Watching. Waiting. Below, it had grown quiet. They'd cleaned us out, and now they, too, were waiting. All waiting. And then the rats, quite suddenly, were silent. And then I heard it. And then I saw the sky and the stars. The rats were gone. I went to the glass. Out there on the water, a small freighter, a banana boat, showing a few lights, came softly and innocently at us. The light was out. They didn't know. I wanted to open the windows to call out to them, to warn them somehow, but I was afraid. What if, what if the rats were hiding from me, tricking me? So I waited. She grounded very softly on a reef not 200 yards from the quay. Grounded so gently that the man playing the cornet, was he a passenger or crewman off watch, didn't even stop playing. They tried washing her back off. I could have told them to save their fuel. The tide was rising, would have floated her free. And I waited. That's all. That's the story. The sun came up and there wasn't a rat on the whole key. Every last one of that terrible army had left us, gone back to sea on their new ship. August, insane asylum, he never recovered. And Louis, they took him into Cayenne where he died of blood poisoning from his bite. Uh. Oh, yes. Well, that's the whole of it. And if you'll excuse me now, I must go set my traps. No, no mouse traps. No rats in this lighthouse, I should say not. Life in the lights isn't bad. But sometimes when I see a strange vessel approaching, I get a little nervous, sure. Somewhere on the seas, there's a little banana boat without a crew. That is, without a human crew. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented Three Skeleton Key by George Tadeus, adapted for radio by James Poe and starring Vincent Price as Jean. Supporting Mr. Price were Harry Bartell as August and Jeff Corey as Louis. Sound effects on Three Skeleton Key, created by Cliff Thorsness and executed today by Mr. Thorsness, Gus Bays, and Jack Sixsmith, have been awarded the best of the year by Radio and Television Life magazine. Harry Essman was at the control panel, and special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are swimming for your life in the dangerous waters off the Florida Gulf Coast about to be smashed by a launch carrying a vicious criminal who must kill you or die himself. And on shore 500 yards away, the police are waiting to arrest you for murder. 
and there can be no escape. Next week, we escape with an exciting tale of temptation and death on the Gulf Coast of Florida as John and Gwen Bagney tell it in Danger at Matacumba. Goodbye, then, until the same time next week when once again we offer you Escape! A patch of weeds, a boxer's biography, and a mild, lukewarm bath. They're all clues that lead the police of Jackson, Michigan, to a killer in the gangbuster story on CBS this Saturday night. It's the case of the double push to be heard on most of the same CBS stations this Saturday night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you John Garfield, Jeffrey Lynn, and Priscilla, Rosemary, Lola, and Leota Lane in Four Daughters. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight in our play, Four Daughters, we take you into an American home, one where the overwhelming problem of bringing up a daughter is multiplied four times. Add the fact that all four daughters are of marriageable age, and we get, to say the least, a very busy telephone. It's popularly supposed that in such a household, the first girl up is the best girl dressed. But thanks to our product, Lux Flakes, one budget can cover four wardrobes quite gracefully. In fact, it's it's little feminine miracles like this that Lux Flakes thrives on. Our family tonight could be your own family, if you have the necessary number of daughters, because it's the gaiety, courage, and affairs of the heart of four daughters that are vital to this drama. On the screen, the Warner Brothers production enjoyed such popularity that a sequel called Four Wives will soon be released. Tonight, in our adaptation of Four Daughters, we have John Garfield, Jeffrey Lynn and Priscilla, Rosemary, and Lola Lane from the original cast. And we have an unexpected Lane as the fourth daughter. You've seen Priscilla, Rosemary, and Lola in many motion pictures. Leota Lane has appeared in New York musical comedies and recently has been studying for Grand Opera. When we heard that she was visiting her mother and sisters here in Hollywood, we leapt at the opportunity to cast four sisters as four daughters. Besides having four members of one family... We have another unusual statistic tonight. Five of our stars are newcomers to the Lux Radio Theater. John Garfield makes his first appearance at our microphone in the role which gained him screen stardom. You'll hear him as, as Mickey Borden, the embittered composer who somehow contrives to make cynicism a lovable quality. Jeffrey Lynn, another young man whose career received powerful impetus from Four Daughters, will play Felix, his original role. Mr. Lynn is the only one of our stars tonight who knew exactly where to find our stage door. And, let me add, no grass has had a chance to grow in front of that door this week, with so many stars beating a path to our microphone. Now we raise the curtain on Act One of Four Daughters, starring John Garfield as Mickey, Jeffrey Lynn as Felix, Priscilla Lane as Anne, Rosemary... The playing is awful. It's horrible. It has no soul. How can four such beautiful girls make four such horrible sounds? <laughs> well, anyhow, Dad, you admit we're beautiful. Beauty isn't enough to justify itself, Anne, unless you do something to go with it. Oh, how I wish I had a lot of money so I could cut all four of you off without a cent. We're safe. No dean of a music school ever got rich. Say, Dad, why don't you go in for more sweepstake tickets? Quite typical, Thea. Something for nothing. That's what you want, isn't it? Darling, you can't be mad just because we didn't turn out to be four little genii. You seem to forget that there is one genius in the family. If you're referring to Kay's voice, Anne, it's just an ordinary voice that needs years of hard work and Dad, training. Dad, when you applied at the foundation for the scholarship, you said my voice was thrilling. The greatest this side of Tepicini. Huh? Well, I couldn't spell mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they expect a father to exaggerate. Oh, Dad. Yes, Emma? Didn't you say you had a class at 3 o'clock? Oh, Lord, where's my hat? Here it is. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. Will you be home for dinner? Uh, yes, and I should like to hear Schubert played as if it meant something. Not like a swing band with discord. 
<laughs> oh, bye, bye. You know, I never knew anyone who could get so much fun out of being angry. Uh, <laughs> yes, Aunt Edda. That young florist fellow's here again. Ernest? I guess that's his name. Come on, girls. Clean up the room. Let him in, Aunt Edda. All right. Well, when Ernest the florist shows up, it means more free posies for Emma. What is this power you have over Floris, Emma? Oh, Thea, I wish you'd stop harping on that. You know very well Ernest is just a friend of the family. He doesn't come here to see me. Mm-hmm. Well, out of four sisters, there's got to be one liar. Go right <laughs> in, Ernest. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I, uh... Well, hello, Ernest. Hello, hello Ernest. Hello. <laughs> oh, hello. What is it today, Ernest? More flowers? Yes, it's, uh, they're orchids. Orchids? Orchids. Emma, did you hear that? Why, Ernest, you shouldn't do that. Oh, well, I, I didn't. I mean, they're not for you, Emma. They're for Thea. And, for well, me? Uh, yes, I'm just delivering them, so, well, there's a card inside that... Thea, who are they from? Here's the card. Mr. Benjamin Crowley. Oh, there's something on the back. Listen, I hope you'll wear these tonight. Thea, who is he? How did you meet him? What's he like, Thea? Wait, I met him last week. He's the handsomest... The handsomest? Well, make it the most distinguished. Is he young? Young enough. I think I'll just... Rich? Strictly Surtex. What's his name again? Benjamin Crowley. No middle name? Why, he can't be so very rich. He asked me to the country club last night, and I accepted. Oh, you didn't? I did, but he's coming here for dinner first. For dinner? Oh. Well, I guess I'd better be getting on. That is if, uh... Oh, Ernest, are you leaving? Well, I thought seeing I've delivered the flowers, and... Well, so long, Em. I'll drop in again sometime, maybe when... So long. So long. Oh, poor Ernest. Emma, you really ought to pay some attention to him. If ever someday he finishes a sentence, I'll marry him. Oh, dear. We're trying to wish a bow on Emma. Now Thea has a real one. Everything has been so beautiful. I want things to go on just the way they are, always. I don't want anything to change it at all, ever. <laughs> oh, don't be silly. Can you imagine anything worse than a house full of old maids? Oh, say, if I'm going out tonight, I'll have to borrow your wrap, Anne. Do you mind? All right. And, Kay, do you have a pair of stockings? I've got one good stocking. I've got another. That'll make a pair. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Every time a limp beauty goes out, the rest of the household automatically becomes a nudist colony. <laughs> <laughs> say, is Mr. Ben Crowley worthy of all this fuss? Sure he is. He's got money, and I want money, lots of it. Well, nobody said a word about love yet, Thea. Oh, love's overrated, old-fashioned, last generation. Don't tell me that you... Why, Emma? Yep, I want love, storybook style, with all the trimming. A knight in shining armor on a white horse. Fantastic. Yeah, of course it is. Where are you going to find a white horse these days? <laughs> oh, Anne, tell them I'm right. About love, I mean. Well, I don't think you are. I wouldn't mind mothering someone, a kitten or a puppy or a baby. But I want fun, lots of laughs. And the married people I've seen, well, they seem a little short on laughter. Well, I don't care. I'll take a chance. And, Anne, you're going to like Ben. I doubt it. Anne. Well, I don't want to like him. He's got no right to come courting you. I don't want to see this family broken up. Oh, why meet trouble halfway, Anne? He hasn't proposed to Thea yet. <laughs> Is everything going all right, Annetta? Now, don't worry, Thea. It'll be a dinner you'll be proud of. All this fuss for Ben Crowley. Never mind, Ann. You just take care of cooking the ducks. That's your department. How's it coming? Well, the last time I looked, they were okay. But if you don't stop getting excited, you're going to look as if you really did cook this dinner. Oh, that reminds me. Have you got your speech straight, Ann? Well, listen to this. Oh, Mr. Crowley, I just can't get over it. Thea cooked the whole dinner, every inch of it herself, and just look at her. She's as fresh and beautiful as she just stepped out of a bandbox. Oh, that's fine, Ann. Well, I've been rehearsing it for an hour. Oh, there he is. Anne, go out and introduce everybody. Well, I don't even know him. Well, introduce yourself. Tell him I'm busy in the kitchen. I'll be right there. All right, all right. Take it easy. Aunt Edda, I'm scared. Now, don't be silly, I tell you. Everything is going to be fine. Do I look all right? I think you look wonderful. Now, go on. It's late enough for you to make an entrance. All right. I... Oh, Oh, what are you doing here, here, Mr. Crowley? Thank right you. Here. So glad you could... Hello, Ben. Oh, hello, Thea. You've met everybody, I see. I certainly have. I, I was just saying to him, Mr. Lemp, you're a, a rosebud garden of girls. Oh, Mr. Crowley. Oh, I mean it. Well, I imagine dinner's ready. Uh, let's sit down, shall we? All right. Oh, right there, Mr. Crowley. Oh, thanks. Certainly is nice to sit down to a home-cooked dinner. <laughs> oh, Anne. Uh, yes, Thea? Anne, uh, you were going to, uh, well, I thought Oh, oh, that... oh yes. <clears throat> Oh, Mr. Crowley, I just can't get over it. Thea cooked the whole dinner, every inch of it herself, and just look at her. She's as fresh and beautiful as if she just stepped out of a bandbox. Yeah, yeah, she is. Yeah, yeah beautiful. <clears throat> well, uh, let's start. Girls, girls. Is dinner ready, Aunt Edna? We might as well fit to face the situation, girls. Anne forgot to light the oven under the dock. What? Oh, oh you oh, mean... Thea, don't you don't... Uh, 
sorry, Thea. What I wanted to say is... Yes, Ben? Well, Thea, uh, the fellows at the Boosters Club think I'm... Well, I have a pretty good future in this town. Of course, Ben. Go on. And if, if I'm going to have a future, well, a man ought to look ahead into the future, so to speak. Oh, yes, Ben? Well, Thea, what I meant is... I, I'd like to share that future with you. With me? Yes. Oh, Ben. Emma. Hmm? Are you asleep, Emma? I would have been. Oh, what do you want, Emma? Emma, do you think Thea really loves Ben? Well, she's going to marry him, isn't she? I mean, do you think she loves him as much as she loves us? Well, it's... It's a different kind of love, Anne. I should think it is. You certainly can't compare what you feel for someone you hardly know and what you feel for your own family that you were born into and have lived with all your life. Well, sometimes it's more. You mean to say a stranger could come in here and mean more to me than father or Aunt Etta, my own sisters more than you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you're certainly not very worldly-wise. <laughs> oh, Emma, don't let's get married ever. Let Thea and Kay if they want to, but not us. We'll grow old together. Beautifully and gracefully. Wait and see. We'll both look just like Whistler's mother. Yes, but if we don't get married, how are we going to look like anybody's mother? <laughs> You'll feel differently one day, Anne. You're a lot younger than I am. A couple of years. What's that? Emma, there isn't anyone. I mean, you haven't met anyone. Of course not. I mean, you and Ernest. <laughs> Does Ernest look like a knight in shining armor? No. As long as he's the only man on the horizon, I guess I'm headed for the shelf. The Lemp family is going to have one old maid, too. And we'll have a cat, mm -hmm. a tortoise-shelled one. And we'll call her, let me think, Bathsheba, uh -huh. Mehetable. No, Topaz, because mm -hmm. she'll have the most beautiful yellow eyes and the hey, longest, hey, most... Hey, hey, wait a minute. Don't make her too beautiful. We want her to be an old maid, too. <laughs> <laughs> Again, did you hear that, Aunt Etta? What did you say, Anne? That squeak, it's driving me crazy. Must be your violin. Your father says you're not very good. It isn't my violin. Listen, there it is. Seems to be outdoors. Why, it's someone swinging on our gate. Swinging on our gate? It's a man. Well, for heaven's sake, go out and tell him to stop. Well, you can bet I will. Hey, hey, get off that gate, will you? Oh, hello. Is this your gate? I have an interest in it, yes. It isn't much good for swinging. You know that, don't you? Well, I've swung on it for 18 years. It's done all right by me. Evidently, my standards are much higher. The fault lies with you, not with the gate. With me? Sure. No leverage. That's your trouble. Mind if I show you? Well, after all, it's your gate. Now watch. There. You see? A little pressure on the ball of the foot. Weight evenly distributed. And there you are. Say, that's pretty good. Mind if I swing with you? It's okay with me, but stay on your own side. Thanks. <laughs> you know, this is the third or fourth happiest day of my life. You're new around here, aren't you? Yes. My name's Felix. Felix Dietz. D-E-I-T-Z. I'm an old friend of the Lemp family. What? An old friend? Oh, slight exaggeration. My father was a very good friend of old Mr. Lemp's. I'm his daughter, and he's not so very old. Well, Miss... Uh... Anne, Anne the gate swinger. Well, Anne, in this pocket, I have a letter to your father. In fact, he's quite young-looking. Granted, but what's Right that? now, he's at the Music Foundation. He works there. He's the dean of the faculty. One of the youngest-looking deans I've ever had. Good. In this other pocket, I have another letter to the president of the foundation. Could you possibly direct me? Why, certainly. You go down Briar Road and turn. Four blocks on Cliff Street and turn. Straight ahead three blocks and then... And then you... I turn... Thanks. I'll find it, I'm sure. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, uh, by the way, one more question. What are you having for dinner tonight? Lamb chops. Lamb chops. Mm, that'll do very nicely. Well, nobody invited you to dinner. Your father will. I'll see to that. Au revoir. So long. I'll see you at dinner. Some nerve. <laughs> Oh, 
Take my advice, Ann. Don't set that extra place. He won't be here. I've seen him. He'll be here, Emma. He can swing on a gate. He's got letters to Dad and the Dean, and he tolerates lamb chops. Well, that doesn't mean he'll be invited to dinner, Ann. He'll not only be here for dinner, but he'll tell us where to sit. He'll say grace, do the carving, make all the conversation, and help himself to a second portion of dessert. That's my impression of Mr. Deets. And my impression of your impression is that he sells vacuum cleaners or something or other. Well, whatever he's selling, you'll buy it. Come in, young fellow. Thanks. Well, nice place, Mr. Lamp. Who's that? That girl's is Mr. Deets, D-E-I-T-Z. Yeah, this way, young man. Well, 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 quite a crowd of daughters. Hello, Deets. Hello, Lamp. Uh, my dad, won't you introduce us? Oh, certainly. Girls, uh, this is Felix Dietz. He's a blasted young pup who prefers jazz to the classics. He's arrogant, disrespectful, argumentative, conceited, and I like it. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot to mention that I have no talent whatsoever. You've been telling me that all the way home. Oh, they can tell that by just looking at you. <laughs> well, I'm Thea, and you look talented to me, whatever you do. Thank you. I compose. I'm Kay. What do you compose? Trash. Uh, modern tone poems, I call them, Miss Kay. How nice. I'm Emma, positively the last sister. <laughs> Go ahead, produce more. I'm not the least bit tired. Well, come on, come on, dinner's ready. Well, I thought you said there weren't any more sisters. Who's this? Uh, this is Felix Dietz, uh, the son of my old friend. Oh, this is Aunt Etta. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. You know, I'm going to sit right next to you at dinner, and we're going to hold hands under the table. Strange how I cotton to you. You know, girls, he's the nicest thing that's come into this house since the electric percolator. <laughs> I imagine we'll be seeing him often. Uh, you know the president of the foundation, don't you? Hard-boiled, isn't he? Pure granite. Well, it took this man just seven minutes to talk him into giving him a job at the foundation. Uh, ten minutes. I timed it. Well, that means you're going to live in Briarcliff, doesn't it, Mr. Dietz? That's right. Hooray! Oh, Mr. Dietz, we want you to feel free to come and swing on our gate any time you like. Emotion chokes me. Oh, by the way, where are you going to live? Oh, I haven't thought about that yet. Well, there's a small hotel in town. Small and mangy. A couple of nice rooming houses, though. With gates. Uh, say, I've got it. Why don't you stay here? Uh, here? Oh, Mr. Lemp, it's awfully nice of you, but, well, moving in on your family will... Would tomorrow be too soon? <laughs> well, girls, what did I tell you? Really, girls, I can't get over it. A few hours ago, we never heard of a young man named Felix Dietz, and now he's practically a fixture in this house. I thought I'd choke when Dad asked him to stay with us. Did you see Aunt Etta's face light up, though? She's fallen for him completely. Why, she's downstairs now, rearranging the living room furniture to suit Felix's taste. Well, if you ask me, life and laughter's finally come to the limps. I think Dad asked him to stay because he wants someone around to argue music with. <laughs> well, okay, maybe Dad figured we could use a room and board money. Did you ever stop to think of that? You know, Felix may not be such a nuisance after all. What do you say, Anne? I say that if Felix Dietz demanded a hundred a month to live here, you girls would move heaven and earth to scrape it together. What? And furthermore, at the very thought of his being in this house, your collective heart thumping is causing enough vibration to crumble the walls of Jericho. Nuisance indeed. You're falling in love with him, all of you. <laughs> oh, Anne. Well, what about you, Anne? I suppose you're immune to the Dietz charm. <laughs> I can laugh at all of you. Remember me, Annie, the sister who never got her man or wanted him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> During this brief intermission, before Mr. DeMille brings us Act Two of Four Daughters with our all-star cast, let's go on our magic carpet across country to Tennessee, to the pleasant home of Mrs. S.C. Silver in Nashville. She has a 13-year-old grandson, Frank, and here he comes now. Hi, Grandma. Oh, Frank, look at your feet. You're all wet and muddy. Well, gee, Granny, I, I sort of slipped in a puddle. Oh, dear, they should have known that white socks aren't practical for a, a jackanapes like you. You'd never know they were ever white. Just look how muddy they are. And good heavens, they're all stained from your shoes. Ah, oh, shucks, you can get them clean all right, can't you? Well, they're so awfully dirty, I'm afraid not. Oh, gee, Granny, please, you gotta, it's important. We're having something special in the gym tomorrow. Well, I'll see what can be done. Uh, 
Well, you know, I got out the Lux Flakes and made some extra rich suds and washed the socks thoroughly in them, and you should have seen the water. It was filthy, but when I finished, the socks were white as snow. And next morning, when I gave them to Frank, he said... Gee, Granny, they're slick. They look like you bought me a new pair. Just like a boy. Well, that scene, ladies and gentlemen, was based on a letter Mrs. Silver wrote us. Those socks were a tough problem... But Lux scored again. Lux flakes not only do the difficult and unusual tasks well, they do your everyday tasks, like stockings and underthings, house dresses and sweaters, and all washables, thoroughly and safely, too. That's what Mrs. Silver found, and that's what you'll find, too. Lux suds are so rich and active, they simply float out the dirt and leave your things bright and fresh-looking. There's no harmful alkali, no cake soap rubbing, to fade or streak washable colors or hurt sensitive fibers. Use Lux for all your woolens. Everything safe in water alone. And, of course, for your pretty house dresses and printed silks, stockings and underthings. Be sure to buy the thrifty large size box of Lux Flakes. The fine sheer flakes are so pure, a little Lux goes a long way. Now our producer, Mr. DeMille. The curtain goes up on Act Two of Four Daughters, starring John Garfield as Mickey... Jeffrey Lynn as Felix, Priscilla Lane as Anne, Rosemary Lane as Emma, Lola Lane as Thea, and Leota Lane as Kay. A few weeks have gone by since Felix made his entrance into the Lemp household. In the room shared by Anne and Emma, there is silence, broken only by the scratch of two pens as the girls write busily in their diaries. It's bedtime. Anne frowns deeply as she begins a new sentence. Quiet evening at home. That's because Felix has gone to New York for a few days. But he'll be back soon to take up his position as president, king, and prime minister of the household. I'll tell you a secret, diary. I like him very much. On the other side of the room, Emma smiles quietly as she reads over what she has written. He's been here only a few weeks, and everything seems different somehow. Isn't it strange that a knight in shining armor should be called Felix? You know, Felix, I don't mind you wasting your time, but please don't waste it on my piano. Quiet, Mr. Lamp. This is my own composition. You wrote that thing? Why? Ever hear of the Manhattan Academy of Music? They've announced a competition for native-born composers. That's me. And first prize is $1,000. We'll use it to buy you a new piano. Oh, so you're going to win first prize, are you? With that collection of catcalls? Oh, come on, come on. You've got a class to teach at three. Well, there's still half an hour. I'm waiting for Mickey Borden. Who's he? He's an arranger I picked up going to help me orchestrate my composition. It's criminal, wasting another person's time. Oh, it isn't exactly a waste of time. Mickey's out of a job right now. Well, you tell him for me that orchestrating this st thing is one step lower than being out of work. Will he be here soon? He's an hour late now, but he might not get here at all. He might not get here next by next week or... Well, it was my impression that only trombone players oh, drank. Oh, Mickey doesn't drink. He's just a little, well, unpredictable. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. No completely sane person could do a good job on that stuff. <laughs> well, I'll see you at the foundation. Now, don't be too late now. Okay. I'll see who it is, Aunt Etta. Hi. Hello, Mickey. Come on in. Right in that way, Mickey. I've just been working on the Rhapsody. Hmm, a rug on the floor, a piano, and the smell of cooking from the kitchen. It's homes like these that are the backbone of the nation. Where's the spinning wheel? <laughs> Shut up. Did you miss the train? I ignored the train. Thumbed my way up. Why? I gave you more than enough for the fare. Well, I bet the five dollars on a horse I could have bought for seven. He had a lovely name, Felix, that I can't for the life of me remember. This time of day, there's plenty of traffic from town. You shouldn't have been this late. Oh, I had lots of offers from small fry trucks and station wagons, but I held out for a town car. Poor man's privilege. <laughs> Look, Mickey, I've got to run over to the foundation. Suppose you take a room in this town for a few weeks till we're through. Save you a lot of traveling. It's all right with me. I was evicted this morning. 
I'm going to miss those cobwebs. Now, here's the first movement. Look it over, will you? I'll be back in an hour, and we'll get you a room. Okay, just so it's on the other side of the railroad tracks. I can't breathe this clean air. Oh, uh, there's a woman in the kitchen. Introduce yourself to her. Name's Aunt Etta. I know the type. <laughs> okay, see you later, Vic. Uh-huh. Well, I kind of thought it didn't sound like Felix explaining. Who are you, young man? Is that important? Well, for all I know, you may be a burglar with designs on the piano. According to Felix, I'm supposed to introduce myself. Mickey Borden. I guess your aunt, uh, something or other. Etta. Etta, yep. Name fits right in. What type aunt are you? The gruff voice hiding the soft heart? Are you the sweet, simple aunt, sakes alive, I smell something burning aunt? Or the... Felix should have prepared me for you. How about a cup of tea? Sure. Can I throw in a couple of cakes? How'd you know I hadn't eaten since yesterday morning? I'm the nearsighted, but you can't hide a thing from me type of aunt. I see. Well, you needn't look so noble about it. Tea is only a little hot water. Well, I'll get the kettle going. I'll tell you what I think of you later. Hello. Oh, Anne. Home early, aren't you? Uh-huh. Who's, who's that? Oh, this is Mickey, er... Uh, Borden. Borden. He's a friend of Felix, I think. Oh, how do you do? We just know each other. I'm orchestrating his rhapsody. I'm making some tea for Mr. Borden. Just a little hot water. You want some, Anne? Oh, please, Aunt Anna. Yes, Aunt Anne. You're in for something. What do you mean? You'll see. <laughs> Got a cigarette? Sure. Cork tip, no less. Here you are. Light it for me, will you? What? Oh, all right. Here, Mr. Borden. Okay. Say, is that part of Felix's composition? No. This is something of my own. Why, it's beautiful. It stinks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, you're probably right. Just making conversation... All the same, I hope you're not entering that in the competition. Around these parts, we want Felix to win. Can't enter it if I wanted to. It's only got a middle. Only got a... You mean you only wrote a middle? No beginning, no end? Just the middle. Well, do you think it's right to leave a song dangling in midair with no face or feet? Why not? Well, for one thing, a full-bodied composition might easily win first prize. I wouldn't win first prize if I were the only entry in the contest. Well, it seems to me that mathematically, you'd stand a fine chance. Do you think they'd let me win, those guys up there? Up where? Who? They. The fates, the destinies. Whoever they are that decide what we do or don't get. Oh. They've been at me now for 28 years. No let up. First they said, let him do without parents. He'll get along. Then they decided he doesn't need no education. That's for sissies. And right at the beginning, they tossed the coin. Heads he's poor, tails he's rich. So they tossed the coin with two heads. Then for the finale, they got together on talent. Sure, they said, let him have talent. Not enough, of course, to let him do anything on his own, anything good or great. Just enough to let him help other people. It's all he deserves. Well, you put all this together and you got Michael Bolgar. Bolgar? Well, that's the name I was born with. I thought if I change it, I'd throw him off the trail. Didn't work. <laughs> well, of course, you know you're very silly. Who asked you to listen? Well, you're insulting a person who believes that a man decides his own destiny. That is, if a man has enough ambition and enough courage. <laughs> well, I guess I deserve that. Still, I know enough about music to tell you that if you finished your composition, you... I tell you, they won't stand for my winning. They're sitting up there, working overtime against me. What some people will do for time and a half. <laughs> we won't talk about it anymore. I can see it's a painful subject to you. Oh, it's my favorite subject. Talking about my tough luck is the only fun I get. Ed, 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 help! <laughs> Wait a minute. Were you smiling just now? I think so, yeah. I wish you'd do something for me. What? Throw your head back and laugh uproariously. Why? No reason, just laugh. <laughs> uh-huh, just as I thought. You don't know the first thing about laughter. I see the sort I'm up against, the gay young thing type. Unimportant species. Well, it isn't the quality of your laughter I'm complaining about. It's your attitude. Attitude? When I asked you to laugh, you wanted to know why you should. As if a person has to have a reason to laugh. They might have a reason not to. And someday I'll give you a little talk on the difference between a laugh and a giggle. Oh, my goodness. Ed, Edda, help, help! Hello. Oh, good morning. You look very domestic. Baking a cake. 
It'll probably fall. That's fate, destiny. Say, I thought you were supposed to be working on Felix's composition. I am. I'm just taking off a little time to practice my laughing. <laughs> well, come to think of it, you've improved a lot for just one week. Thanks. Say, were you sneaking around my room yesterday when I was out? How'd you guess? Tried not to leave fingerprints. The minute my back's turned, you put curtains up on me. And that isn't all. The next time you're out, I'm going to slip a couple of flower pots on your sill. You just try it. My landlady's got orders to shoot you on sight. And when I get through with your room, I'm going to work on you. Look at yourself. What's wrong with me? Your hair's always reaching for the ceiling. Your tie's at half mashed. Your... And there's something about the state of New York that I think you ought to know. Huh? What? In the state of New York, a crease in the pants is strictly constitutional. What do you say, Mickey? Uh, I'll think about it. Swell. And now, just one more thing. Yeah? In between times, when you're not practicing how to giggle, what about doing a little work on your own composition? Ah, uh, shut up. Well, think what a kick in the pants it would be to those destinies of yours if you ran off at the first prize. What if I do win? Oh, here it comes again. My picture in the magazines, a new suit, hullabaloo. Then one morning, I'm walking down the street when a bolt of lightning with my number on it and nothing else to do follows me around the corner and bops. Oh, Mickey. Yep, that's the way I'm leaving this world. Lightning. I'll lay odds. Somewhere, Mickey, there's a straight jacket with your number on it. Just waiting. Oh, what time is it? It's early. I promised to meet Felix at the train. Aunt Edda, will you finish this cake? I knew it. All right. Thanks. I've got to rush, Mickey. I promised I'd walk Felix home from the station. Why the excitement? He's only been away a day. But I promised. That's important. I made a promise, too. To myself. What? Come here, Anne. Mickey. Mickey, please. I... I don't want you to think that that kiss was a spur-of-the-moment stuff. I planned it for a week. It's pretty mild for a week's thought. Just a friendly kiss. We're going to be great friends, aren't we? Yeah, I'll work at it. In fact, we're going to be such great friends that we won't have to give each other anything for Christmas. How's that? Yeah, that's great. I like that. I'm sorry, Mickey. Well, I've got to go now. Goodbye for a while. So long. Home again. Ah, it's great to be home. The old town hasn't changed a bit. Say, listen. When I promised to walk home with you, I didn't think it was going to develop into a foot race. Slow down. Oh, sorry, Anne. Well, that's better. Do you know, Anne, that your eyes are very beautiful? Why, Mr. Deeds. They are. Know something else? I love you. Why? What? I said I love you. Excuse me, I didn't... What did you say, Felix? I said I love you. I won't say it again. Oh, well, thanks. Since when? Since the moment I first saw you. You can't be original when you're in love. Oh. Well? Well, what? That was in the nature of a proposal. I expect something in the nature of an answer. Well, of course I adore you, Felix. That's a good start. But couldn't we go on just this way, you know? Lots of laughs. Well, we could be married and still go on laughing. There have been cases. I love you, Anne. I can't swing on a gate and I don't know much about anything else. But I'll try to make you happy. You're this crazy world to me, Anne. And the insane world before this and the mad world to come. I... Oh, Felix. What? Let's hurry, shall we, darling? Hurry? I, I want to tell the family right away. You want to... You mean... Well, come on! Here, these flowers go over there. Ben, help me, will you? Sure thing. Oh, Thea, aren't you excited? Excited? You'd think it was my wedding day instead of Anne. Weren't you excited at our wedding, Thea? Of course, darling. I did it all over. Emma! Where's Emma? Here. Emma, did you arrange about the wedding cake? Yes, it's on its way over. I, I'd better speak to Aunt Etta about it. Kay, what's the matter with Emma? I don't know. Oh, I guess she's got the weeps. I've kind of got them myself. <laughs> Emma. Emma, don't, darling. They'll hear you. I can't help it, Aunt Etta. I know it's wrong, but I love Felix. Now he's... Oh, Aunt Etta. Hush now. Shh. Someone else will come along. No. No. Of course he will. In about six months. That's the usual time. Don't contradict me, Emma. 
I know all the ways of bad men being a spinster. Etta, where's Anne? Have you seen her? Yes, I did, and don't get so excited. Well, where is she? She went out for a walk with Mickey. A walk on our wedding day? Well, why not? Lots of girls get the fidgets on their wedding day. Walk will probably do her good. Please, Mickey, don't just sit there and stare. Listen to me, please. Why must you look so beautiful? Oh, Mickey. You're getting married in an hour. Another dream shot. That isn't tough enough. But you've got to look like a convention of angels. Listen to me, Mickey. You always said it was my fault. I never put up a battle. All right, I'm full of fight now. I love you, Anne. Nobody else can have you. I love you. Mickey, come to your senses. You see, Anne, your theory's all cockeyed. There's no use fighting. I accept the verdict. What's more, I'll attend the wedding. I'll stand in the corner and my smile will be just as brave as Emma's. Emma? Well, why should Emma? Why should Emma? You mean to say you don't know Emma's insane about Felix? Emma? Felix? Mickey, you're out of your mind. Huh? Well, I guess when you're used to standing on the outside looking in, you can see things others can't. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Poor Emma. That night when you told everybody I was watching, she went white as a sheet, ran out of the room. No. When she came back, her eyes were red from crying. That, that made me feel very close to Emma. But it wasn't that. It couldn't have been. It was because of me, because I was getting married. Oh, don't you see, we've always been so close. No, I don't believe it, Mickey. You're only saying it to frighten me. All right, go home. Get married. But it isn't true. You were lying, weren't you? Yes, that's as good a name for it as any. No, you weren't lying. You weren't. Oh, Mickey, what can I do? Emma? Hey, Emma! Yes, Felix? Oh, Emma, will you do me a favor? Will you tie this tie for me? Oh, of course. Better stand still. Oh, I can't do a thing with it. I I'm a nervous wreck, I tell you. My fingers have turned to jelly. Feel. They're cold. It's so yours. What are you nervous about? I? I'm not nervous. Hey, it's a quarter after three. I'm ready. Emma, is Anne in our room? Why, I don't know. Well, I'm sure I don't. I'll go look, Dad. Who was that at the door, Aunt Etta? Here. It's a telegram. Telegram, Felix? No, it's not for Felix. It's for you, Emma. For me? Excuse me. Well, I thought only brides got wires on wedding days. Who's it from, Emma? Oh. Oh, no. What's wrong? Emma, what's happened? It's... It's for man. She's married Mickey Borden. Married? Emma, what does it say? Here, read it. You must break the news to Felix. Make him understand that this is for the best. I found out just in time to avoid making a dreadful mistake. Mickey and I will be married by the time this reaches you. Felix will understand and forgive. Oh, Felix. No. Don't. Don't say anything, please. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille brings you Act Three of Four Daughters with John Garfield, Jeffrey Lynn, and the Four Lane Sisters. Every now and then, don't you ask yourself what you want most in life? And I think pretty often your answer is happiness. Well, that's really what we all want, Mr. Ruick. Happiness for ourselves and for those we love. Yes, Sally. And it makes me think of something Mrs. Ruick was telling me this morning. She was telling me about a friend of hers, a young bride, who wanted happiness but felt it slipping away from her. You know, Helen, I want Jack to be proud of me more than anything else in the world. Of course. And he is, Jane. I don't know. You see, Helen, he used to be so proud of me, of my appearance. And everywhere we went, he sort of, well, you know, sort of showed me off and everything. And now, well, I just have the feeling that he isn't quite so proud of me. I have a feeling he thinks I've let him down. Oh, Janie, you can't mean that. Well... I'm a little self-conscious these days, for one thing. Just look at my hands. They used to be so nice, 
And now they get so rough and red from housework and especially from dishwashing. I'm ashamed of them. I sort of try to hide them and it spoils everything for me. And I do so want to help Jack. Poor dear. I know exactly how you feel, but there's really no need for it. Well, what can I do? The, the thing that hurts most is that I know it hurts Jack every time he looks at my hands. He feels I'm working too hard, and I'm not, really. Oh, now, Jane, stop your worrying. I know the very thing for you. And Helen, being a woman of action, had Jane stop at the corner grocery store on her way home to get some Lux Flakes, because Lux will help hands stay soft and smooth in spite of dishwashing. That's a mighty good way to help, Jane. Lux is so kind to your hands. But it means so much more than that, don't you think? It means more love and admiration and social success. Every husband wants to be proud of his wife's appearance, and that will make both of them happier. Sally, it's amazing, but true, how a simple thing can have such far-reaching effects. <laughs> well, pretty hands are mighty important, Mr. Ruick. And here's a fact that I think is worth repeating. Beauty experts advise Lux Flakes for washing dishes because it's so mild. And it's inexpensive, too. You'll find Lux is so pure, a little goes a long way. Lux is thrifty. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Continue with Four Daughters. Anne and Mickey were married in September. Now it's just a week before Christmas. And in their tiny New York apartment, Anne sits alone in the shabby living room. She looks tired and drawn, but she's smiling as she reads over a letter from home. I suppose you read in the papers that Felix Composition won the first prize and a contract with the Seattle Symphony. He will be leaving soon, and I don't know when we will see him again. And now, here's our big news. Emma is going to be married to Ernest, the florist. We were all terribly surprised, but she seems quite happy. She will tell you all about it herself. And you can't imagine how we've missed you these months. But now Christmas is a week away, and your father is so looking forward to a family reunion... Please, Anne, please get back for Christmas. Your loving aunt, Etta. Mickey. Hmm? What? You hate vegetable soup, don't you, darling? No, I kind of like it. Oh, for my sake. Hate it, please. Why? I've just discovered something about myself. I can't make vegetable soup. Well, uh... Could you salvage something from the vegetables, a stew or an omelet or something? Well, I must have done something wrong. Those vegetables in the pot, they disappeared. Well, anyway, we can look forward to the Christmas dinner your dad's going to give us. I just read Aunt Etta's letter again. It gets better with each reading. In the meantime, we can run down to Joe's Red Room. We've got just enough left for two of his death-defying dinners and a pair of tickets to Briarcliff. After that, yeah. After that, Social Security will take care of us. Well, I feel old enough to be eligible. Anne, I can't make any money orchestrating. If only there was something else I could do. Nonsense. A little gray at the temples and you'd make a wonderful bank president. Yeah? I bet you'd be glad to get out of this dungeon for a couple of days. Oh, it's not so bad. Only, did you ask the landlord for hot water? I did, but uh, he counted by asking for the rent. Well, you ask him first. Anne, after all these months, you still love me? Oh, it's only four months. Sure I do. You really do? Get a notary. I'll sign an affidavit. You still love me? You must be crazy. That's a statement that would get you into the most exclusive insane asylum. Well, you wouldn't do so badly with the entrance exams yourself. Yeah, maybe. Do you want to go home for Christmas? Why, yes, Mickey. Don't you? Okay, okay. I, I just wanted to make sure. Why, Mickey? I met a fellow today who was trying to set up a combination for South America. You mean a band? Yeah, yeah. He, he wants me at the piano. It'd only take $300 to get us there. I could raise it someplace, but we'd have to leave right away. Oh, uh, Mickey. Yeah? Now it's my turn to ask you a question. These past four months, have you been happy? I've been closer to it 
than I've ever been before. Then why do you suddenly want to traipse to South America? Perhaps to give its lightning a chance at me. Only fair. If you weren't married, if you didn't have me, you'd get there somehow, wouldn't you? I guess so. I'm holding you back. That's right, that's right. That's what I told this guy. I said, I can't go. I got a wife around my neck who wants to go home for Christmas, and I think more of her than I do of your job. Thanks, Doc. Pretty swell. Nice work, Thea. And you're wonderful. Isn't she wonderful, Adam? Oh, fair, fair. They need to practice together. Oh, On the contrary, oh, I think they're very good. Personally, I thought it was great. You ought to get home more often, Anne. Thanks, Felix. Well, who will have what's left of the turkey? Ernest? Well, uh, yes, I wouldn't mind it. I guess nobody'd mind. Come on, Emma. You can help. All right. Wait, Aunt Etta. Don't fix anything for me, will you? I've got to leave, you know. Oh, Felix. Sorry, trains don't wait. I'll get your bag, Felix. I'm the youngest. I'll go get his hat and coat. Better get the car out, I guess. Oh, Felix, I do hate to see you go. Please miss your train. Seattle won't believe you're a real musician if you get there on time. <laughs> we'll expect a letter every week now. Full report. I'll send press clippings. Make sure your father reads them. <laughs> oh, was somebody getting my coat? Here, Felix. Oh, thanks, Anne. It was swell seeing you. It was swell being here. You know, Anne, whoever said out of sight, out of mind was a liar. Shakespeare probably said it. He said everything. Yes. Well, goodbye, Lynn. So long, Beats. Wait a second, will you? Oh, so long, Mickey. Not yet. I'm going to drive you to the station. Okay, thanks. Well, bye, everybody. Bye, So long. All right. Well, there he goes. Come on, if you want some supper. I'll help right, them. Right. Right. Anne. Yes, Emma? Isn't it grand for all of us to be together again? Seems almost like a dream. So much has happened. Felix a success. Three of us married. <laughs> well, I almost am. Ernest wants to make it soon. Emma, I've got to know. You and Felix, I... I thought you were in love with him. I was. I guess we all were. Looking back, the day you were going to marry Felix, I thought if the world should end now, it would only be an anticlimax. I know better now. And I really owe it all to you, Anne. To me? You see, if you'd married Felix, I suppose I'd have gone on all my life thinking I'd miss my Prince Charming on his white horse. But when your telegram came, well, everyone just went to pieces. That is, everyone but Ernest. But he was so quiet and so capable and, and so dignified. That started it. It's funny how long you can be around people and not know how much they really mean to you. Now, take you and Mickey. Emma, stop. Anne, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. I'm just... Well, have I said anything that... Anne, you're happy with Mickey. You are, aren't you? Mickey does everything he can to make me happy. He tries very hard. Felix. Yes? I asked Ben to let me drive the car because this is my last chance to tell you that um, I'm sorry I busted things up for you. Oh, ancient history, Mickey. Forget it. Messing things up, that's where I shine. There's one saving grace, though. I usually end up at the bottom of the pile. How have things been going with you, Mickey? No complaints. Been working? After my fashion. Everything all right, then? I head above water. That's good. Do me a favor, Mickey. Huh? <laughs> How much do you need? Oh, no. I've been lucky lately. Let me lend you a little something to tide you over. Don't you ever get tired of being such a swell guy? It would bore me stiff. No, thanks, Felix. I, I, I can't take it. Why not? I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm a new man. The old Mickey would have taken it. The old Mickey was no fool. Well, there's the train. You haven't much time to lose. You got your ticket? Yes, everything. Oh, Mickey. Yeah? Here. Take this, will you? What is it? I told you I didn't need any... Please. It's for Anne. Use it any way you think. That'll make her happy. So long, Mickey. So long. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. 
what a chance. A man decides his own destiny, and he has enough courage. Think what a kick in the pants it would be to those destinies of yours if you won the first prize. <laughs> a man decides his own destiny. <laughs> Someday I'm going to teach you how to land. A bolt of lightning with my number on it. That's the way I'm leaving this world. I'll lay odds on it. A man decides his own destiny. Lightning. That's the way. A man decides his own destiny. A man can make his own lightning. His own destiny. His own lightning. His own lightning. His own lightning. Oh, please, doctor. Tell me. Is he very bad? I'm afraid so. It was a bad accident. There's no chance for him. No chance at all. Oh, Mickey. Poor Mickey. You'd better go in now. He only has a few minutes. Mickey. And more of their work. Wouldn't even... Wouldn't even let me go out in style. Don't try to talk, Mickey. You'll be all right. Only lightning can get you. I have your word for it. Sure. But... Lightning... Can be manufactured. You know, a man, a man can make his own. Doctor, doctor, is it? I'm sorry, my dear. There was nothing we could do for him. He's, he's gone, my dear. Oh, Mickey, Mickey, oh, Mickey. Stop, stop. Terrible, terrible. How you girls, with all the training I've given you, could look so sweet and play so sour. <laughs> for girls who haven't played together for over a year, I think they're doing very well, despite your training. Well, that's <laughs> enough now. That's enough. Now we'll try it again. Ready, Anne? Stop squeaking. I didn't do that. You certainly did. I heard... Listen, it's our gate. There's a man swinging on our gate. It's Felix. Hello. Man home? Anne, he wants to see you. Oh, yes, I... I... Excuse me, Dad. Hello, Lamp. Hello, Dietz. You haven't done right by my gate. Listen to that squeak. I wouldn't swing on a gate that didn't squeak. Why do women hate to use an oil can? Why do men love to smoke smelly pipes? It isn't the pipe. It's the tobacco. And whoever said out of sight, out of mind, is still a liar. Oh, Felix, I'm so glad you're back. I came back for you. For me? Didn't you know I would someday? Oh, I hoped you would. But if you came back for me, then then what are you doing on that side of the gate? <laughs> oh, Anne. <laughs> 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 In just a moment, our stars return for their curtain calls. But first, I'd like to make a timely suggestion. And, of course, that means a Christmas suggestion. Well, last year, we received quite a lot of nice letters praising our recipe for Lux Snow as a Christmas tree decoration. In fact, I'd like to have you hear one. It's from Mrs. L.H. Hubrexy of Brilliant, Wisconsin. She says, I tried the whipped-up Lux suds you mentioned on the Lux Radio Theater for my Christmas tree, and I was simply delighted with the result. Now, listen closely to this, because this is a brand-new idea. She goes on to say... I also took branches from a bridal wreath bush and covered them with a Lux mixture. Then I sprinkled shiny, artificial Christmas snow over the Lux, placed the twigs in a glass frog also covered with Lux snow, and set it on a mirror flanked by silver candlestick. 
I used this on my New Year's holiday dining table. <laughs> the result was beautiful, and my guests complimented me on my originality. Now, there's an idea for you. There's lots of ways you can use Lux to make your Christmas more beautiful. For your tree, of course, for your wreaths, and as table decorations. Now, here's the way you make the snow. Get a large box of Lux Flakes, pour it into a bowl, add two scant cups of lukewarm water, and beat with an egg beater to the consistency of thick whipped cream. Then, take handfuls of the snow and spread with your fingers along the branches of your tree. When you're finished, your tree looks as if it had been out in a snowstorm. It's really beautiful. For extra sparkle, sprinkle shiny artificial Christmas snow over the tree while the suds are still moist. Now, did you get that recipe? You take two scant cups of lukewarm water to a large size box of Lux Flakes and beat to the consistency of thick whipped cream. Be sure to buy the large size box of Lux Flakes. Here is Mr. DeMille with our stars. The traffic problem at our microphone being what it is tonight, I think I'd better make sure that our stars are all here for their curtain call. Garfield? Here. Lynn? Here. Lane sisters, Leota? Here. Rosemary? Present teacher? Lola? Yes, sir. Priscilla? I'll say kid. Oh, don't mind Priscilla. <laughs> don't mind her, Mr. DeMille. That was the first thing she ever had to say on the stage, and she's very proud of it. Well, she should be. It's a good line. <laughs> This seems a good time to find out how Mrs. Lane's four daughters got into the business of entertaining the public. Well, I guess it's because we learned to sing when we were all youngsters. You see, we lived in a little town in Iowa where there was a music school, just like the town in Four Daughters, and everybody naturally thought about music. Then Lola and Leota got a job on the stage in New York. Mother was worried about them going to the wicked city alone, but it turned out all right. <laughs> Two weeks later, we got a telegram that said, A sign leads in Greenwich Village Follies. Please send fudge cake. Did you send it? <laughs> I'll say, kid. <laughs> <laughs> two down and two to go. How about you, Rosemary? When were you and Priscilla called to the footlights? Well, Priscilla and I went to New York to visit Leota, and Fred Waring hired us to sing with his orchestra. And so here we are, four daughters. No, Rosemary, you mean four wives. Our family's growing so fast we have to consult Warner Brothers ourselves before we know exactly where we are. <laughs> <laughs> At least I know where I am, and four wives, I'm only the ghost of Mickey Borden. A very spirited performance, according to the critics. Well, nobody will miss me with four husbands and four children that go with four daughters now. Oh, we could never forget Mickey Borden. Yeah, what happens between, between you and Jeffrey Lynn and four wives? <laughs> <laughs> you can't expect her to be an old maid. The grapevine says the next picture is four mothers. How'd you like to have first call on uh, four grandmothers, saying about 50 years, Mr. DeMille? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had parts for four daughters right now in a certain picture called Northwest Mounted Police. Well, the four daughters always get their man. Look at me. By the way, what are you ha having here next week, Mr. DeMille? Next Monday night, we celebrate Christmas with one of the most unusual presentations of the entire year, the new Walt Disney production, Pinocchio. Early in the year, Pinocchio will receive its nationwide motion picture release. But next Monday night, you'll have your first opportunity to hear this successor to Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Pinocchio is a lad with a great capacity for getting into trouble. And his classic story has charmed grown-ups and children alike in every country in the world. So next Monday night, the Walt Disney feature Pinocchio will have its premiere at this microphone as our Christmas present to you. Well, that's going to be a swell show, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night, Good night. Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night. Don't all try to get through the stage door at once. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Walt Disney's Pinocchio. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Wallace Clark as father, Clara Blandick as Aunt Etta, Hal K. Dawson as Ben, Lou Merrill as Ernest, and Harry Humphreys as Doctor. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. Our Lux Radio Theater production of Four Daughters has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, the tissue-thin soap flakes used by smart housewives everywhere and by the great picture studios here in Hollywood to protect the million-dollar wardrobes you see on the screen. Your announcer has been Melville Roick. 
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. I can still hear those words echoing in my memory, for in a sense they changed my life. My name is Watson, Dr. Watson, and I was privileged to share the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. I will tell you how we first came across the sign of the four. I can see it still. Our rooms in Baker Street and Sherlock Holmes, and in such detail you will be there yourself. If I may collect my thoughts for just a moment. Bells of stagnation, Watson. Give me the most abstruse cryptogram or the most intricate analysis, and I'm in my own proper atmosphere. But I abhor the dull routine of existence. That's why I've chosen my own particular profession. Or rather, created it, for I'm the only one in the world. You're the only unofficial detective? The only unofficial consulting detective. The work itself is my highest reward. But, Watson, you've had some experience of my methods of work. I was never so struck by anything in my life. I even embodied the experience in a small brochure with the somewhat fantastic title of a Study in Scarlet. I read it. Honestly, I cannot congratulate you on it. Oh? Detection is or ought to be an exact science and should be treated in the same cold and unemotional manner. You have attempted to tinge it with romanticism which produces much the same effect as if you worked a love story into the fifth proposition of Euclid. But the romance was there. My practice has extended recently to the continent. I was consulted last week by Francois Lavilla, who, as you probably know, has come rather to the front lately in the French detective service. He's now translating my small works into French. Your work? <laughs> yes. I've been guilty of several monographs. Um, here, yeah, for example, is one upon the distinction between the ashes of the various tobaccos. In it, I enumerate 140 forms of cigar, cigarette, and pipe tobacco. 140? Here is my monograph upon the tracing of footsteps, with some remarks upon the uses of plaster of Paris as a preserver of impressions. <laughs> but I weary with my hobby. No, not at all. But you were speaking just now of observation and deduction. Surely the one, to some extent, implies the other. Oh, by no means. Observation shows me that you've been to the Wigmore Street Post Office this morning. Hmm? But deduction lets me know that when there you dispatched a telegram. Oh. Observation tells me that you have a little reddish mold adhering to your instep. Now, just opposite the Wigmore Street Post Office, they've taken up the pavement and thrown up some earth which lies in such a way that it's difficult to avoid treading in it on entering. The earth is of this peculiar reddish tint, which is found, as far as I know, nowhere else in the neighborhood. Bravo. But how did you deduce the telegram? Well, of course, I knew that you'd not written a letter since I sat opposite you all the morning. I see also in your open desk there that you have a sheet of stamps and a thick bundle of postcards. Well, what could you go into the post office for, then, but to send a wire? Eliminate all other factors, and the one which remains must be the truth. Dear me. Dear me. Dear me. See, Watson, how the yellow fog swirls down the street and drifts across the dun-colored houses? What could be more hopelessly prosaic and material? What's the use of having powers, Doctor, when one has no field upon which to exert them? Crime is commonplace, existence is commonplace, and no qualities save those which are commonplace had any function upon earth. 
Uh, what is it, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, a young lady for Mr. Holmes, sir. I have no appointments. Uh, yes, her card, sir. Oh, Miss Mary Morstan. No, I have no recollection of the name. Oh, very well. Ask her to step in, Mrs. Hudson. Very good, sir. Will you go in, please, Miss Morstan? Thank you. Pray come in, madam. It's good of you to see me, Mr. Holmes. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, Miss Watson? Will you take the basket chair? Oh, thank you. I've come to you, Mr. Holmes, because you once enabled my employer, Mrs. Cecil Forrester, to unravel a little domestic complication. She was much impressed by your kindness and skill. Mrs. Cecil Forrester... Oh, yes, I believe that I was of some slight service to her. Mr. Holmes, I can hardly imagine anything more strange than the situation in which I find myself. Then pray state your case. Briefly, the facts are these. My father was an officer in an Indian regiment who sent me home when I was quite a child. My mother was dead, and I had no relative in England. So I was placed in a comfortable establishment in Edinburgh. When I was 17 years of age... My father arrived in London on leave and directed me to come down at once. On reaching the Langham Hotel, I was informed that Captain Morstan had gone out the night before and had not returned. From that day to this, no word has ever been heard of my unfortunate father. Good the date? He disappeared on the 3rd of December, 1878. 1878. Nearly ten years ago. His luggage? Uh, there was nothing in it to suggest a clue. Had he any friends in London? Well, only one that we know of. Major Sholto of his own regiment, the 34th Bombay Infantry. Sholto. Major Sholto had retired some little time before my father came home. He lived at Upper Norwood. Upper Norwood? We communicated with him, of course... But he didn't even know that his brother officer was now in England. I see. I haven't yet described to you the most singular part. About six years ago, in 1882 to be exact, an advertisement appeared in the Times asking for the address of Miss Mary Morstan. 1882. I had just entered the family of Mrs. Cecil Forrester as governess, and by her advice, I published my address in the advertisement column. The same day, there arrived through the post a small cardboard box addressed to me. It contained a very large and lustrous pearl. Remarkable. No word of writing was enclosed. Every year since then, on the same date, there has come a box containing a similar pearl, without any clue as to the sender. You can see for yourselves. But they are very handsome. This is most interesting. Has anything else happened? Yes. This morning I received this letter. Oh, thank you. Uh, the envelope too, please. Of course. Thank you. Postmark London, SW, date July 7th. Hmm. Man's thumb mark on the corner. Probably postman. Best quality paper... Envelopes at sixpence a package. Particular man in his stationery. No address. So what does it say, though, Holmes? Be a preferred pillar from the left outside the Lyceum Theatre tonight at seven o'clock. If you are distrustful, bring two friends. You are a wronged woman and shall have justice. Do not bring police. If you do, all will be in vain. Signed, your unknown friend. What do you intend to do, Miss Morstan? That is exactly what I want to know, Mr. Holmes. We shall most certainly go. You and I and... Yes, Dr. Watson's the very man. Uh, We've worked together before. Oh, you're both very kind. If I'm here at six, will it do? You must not be later. No. Oh, there is one point, however. Is this handwriting the same as that upon the pearl box addresses? Uh, I have them all here. You're certainly a model client. Let's see now. Uh, these are disguised hands. But they're undoubtedly by the same person. Well, we shall look out for you at six. 
Au revoir, then. Au revoir. Good afternoon. I say, what a very attractive woman. My dear Watson, it's of the first importance not to allow your judgment to be biased by personal qualities. I assure you that the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money. Yes, but in this case... I never make exceptions. An exception disproves the rule. Well, I'm going out now. I have a few references to look up. I shall be back in an hour. Hello, my dear Watson. There's no great mystery in this matter. The facts appear to admit of only one explanation. But you haven't solved it already. I've just found on consulting the backfires of the Times that Major Shalter of Upper Norwood, late 34th Bombay Infantry, died on the 28th of April, 1882. I may be very obtuse, Holmes, but I fail to see what this suggests. No? You surprise me. Captain Morstan disappears. His only acquaintance in London is Major Shalter. Four years later, Shalter dies. Within a week of his death, Captain Morstan's daughter receives a valuable present, which is repeated from year to year, and now culminates in a letter which describes her as a wronged woman. Why should the presence begin immediately after Shalter's death, unless it is that Shalter's heir knows something of the mystery and desires to make compensation? Yes, but the letter speaks of giving her justice. What justice can she have? He... It's too much to suppose her father is still alive. Mm, there are certainly difficulties. But our expedition of tonight will solve them all. Ah, I think that's a four-wheeler. Uh, yes, and, and there's Miss Morstan inside. Are you all ready? I'm ready, Holmes. Shalter was a very particular friend of Papa's. They were in command of the convict guard on the Andaman Islands. The Andaman, then? Oh, by the way, Mr. Holmes, a curious paper was found in Papa's desk. I don't suppose it's of the slightest importance, but I thought you might care to see it. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Seems to be a plan for part of a large building. At one point, uh, here, you see, there's a small cross done in red ink. In the left-hand corner, there's a curious hieroglyphic, like four crosses in a line with their arms touching. And beside that, there's written in very rough and coarse characters, the sign of the four. Jonathan Small, Mohammed Singh, Abdullah Khan, Dost Akbar. Preserve it carefully, Miss Morstan. I shall. I suspect that this matter may turn out to be much deeper and more subtle than I at first supposed. Fancy, this is our man. Are you the party who have come with Miss Morstan? I am Miss Morstan, and these two gentlemen are my friends. Ah, I was to ask you to give me your word, Miss, that neither of your companions is a policeman. I give you my word. Thank you, Miss. If you'll follow me, the cab goes. Oh, I lost my bearings ages ago. Wandsworth Road. I don't know how you'll do it, Holmes. Stop for place. Cold Harbor Lane. Dear me, our quest doesn't appear to be taking us to very fashionable regions. You are coming this way, please. Your servant, Miss Morrison. Your servant, gentlemen. Pray step into my little sanctum. My name is Sadir Soto. 
These gentlemen... This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and this Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Oh, a doctor, eh? I'm a great sufferer, and I've long had suspicions as to my mitral valve. Had your father, Miss Morstan, refrained from throwing strain upon his heart, he might have been alive now. Well, sir, pray have some consideration for the lady. I knew in my heart that he was dead. Miss Morstan, I can give you every information... And what is more, I can do you justice. And I will. Whatever Brother Bartholomew may say. But let us have no outsiders, no police or officials. Whatever you may choose to say, we'll go no further. Thank you. Mr. Sholto, it's getting late and I should like the interview to be as short as possible. Well, at the best, it must take some time. For we shall certainly have to go to Norwood and see Brother Bartholomew. He's very angry with me for taking the course which has seemed right to me. Norwood, then wouldn't it be as well to start at once? Well, I must prepare you by laying the facts before you. Then pray do so, sir. Uh, my father, Major John Sholto, retired from the Indian Army some 11 years ago and came to Pondicherry Lodge, Upper Norwood, with a considerable sum of money, a large collection of valuable curiosities, and a staff of native servants. My twin brother Bartholomew and I were the only children. I very well remember the sensation which was caused by the disappearance of Captain Morstan. We read the details in the papers, but never for an instant did we suspect that my father had the whole secret hidden in his breast. We did know, however, that some mystery overhung our father. Early in 1882, my father received a letter from India which was a great shock to him. From that day, he sickened to his death. Towards the end of April, we were informed that he wished to make a last communication to us. Sons, the only one thing which weighs upon my mind at this supreme moment is my treatment of poor Marston's orphan, Mary. At least half of the treasure should have been hers. You, my sons, will give her a fair share of the Algora treasure. Father, when we were in India, Morstan and I, through a remarkable chain of circumstances, came into possession of a considerable treasure and brought it over to England. And on the night of Morstan's arrival, he came straight here to claim his share. We had a difference of opinion. Boston sprang out of his chair, and then he suddenly pressed his hand to his side and fell backwards. I found, to my horror, that he was dead. Good God. I was still oh stooping over him. When I saw my servant, well, child, in the doorway. Do not fear, Saab, he said. No one need know that you have killed him. I did not kill him, said I. Mel Chowder shook his head and smiled. I heard you quarreling, Saab, said he. And I heard... And I heard... And I heard... Enough to decide me. If my own servant couldn't believe my innocence, how could I hope to make it good before twelve foolish treason? In the jury box. And then? Well, then Childer and I disposed of the body that night. And within a few days, the London newspapers were full of the mysterious disappearance of Captain Boston. I... I... Father, what is it? I must tell you where the treasure is. It is hidden in... No, no! Keep him out! There, at the window! What is it? That face! That face! The sign of the fall! Can you describe the face of the window, Mr. Shalter? Uh, bearded, hairy, with cruel eyes, and an expression of concentrated evil. 
When we returned from the window, we found that my father's pulse had ceased to beat. In the morning, we found his window open, his cupboards and boxes rifled, and on his chest there was fixed a torn piece of paper with the words, The Sign of the Fall. Ah. Sign of the Fall. And the treasure? For weeks and months, my brother and I dug in every part of the garden. Oh, it was maddening to think that the hiding place was on my father's lips at the very moment he died. To this day, I have seen only one piece of it. That little chaplet over there. This? Yes, Doctor. Some of the pearls are missing from it. Well, after my father's death, I persuaded Bartholomew to let me find out Miss Norston's address and send her a detached pearl at intervals so that at least we might make part of the restitution my father had wished. That was a kindly thought, Mr. Shelter. Oh, not at all. We were your trustees. Well, that was the view I took of it. Though Bartholomew could not altogether see it in that light, so I left Pondicherry Lodge. And may I ask now, Mr. Shelter, exactly why you brought us here this evening? Because yesterday I learned that the treasure had been discovered. Discovered? It only remains for us to drive to Norwood and demand that Brother Bartholomew give us our share. I explained my views to him last night, so we should be expected, if not very welcome. Mr. Shotter, you have done well. We had best put the matter through without delay. Uh, very well, Mr. Holmes. A cab will be waiting outside. How did your brother find the treasure? Oh, Bartholomew was a clever fellow. He worked out the cubic space of the house. He found that the height of the building was 74 feet. But on adding together the heights of all the separate rooms and the spaces between, he could not bring the total to more than 70 feet. The four feet unaccounted for could only be at the top of the building. He knocked a hole in the ceiling of the highest room, and there, sure enough, the treasure chest stood in the center. He computes the value of the jewels at not less than half a million sterling. A million? Oh, no! Then Miss Morstan must be about the richest heiress in the country. I believe you're right, Watson. Well, let us be going. Perhaps we shall see for ourselves. Is I, McMurdo. Sure you know my lot by this time. Oh, I... That you, Mr. Sadir? But who are these others with you? Well, I told my brother last night that I should bring some friends. I'm very sorry, Mr. Sadir. I don't know any of your friends. Oh, yes, you do, McMurdo. Eh? Not... Not Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Uh, in you come, sir, in you come. You and your friends. Uh, very sorry, Mr. Thaddeus, but Master's orders are very strict. Oh, well, come along, then. We've wasted enough time. Uh, if you'll just follow me, ma'am and gents, I'll light the way up to the house with my lantern. I, I can't understand it. I distinctly told Bartholomew that we should be here. And yet there's no light in his window. I see the glint of a light in that little window beside the door. Ah, that's the housekeeper's room. That is where old Mrs. Burnstone sits. What's that? What? I was sure I could... Yes, listen. Huh? It's a woman crying. You're right, my Joe. Oh, Mr. Holmes, something seems to be amiss. Oh, will you come into the house with me, please? Certainly. I think I'm a little afraid. Nothing to fear, Miss Morstan, I assure you. Would you... Would you care to take my hand? I do... Oh, oh yes. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, better now? Much better. Miss Morstan, I feel I, I... I feel we should follow them. <laughs> Oh, no, no, Mrs. Burnson. What is the matter? Oh, oh Mr. Mr. Faddy, sir, there is something. There's something amiss with Mr. Bartholomew. My brother? He's locked himself in and won't answer me. 
All day I wanted to hear from him. And so an hour ago I went, went up and peeked through the keyhole. You must go up quickly. You must go up and look for yourself. Dear, oh, dear. Give me your lantern, McMurdo. And you stay here with Miss Morstan. Yes, sir. Mr. Sauter, Watson, come with me quickly. <laughs> And there's his room, the first door on the left. How can we see into it if there's no light in there? Well, there's, there's plenty of moonlight. Let's see. <gasps> Good heavens, something damnable. You take a look, Watson. Uh, he's, he's just sitting there with a horrible smile on his face. He looks inhuman. Oh, tell me. Uh, the door must come down. Right. Together, then. Uh, <coughs> Now, the sign of the four is one of the Sherlock Holmes stories by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. We're presenting it in three parts. You've just heard part one. My name is Norman Shelley. My friend Carlton Holt played Sherlock Holmes, and I was Dr. Watson. Michael Hardwick wrote the script for this BBC production from London. Of course, I look forward to the pleasure of your company again very soon for part two of the sign of the four. smile on his face. He looks inhuman. The door must come down. Right. Together, then. Uh, yes. Now, this time. So, was the sign of the four again to be the sign of death? A further mystery for my friend Sherlock Holmes. My name is Watson, Dr. Watson, and I was privileged to share the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. First, I will refresh your memory on the case so far, and then I will tell you what happened next in our investigation of the sign of the four. Concerning the disappearance of her father, Captain Morstan, ten years earlier. Each year since then, she had been receiving through the post a single large pearl. And now the anonymous sender had expressed a wish to meet her. We accompanied her to the rendezvous and heard from an eccentric fellow, Sir Dear Salto, how his father and Captain Morstan had gained a fabulous treasure which had disappeared after both their deaths. Now it had been rediscovered by his brother, Bartholomew Salto, whom we were to visit to claim Miss Morstan's rightful share. Arriving at Bartholomew's house, we found him sitting in a chair, a horrible smile on his face, and quite, quite dead. Oh, what on earth does it all mean, Mr. Holmes? It means murder. Murder? Ah, just as I expected. Look here, Watson. Stuck in the skin, just above his ear. A long, dark thorn. Be careful. He's poisoned. Poisoned? Oh! What a fantastic mystery, Holmes. On the contrary, my dear Watson. I only require a few missing links, and I shall have an entirely connected oh. case. Oh! Oh! Mr. Oh. Shorter, what is it? Oh, the, the treasure! It's gone! Are you sure? Oh! 
There is the hole in the ceiling. We lowered it through. I helped him to do it. I left him here last night, and I heard him lock the door. The treasure was locked in this room with him. What time did you leave? It was ten o'clock. Oh, dear me. Now the police will suspect me of having a hand in it. Take my advice, Mr. Sholto. Drive down to the police station and report the matter. The, the police station? Offer to assist them in every way. We shall wait here until you return. But I... Uh, please do as I say. It will be for the best. Oh, very well. I suppose you know best. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Now, Watson, we have a little while to ourselves. Let us make good use of it. Very well, Holmes. In the first place, let us consider how these folk came and how they went. Now, Sholto reckoned the door hasn't been opened since last night. Then how about the window? Mm -hmm. No, it's fastened on the inside. Solid framework. I'll just open it. Hmm. No water pipe there. Roof quite out of reach. Yet a man mounted by the window. Uh, how do you know? Here is the print of a foot in the mould upon the sill. And here is a circular muddy mark. See here again on the floor. And here again by the table. But that sort of footmark is something much more valuable to us. These are the impressions of a wooden stump. A wooden leg man. But there's been someone else here. Oh? Could you scale that wall yourself? Mm, let's see. Whew, certainly not. A good 60 feet from the ground, another foothold all the way. But supposing you had a friend up here who lowered you that good stout rope, which I see in the corner. Mm -hmm. Then, if you were an active man, you might swarm up wooden leg and all. Of course, you'd depart in the same fashion, and your ally would draw up the rope, shut the window, secure it from the inside, and depart in the way that he originally came. Yes, but look here, this, this accomplice, how did he get in? The door's locked, the window is inaccessible. Did he come down the chimney? The grace much too small. Well, then, how? My dear Watson, how often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. He didn't come through the door, the window, or the chimney. He couldn't have been concealed in the room as there is no concealment possible. Then where did he come from? Through the hole in the roof. Of course he did. Now, if you will have the kindness to hold the lamp for me, we shall now extend our researches to the secret room above where the treasure was found. Can you can you manage to get up? I, I fancy I can just get up. On this raft. Uh, good. Now I'm coming up too. As you take a minute. Oh, uh, there. Here you are, you see. Oh, there's a flat door leading out onto the roof. I fancy I can press it back. Yes. And the roof slopes at a gentle angle. Ah, this is how he got in, then. Now, let's see if we can find some other traces of this queer individual. It doesn't look as though this place has been entered for years. Ah. Oh. I did just... Ah, but even yeah. dust has its uses. Look at these footprints. As clear as we could wish. But these are the prints of a child's naked foot. Holmes, a child has done this horrid thing. Come along, Watson. There's nothing more to be learned here. Mm -hmm. If my memory hadn't failed me, I should have been able to forestall this. Now, where do I put my lens? Uh, here it is. Oh, thank you. Mm. Mm hmm. Yeah, we're certainly in luck. What does it know? Our naked-footed friend has had the misfortune to tread in this creosote that has leaked out of the cowboy there in the corner. You can see the outline of the edge of his small foot here. Well, then. Why? We've got him. That's all. I know a dog that would follow that scent to the world's end. Hello. Here come the accredited representatives of the law. <laughs> now, before they come, Watson, just put your hand here on this poor dead fellow's arm. Yes. And here on his leg. Yes. What do you feel? The muscles are as hard as a board. Quite so. They're in a state of extreme contraction, far exceeding the usual rigor mortis. 
Coupled with this distortion of the face, what conclusion would it suggest to your mind? Oh, death from some powerful vegetable alkaloid. Some strychnine-like substances which uh, produce tetanus. As you saw, I discovered a thorn which had been driven or shot with no great force into the scalp. You observed that the part struck was that which would be turned towards the hole in the ceiling if the man were erect in his chair. Uh, now, then, examine this thorn. You go first, Mr. Shorto. Hmm, it looks as though some gummy substance has dried on it. Quite so. But is that an English thorn? Oh, no. No, it certainly is not. Then with all these data, you should be able to draw some inference. Now, but here, the regular, so the auxiliary forces may beat on a tree. Here's a pretty business. The house seems to be as full as a rabbit warren. Ah, Mr. Jones. You must recollect me. Indeed I do. It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the theorist. <laughs> Remember you? I'll never forget the business get jewel case. Ah. But uh, what's all this? Bad business. Stern facts here. No room for theories. Lucky I happened to be out at Norwood on another case. What do you think the man died of? Oh, this is hardly a case for me to theorize. Uh, no, no. Still, we can't deny that you hit the nail on the head uh, sometimes. Uh, door locked, I understand. Jewels worth half a million missing. How was the window? Fastened. But there are footmarks on the sill. Well, if it was fastened, they could have had nothing to do with the matter. Oh. Oh, I see. Yeah. Ah, I've got it. These flashes come upon me at times. Uh, just step outside, Sergeant. Yes, sir. And you, please, Mr. Shoto. Oh, very well. I shall go mad. I'm sure I shall go mad. Inspector, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you know? He's assisting me. May he remain? Yes, yes, I suppose so. Uh, now, Mr. Holmes, Shoto was with his brother last night... The brother died in a fit, and Sholto walked off with the treasure. How's that? Upon which the dead man very considerately got up and locked the door on the inside. Mm, yes, yes, there's a flaw there. You're not in possession of all the facts, eh? Huh? This splinter of wood, which I had every reason to believe to be poisoned, was in the man's scalp, where you still see the mark. There, you see? Ah, yes. This card inscribed the sign of the four was on the table. How does all that fit into your theory? If this splinter's poisonous, that Dias may well have made murderous use of it. The card is some um, hocus pocus, blind as like as not. I see. The only question is. Oh, there is a question then. The question is, how did he get out? Ah, of course. Here's a hole in the roof. You see, facts are better than theories after all. There's a trap door communicating with the roof, and it's partly open. I opened it. You? Oh, well, uh, no matter. It shows how our gentleman got away. Sergeant? Yes, sir? Ask Mr. Sholto to step this way. Very good, sir. This way, sir, if you please. Mr. Thaddeer Shoto? Yes. It's my duty to inform you that anything which you say may be used against you. I arrest you in the Queen's name as being concerned in the death of your brother. Oh, then I... Didn't I tell you what they would say? Don't trouble yourself, Mr. Shoto. I think I can engage to clear you of this charge. Oh, you can, Mr. Holmes. Don't promise too much, Mr. Theorist. You may find it a harder matter than you think. Not only will I clear him, Mr. Jones, but I'll make you a free present of the name and description of one of the two people who were in this room last night. His name, I have every reason to believe, is Jonathan Small. He's small and active, with his right leg off, and wearing a wooden stump which is worn away on the inner side. He's been a convict. <laughs> As for the other man... Ah, the other man. He is a, a rather curious person. I hope before very long to be able to introduce you to the pair of them. Oh, a word with you, Watson, please. Yes, yeah, coming, Holmes. Watson, you must escort Miss Morstan home. Mm -hmm. Oh, delighted. Then I want you to go to number three, Pinchin Lane. Yes. Down near the water's edge at Lambeth. Mm -hmm. The third house on the right-hand side is a bird stuffer's. Sherman is the name. Sherman, yes. Knock old Sherman up and tell him with my compliments that I want Toby at once. You'll bring Toby back in the cab with you. 
Tobit? <laughs> a queer mongrel with the most amazing power of scent. I'd rather have Toby's help than that of the whole detective force of London. a dog. Mr. Sherlock Holmes is wanted. He wanted a dog of yours. Ah, that will be Toby. Yes, yes. Toby was then. Toby lives at number seven on the left here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, Mr. Sherman, I'm much obliged. <laughs> Come on, Toby. That's a good fellow. <laughs> You have him then, Watson. Leave the dog here and come up. Yes, I'd better tie him to this banister, I suppose. Oh, boy. <laughs> Unprepossessing Bruce, isn't he? <laughs> ah, Toby and I understand one another. <laughs> oh, Sergeant, lend me your bullseye, please. Certainly, sir. Thank you. Now well, then, I must kick off my boots and socks. <clears throat> oh, uh, Watson. Yeah? Just carry them for me, will you, please? Where to, Holmes? Um... I'm going to do a little climbing. Oh, yes, and I must uh, dip my handkerchief into this creosote. There. That'll do. Now, come up through the hole in the ceiling with me for a moment. Now, <coughs> uh, 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 do you observe anything noteworthy about these footmarks? Well, only that they belong to a child or a small woman. Apart from the size, what's the chief difference? Well, your toes are all crammed together. The other print has each toe distinctly separated. That is the point. Now, would you kindly step over to that roof window and smell the edge of the woodwork? I shall stay over here, as I have this handkerchief in my hand. Yes. By Jove, yes, this is a strong, tarry smell. That's where he put his foot in getting out. If you can trace him, I should think Toby will have no difficulty. Thank you. <laughs> now, while I get out onto the roof, you run downstairs and wait for Toby in the garden below. Very well, Holmes. That you, Watson? Yes, Holmes. Have you got the dogs? Well, I let him loose. This water fight feels pretty fun. Yeah, go. No, 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 careful, careful Holmes. Oh, do be careful. Oh, well done. <laughs> My boots and stockings, if you please. There you are. Thank you. Oh, it, was, uh, it was easy to follow his course across the roof. No. I tiles were, were loosened the whole way. And, oh, yes. In his hurry, he, he dropped this. Some sort of a pouch made out of beads. Yes, sir. Anything inside? Ah, some more of those thorns. Mm. They're hellish things. Now, oh, Watson, will your leg stand a six-mile trudge? Certainly. Then here you are, doggy. Oh, oh, oh. What? Good old Toby. Smell it, Toby. Smell it. What's that you're showing you, Holmes? The handkerchief with the creosote on it. <laughs> and watch him go. What? What? Come on, Watson. He's going to set us a stiff face. I think we think we can allow ourselves a breather. Huh? Oh, we've had no, no very heavy rain since yesterday. They had 28 hours past, but their scent will still lie upon the road. Holmes, how would you describe the wooden leg man with such confidence? The simplicity itself. 
two officers who were in command of the convict guard learn an important secret as to bury treasure. A map drawn for them by an Englishman named Jonathan Small. Jonathan Small? You remember we saw the name on the chart Miss Morstan showed us. Oh, that's right, yes. Small had signed it on behalf of himself and his associates. The sign of the four, as he somewhat dramatically called it. Ah, yes. Well, aided by this chart, the officers, or one of them, gets the treasure and brings it to England. Now then, why didn't Jonathan Small get the treasure himself? The answer is obvious. Oh? Uh, is it? You haven't a pistol with you, have you? No, I have my stick. Hmm. I shall leave Jonathan to you, but if the other turns nasty, I shall shoot him dead. Come along now. Toby's anxious to be getting off. Well, he's baffled again. There's nothing but the river from here. Yes, but out of luck. They've taken to a boat. Stone it? No. These fellows are sharper than I expected. Daddy! Daddy! Oh, what, Mom? You come back to me, what? Come back to me, young man. If you can't come home and find him like that, he let us hear about it. Oh, dear little chap. A fine child, Mrs. Smith. Lord bless you, sir, he is that. Here, how do you know my name? The, the signboard over your door. Mordecai Smith. Oh, that. Uh, away, is he? Uh, I wanted to speak to Mr. Smith. Well, he's been away since yesterday morning, sir. But if it was about a boat, sir, maybe I could serve as well. Uh, I see from the board that he has a steam launch. Uh, that's what I'd like to have. Why, bless you, sir. It's in the steam launch that is gone. That's what puzzles me. I know the rate more cool and know them would take it to about Woolwich and back. He might have bought some at a wharf downriver. Well, he might, sir, but it weren't his way. Many a time I've heard them go on about the prices they charge for a few odd bags. Besides, I don't like that wooden legged man with his ugly face and outlandish talk. Uh, a wooden legged man? I roused him up yesterday night, I did. Oh, then I'm unlucky, Mrs. Smith. Oh. I wanted a steam launch, and I've heard good reports of the. Um... Oh. Let me see, what is her name? The Aurora, sir. Ah, oh, yes, of course it is. Uh, she's not an old green launch for the yellow line, uh, very broad on the beam. No, indeed. She's as trim a little thing as any on the river, black with two red streets. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, I, I hope you'll soon hear from Mr. Smith. I'm going down the river. If I should see anything of the Aurora, I shall let him know that you're uneasy. Uh, a black funnel, you say? Uh, no, sir. Black with a white band. Oh, oh of course, yes. Uh, it was the sides which were black. Uh, well, uh, good morning, Mrs. Smith. Good morning, sir. Clever. <laughs> the main thing with people of that sort is never to let them think their information can be of the slightest importance to you. If you do, they'll instantly shut up like an oyster. Well, our course seems pretty clear now. What would you do, then? Well, I would engage a launch and go down the river on the track of the Aurora. My dear fellow, it would be a colossal task. She may have touched at any wharf on either side of the stream between here and Greenwich. Destroy the police, then. Worse and worse. What are we to do, then? I want you to take a handsome and return to her to his owner with my compliments. Then drive home, have some breakfast, and get an hour's sleep. It's quite on the cards that we may be afoot tonight again. Very well. I must send a wire. To whom? You remember the Baker Street Irregulars whom I employed in our study in Scarlet Gate? Oh, those little ragamuffins. This is just where they might be invaluable. The wire will be to my dirty little Lieutenant Wiggins. I expect he and his gang will be with us before I have time to finish my breakfast. Future, they can report to you, Wiggins, and you to me. I cannot have the house invaded in this way. Honorable yeah, 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 Stay yeah. here, I'm warning you. However, it's just as well that you should all hear the instructions. Now then, I want to find the whereabouts of a steam launch called the Aurora. Black with two red streaks. Funnel, black with a white band. Owner, Mordecai Smith. She's downriver somewhere. Is that clear? Yes, Governor. The old scale of pay and a guinea to the boy who finds the boat. Oh, 
Here's a day in advance. Now, off you go. Oh, thank you, Governor. Come on, you lot all out. Hey, hey, hey. Come on, all of you. Keep on. Uh, 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 horrible rebel, all right. <laughs> if the launch is above water, they'll find her. In the meanwhile, we can do nothing. You going to bed, Holmes? No, I'm not tired. I never remember feeling tired by work, though idleness exhausts me completely. Now I'm going to think over this queer business to which our fair client has introduced us. Wooden-legged men are not so common, but I should think the other men must be absolutely unique. Oh, that other man again. Diminutive footmarks, toes never fettered by boots, naked feet, great agility, small poisoned darts. Now, what do you make of all this? Perhaps he's one of those Indians who are associated with Jonathan Small. Oh, hardly that. Some Indians are small men, but none could have left such marks as that. Now, let's consult the gazetteer. Now, then, what have we here? And ten and arrivals too far. The Andes, no? Uh, Andaman Islands, situated 340 miles to the north of Sumatra and the Bay of Bengal. Ah, uh, <clears throat> moist climate, coral reef sharks, convict barracks. Ah. The aborigines of the Andaman Islands may perhaps claim the distinction of being the smallest race upon this earth. The average height is rather below four feet. They are fierce, morose, and intractable people who are capable of forming most devoted friendships. Now then, listen to this. Their feet and hands are remarkably small. They've always been a terror to shipwrecked crews, braining the survivors with their stone-headed clubs or shooting them with their poisoned dart. Oh, amiable fellow. Watson, you look done. Uh, Why not lie down there on the sofa and see if I can put you to sleep? Uh, oh, well, um, <laughs> I don't mind a bit I could do with a few wigs. Oh. <laughs> Oh, oh. Oh, my dear Watson. I, I hope you slept soundly. Uh, I was afraid our talk would wake you. Talk? Uh, I heard nothing. Oh, Wiggins has just been up to report. He says no trace can be found of the launch. Look, can I do anything? I'm, I'm perfectly fresh now. We can only wait. If we go ourselves, the message might come in our absence, and that would cause delay. Yes, but... Well, you can do what you will, Watson. But I must remain on guard. Oh, then I shall... Uh... Run over to Camberwell and call on Mrs. Cecil Forrester. She uh, asked me to yesterday. On Mrs. Cecil Forrester? I see. Uh, well, of course, on uh, Miss Morstan, too. Ah. Uh, they were anxious to hear what's happened. I understand. I wouldn't tell them too much, though. Women are never able to be entirely trusted. Not the best of them. What's the truth of sentiment, Holmes? Don't be too late back, my dear Watson. I expect to hear something definite before the night, sir. The Sign of the Four was one of the Sherlock Holmes stories by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. We're presenting it in three parts, and you have just been listening to part two. My name is Norman Shelley. My friend Carlton Hobbs played the part of Sherlock Holmes, and I was Dr. Watson. Michael Hardwick wrote the script for this BBC production from London. And, of course, I look forward to the pleasure of your company again very soon for the third and last part of The Sign of the Fall. The BBC, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Like 
You ready to part? He raises his hand. I'm ready, Holmes. Action and danger were a frequent climax to the investigations of Sherlock Holmes. My name is Watson, Dr. Watson, and it was my privilege to share the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. First, let me refresh your memory concerning the case so far, and then I will tell you what happened in the end of The Sign of the Four. Sherlock Holmes and I were upon the track of Jonathan Small, the one-legged ex-convict responsible for the theft of the Agra treasure, which we were endeavouring to recover on behalf of our charming young client, Miss Mary Morstan. The scent had led us to the River Thames, upon which it seemed the thief and his mysterious accomplice were preparing to escape in the steam launch Aurora. After instructing his young Baker Street Irregulars to find where this vessel at present lay, Holmes restlessly awaited the news that would lead to the resumption of the chase. Ah, oh, here I am, Holmes. Anything happened? Nothing yet, Watson. You're just in time to take over watch, though. I say, what's the idea of the sailor outfit? I'm off down the river, Watson. I've been turning it over in my mind, and I can see only one way out of it. Well, surely I can come with you, then. No. You will be much more useful if you remain here as my representative. Some message may come early in the morning. I want you to open all notes and telegrams and act on your own judgment. Can I rely on you? Most well, certainly. Well, get some sleep while you can. If we're in luck, you may have news of some sort before I get back. Oh, well, I hope. I should be going with you, but best luck, you. Here's your breakfast. Dr. Watson. Ah, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, and uh, Mr. Anthony Jones is here to see you, sir. Ah, come in, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Dr. Watson. Mr. Sherlock Holmes is out, I understand. Yes, he's been out all night, and I can't be sure when he'll be back. Take that chair and join me in a cup of coffee. I don't mind if I do. Ah, how's that? There you are. Now, may I know what brings you here so early? Well, I got a wire from Mr. Holmes this morning. There he is. What does he say? Uh, go to Baker Street at once. If I have not returned, wait for me. Uh-huh. I am close on the track of the Shelto gang. You can come with us if you want to be in at the finish. Uh-huh. Sent from Poplar. He definitely picked up the scent again. Ah, then he's been on a false chase too, has he? Well, even the best of us are thrown off course sometimes. This may prove to be a false alarm, you understand. But it's my duty as an officer of the law to allow no chance to slip. Isn't that someone come to the door? Ah, uh, perhaps it's Mr. Holmes. I say, who are you, my man? What do you mean, coming in like... Is Mr. Sherlock Holmes here? No, but I'm acting for him. If you have a message for him, you can tell it to me. Uh, it was to himself I was to tell it. I tell you, I am acting for him. Uh, uh, was it about Mordecai Smith's boat? Yes. I knows well where it is, and I knows where the men he's after are, and I knows where the treasure is. Look here, my man. It I... was to Mr. Sherlock Holmes I was to tell it. Well, then you must wait for him. No, no. No, I'm going to lose our whole day to please no one. Wait no. for a bit, my huh? friend. You have important information, and you're staying here whether you like it or not. Oh, all right. I think you might offer me some coffee, though. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I thought my disguise was pretty good, but I hardly expected it would stand that test. <laughs> ah, you rogue. <laughs> You'd have made a rare actor. Those weak legs of yours would be worth, well, ten pounds a week on the stage. But I thought I knew the glint of your eye, though. Oh, did you, Jones? Well, it's nice to get these whiskers and things off for a while. I've been working in that get-up all day. You see, a good many of the criminal classes begin to know me, especially since our friend Watson here took to publishing some of my cases. So I can only go on the warpath under some simple disguise like this. You got my wire, Jim? Well, that was what brought me here. Uh, here's a coffee, Holmes. Ah, thank you. And how's your case, prospered Inspector? I had to release two of my prisoners, and there's no evidence against the other two. Never mind. We shall give you two others in the place of them. 
But you must put yourself under my orders. Oh, now, look here. You are welcome to all the official credit, but you must act on the lines that I point out. I shall want a fast police boat to be at the Westminster stairs at 7 o'clock this evening. Well, that's easy, man. It should. Then I shall want two good men in case of resistance. There'll be two or three in the boat. Uh, what else? When we secure the men, we shall get the pleasure. I think it'll be a pleasure to my friend here to take the box round to the young lady to whom half of it rightfully belongs. Let her be the first to open it. Eh, Watson? It would be a great pleasure to me, Holmes. Rather an irregular proceeding. However, the whole thing is irregular. I suppose we must wink at it. Exactly. Uh, the treasure must be handed over to the authorities afterwards, until after the official investigation. Certainly. Uh, is there anything else? Only that I insist upon your dining with us before we set out. Oh, well... I have oysters and a brace of grass with something a little choice in white wines. Watson, you never yet recognized my merits as a husband. <laughs> oh, by the way, Watson... Yes, Holmes. You'd best clean that old service revolver of yours. It's well to be prepared. Looking craft. Is there anything to mark her as a police boat? Well, yes, uh, that green lamp yeah. on the side. Then take it off. Oh. All right. You can tell them to cast off now. Right. Cast off. Yes, sir. Uh, where to? To the tower. Tell them to stop opposite Jacobson's yard. Opposite Jacobson's yard. All right, sir. Splendid craft. We ought to be able to catch anything. If that river steamer well behind us. There aren't many launches to beat this, I can tell you. So she'll need to be smart to catch the Aurora. She has a name for being a clipper. Now, I'll tell you how the land lies. Yes? How would Small conceal the launch until he knew how the police inquiries were shaping? If I were in his shoes, I might hand her over to some boat preparer with directions to make a trifling change in her. She would then be removed to his shed or yard, and so be effectually concealed, while at the same time she'd be available again at a few hours' notice. Yeah, that seems logical enough. At Jacobson's yard, I learned that the Aurora had been handed over to them by a wooden-legged man with some trivial directions as to our rudder. At that moment, who should come down but Mordecai Smith, the missing owner? But how did you recognize him? Oh, he bellowed out his name and the name of his launch. I want it tonight, said he, at eight o'clock sharp, for I have two gentlemen who won't be kept waiting. I was lucky enough to pick up one of my boys on the way, so I stationed him as a sentry over the launch. He's to stand at the water's edge and wave his handkerchief to us when they start. I should have had a body of police in Jacobson Yard and arrest them when they came down. Which would have been never. Eh? This man Small is a pretty shrewd fellow. If anything made him suspicious, he'd lie snug for another week. If you might have stuck to Mordecai Smith's homes, he would have led you to their hiding place. I think it's a hundred to one against Smith knowing where they live. Why should he ask questions? Well, there's Jacobson's Yard anyway. Where are those masks are standing up? Ah, yes, I see. Ah, yes. Yes, I can see my sentry through these night glasses. There's no sign of a handkerchief yet. Suppose we go downstream a short way and lie in wait for them. It's ten to one that they'll go downstream, but we can't be certain. It'll be a clear night and plenty of moon. Now we must stay where we are. Will you give instructions, please? Very well, as you say. Look, Watson. See how the folks swarm over the under and the gaslight? Yes, they're coming from work in the yard. <laughs> Just a looking rascal. But, but do I see a handkerchief? There, surely. Surely there is a white flutter over yonder. Yes, yes, I can see it plainly. Yeah, and there's the aurora. I'm going like the devil. Full speed ahead, engineers. Sneak out to that launch for the yellow light. I hope I shall never forgive myself if she proves to have the heels of us. She's very fast, the toes. I doubt we should catch her. We must catch her. Keep it on, Stelford. Make her do all she can. If we burn the boat, we must have them.
Jonathan Small, I fancy. Ah, damn this mud. Oh, it's unquietly. Give me that. Well, Jonathan Small, I'm sorry that it's come to this. And so am I, Mr. Holmes. But I don't believe I can swing to the job. I give you my word, I never raised a finger against Mr. Sholto. It was that little Alan Tonga who shot one of his darts into him. You are under the charge of Inspector Ethel Ned Jones of Scotland Yard. He's going to bring you up to my rooms, and I shall ask you for a true account of the matter. If you make a keen breast of it, I may be of use to you. No, I shall never hear. I think I can prove that the poison act so quick that the man was dead before ever you reached the room. Now you are, sir. Now you seem to know as much as if he'd been there. <laughs> He didn't take that alive, but uh, it was a choice. Oh, well, it ends up. We'll be at Box Hall Beach, presently. Uh, Dr. Watson. Yes, Mr. Zegger? I shall land you with the treasure box. It's most irregular, but an agreement's an agreement. And you shall take it round to the young lady yourself. Uh -huh. uh, you, where's the key? At the bottom of the river. Ah, we had work enough already through you. Well, Doctor, Miss Morrison might at least uh, see a box. Bring it to the Baker Street as soon as you can. Greatest pleasure. Watson, it's you. Yes, Miss Morton. I thought I heard a cab drive up. Hmm? What news have you brought me? I brought something better than news. Oh? I've brought you a fortune. Is that the Agra treasure? The great Agra treasure. Half of it is yours and half is Daniel Schultz's. You are a couple of hundred thousand each. There will be few young ladies in England richer than you. If I have it, I owe it to you. <laughs> no, no, it, 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 it's my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, whom you respect. When do you sit down? Don't know yet, beside me, yes. and tell you all about uh, it. I, no, no, I, I have to get down to Baker Street with it as quickly as I can. I, I, I just want you to bring it so that you should be the first to see it. Oh, Where is the key? It's, uh, it's in the sled. Um, the police will soon have it open. No? You don't try to see into it now, Dr. Watson. Well, I don't really think that be... Oh, but you can't see a woman's curiosity in this way. Uh, <laughs> oh, go on. I insist. Uh, um, the police might... Oh, as part owner of the content. I, uh... Would you rather? Of course. Now, what could we use? Well, uh, I guess, uh, I think that's the problem. Well, you have my permission, Doctor. Now then, get me into it under the heart. Good. Now, do it as a lever. Bravo. Well done. And now, you must lift the lid. Very well. Well, oh, I feel quite nervous. <laughs> it's empty. Oh, thank God. Why did you say that? Because it puts you within my reach. Because I love you, Mary. 
This truly is a man, I do. Because this treasure, these riches, seal my lips. Now that they're gone, I can tell you how I love it. That's why I said, thank God. Then I say, thank God too, George. Whoever has lost the treasure this night, I know that I have gained one. Did you say, Dr. Watson? Yes, uh, Inspector. This is small. <laughs> yes. No only man has any right to it, say three men who are in the Andaman convict barracks and myself. And I know they'd have me do just what I done, rather than let it go to Kipper, Kim, or Shoto, or Morrison. Can't ask that bag. Where is it? You'll find the treasure where the key is, and where little Tonga is. In the river. You ought to see that small. Why didn't you throw the box in as well? The man that was clever enough to hunt me down is clever enough to pick an iron box from the bottom of a river. Now, they're trying to pick up what's scattered over five miles or so may be a harder job. This is a very serious matter, Small. If you'd had justice, it's any hindering us like this. Well, let's talk about justice. Look how I earned that treasure. Twenty long years in a fever ridden swamp. Chained up all night. Bullied by every native guard who'd like to take it out of a white man. You forget that we know nothing of all this. Until we told your story, we cannot tell how far justice may originally have been on your side. Well, that's true, Mr. Holmes. Now, you've been very fair-spoken to me. Uh, if you want to hear my story, I'd know which to hold it back, if you please. Uh, keep it short. I shall want you to pull when we get to the station. Very well. Well, it begins when I was 18, and so going in India with the third box. A crocodile in the Ganges nipped off my right leg. Ah, uh, with this piece of timber strapped in his stump, I was useless for anything active. Ah, uh, but lucky for me, I got a good job as overseer on an Indico plantation. And I was all right till the mutiny. I got into Agra just before the siege closed it up. Well, to cut a long story short. That's right. Get on with it. I joined up with three Indians. An angel Abdullah Khan, Mohammed Singh, and Dost Akbar. In a bit of a plot to get some treasure off a refugee merchant. Mind, that wasn't none of my idea. No, of course not. They couldn't work it without me, and they put it to me at the point of a knife. Join them, or he kept them in. <laughs> well, I killed the merchant. I never touched him, mind. I hid the body in the fort. Well, there was no use dividing the treasure while we were under siege, so he had that too. I drew four plans of where it was, and we put the sign of the four of us at the bottom and swore that we should each always act for all. Leave out the fine sentiments. Well, the mutiny was broken, and we thought we were safe. But the merchant's body was found, and so now we were suspected. We were brought to trial. We all got penal servitude for life. Wasn't the treasure found then? Not a word of it came out of the trial. And there we were, shipped off to the Andamans to serve our time and work a fortune we couldn't touch. Hmm. Well, after a few years, I was put to dispensing for the surgeon. Had it in a little hut next to his quarters. Now, some of the officers used to come and play cards with him in the evenings. There was Major Shoto and Captain Morrison and some others. Well, I used to over him talking, and it pretty soon struck me that Major Shoto was falling in for some pretty big losses. Yep. The one evening I heard him say, it's all up, Morrison. I'm a ruined man. So when the captain had walked off his quarters, I nipped out and asked the Major if I could have his advice. What about, says he? Oh, well, sir, I said, I happen to know where half a million in hidden treasure lies. And I thought if I told the proper authorities, it might get my sentence shortened for me. Get down with it. I could see him think it over like. Well, the upshot of it is that he comes back next day with Captain Morstan and a little, what you might call, unofficial proposition. You don't mean to say it, mind. I didn't betray my friends. We held a little meeting, the three Indians and the two officers and me, and it was decided Major Sholto would go to Agra and recover the treasure. Then he sent a small yacht provisioned for a voyage. The Indians and I would get away in it, Captain Morrison would apply for leave to go to Agra, and we'd all meet there for a final share out of the treasure. Uh, I'll say this way, you're small, if this is a year on your spinning, I've never heard the like of it before. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? I think you were hearing the truth. Ah, and you can guess what I'm next. That villain showed all went off to Agra, but he never came back. No yacht to fetch us, nothing. Well, what else did you expect? An officer's word, sir. Where four convicts could keep faith with each other, then you might have thought that, oh, let's hear the rest of it. Well, from that day, I lived only to escape and track down Shoto. Ah, but it was weary years before my time came. One day, a little Andaman Islander was picked up in the woods, sick nearly to death with fever. He was venomous as a young snake. 
But as I nursed him round, he took quite a fancy to me. Is this Tonga? That's right, sir. He was a fine boatman, and he owned a big roomy canoe. He didn't need much talking into getting me away from that place. Now we got to Singapore. From there, we wandered about the world until we reached England three or four years ago. I earned our living showing Tonga off at fairs as a cannibal. He used to eat raw meat and do a war dance. I was staunch and true with little Tonga. Don't say enough about him. Give back the shelter. Ah, it wasn't long before I found where he lived. But I was too late. We went to his place and looked through the window of his room. He was lying in bed with his sons at either side of him. Even as we watched him, he died. Well, I got into the room that night. I searched these papers, but there wasn't a line about where the treasure might be. And before I left, I thought of my poor Indian friends still back there in the Andamans. I wanted to leave our mark behind. So I scrolled down the side of the four of us on a piece of paper, and I pinned it on him. Oh, that explains that then, Yeah. Pray continue, Small. Well, after a while, I heard that the treasure had been found at the top of Pondy Chili Lodge. Well, I couldn't hope to get up there, not with this leg. So I brought Tonga with me, with a long rope wound down his waist. He could climb like a cat. But as ill luck would have it, our tongue and shoulder was still in the room when Tonga got in. The little devil killed him with his blowpipe. Thought he'd done something very clever until I, I gave it to him with the rope's end. Anyway, there was nothing else to do but lower the jewels down, leave the sign of the floor on the table, and get away as quick as we could. And there you are, gentlemen. I told it all. And every word of the truth, I swear. A kitten wound up to an extremely interesting case. There's nothing at all new to me in the latter part. Hmm? Except that you brought your own work. That I didn't know. By the way, I had hoped that Tonga had lost all his bath, yet he managed to shoot one at us in the boat. I have it here. I didn't see you find that, Holmes. You'll examine your hat when you have a moment, my dear Watson. <laughs> I managed to pick it out without your notice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, sir, he did lose them all, except the one he had in the blowpipe ready, did you see? Ah, of course. <laughs> well, Mr. Holmes, uh, you're a man to be human, but uh, duty is duty. I feel no reason we have our story till here safe under lock and key. All right. I shall make any trouble. Of course, you'll both be wanted at the trial. Good night, dear. Good night, gentlemen, both. Good, Good night. night. <sighs> well, Holmes. There's the end of our little drama. Thank you, Watson. Mm. Well, good help. And to you. I, uh, I'm afraid it may be the last chance I shall have of studying your methods, Holmes. Oh? Why, sir? Miss Morstan has done me the honor to accept me as the prospective husband. I shared as much. I really can congratulate you. Any <laughs> reason to be dissatisfied with my choice? Oh, not at all. I think she's one of the most charming young ladies I've ever met. But love is an emotional thing. And whatever is emotional is opposed to that true, cold reason which I place above all things. I shall never marry myself, lest I bias my judgment. <laughs> I trust my judgment may survive the audio. You're uh, wary, Holmes. Yes. The reaction is already upon me. I shall be as limp as a rag for a week. Strange how terms of what in another man I should call laziness alternate with your fits of splendid energy and vigor. Yes. Well, I need the makings of a very fond loafer. And also a pretty surprise, Stories of Sherlock Holmes, written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And now you know how it ended. My name, my, my real name, is Norman Shelley. My friend, Carlton Hobbs, played Sherlock Holmes, and I was Dr. Watson. Wedding bells are ringing for me now, it seems. Michael Hardwick wrote the script for this BBC production from London. And need I say, I look forward to the pleasure of your company again, and soon for more of the adventures of Sherlock Holmes.
Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Francho Tone and Ann Baxter in Five Graves to Cairo with Otto Preminger, J. Carol Nash, and Fortunio Bonanova. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. All the world loves a lover, and all the world loves a mystery. Tonight we make everybody doubly happy by combining romance and mystery in Five Graves to Cairo. And we have the same stars who made millions of hearts skip a beat with their adventures in that Paramount picture. Francho Tone and Ann Baxter. This week we borrowed Francho from the cast of the new Paramount hit, True to Life. The studio grapevine has a way of picking up advanced tips on promising pictures. And my spies all reported that producer Charles Brackett and director Billy Wilder had created a triumph of suspense in Five Graves to to Cairo. So we had our bid in for the radio rights before the shooting had even finished. The setting of the play is the Egyptian desert at the high tide of the German advance. And the people are a British soldier a young French girl, and a rather well-known Nazi general, Marshal Erwin Rommel. We invite you to join our hero in matching wits with the Marshal and turn your ingenuity on the strange secret of the five graves in the African sand. As a prime example of American ingenuity, I point to an Air Force sergeant in New Guinea who has sent his mother in Kentucky a snapshot showing his tent with a box of Lux Flakes in a prominent position. He's made a mattress by stuffing a sheet with grass, built a table and chair, and rigged up a washing machine out of a discarded oil drum. And he writes that with Lux Flakes, this unique washing machine beats washing on a board by, quote, two gallons of sweat, unquote. Our thanks to his mother for this late communique from New Guinea. We turn now to North Africa as the curtain rises on the first act of Five Graves to Cairo. Starring Francho Tone as Corporal Bramble and Anne Baxter as Moosh, with Otto Preminger as Marshal Rommel, J. Carol Nash as Farid, and Fortunio Bonanova as General Sebastiano. <laughs> in June of 1942, the British Eighth Army was defeated in Egypt. Tobruk had fallen. The victorious Rommel and his Africa Corps had mounted an offensive that was pounding the British back step by step toward Cairo and the Suez Canal. On the desert, between the British and the German lines, stood the town of Sidi Halfaya, ablaze with heat, which rose in waves from the dead street and the dead buildings. No creature moved, no sound was heard. And then, far across the desert, a figure wove its way through the scorching sand. His uniform hung in tatters from his bruised and bloody body, and yet he stumbled on, falling, crawling on his hands and knees. From a window in the Empress of Britain Hotel, the native proprietor watched the figure approach the town, watched with wondering, fearful eyes. Boosh! Boosh, look! What is it? He is coming here, a British soldier. Divisional headquarters. I said, is this divisional headquarters? Uh, no, no, this is hotel, sir. We... I wish to speak to the commanding officer quickly, please. But, but, but the British have gone, sir. What's the matter with him, Farid? Fever, sunstroke. Uh, listen, the British Corporal have... John Bramble reporting, sir. Royal Tank Regiment stationed at Tobruk. You've been in Tobruk, sir? Hottest blister on the devil's heel. We joined operations last night near Bir Hakim. Looked like a frolic, sir. We thought we had those German tanks on the run. Then... The 88s. Listen, please. Very clever, this blasted Herr Rummel. 30 shells a minute. Oh, yes, sir. We pulled out all right. The rest of the men in the tank were killed. Ever see a five-passenger hearse, sir, doing the Lambeth Walk? Listen, please. The British are not here Stevens anymore. Dead. They left. Fitch, dead. Yes, dead. yes, sir, but no English here, O'Connor sir. Connor dead. All of them driving themselves to their funeral. 
That's service. Moosh, Moosh, bring water and salt. He has got to get out of here. Is there transportation back to Tobruk? No, sir, there is no more Tobruk, sir. They've taken Tobruk. Listen, this is the Hotel Empress of Britain in City Alfaya. Oh. You must leave. The Germans are on their way here now. Uh, hello, miss. Women at headquarters now? Sir, sir, please. Where's the commanding officer? I was speaking with the commanding officer. No, sir, I must please. rejoin my outfit. Abbott, step in. Mister, listen. The Germans. Six. They are here. Oh, you get. Oh, Connor, I've got to find them. I... Oh. Oh, mister, get up, get up. He's unconscious. Mister, wake up. Moosh, what can we do? I will put him behind the desk. I wouldn't do that, Farry. No, but where else can I put him? Right where he is, in the middle of the floor. Oh, no, no, they'll see him. They'll shoot him. I will drag him behind the desk. Help me, please. He is heavy. I will not help. I must hide him. There. Ah, I would not want them to shoot him. Barry, you fool. They will find him and then they will shoot you too. Shoot me? Shoot me? No. Oh, no, they... That's going to the hotel. Yeah. Oh, oh, salam alaykum. Good afternoon. Perhaps we're a little late for tea. Tea? Well, well you see, see, the cook... Uh... Is this a tea time? Huh? Oh, please, sir. The Empress of Britain. Oh, I, I did not name the lo- hotel, Lieutenant. That was the name when, when I bought it, Lieutenant. Let me see. I have some notes here. My name is Farid. Yes, yes, sir. My name is Farid. You're Egyptian. Oh, yes, sir, yes. But only because my parents were Egyptians, sir. Nothing wrong with Egypt. Oh, no, no, no. Nothing, Lieutenant. Except too many English and too many flies. Yes, yes, Lieutenant. We've been killing the English like flies. Later, we will kill the flies like the English. Oh, yes, yes, Lieutenant. You have a native cook by the name of Barrick. Terek, sir. Terek, yes, sir. But he ran away this morning with the British to Alexandria. You have a wife? Oh, yes, yes, sir. But she ran away too, sir. With the British to oh, Alexandria? No, 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 sir. With a Greek to Casablanca. There's a maid by the name of uh, Marie Jacqueline. Oh, is that you? Yes. They call me Moosh. French citizen born in Marseille. Is that right? Yes. Huh, informed of everything. There's a waiter here, Alsatian, by the name of Paul Davos. Uh, yes, sir. He was killed, sir. By who? Uh, by you, sir, in the bombing when your planes came over last night. You know your beautiful planes. Flute. You, Moosh, uh, what is a French maid doing in Egypt? Housework. What is the matter with housework in Paris? In Paris, there are one million French chambermaids. There is only one Moosh in City Alfaya. The cook ran away this morning to Alexandria. Why didn't you? What for? You will take Alexandria, you will take Cairo. Naturally. Cigarette, please. You have some? Yes. Thank you. Write it for me, please. Your hands are very small. It's been a long time since I've seen such a small hand. Thank you. You, Farid. Uh, yes, sir. How many rooms in this hotel, exactly? Oh, this is the largest hotel, sir, between Alexandria and Benghazi. How many, I said? Uh, Sixteen, sir, sixteen. Bathrooms? Oh, yes, yes, of course, sir. Everything the best. How many? Two. One that works. Uh, uh, maybe you would like to see the room? Full of bedbugs, I'm sure. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Every one of them. Yes, yes, sir. Full of bedbugs. We always have... Oh, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, sir. We have absolutely no bedbugs. Not one, sir. Never I... mind. Bedbugs, broken down bathrooms and all. We're taking over the Empress of Britain as our temporary headquarters. Uh, yes, yes, sir. A great honor. I expect your fullest cooperation. If there be any irregularities, you will be held responsible. Our complaints are brief... And we make them against the nearest war. Yes, sir. As though he had to warn us. He's warning you. I'm only a servant here. The rooms immediately adjacent to the good bathroom will be occupied by the German high command. Yes, sir. The one at the bathroom that doesn't work goes to the Italian general. The Italian? I will inspect the rooms now. Oh, good, good, yes. Mueller! Ja, Herr Lieutenant. Wir werden in Zimmer Ja, Herr Lieutenant. Oh, maid. Yes? Before I make final arrangements about the quarters upstairs, uh... Which is your room? Way down the hall, next to the one you assigned to the Italian general. Oh. Well, if that worries you... I'm uh... not afraid of generals. You're not? It's lieutenants I'm afraid of. <laughs> I see. Oh, go, go, go right up, sir. I will be right there at once. Hurry, we do not enjoy waiting. Moosh. The man behind the desk. Get him out of here. Yes. Uh, mister, mister, you... Moosh, he is gone. What? He is gone. Oh, Where? Oh, thanks to Allah. Of all the miracles, that was the most miraculous miracle. Shut up. He must have wakened and gone out the back. Oh, Allah be praised. Well, he's gone, that's all. He was never here. We had nothing to do with him. If any questions are asked... Shh! Listen! They shoot. Oh. That's even better. There will be no questions asked. They found him. 
poor fellow, such a nice fellow. Well, maybe it is for the best. <laughs> Hurry. Oh, yes, yes, sir. I am getting them. I, I have some right here in my room here, sir. Cigarettes, cigarettes, fooey. Where did I... Shut that door. The... Oh. Shut it quick. Oh. How did you get in here? The window. I woke up downstairs behind the desk. Yes. I heard a German talking. But they are here now. Well, how did I get to this hotel? Hey, you had a sunstroke. I put you behind the desk. That is all I know. Except... They shot you. Well, they shot an Italian soldier for stealing drinking water. Sir, but, sir, you cannot stay here. You understand? You cannot. You have to leave, sir. Please. Oh, of course. Why not ask that German officer to call me a taxi? Sir, please. I found these clothes on the bed and these shoes. Whose are they? They belong. Listen. Oh, they are here. The general staff. Please, sir, get out, please. I'm sorry, I can't. If the Africa Corps doesn't get me, the desert will. Whose clothes are these I'm wearing? Uh, they belong to our waiter, sir. Waiter? Yes, he was killed last night when room 14 blew into the cellar, sir. One of these shoes is bigger than the other. Was he lame? Yes, sir, a crippled foot. What was this waiter's name? Paul Davos. Davos? Yes, sir. Good. He was never killed, understand? Huh? Oh, but he was Alsatian. He was older, then sir. Then I'm Alsatian and he was my age. Yes, but, Hand sir... me those shoes. No, please. Moosh, Moosh, he is alive. He can be heard from the outside. Uh, Moosh, he wants to stay here as Davos. Tell him he cannot help me. Listen, man, it's only for a few days until the British come back. Until the who come back? The British? That's right, the British. Since when do the British come back? You don't like us. No. And if Ferry doesn't tell the Germans, I will. But I thought you were French. Yes. I had two brothers in the French army. At Dunkirk, when the British decided to evacuate their troops, what did they do with the French? They left them on the beaches to die or to be captured. Who told you that? Laval? Waiting out into the water, begging the boats to come back for them. But did the British come back? Did they? I'm only a chambermaid. If somebody rings for me, I come. If it's only a towel they want, or an extra pillow, not life. Oh, wait. Give me just five seconds before you call the Germans. Five seconds, that's all. What do you want to tell me about? Blood, sweat, and tears? Pencil. Here is Pencil. This is the address of my wife in London. Oh, they are ringing from the lobby. The Germans. I want you to mail this note to her when you can. Yes, sir. But, but you'd better get out of those clothes. They will shoot you for a spy. They'll shoot me in my uniform, too. They're thrifty with their drinking water. Put my dog tag inside. My wristwatch for my older boy. I wish I had something for the younger one. Well, <clears throat> now that we've disposed of the tears, any time, mademoiselle... Oh. Didn't you hear the buzzer? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was just Quiet. coming. Who is this man? He, he was... What's the matter with you? Who is he? Answer. He's our waiter. What waiter? Our waiter, sir. We, we always had a waiter. My name is Davos. I'm Alsatian. I thought he was killed. Only buried alive, sir. When I came to, it seemed as if the whole hotel was on top of me. It took me eight hours to dig myself out. So you're Paul Davos? Yes, sir. Come with me. Me, sir? Yes, you're Davos. We'll have a little chat downstairs. Yes, sir. Stop here a moment. Yes, sir. You know, I'd almost believe you were a waiter. I... I am a waiter. That's a special kind, eh? You play your part well. Come along. The field marshal will wish to speak to you. To me? Of course, to you. Who else? He's working in the lobby now. Remember to address I him as your take excellency. take another message. Yes, sir. This is to the Führer. Your excellency. My Führer. I have today crossed the Egyptian border. I am now marching on toward Alexandria and Cairo. Then I'll take the Suez Canal. Nothing can save the 8th British Army from a colossal catastrophe. They say the Red Sea once opened by special arrangement with Moses. A similar mishap will not occur this time. I pledge you herewith my word as a soldier. Signed, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. Your Excellency. What is it? Your Excellency, this man is Paul Davos. Davos? Well, Davos, why in the name of the devil didn't we get proper information about the British withdrawal? Why? They told me in Berlin you were a competent man. Is that competent? Well, Your Excellency... With the field marshal's permission. He's been buried in the cellar ever since last night. He couldn't very well have used the laundry communications. Ah. The field marshal will find he has a good record as an advanced man. We used him as a waiter in Danzig, in Rotterdam, and in Athens. Cognac. Yes, Your Excellency. Of course, no one in this so-called hotel has the slightest suspicion that you have been working for us. No, Your Excellency. You will continue here as a waiter? Until we can get you through to your new assignment. Yes, Your Excellency. Cairo. Thank you, Your Excellency. I rather like to think of myself as the vulture who flies ahead of the Stukas, limping a little. Rather well said. 
three glasses. Yes, Your Excellency. I suppose you'll be glad to escape from this sand trap. I will indeed, Your Excellency. How do you find the British intelligence service? Not very intelligent. Not an inkling about Professor Kronstetter. Uh, I beg your pardon, Your Excellency. Professor Kronstetter, the five graves. Oh, of course. No, no, Your Excellency, not an inkling. Well, we shall take that big fat cigar out of Mr. Churchill's mouth and make him say Heil five times. Rather well said, Your Excellency. Cognac? Who is that singing? General Sebastiano, Your Excellency. Italian opera? I have always despised it. Yes, Your Excellency. You will drink with us, Tabor. See, Kyle, to victory. To victory. To victory. <laughs> Vestita, la luce di... Avanti! Yes? General Sebastiano, I've come with a request. Yes, yes, yes. What request? A request that the general cease singing. Who made such a request? The gentleman of the German staff. I'll tell the gentleman from the German Among staff. Among them, Field Marshal Rommel. Oh, very well, very well. But I ask you... Can a nation that belchers understand a nation that sings? Ah, uh, no, sir. <laughs> I'm getting very sick of these Germans pushing Italian soldiers into the front lines without letting their general in on their staff meetings. They steal the food packages my family sent me. They are censoring my letters. In fact, as we say in Milano, we are getting the short end of the stick. I have even been given a bathroom that does not work. Why? Because it was assigned to you, General Sebastiano. Oh, no, the kick in the face. They let us die, but they don't let us wash. Well, what did we expect? As we say in Milano, when you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. That's right. <laughs> Wait! You... you haven't heard anything. You understand? Of course not. From so far away, how can I hear what they say in Milano? Good, good. I can fill the general's wash basin in the morning if he wishes. Please, please. My orderly is in the hospital with measles. German measles. <laughs> psst, psst. Come in here. What is it? The key. Lock the door. What do you want, Ferry? Look. I found his papers, Davos's papers. He has three passports. See? A Danish, a Swiss one... And a Romanian. Let me see how I look. Hmm. What a kindly face. I'd never suspect myself. Now, how was I ever to know he was working with the Germans glove in glove? He came here two years ago. He. What do you know about Professor Kronstetter? Professor Kronstetter. Yes, I think I know that name. Yes? Or do I know? Maybe I do not. Well, what about graves? graves? Five graves. Graves, graves. Whose graves? All right. What did Davos have to do with the laundry? Oh, with, with the laundry? Nothing, sir. Nothing at all. Let me in. Bush. Come in quickly. Bush knew him better than I did. Didn't you, Bush? Who? Davos. What of it? We were talking about the laundry here. Where does Davos come in? I do the laundry. All alone? Sometimes he helps me put it out to dry. Flat on the sand, perhaps? Bed sheets, towels, washcloths, all nicely spread out for the Messerschmitts? What Messerschmitt? Well, it's my guess, mademoiselle, that you've been washing some sort of alphabet. A towel could be a dash, a washcloth a dot. Why well, don't you see a sheet could mean 10,000 men in a towel, petrol tanks coming through. You suspected nothing? No. Bed sheet and a, and a dash and a... Say that slower, please. It's perfectly simple. The Germans were smart again and the British were stupid. Why not call us naive, mademoiselle? We use sheets just to sleep on and towels for drying hands. Your hands will need a lot of towels. Shh, Moosh, please. Why fight? He will not be here long. He, he's going away, aren't you, sir? No, I'm not. Huh? But, sir, I heard it with my own ears from the kitchen. They're sending you to Cairo, sir. You will be safe. Oh, yes, of course. I limp into British headquarters in Cairo with this club foot of mine. Where have you been, Corporal Bramble? Oh, nowhere in particular. I spent a day or two with Rommel. Rommel? Field Marshal Rommel, sir. You mean to say you were under the same roof with Rommel? That's right, sir. And? And what, sir? You didn't leave him with a bullet in his head and his head in a puddle of blood? Oh, dear. He, he's talking so fast again. Talking foolish. Perhaps. Corporal John J. Bramble, formerly with a four-square insurance company, always rather afraid of the manager. 
out of 120,000 men in the army of the Nile that it should be this J.J. Bramble. It does sound foolish. Oh, I'm, I'm scared. I'm, I'm all scared inside. Well, what do you think I am? It's just that I happen to have drawn a black ball. But we haven't drawn it. Tide and I. Oh, no, 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 no. We haven't. And, and we saved your life, didn't we, Mush? I owe their wife crying and two little boys. And some words came out of my mouth. And I'm very grateful. But you won't be involved, either of you. I'll work it out. You will work it out. In the morning, His Excellency will ring for breakfast. Room number five, black coffee in bed, he told me. No one else in the room. I'll have my revolver beneath the napkin. It must all happen very quickly. Perhaps as he drops in his second lump of sugar. So that's all you want? Yes. Because it's good for England. Oh, I don't imagine it'll win the war. But it'll knock the breath out of him for a while. Well, you are not going to do it. Because it doesn't fit in with my plans, understand? What plans? Why do you think I stay down here in this filthy place? I was waiting for them. Understand? No, I don't understand. Because I want to do business with them. Business? I see. That's not very attractive, mademoiselle. What you think of me, I don't care that. I advise you to postpone your business, mademoiselle. Mine is much more important. You'll stay in this room tonight. I'll sleep here in the chair. When room number five rings in the morning, remember, I take in the breakfast. You understand each other? Good. Sancho Tone, Ann Baxter, Otto Preminger, J. Carol Nash, and Fortunio Bonanova will return in a moment in Act Two of Five Graves to Cairo. But first, Mr. DeMille has a very important message for you from our government. I want to step out of character for a moment and tell you about a drama in real life. A drama of medicine in which sulfur drugs and tannic acid, insulin and opiates are saving lives every day on our battlefronts. You can have a part in that drama simply by saving used fat. Undramatic, unimportant. Uh, the Office of Price Administration thinks it's so important that beginning today, you will receive two meat ration stamps for every pound of used fat you turn into your butchers. And take them proudly. It's your government's way of saying thank you for this important war work. How do you go about saving fat? Well, <laughs> kitchens are something of a mystery to me, so... I'll let a housewife tell you in her own words. Mr. DeMille, I think it's wonderful that our government is giving us two extra meat stamps for every pound of used fats we turn in. We've been trying more and more to help win the war in every way we can. And we know how important saving used fats is. But just the same, we're mighty glad to get those extra ration stamps. So we say thank you, Uncle Sam, and we'll show our appreciation by turning in every single bit of used fat. There isn't much mystery about saving fat. Simply start with a tin can. Any size will do. Please don't use cardboard or glass. They may tear or break. Every time you have any drippings you can't use in cooking, pour them into your tin. You may have grease left over from bacon or sausage or fat you've skimmed from stews and soups. Pour it into the can and keep it in the ice box so it will stay solid. Don't throw away any of the blackened grease in your roaster or frying pan. It contains pure glycerin, just what the government needs. When the tin is full, take it to your butcher. He will pay you at the rate of four cents and two meat ration stamps for each pound. Yes, friends, it's as easy as that. But it's one of the most important war jobs you'll be called on to do this winter. Won't you do your share? Every tablespoonful counts. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act Two of Five Graves to Cairo, starring Francho Tone as Corporal Bramble and Ann Baxter as Moosh with J. Carol Nash as Farid, Otto Preminger as Marshal Rommel, and Fortunio Bonanova as General Sebastiano. In a little room just off the kitchen, Moosh and the British corporal wait the summons from the German field marshal. The girl is quiet, a dark, silent shadow in the far corner. 
They're calling for you, mademoiselle. Room number three. Farid is looking out for it. Farid won't do, obviously. They say Rommel keeps his Africa Corps in hothouses before he sends them out to the desert. It must be quite some time since they've heard a woman's voice. Oh, mademoiselle, I think this is the time for an additional bit of information. I lied to you. I had to say something quick and effective to soften your heart. I haven't any children. I haven't any wife. I've never been married. Really? Can you forgive me? Thank you. Ah, here's a request from the Italian general. How about the Italian general? Not the Italian general. How about the major with the monocle? Not the major with the monocle. Who are you waiting for, mademoiselle? Number five. <laughs> Good night, mademoiselle. Good night. <laughs> Number five. You slept very soundly, monsieur. Wait, wait, where are you going? To Orsay. Moose, wait. Hey, where, where's my gun? I took it from you, monsieur. I said you slept soundly. Moose, come back here. Good morning, your excellency. Where's the waiter? I'm quicker on my feet. Put the tray on my lap. Sugar, your excellency. I don't like women in the morning. Go away. Don't you understand English? Go away, I said. No. No, Your Excellency. I stayed on while this place was bombed. I could have run away. I waited for the German troops. I waited for Your Excellency. Why? I wanted to talk, Your Excellency. Two steps back, please. Now what do you wish to say? It's about my father, Your Excellency. He's in Germany. Continue. I had two brothers. One was taken prisoner. He's in a concentration camp in Wittenberg. The other was killed. Fighting the Germans. They were just boys. Their classes were called. They had to go. They didn't hate the Germans or anybody. Of course, nobody hates the Germans. Proceed. What I wanted. I know that one word from you, Your Excellency. He was wounded. He's lost one arm. He can't even work for you. He's useless. Maybe... I'm not. If there is anything I can do... You are suggesting some sort of bargain. This is a familiar scene, reminiscent of bad melodrama. Although usually it is not the brother for whose life the heroine comes to plead, it is the lover. The time is midnight. Place the tent of the conquering general. Blushingly, the lady makes her proposal and gallantly the general grants her wish. Later, the lady very stupidly takes poison. In one Italian opera, the two even go so far as to sing a duet. Schwegler! If I had any tears left, maybe you'd listen. There will be no duet today. Schwegler! Yes, Your Excellency. Take this woman out of my room. He's not an enemy of yours. He's only 19 now, a boy, and he's dying. Petitions for the release of prisoners must be addressed to the command of the prison camp. They must be submitted in triplicate. You can have the Red Cross right and then... They are the Quakers. But everything must be submitted in triplicate. We can use paper in Germany. A great deal of paper. Take her out. Yes, Your Excellency. You are to keep out of this room from now on. Yes. Who do you think you are to open your mouth to him? Are you crazy? You get a little crazy if you think about something all the time for a long, long time. It is so stupid. Never ask a very big man for a very small favor. Sometimes a lieutenant can be of more use. Or are you still afraid of lieutenants? No. I know people in Berlin who can pull some wires. I will meet you tonight and we will talk. Thank you. Lieutenant Spegler. Yes? The Major is waiting for you in the lobby. We have just brought in five prisoners. British officers. You must not go down there, do you hear? Oh, it's all right. They're not from my outfit. They'll never recognize me. It is not that. They were stationed here once. Colonel Fistume lived in this hotel. Oh. He knew Davos. Go back to your room. Stay there. All right. Davos! Uh-oh. Yes, sir? You need it downstairs. We'll serve drinks for the officers. Uh, yes. At once. Yes, sir, at once. May I serve you something, sir? Our friends, the British Davos. Yes, sir. Is that Davos? Oh, uh, Davos, it seems that I neglected to tip you when I was here before. Why, you and... That's quite all right, Colonel Fitzhugh. I, I 
really didn't expect you to remember me, sir. Oh. What will it be, Colonel? Cognac? Sherry? Whiskey? Uh, whiskey for me and a little soda. The whiskey's over here, sir. Will you help yourself, Colonel? Uh, thanks. Who are you? Intelligence? No, sir. Brambles, sir. Royal Tanks. Just happened in on this, so to speak. Where is Davos? Davos is dead. He was a German agent. Go on. I have a plan, sir. What plan? If I can get hold of a gun somewhere and then get Rommel alone... No, none of that. Why not? Isn't it sporting to shoot a sitting field marshal? Dead field marshals tell no secrets. What secrets, sir? You have their confidence. You have your freedom. There's a bigger job. Yes, sir. Stand by. And no ill-considered heroics, understand? That's orders. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, the field marshal requests the honor of your company at luncheon. Coffee ready? Cream? Sugar? Where's the sugar? Find you getting it down in the cellar. I'm disappointed in you, Moosh. Having set out for a field marshal, I didn't expect you to settle for a lieutenant. What is it to you? Well, now that you're down to lieutenants, how about a corporal? Let me remind you, this foot of mine is only camouflage. Eight coffee. Ah, uh, obviously I'm in the wrong army. You are. And I'm getting what I want, so shut up. That's a very agreeable mouth you're casting before these swine. Oh, Moosh. Moosh, I've seen him. Oh. What's the matter, Farid? I have seen him. Who? That was his body in the cellar. His hands stretched out like this, all yellow, with the fingernails white. Davos! I thought he was way down under everything. Well, me too, but when I climbed over for the sugar, the wreckage started giving away like apples, and there was his hand, all yellow, and the fingers... Quiet! What did you do? I piled the rubble over him more and more. Herr Davos could have been more cooperative and died further away. I'd better get the coffee in there. Yes, and you'd better give Farid a large cup, too. Later, we can find more suitable arrangements for the gentleman in the cellar. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, I understand that not long ago when the question came up in the British Parliament as to who should be entrusted with the supreme command of the Allied forces in Africa... Some members suggested my name. Oh, that's quite possible, Field Marshal. The British sense of humor is unpredictable, you know. You are fast becoming a legendary figure. Yes, they say everything possible about me. That I'm a magician, a puller of rabbits out of hats, the man who can saw Africa in half. They also say that you entertain captured British officers by giving them lessons in strategy. Better a lesson too late than no lesson at all. Two more salt cellars, please. Davos. Salt cellars. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, I have before me North Africa from Tripoli to Cairo. El Agaila, Benghazi, Sidi Barani, Alexandria, Cairo. Now, gentlemen, the subject being vast and my time brief, why don't you ask me what puzzles you most? Suppose I give you 20 questions. Hmm, that's uncommonly generous of you, Field Marshal. It certainly is. Are you there, Davos? Yes, sir. Give me a brandy, will you? Yes, sir. All right. Who will start? Uh, may I? How many men have you got in North Africa? Not as many as you. Well, gentlemen, if you count in the Italians... Nobody counts in or on the Italians. I'm oh, so sorry. Sorry. Uh, Field Marshal, in February, when we had you at Agadabir, we had an idea they sent your best troops to Russia. You gentlemen have six senses. We have only five. But we use them. We must rely on preparation. For instance, we knew the Dutch would open their dikes, so we started building rubber boats, 50,000 of them, as far back as 1935. What did you do in 1935? Took your wives on little pleasure trips, snapped their photographs, plucking Edelweiss in Switzerland. German wives found themselves being photographed on bridges across the Vistula and in the neighborhood of the fortifications of Brussels. Next question. Field Marshal, now that you've pushed ahead 500 miles, aren't your supply lines getting a little taut? They are very taut. And yet you expect to take Cairo? In six days. I have my reservations in Shepherd's Hotel. Without supplies, how can you do it? Yes, Field Marshal, how? I'm speaking to the Britishers. I'm sorry. <laughs> Gentlemen, it is not the supplies which reach us. It is we who reach the supplies. Is that clear? Uh, not quite. You reach the supplies. How? Preparation, gentlemen. Preparation. 
In 1937, two years before this war started, we dug supplementary supplies into the sands of Egypt. A number of depots under your very noses. Thousands and thousands of gallons of petrol and water. Ammunition, spare parts for our tanks, waiting for us. Under our very noses, eh? Where? Yes, where? Where? I gave you 20 questions, gentlemen. That is question 21. We'd gladly trade you Rudolf Hess for the answer to 21. You may keep him, gentlemen. My time is short. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Davos, is the gentleman's car ready? Yes, Your Excellency. Thank you, Davos. Davos, I'm afraid that tip will have to wait till after the war. Oh, don't worry, sir. You're a good man, Davos. I hope I know my job, sir. You do. I'm sure of it. Water, petrol, ammunition. What is it? You looking for something? Yes, water, petrol, ammunition. Right here on the table? Between this spot and Cairo. You sure? Buried right under our noses. How could they do it? How? Who? The Germans. You sick again, sir? Not a bit, thanks. But this is pepper and salt cellar, sir. I know. And you are looking for water, petrol, ammunition. That's right. Well, how could it get in here? That's what I'd like to know. Oh, dear. Rummel on top of us. The man you are supposed to be dead underneath us and you are making riddles. I will put these things away. Clean off the table, please. Six days, he said. That means he'll be in Cairo Sunday. Perhaps. Hey, hey. Hey, that name. Hmm? Here it is. That name. In the newspapers, lining the drawer. What name? Well, you asked me about it, and, and, and I did not remember, you know. And here it is, under the knives. For years, I have been looking at it every time I put the knives away. What name? Professor Kronstadter. Let me see it. Yes, his picture. The German archaeologist, Professor Kronstadter. Sorry, you're a great man. Who, me? Archaeologist, of course. Oh, we get them all the time in Egypt, digging up the old mummies. London Press, February 17th, 1937. That's the year. What year? Preparations year. And just have a look at Professor Kronstetter. Who is it? Oh, yeah. <coughs> That's him. His Excellency Field Marshal Rommel. It's so simple. A highly respectable group of German scientists arrived in Egypt to dig for tombs between the Libyan border and Cairo. What a convenient way to send a military mission to full authority to dig, dig, dig. Only they didn't dig anything out, they dug everything in. What, sir? Water, petrol, ammunition. Oh, not again, please, sir. Sorry. Now we know how. Yes, sir, yes. But we don't know where. There's still question 21. Is Davos here? Quiet. Yes, yes, here, sir. The field marshal wants to see you in his room. Come in, Davos. I have just received information that my advance columns have reached Objective Y. Ob objective Y, Your Excellency? That, that's good news, isn't it? Yes. Everything works out according to my plans. I wish I could have told it to those Britishers at luncheon. Their digestion would have stopped completely. If I may be permitted, Your Excellency gave them a very brilliant lecture. They will remember Field Marshal Rommel, or should I say Professor Kronstetter? Thank you, Davos. For a moment, I was really afraid Your Excellency might put all the cards on the table, tell them about the five graves. My tongue did itch. Such blind ignorance. I might have just as well shown them my map. With the exact location of the five graves? Come here, Davos. Yes, Your Excellency. Here is the map of Egypt. You, of course, know the answer. But would they have seen anything? Not a thing, Your Excellency. They have such complicated minds. They expect invisible ink, maps that have to be warmed over fires or held against the light to reveal secret pinpricks. Too simple for them, this. I'm trying to look at it with an Englishman's eyes. Not a clue, just an ordinary map. There's nothing here that could give them a hint. Is there? After I've taken Cairo, I shall send a postcard to number 10 Downing Street with the correct solution. Davos? All arrangements have been made for you. Yes, Your Excellency. You are leaving for Cairo this evening. You will be taken by motorcycle to El Daba. From there, a guide will get you through the British lines. This evening? At nine o'clock. That gives me six hours. For what? Oh, some things here. Unfinished business of no importance. You can expect me Sunday afternoon. We won't have any difficulty with objectives P or T, I'm sure. P or T, Your Excellency? 
It seems improbable. Have a lukewarm bath drawn for me in Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo. The royal suite. In the evening, a command performance at the opera. Aida in German. Omitting the second act, which is too long and not too good. It'll be all, Davos. Yes, Your Excellency. May I come in? Yes. What time is it, Moosh? Half past six. Oh. I hear you are leaving. That's right. Moosh, if there were a local florist, I'd offer you an armful of white lilacs with my humblest apologies. For what? I had an unpleasant idea about you, Moosh. Farid cleared it up. He told me about your brother. I'm sorry. It's all right. Now, let's see. Port Said? No, that's too far east. What are you doing? What is that book? The Tourist Guide. You know, Moosh, I not only have a club foot, I have a club brain. TP and Objective Y, does that mean anything to you? TP and Y? Not a thing. It was maddening, Moosh. There was Rommel's map staring at me with everything in it. Eyes have I, but I see not. TP, Y. What's the key? Where's the answer? Say, that's a pretty dress. In Cairo, I wore it on Sundays. Drifting down the Sharia Ibrahim Pasha with a white parasol over your shoulder. There was a parasol that went with the dress. Where is it? In the shop. I could never quite afford it. The handle was real ivory. Maybe someday when I'm rich. Objective why? Why? Listen, either you stop talking like alphabet soup or you tell me. I've gone through this thing writing down the name of every village, every oasis, every landmark that begins with P or T. There are dozens of them, but there isn't a Y in Egypt. Hey, what have I said? Moosh! That's it, Moose. That's it. What is it? Did you hear what I said? I said there isn't a Y in Egypt, but there is. There's a Y and a P and a T. I've got it. E-G-Y-P-T. The five graves. What five graves? The five supply depots of Professor Rummel. Of course, no invisible ink. Just the map of Egypt and printed across it. Egypt. And the letters, don't you see? Every letter marking a supply depot. Invisible because they're so visible. All over the map. Just a moment. Since when was, was Rommel a professor? I must see that map again. I must get back into his room. Whose room? Rawls. No, please don't. You've had such luck so far. You can leave. You're safe. Why risk your neck again? What for? Thank you, Moosh. Before, you took pity on the neck of a married man. This time, you know, it's just my neck. Where's that agreeable mouth of yours? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. Wrong army. Well, I've got to get to those maps. Wait. They'd kill you. We'll see. Goodbye, Moosh. And now, before Mr. DeMille presents Francho Tone, Ann Baxter, Otto Peminger, J. Carol Nash, and Fortunio Bonanova in Act Three of Five Graves to Cairo, there's a thought I'd like to share with you. I read this about our soldiers. Only 50% of our army's time, only 50% is spent in actual fighting. So even our soldiers spend a lot of their time doing the unexciting things nobody hears about. Plain chores. Well, I'm afraid that's the way some women feel about keeping house. There are beds to be made every day. Cleaning and dusting. Cooking and dishwashing. Chores, yes, but a lot depends on how you do them. A successful businesswoman once told me about her first job. She spent every day filing cards, all day long. It was so boring I could have screamed, she said. So every day I set myself to memorize a poem while I worked. Something that made the day seem beautiful. How about that for an idea while you're washing dishes? Next, make jobs like dishwashing as pleasant as they can be. Pour Lux Flakes into the dishpan. Turn on the water. See the rich, lively suds bubble up. That's a pleasure in itself. No slowpoke suds. No gray, greasy dishwater. Best of all, when you finish that dishpan job, your hands will be as soft, smooth, and lovely as when you started. Changing to Lux takes away the red, coarse look a strong soap leaves. Scores of women found changing to Lux Flakes made their hands look nicer in just a few days. Use all the Lux you need to get good suds, but no more than you need. A little Lux goes a long way. It's really thrifty. Why not try the Lux way of doing dishes tomorrow? Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. After the play, we'll get some news on the offstage doings of our stars. Now the curtain rises on the third act of Five Graves to Cairo, starring Francho Tone and Ann Baxter with Otto Preminger, J. Carol Nash, and Fortunio Bonanova. In the field marshal's quarters, the British soldier bends low over the map of Egypt. E, G, Y, P, T. Each letter marking a supply depot for the German Africa Corps. 
But now the sky overhead roars with planes. British planes returning to bomb Sidi Hellfire. You, what are you doing in here? Well, the maps, Lieutenant. I thought the field marshal's map should not be left behind. You did, eh? Very conscientious. Thank you, sir. Go on, get down the cellar. Yes, sir. Yes, Lieutenant. Tell me something, Doubles. When we arrived here, I understood you had been bombed into the cellar. Is that correct, Doubles? Yes, Lieutenant. This cellar, Doubles? Yes, Lieutenant. And you dug yourself out, Doubles? That's right, Lieutenant. You are sure, Doubles? Quite sure. You are sure you are not dead, Doubles? Come here. Over here behind the sugar barrel. Isn't it strange, Doubles? It seems to be the body of a man. With yellow fingers and a club foot. Yes, so it is. Here, Snell! Here! Here, Snell! Spion! Who is it? Moose. Come in. Hurry. Why did you lock the door? Sit down there and listen to me. Well, better go. Sit down. Go, please. Lieutenant Schwegler is coming in. Lieutenant Schwegler begs to be excused. He's dead. Dead? No screaming, please. He was shot. You killed him? Yes. Unfortunately, he ran across the late Mr. Davos. Fortunately, no one knows about it yet, and they mustn't until tomorrow morning. Farid has full instructions. The body will be found down below in the sand outside this window. There'll be my waiter's jacket and my shirt with some blood on it, enough to prove I did it. Farid and you will work together. Farid and I? That's right. I need six hours to get through the German line. Why did you kill him? I said no screaming. Why? I'll tell you why. Because a little piece of paper has to get through to British headquarters, see? Just a piece of paper with some pencil marks on it. E-G-Y-P-T. That's why Farid and you must cover up till I get there. Is that clear? Perfectly. You have killed two people. You have killed him and my brother. His only chance to get out alive. And now all you ask is that we cover up so you can get back to the British. Is that it? Like Dunkirk again? Well, what about Dunkirk? Yes, some were left behind. French, Polish, Belgian, and British. Some? They had to be. The rest were to carry on. Carry on for what? Are there not enough dead already? Oh, yes. There are a lot of dead, Moosh. In Tobruk, I saw them piled up with the hundreds. At Sevastopol, they lay ten deep. They were blown to bits on the repulse in the Prince of Wales. In Athens, they're dying of starvation, 400 a day. For what, Moosh? So that somebody like you can hold out a tin cup to a victorious lieutenant, begging for a penny's worth of pity? It's not one brother that matters. It's a million brothers. It's not just one prison gate they might sneak open for you. It's all their gates that must go. All right. Talk. You talk such big words. You have a million brothers. I'm small. I have only one. And I want him to live if it costs a piece of paper. I see the field marshal himself. Du eine verfluchte Schweinerei! Das ist ja unerhört! Mate! Come here. Your Excellency. Be quiet. This concerns your brother. You remember I advised you to approach his case through the Red Cross of the Quakers. You thought it wiser to approach it through a certain lieutenant. Did you? Well, I have just found out that this certain lieutenant has shown you some telegrams. Telegrams that were sent to Berlin and telegrams that were received from Berlin. They were never sent. They were never received. They are forgeries. Oh, no. You will wait for that certain lieutenant. I prefer to have him present. Your Excellency. Where is Schwegler? They have found him. He is dead, Your Excellency. He was shot twice. I see. Self-defense, of course. Hey, mate. Speak up. Why did you do it? Because I thought I could make a bargain with him. Because he lied to me. Because he was dead. Because he was one of you. First, you made him forget that he was a German officer. Then you killed him because he was one. He was only 23. At 20, he was decorated in Poland for conspicuous gallantry in action. At 21, he was commanding a tank company. Best aid I've ever had. A German officer with a brilliant future. Yes. She might have become a field marshal with somebody on her knees before him. Two steps back, please. Swine! 
Her field marshal. Well, what is it, our boss? Oh, your spy wants to speak. I will say what there is to say. I knew you worked for them all these years, Davos. Get out of here, Davos. Get out. What is it, Davos? Get out! Your Excellency, there's no further orders. I'm about to leave for Cairo. Nothing, Davos. Good luck. Yes. Good luck, Davos. Thank you. Harry. Yeah. Yes? Tomorrow morning, give them the proof that Davos did it. Understand? Uh-huh. And will you say to her, for me, God bless you. There's objective EG and Y, sir. They've used E and G already. Yes. Well, I doubt if they'll ever use Y or objective P or objective T. English Eighth Army under General Montgomery is still pursuing the Africa Corps. From El Alamein, they have pounded their way eastward step by step. Benghazi has been reoccupied in Sidi Barani. And today, the British forces entered Sidi Halfaya. Come on, you oiters. Keep moving. Hey, soldier, who are these men? Italian prisoners. Millions of them. Keep moving, boys. Come on. Well, hello, hey, General Sebastiano. What? You know me? That's right. As we say in Milano, it's a wise man that drops the short end of the stick, huh? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> Soon you can lie in your tub and get rid of the fleas. What fleas? The ones you caught from lying down with the dogs, as we say in Milano. <laughs> now I remember. Hello, hello. <laughs> Arrivederci, Generale. Arrivederci. Pallorola di bianco vestita. Galoccio di fiore al gamba. Hurry. You have come back. Oh, it is good to have you here again, sir. What happened? Where's Moosh? Well, uh, uh, maybe you would like to have number five this time, huh? With the good bathroom? Where is she? Tell me. There was a trial that morning. I brought in the evidence, as you told me. They found her innocent of shooting Schwegler. Well? But, but they found her guilty of spreading enemy rumors. She kept on screaming in his face, The British will be back! The British will be back! They beat her! Turn. Then they they led her out. One bullet would have been enough. Where is she? Out there on the desert. I put her with the other soldiers. Show me, Fanny. There, sir. We buried her there. Almost. Perhaps I should bend down so you can hear me better. I brought you that parasol, Moosh, in a shop. They swore it was real ivory. Let's hope so. It will give you some shade until we can come to take you back where there are trees and leaves and rivers and dew on the grass. Don't worry, Moosh. We're after them now. When you feel the earth shake, that'll be our tanks and our guns and our lorries. Thousands and thousands of them. British... French and American. We're after them now, coming from all sides. We're going to blast the blazes out of them. We're going to pound and pound till the earth shakes like a great bell, till it rings with a new song, a better song. Pray God. Just a moment, our stars will return for a curtain call. Listen. Did you count them? Ten. There are only ten more shopping days till Christmas. Ten days to get all the things you've put off till now. Well, fortunately, there's still time to buy bonds. And here's another gift the women on your list always appreciate. Lingerie. And if you choose just the right type of slip or nighty for each person... It won't look like a last-minute selection at all. Try easy-to-pack rayon jersey for young Army and Navy wives living out of a suitcase. 
Oh, trimly tailored kinds for war workers or women in the armed services. A more elaborate lacy style for the brides, you know. And if you can, include a small box of Lux Flakes with your gift. Isn't that a good idea, Libby? Mm, yes, it's a gift of extra long wear for Christmas Sundays. We all want our nice things to stay lovely a long time these days. If your dealer is out of Lux Flakes, you might put a hint about Lux Care to rhyme instead. More Lux is on the way, and it is worth waiting for. You can be sure it will come to the rescue of our undies and stockings very soon. Now here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. From five gates to Cairo, it's only five steps to the footlights and a curtain call for Francho Tone and Ann Baxter. Thank you, C.B. You're one of my favorite hosts. Well, thanks, Francho. You're one of my favorite fathers. How's your son? He's probably one of the handsomest men in Hollywood, C.B. Fathers always take the credit and mothers do all the work. Oh, I don't know. I built the baby's crib. <laughs> Good job. He likes it. I didn't know you designed furniture for a hobby, Francho. My grandfather has a hobby something like that. He designs buildings. Have you heard of him, Mr. DeMille? Frank Lloyd Wright? And? Even if he is your grandfather, one of the world's most famous architects might resent your calling his art a hobby. <laughs> By the way, what's yours? Cooking. Well, if I hadn't been happily married for more than 40 years, I might make an offer at this point. <laughs> I mean, have you, have you got a favorite re recipe? Oh, yes. Herb omelet. I'm quite proud of it. Well, let's have it. Oh, I'm sorry, but I can't give the recipe I... Kind of make it up as I go along and never do it twice the same. That's the fun in cooking. You mean you'll never use a cookbook? Oh, yes. I collect them to read, but I don't always do what they say. Well, C.B., maybe you'd better give us the recipe for next week's play. Mix carefully equal parts of music, comedy, and romance. And the result is the paramount hit, Dixie. And the stars, well, who else but Bing Crosby and Dorothy L'Amour? It's the story of the first minstrel man, Dan Emmett, who gave us the great song, Dixie. Bing will sing that and the other big hits of the picture. So don't miss Dixie next Monday night. I wouldn't miss it for anything, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> we'll hope soon to say goodbye to Marshall Rama. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Bing Crosby and Dorothy L'Amour in Dixie with Barry Sullivan. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Five Graves to Cairo was presented through the cooperation of Paramount Pictures, whose current release is the Technicolor production, Riding High. Anne Baxter will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox picture, The Sullivans, and in the same studio's production of the Maxwell Anderson play, The Eve of St. Mark. Otto Preminger will produce and direct the 20th Century Fox picture, I Marry the Soldier. J. Carol Nash is currently seen in the Columbia picture, Sahara. Fortunio Bonanova is currently seen in the Paramount picture, for whom the bell tolls. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Christmas seal time again. Put Christmas seals in all your letters and packages during the holiday season, because every Christmas seal you buy helps the fight against tuberculosis. Heard in tonight's play were Fred Mackay as Schwegler, Edward Harvey as Fitzhume, and Charles Seal, Ed Emerson, Dennis Green, Norman Field, and Vernon Steele. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, this program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas by International Shortwave Radio in cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Bing Crosby and Dorothy L'Amour in Dixie with Barry Sullivan. In these days of food shortages, don't be confused about vitamins. Give your family VIMS, the new money-saving vitamin mineral tablets scientifically designed to help make meals complete. VIMS give you all the vitamins recommended by government experts, including those of the B-complex. All the minerals commonly lacking, too. Get VIMS from your druggist, the qualified vitamin dealer. VI for vitamins, double MS for minerals. Get that VIMS feeling. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you.
Suspense. is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so with five canaries in the room and the performances of Ona Munson as Anita, Osa Masson as Fifi, and with Lee Bowman as Ronald Denham, who tells the story, we again hope to keep you in suspense. The trouble was, you see, that a whole apartment vanished. It's true. A flat disappeared straight out of that apartment house. And the dead man disappeared with it. No, I'm not crazy. And in spite of what they said, I hadn't taken too many drinks. You see, I was getting married to Anita in another two weeks. And Jimmy Westlake gave a bachelor party for me. Oh, hang it, it's a situation that might have happened to you. The party was at the old Cap and Bells Club on Lower Fifth Avenue. And it wasn't a brawl. Jimmy Westlake was in the chair, I admit. But nothing could have been more quiet, more dignified. <laughs> oh, mademoiselle from Armitage, parlez Oh, mademoiselle from Armitage, parlez Oh, mademoiselle from Armitage. Quiet, you fellas! Quiet! Pipe down, can't you? Wait a minute, the chairman wants to say something. Break Gentlemen! Gentlemen, this is a solemn occasion. Those dopes over there will kindly get away from the piano and sit down at the table. I have another toast to propose. Excuse me, Mr. Westlake. Excuse me, please, sir. Yes, Uncle Cato. What is it? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Westlake, but you ain't going to bust the glasses on this toast, is you? And why shouldn't we bust the glasses, Uncle Cato? Why shouldn't we bust the glasses? Oh, but Mr. Westlake, if you keep on busting the glasses, there ain't going to be no glasses left. Well, in that sad eventuality, Uncle Cato, we will simply start busting the plates. Isn't that fair enough, boys? Yeah. Oh, look, Jimmy, don't you think you'd better tone the gang down a little? Be quiet, Ron. You're only the group. Yeah, I know, Jimmy, but... Gentlemen, I regret to tell you this, but the protesting voice you just heard was that of our guest of honor, Ronald Denham. Now, we all know Ron, and we all like him. But I am sorry to say he is not himself. Where now is the terror of nightclubs, the chorus girl's friend? I say it to his face, he is sober. But we like him just the same. Friends, guests, and bachelors, I give you the groom. The groom! <laughs> Gentlemen, don't bust the glasses. Hey, come on, Ron. Come on, say a few words. That's right, Ron. Get up. Come on. Now, look, boys, I thank you for all the good words, and I don't want to be a wet blanket on the party, but it's nearly midnight, and I've got to get home early. Oh, don't you understand, boys? I'm a reformed character. Yeah, how's Fifi Latour? I haven't seen Fifi for over a year. She doesn't mean anything to me anymore. He thinks he does protest too much. Oh, now, look, I'm marrying the sweetest girl in the world, but Anita's a little... Well, straight laced. Oh, yeah. You know how it is. Now, what's more, there's my Uncle Rufus. Uncle Rufus. We'll hang Uncle Rufus to a sour apple tree. Quiet! Quiet! Anita and Uncle Rufus. Uh, Anita and Uncle Rufus have apartments in the same building as I have. Now, what's more, they're on the same floor, and that's not all. Tom Evans, the fellow I share my hey, flat with. wait a with. minute. Where is Tom Evans tonight? What's the matter with him? Tom works for Uncle Rufus, and he doesn't drink. Oh, he works for hey. Uncle Rufus. Hey, fellas. Fellas. Quiet, you baboons. Quiet. He's a royal broker, and he's 
music. Now, it's wait a minute. Will, will you put yourselves in my place? My girl and my uncle and my best friend, Tom Evans, are all expecting me to come home from this party in an ash cart. Sure. And I'm going to fool them. Right, you are that so? Oh, and I have a heart, can't you? This Uncle Rufus must be a pretty tough egg, isn't he? Oh, he's all right, but after his first million dollars, it went to his head. <laughs> Has he got any human weaknesses? Yes, he keeps canaries. Oh, oh no, not the kind of canaries you're thinking. I mean the kind that go tweet-tweet in cages. <laughs> oh, what's the use? What do you say, gentlemen? Shall we allow this pure in heart to wind his way home? Well, he's got a drink for the bride, though. That's right, Ron. Can you, as a chivalrous gentleman, refuse to drink to the bride? You can't, and you know you can't. Uncle Cato. Yes, sir, Mr. Westlake. Get a beer mug from the sideboard there. Fill it with champagne. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jim. One more drink won't hurt you, Shirley. Just one little drink? Well, no, I suppose not. Fill it up, Uncle Cato. All right, I'll have one more drink, just in honor of the occasion. But that's all, do you understand? That's absolutely all. Yes, sir. 098 Park Avenue. Hey, 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 mister, mister. Hmm? Come on, wake up. Hmm? Uh, what's wrong? Well, you're home, mister. This is the apartment house. Oh, yeah. Yes, of yeah. course. All right. Thanks. Here we go. Easy now. Are you sure you're all right? Yeah. Yes, I... I'm all right. I... I have been to a bachelor party. Yeah, sure, I know. Well, take it easy now. I can't see straight. The whole street's going around. The funny part is, I only had a couple of drinks. They... They must have put something in that last... Well, it's none of my business, mister, but I wouldn't tell that to the missus if I was you. It's absolutely true. Oh, sure, sure. I know, I... And I haven't got a missus. Not yet. For my word of honor, I'm a reformed character. I have nothing to do with any woman except... Ronald Denham. As I live and breathe, it is Ronald Denham. Fifi Latour. Oh, Cherie, how good it is to see you. I look everywhere for you. I cry my eyes out, but I don't find you. What are you doing here? I live here, Fifi. I moved. I... Oh, you try to get away from me, yes? Yes. Uh, no, no, I'm, I mean... Well, here's your money, driver. Good night. Oh, good night, sir. It's a friend of yours, lady. You better take care of him. I'd take care of him. Yes, you bet you. My poor Ron. I forgive you this time, because you've been on the rassle-dassle and you need someone to take care of you. You live in this building, yes? Yes, fifth floor, I... Oh, good. I take you to your apartment. No. No, no. You say no, eh? And why not? Because you mustn't go in there. Oh. Oh, there's an hour woman. What? Oh, yes? Well, if, yes. The, the fact is, Fifi, I'm going to get married. Married? Oh, no, for heaven's sake, Fifi, don't make a scene in the middle of the street. Oh, you break my heart, eh? Right in the middle of Park Avenue, you take my heart and you break it bang, bang. Fifi, please. Now I tell you what you do. You will take me to your apartment this very minute. No, definitely no. You will give me one cigarette and one brandy. You will tell me what this means. Oh, I warn you, by golly, I start screaming so they can hear me at City Hall. I can't do it, Fifi. All right, then I start screaming. No, wait a minute. Oh, of all the times in the world you had to pick this. Do I go along, Cherie? Yes or no? Well, if I do take you, Fifi, will you promise to be good? Cherie, I am always good. You won't kick up a row or start banging at doors. Oh, if Anita heard of this. Anita? And who is she? Oh, never mind. I'm too groggy to argue. Come on. I remember going into that building. Dim religious light, deep carpets, an automatic elevator that you work yourself. I remember stepping into that elevator because the floor creaked. I remember pressing the button for the fifth floor... I took Fifi with me, and I took her into what the champagne told me was my own flat. Maybe you think that's funny, but it won't be funny much longer. Either the door of the flat was unlocked or my key fitted it. Anyway, I, I remember stumbling through the little hall inside, getting a light on, and into the living room. I remember sitting back in an easy chair, thanking the Lord I was home. If I take my coat off, Cherie? Look, Fifi, couldn't you just go home? I want to talk to you, Cherie. And this is one very nice flat. 
I like it. Thanks a lot. You and Tom Evans, you have good taste in furniture. We didn't choose the furniture, Fifi. This girl of yours chooses it, I suppose? No, it comes with the flat. Oh, you mean? Well, these are furnished flats. They're all furnished exactly alike, except for the personal things you bring yourself. Like that picture on the wall behind me. What picture, Cherie? The painting of the clipper ship over there. <laughs> but, Cherie, <laughs> your eyes are funny and you cannot say straight. There's no picture on that wall. Wait a minute. What's wrong? Why you jump up? We... We don't own any bronze bookends. And the, the lampshades are different. And, Fifi, we're in the wrong flat. Oh, well, then that explains everything. Explains what? It explains about the canary birds. What canary birds? When we first come in here, I think I hear a lot of birds sing. And I think, ooh la la, this is a funny taste for Ron Denham and Tom Evans. But the... Uncle Rufus. Great Scott. Uncle Rufus. This uncle of yours, he keep canary birds? Yes, five of them. But this isn't his flat. I know his flat as well as I know my own. Where'd you hear the singing? Behind that door over there, where I point. That ought to be the door to the dining room. But... <laughs> what was that? Oh, it is a car backfire. Maybe yes. Maybe no, unless they keep cars in dining rooms. That was a gun. It came from the dining room. Yeah, I think so. Quick, let's get out of here. Oh, no, we don't. I've been pushed around tonight till I'm good and mad, and I'm just about crazy enough to find out what this is all about. You're not going to open that door. You just watch me. There's a light in that room anyway. Oh, you know. Look under the sill of the door. Not a very bright light, but... Ron, don't do it. Stand back now while I get the door open. Hmm. Dining room. Not Uncle Rupert. And... Five canary birds. Five canaries in cages, all in a line. Where in Satan's name are we? Oh, sir, I don't know. Whose flat is this? Who except Uncle Rufus would keep five canaries? I tell you one thing, though. And then I go out of here. Well? There's somebody watching us. Where? That swing door to the kitchen is partly open. But don't look. How the devil can I see it if I don't look? There's somebody standing behind it. I see the light shine on his eye. Quiet, Fifi. Hello there. Hello there. The door move a little more. He's pushing it. Oh, excuse me, sir. We didn't mean to barge in here. We're not burglars or anything like that. We got into the wrong flat, that's all. I want to apologize if we... Straight ah! out through the door, flat on his face. What's the matter with him? Why don't he move? I've got an idea, Fifi. It's because he's dead. He was a little fat man with eyeglasses and a spade-shaped beard. He looked foreign somehow. And there was a bullet hole over his heart. You ask me what happened then? I don't know. Fifi turned and ran. At least I think she did. I bent over the man to make sure he was dead. And then something hit me. As though it hadn't been enough of a nightmare already, I... I could hear that blackjack strike the back of my skull. And everything exploded. I couldn't get my breath, and I, I seemed to be swimming in dark water. The next voice I heard wasn't Fifi's at all. It, it was Anita's. And... Ron. Ron Denham. Oh. Oh, my head. Oh, Lord, my, my head. Well, I'm not at all surprised. What's, what's that, Anita? I can't hear you. I said I'm not at all surprised. Of all the disgraceful, dissolute objects I ever saw. Anita, where am I? Oh, darling, as though you didn't know. But, uh, but I don't know. My head feels like a, like a printing press in full blast. Well, you're out in the main hall, dear, on the fifth floor, sitting on the stairs beside the elevator shaft. That's true. But how did I get here? Oh, now, really, Ron. I, I must have been carried here. That's it. By your drunken friends at the club? Well, I don't doubt it in the least. No, Anita. No, you don't understand. I left that party early. I was cold sober. But the low hounds wanted to see me come home in bad shape. So they could 
So they, they put something in my glass. Oh, naturally wrong. Whiskey or champagne? Oh, no, Anita. I mean a drug of some kind. I was dizzy when I got here. Just as I was getting out of the taxi, I met... Well, go on, dear. Whom did you meet? Uh, uh, nobody, Anita. Nobody at all. I came up here to what I thought was my own flat, but it, it wasn't my flat. It was somebody else's. There were a lot of canaries singing and a dead man with a bullet hole in his chest. And... <laughs> well, this sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? Yes, dear, it certainly does. Yeah, but it's true. <laughs> oh, Ron, I suppose I've got to forgive you. I always do forgive you. Now run along like a good boy and sleep it off, hmm? Listen, Anita... There's a dead man in one of these flats. A dead man? In which flat? Well, that's just it. I don't know. You're not saying it's on this floor. Yes, I definitely remember pressing the button for the fifth floor. Suppose you listen to me, dear. Now, don't make faces and rumple your hair. Just listen. There are only two other apartments on this floor. One is your uncle. It wasn't but... his. I'll swear to that. Well, and the other is mine. You don't think I'm hiding a dead man? No, it wasn't your flat either. Well, then where is it, darling? A whole flat can't vanish and take the dead man along, can it? No. But I'll tell you something else, Anita. I've seen that man's face somewhere before. Well, whose face? The dead man's. Thick eyeglasses, square black beard, something foreign about it. I, I've seen him, or, or I've seen his picture, or... Oh, Ron, please. What's wrong? It's the elevator. Somebody's coming up. Oh, please don't let people see you. Your hat smashed in and your tie's untied and you, you look like nothing on earth. Well, look here, Anita. If it comes to that, what are you doing out in the hall in negligee and pajamas? Well, I wanted to make sure you got home safely. Ron, the elevator, it's Tom Evans and your Uncle Rufus. All right, I can take it. But your uncle can't. Now, don't say anything to him about this dead man. Promise me. Hold on, I've got it. Pierre Duroc. Who? Pierre Duroc. That's the dead man's name. He... The prospect of a European war is so remote as not to be worth serious consideration. Excuse me, sir, but isn't that a little strong? Now, don't argue with me, Evans. No, sir. You may tell my secretary to... Look here. What's this? Well, now look, Uncle Rufus. Oh, I can't stand any more of this. I'm fed up. Well, I don't blame you, my dear. Has this nephew of mine been annoying you again? Oh, no, of course not, but please don't pay any attention to him. He's... He's drunk. For the last time, I am not drunk. I just want to ask Uncle Rufus, before I go completely nuts, whether he hasn't heard of Pierre Duroc. What's that, Ronald? What'd you say? Pierre Duroc, the French millionaire. Well, what about him? He's the man who always deals in cash on the line. Spot cash, even if it's a million. I saw his picture in the paper. He's in New York to put through a business deal with you, isn't oh, he? Oh, indeed, Ronald. Well, you show a commendable interest in my affairs... That's what you want me to do, isn't it? Well, I believe Duroc does want to buy some property I own, but uh, he hasn't approached me and I haven't approached him. It's a bad business. Uh, why have you developed this sudden interest in Duroc? Because he's dead. Dead? Somebody shot him in a room full of canaries and then slugged me over the head. Do you believe me, Evans? If your uncle will excuse me, old man, I don't see any reason not to believe you. Where's the body? Well, that's the trouble. Ron claims he found it in a flat that doesn't exist. Listen, what's that? It sounded like somebody running upstairs in a devil of a hurry. Well, maybe it's the dead man. Well, as a matter of fact, it's the night porter. He's the one who can tell us. Tell us what? Well, maybe I did get off at a different floor, but that flat's got to be somewhere in this building. Pearson! Oh, just a minute, Pearson! I'm very sorry, sir. I can't stop now. Please stand aside. I've got to go upstairs and get the manager. Why, Pearson? Is anything wrong? Well, Mr. Evans... Speak up, man. Is anything wrong? It's the police, sir. We found a dead man in the palm garden downstairs. Now do you believe me? You will oblige me, all of you, if you remain quiet and allow me to deal with this. Uh, <clears throat> oh, what does this man look like, Pearson? Uh, he's a foreign-looking gentleman, sir. Never saw him before. He doesn't live in the building. Well, then how did he get to the palm garden? Uh, well, sir, that's what we don't know. He certainly wasn't there when I looked in half an hour ago. But I went back to the palm garden just by chance, and there he was in a wicker chair with the singing birds in cages all around him. Birds again? Oh, be quiet, Ronald. He'd, uh, he'd been shot, sir. The police think he was brought down in the service elevator from somewhere upstairs. Why do they think that? Because they found a revolver in that elevator and a little paper band of the, the kind that goes around banknotes. If they could tell where the dead man came from... You can tell us where he came from. Huh? 
Hi, hi, can, sir. Yes, you've been in most of the flats in this building, haven't you? Uh, I've been inside all of them, sir. Why? Well, would you recognize any given flat if I described it? Oh, well, uh, yes, sir, certainly, but... Uh... Well, then, for the love of Mike, think. Who lives in a flat with five canary cages in the dining room? Ronald, are you out of your mind? In case you don't happen to remember, you're describing my place. No, it, it was like your place, but it wasn't at all the same. Oriental prints on the walls. In the living room, uh, bronze bookends and, and bronze lamps. Uh, dragon patterns on the lampshades. There was a, a queer kind of clock on the mantelpiece, shaped like a figure of Father Time. And what's the matter with you, Pearson? Uh, nothing, sir. Uh, but you, you're sure you saw all that? Yes, of course I'm sure. Why not? Because... I'm sorry, sir, but you couldn't have seen it. What do you mean, I couldn't have seen it? I did see it. Who lives in the blasted place? Nobody. Well, you mean the flat's vacant? Uh, no, sir. I mean, there, there's no such flat in the whole building. And that's the position I was in when the police took us down to that palm garden to see the body. I never did like the palm garden much. It's a big, dimly lighted hollow of a place. With bird cages beside the palms and an artificial goldfish pond in the middle. I liked it even less at three o'clock in the morning with a dead man looking at me from his chair. They sent us in one at a time. I was first to see the homicide squad officer. And there was Inspector Braddock, a big, sleepy-looking hulk with a hat like a pirate sitting on a bench throwing pebbles at that pond. Back would go his arm and a pebble would hit the water. Back would go his arm and a pebble would hit the water. And that's all you've got to tell me, Mr. Dunham? Yeah, that's all, Inspector. It happens to be true. Oh, I believe you. After all, son, we've got corroboration. Corroboration from whom? From your other girlfriend, Fifi Latour. But Fifi's not here. She ran out of here as soon as Duroc's body fell through that door. Yes, but she didn't run far. A cop wondered why she was running and brought her back. Where's Fifi now? In that room there, talking to your official girlfriend. Oh, that's fine. That's beautiful. The one thing I didn't tell Anita. Why don't you wake up? Wake up? How? This isn't post office any longer. It's murder. And one of that gang out there shot Pierre Duroc. Are you serious? Serious. Sure, I'm serious. This is as clever and slick and mean a trick as ever went on the blotter. Pierre Duroc was one of the goats. You were the other. This uncle of yours is a fairly important guy, isn't he? Wait a minute. Just exactly what are you saying about the old boy? I'm saying he gets lots of publicity. This hobby of his, keeping dicky birds, must be pretty well known. Yes, I suppose so. All right. So if Duroc came to visit your uncle tonight... You say, if Duroc came to visit my uncle. What you're forgetting, son, is that Duroc's an important man, too. He's a visiting foreigner, capital letters, and the department's got to keep an eye on him. The Rock did go to visit your uncle tonight, and he was carrying $20,000 in cash. What are you intimating? Murder. Inspector Braddock. Yes, Sergeant? That crowd out there is raising Kane, especially the old man and the French gal. Shall I let him in? Yeah, you can let him in now. An hour. No, more than an hour. Sitting in an ante room without even hearing why we're here. I tell you, Evans, this is intolerable. It's all right, sir. They probably know what they're doing. You think so, my friend? But I still don't know why I'm here. How very interesting, Miss Latour. Such extreme absent-mindedness. Well, perhaps Ron could tell you why you're here. Oh, listen, Anita, I can explain everything. Can you explain the disappearing apartment? Well, that's better. I'd like, if you don't mind, to have a little quiet here. Now, which one of you is Mr. Rufus Denham? I am Rufus Denham, sir. Rufus Denham of Denham and Company. Can there be any doubt whatever about that? No, but I thought I'd ask. I was just telling your nephew, Mr. Denham, that Pierre Duroc came here tonight to see you. To see me, Inspector? That's right. <laughs> I can only characterize that statement, sir, as a flat and downright lie. I've never met that man. I didn't say you met him. I said he came here to see you. Duroc wanted to buy some property from you, didn't he? Well, well I suppose he did. And Duroc always paid spot cash, didn't he? Yes, I believe so. Just one more question. I imagine you've got a secretary. Yes, naturally I've got a secretary. Miss Helen Gardner. What about her? Somebody posing as your secretary telephoned to Rock at the Metropolis Hotel and spoke to him in very good French. 
Well, Inspector, don't stop there. Go on. This person, pretending to represent Rufus Dunham, asked Duroc to come here with the money and said they could settle the deal immediately. Don't you see the trick now? Don't you see Duroc was lured into a dummy apartment? A dummy apartment? What does this man mean? I'll tell you. All the flats are furnished exactly alike except for personal things. Pictures, books, lampshades, ornaments. Is that correct? Yes, of course it is. The murderer didn't dare use Rufus Dunham's real flat. But the murderer could always decorate an imitation flat. So that Pierre Duroc would be deceived when he saw... Five canary birds. That's it, son. But what was the idea? A very neat swindle. Look at Duroc's body now. Oh, I can't look at it. Look at his thick glasses. Well, the man was half blind. This so-called secretary, disguised, would meet Duroc in an imitation flat. Duroc would hand over the money and get forged title deeds in return. When Duroc had gone, the flat could be put right again and no evidence left. But, uh... Something went wrong. That's huh? right. Something went wrong. The rock suspected. And it had to be killed. Right again. Inspector Braddock, who is the murderer? Can't you guess? Crinom. I think I know how it all happened. Do you, Miss Latour? Well, it's very smart of you. Uh, this poor Ronald of mine, he is at a bachelor party. They do not think that he will be home until daylight. Um, but he get reformed and come home early. He blundered straight into that flag in time to interrupt... In time to interrupt the murder, yes. Afterwards, when you were supposed to run away... But I did run away! Sure, Miss Latour, I'm admitting you did. Then why do you look at me as though I didn't? Afterwards, as I was saying, the murderer had to hit Ronald Denham over the head and drag him out in the hall. Duroc's body was brought down here along with the canary cages that had been borrowed from here. And the dummy flat was set right again. Uh, just one moment, Inspector Raddock. I, I'm not disputing anything you say, but... Uh, well, sir, what's on your mind? The murderer. What about the murderer? Well, all this. Uh, wouldn't it have been much too heavy a job for a woman? Who said the murderer was a woman? Well, didn't you? I don't think I did. I said the murderer was somebody who planned to swindle. And you still don't see it, any of you, because you can't find the dummy flat. Well, no, and I can't find it myself. That's one question you've got to answer here and now. Where in Satan's name did I go? Whose flat was I in? Your own. What? My own? Naturally. If you'd been cold sober, you might have made a mistake. But your instinct brought you home to your own flat. And the only possible murderer is the man who shares that flat with you. The man who thought you'd be away until daylight. The man who knows enough about Dunham's business affairs to plan this swindle against Duroc. Look out, Inspector Braddock. Grab him, Sergeant. <laughs> Thomas Evans, I arrest you for the murder of Pierre Duroc. Good Lord, Evans. Well, that's about all there is to the story. Anita and I were married last week. She's a wonderful girl. I tried to talk her into our staying on in my old flat, but she said she just had to have an apartment which didn't have such a habit of disappearing. Oh, we're very happy. We agree about everything, don't we, dear? Oh, practically everything, darling. But I still don't think it was cute of Fifi to send up three dozen canaries for a wedding present. <laughs> and so closes Five Canaries in the Room. Starring Ona Munson, Lee Bowman, and Osa Masson. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, when our suspense play will be Last Night by Cornell Woolrich, and will star more of your Hollywood favorites. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear. With Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
In just a moment, you'll hear James Stewart as the six shooter. There's music for you tomorrow evening with two of your favorite song stylists. First, it's the Dinah Shore Show, and then Songs with Sinatra. There's laughter, too, in your Friday lineup with three comedy favorites. The Bob Hope Show with Bob's guest, Jerry Colonna, the Phil Harris, Alice Faye Show, and Can You Top This? It's a great Friday night program lineup, all of them heard only on NBC. James Stewart as the Sick Shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. Its handle unmarked. People call them both the Sick Shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as the Six Shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still remembered legends. about seven o'clock on a Saturday evening, and I was riding down the east trail that led from Castle City over to Crown Ranch. It's been a real warm day, a little breeze was coming up now, and things were cooling off, a nice, comfortable twilight. I hadn't seen any signs of habitation for the last few miles. The soil was pretty thin and sandy, probably wouldn't grow much. But a little further on, the ground turned brown, rich looking. I noticed a frame house sitting back, oh, 50 yards back from the trail. When I was almost even with the house, the front door opened and somebody came running out toward me. Hey, hey, mister, would you hold up a minute, mister? Young boy, it looked like, about 15, 16, wearing blue jeans and a checkered shirt and a little peak cap pulled down over his ears. Whoa, Scar. Whoa, boy. Whoa, boy. Howdy, son. What can I do for you? You come from town, mister? That's right. You didn't run across Friendly DeWitt on the trail, did you? Friendly DeWitt? You know him, don't you, mister? He runs the traveling mercantile. How's that? Oh, sure. We're too far out to get into town very much, so he brings around a wagon load of goods every once in a while. I, I just don't know what we do without him. Well, don't stand out there all night jawing. Just find out about Friendly, like I told you. The gentleman ain't seen him, ma'am. Ah. Oh, shut up, Fern. You can wear something else if you have to. The supper dishes are waiting, Cindy Lou. What what was that she called you? Cindy Lou. But that's a girl's name. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Oh, and this light here, the way you were dressed, I, I sort of thought maybe you were... It I don't mean... matter. Thanks again, mister. So long. Ah. Ah, so long. Hmm, Cindy Lou. Hmm. Well, I gave Scar a little touch of my heel. Let's go. Come on. Come on, boy. We started off. I figured I'd had about eight miles to go before I'd reached the Crown Ranch. I, I hadn't been through this part of the country in quite a spell. But I was pretty certain Floyd Prince would remember me from the old days. He'd sign me on for the summer if he had an opening. Come on, Scar. Come on. Come on. It was about 15 minutes later, and I... I came to the fork on the trail. I saw a wagon rolling along from the south. There's some wagon, too. Almost twice the size of anything I'd ever run into before. And the way the canvas bulged out, it looked like it was loaded to the brim. Well, it stood to reason that this was the traveling mercantile that Cindy Lou had mentioned. Whoa, Scott. Whoa. Whoa, Pacey. Whoa, Pacey. Easy now. Easy there. <laughs> Howdy, friend. Good evening. Good evening. You're, uh, Mr. DeWitt, I take it. You take it right, sir, except for that Mr. Point. Just call me friendly like the rest of the folks. A friend in need is a friend indeed. <laughs> uh, something you need, mister? No, no. Shoelaces, chewing tobacco, flour, salt, kitchen utensils, ammunition, yardage, zone equipment, anything at all. Just you name it, I got it here in my wagon. <laughs> yeah, sounds like quite an assortment there. Oh, that's only a part of it. 
I didn't even touch on my medical supplies. Oh. Old Doc Bostow's painkiller, Seth. Simple, all purpose salve. Uh -huh. Miss Jenny's bunion plasters and corn removers. You got any corns that's troubling you, mister? They're just a thing. No, no, I don't do too much walking. Oh. Some liniment, then? Uh, no, thanks, just the same. I'm in pretty good health. Studying well, studying. what about wearing apparel? I got a full line of Levi's shirts, bandanas, cotton and wool socks. No, I'm just, afraid I'm just not in the market for anything friendly. I, oh. The only reason I stopped was to tell you that those folks down the trail are getting kind of anxious about you. Folks down the trail? Uh-huh. You know, the farmhouse a couple miles back there. Well, I just can't imagine who you're talking about, mister. I ain't even headed that way. I'm making a delivery over the Davis Ranch near Evergreen. A uh, Davis girl's getting married tomorrow morning. I'm bringing all the paraphernalia for the wedding. You sure somebody in this neighborhood's looking for me? They seem to be. I don't know the family's name exactly. The girl I bumped into is called Cindy Lou. Well, that must be Cindy Lou Ames. But why would... Great yellow pumpkins. Patty Ames. That dress she ordered for her daughter Fern. Uh, what time you make it out to be, mister? I ain't on pack my shipment of alarm clocks yet. Oh, it must be 7.30. Well, know. maybe I can get there before they leave. If I don't, Hattie Ames will skin me alive. Uh, get up, Teddy. Come on now. Come on, Francis. Come on. I knew there was something else. And I was working on that dress only this morning, too. Shortening the hem. So long, mister. Hope you enjoy the square dance. Dance? What are you... Come on, Scott. Come on, Dan, what are you what are you talking about? Well, that's where you're heading, ain't it? Brown Ranch? Yeah, as a matter of fact, it is. But I didn't know about any dance or anything. I was going to ask Floyd Prince for a job. Well, you mean tell me you ain't heard about the celebration tonight? No, not a word. Well, it's a count of Floyd Prince's son. He just come home from school in back east. Why, you mean Monty Prince? Yeah, that's the boy's name. You know him, mister? Oh, I used to. He was just a little shaver then. He's all grown up, huh? Well, he must be 20 or so, somewhere along in there. I guess he'll be taking over the crown one of these days. I see. Well, I reckon better put off my job hunting until some other time. I I wouldn't want to bother Floyd to give him a party. I'll, I'll ride along with you for a spell, friendly. Well, if you're an acquaintance of Floyd Prince's, I imagine you'd be more than welcome at his party. Practically everybody in the neighborhood's been invited. Maybe so, maybe so. But fact is, I'm not too good at square dancing. I don't know, but there's just something about my legs. I, a little too much of them, I reckon. <laughs> well, I just hope you're the only absentee. Well, what do you mean? Well, Hattie's daughter, Fern. She was planning to wear this here dress her mom ordered from me. Oh. Yeah, oh. like it's not she's having a tantrum right now. She sure takes after Hattie. She does, huh? Yes, sir. And mind not delivering her outfit on time, well, there'll be real catastrophe. You see, Hattie's aiming to marry her Fern off to this young Monty Prince. And she'll probably manage it, too. Hattie usually gets her own way. Uh-oh. Look over there, mister. Hmm? Uh, buggy coming up the trail. That'll be Hattie and Fern on the way to the crown. Yeah, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Well, yeah. it's too late to do anything about the dress now if they're sorted off. Yeah, the best thing for me to do is to stay out of sight. Uh, I'll get my wagon over here under these trees here. Well, but, easy, friends, easy, easy now. But, oh, but what do you... Easy. They're bound to see you sitting there. Oh, anyway. you don't know Hattie Ames like I do. What do you mean? Well, she's as nearsighted as a buffalo. Can't see her hand in front of her face unless she's wearing her bifocals. Oh. Uh, and she won't be wearing them either. Not if she's heading for Shindig. Well, what about the daughter? Well, I told you, Fern takes after her mother. She's as blind as a bat without her spectacles. I see. Uh, sh sh here they come. <laughs> there, there. What did they tell you? Oh, <laughs> doggone, they never even glanced over towards us, did they? No, nope, not a glance. <laughs> well, I guess I might as well mosey over to the Davis Ranch. Nice meeting you, Mr. Uh, Mr., uh... Oh, I'm sorry, friendly. I meant to introduce myself. My name's Ponsett, Brick Ponsett. Oh. Oh! Why, Mr. Ponsett, I, I didn't recognize you. Oh, no reason why you should, friendly. No reason you should. Well, I heard so much about you. And that gun. Here, Mr. Ponsett, here. I, I got me some samples of a new hair tonic. Smells real elegant, too. Uh, maybe you'd like to try it. They say it'll grow fuzz on... <laughs> Not that there's anything mad with your hair, you understand? Well, my supply is kind of decreasing. A little tonic might be... Very handy. All oh, right, sir. Just a second now. I got it right back here. Ah, here it is. Ah, thanks, friendly. My thanks pleasure, Mr. Ponsett. My pleasure. Well, I... Say, uh... I, I just happened to think, uh... What happened to the other daughter? Hmm? Well, uh, that buggy that just went by. Uh, there were only two women in it. Now, the girl I met back at the farm, she wasn't... Oh, I... you mean Cindy Lou. Well, <laughs> she wouldn't be going to Prince's dance. She, she wouldn't have. No, no. 
You see, Hattie ain't uh, got much use for her. Uh, Cindy ain't Hattie's real kin. She's just a stepdaughter. Oh, oh. Yeah, Hattie and Fern, well, they just seem to go out of their way to make things miserable for her. Uh, well, not like this here dance, for instance. Everybody knows that Monty Prince and Cindy Lou used to be real friendly when they was kids. Well, she'd probably give her eye tooth to go to that party tonight, see him again, but... Well, well it's too bad she can't. Eh? Yeah, yeah, but there's nothing anybody can do about it. Why, she don't even have a dress to her name. You know, I've got a hunch she'd be real pretty if Hattie ever allowed her to fix herself up. But well, she seemed a mighty nice-looking girl. Maybe. Yeah, sure is. Yeah. What's the matter? Why shouldn't Cindy Lou go to that dance tonight? With all the stuff in this wagon, I could fix her up so she'd be the prettiest girl there. Oh, well, maybe you could, friendly. Maybe you could. <laughs> it sure be a good trick to play on Hattie and Fern. <laughs> Why, if they couldn't tell my wagon at 50 feet, they'd never know Cindy Lou when I got done with her. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Ponsett. Why? Well, a girl can't go to square dance all by herself. She's got to have an escort. Oh, I suppose so. But, oh, now, hold on, friendly. What, you don't mean me? Well, you're a friend of the princess. You said so yourself. Why, I'm old enough to be her... If we don't hurry, Mr. Punson, the square dance will be all over. Come on. Step lively there, Francis. Come on there, Peggy. Let's go traveling. Come on, Mr. Punson. <laughs> don't understand, Mr. DeWitt. You, you mean you want to loan me a dress? And all the trimmings, Cindy Lou. Before I get done with you, you'll be so duded up that your own stepmother won't recognize you. And and you want to take me to the dance, Mr. Ponson? Uh, yeah, sure. That is, you want to go. Yeah. Well, that, that's right kindly of you both, but the fact is I, I don't have no interest in attending the doings at the Crown. Oh, oh you don't, huh? Well, in that case... I I'm... don't know where you ever got such a notion, Mr. DeWitt. As if I cared anything about seeing Monty Prince again. Why, well, I haven't even thought of him since he went away to school. Not once. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I reckon your stepsister Fern's done some thinking about him. A lot of good it'll do her. Monty wouldn't look to... I mean, it's none of my business, one way or the other. No, no, I guess it isn't. Uh... I'm oh, sorry we bothered you. Right. Let's go, Franny. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Ponson. Night, Cindy Lou. Um, uh, Mr. DeWitt. Mm hmm? Was there, um, something you wanted, Cindy? I, uh, I guess maybe I'm acting kind of ungrateful. I mean, well, you both did put yourself out for me, and it was real generous of you to do it. I, I don't suppose it would do me no harm to go to that square dance. For a little while, anyway. If you really want me to. Well, now, that's more like it. Uh, let's see now. The uh, first thing we got to do is find a dress. Uh, you come on out to my wagon, uh, Cindy. We, we'll pick something that'll make you look like a princess. Uh, yes, sir, a real princess. <laughs> Well, I want to tell you, Friendly wasn't very far wrong. That's just exactly how Cindy Lou looked when she came out of that bedroom about half an hour later. And for a minute, we just stood there, just not saying a word, just staring at her. Is something wrong? Don't I look good enough to go to the dance? Mm, good enough? Why, well, Cindy Lou, you're, you're as pretty as picture. Ain't you, Brady? Why, well, she sure is. Well, if uh, you're all ready, Cindy, well... uh, There's just one thing. We forgot the shoes. Shoes? I don't have any party slippers of my own. Oh. <clears throat> well, uh, well, you see, Cindy Lou, that, that, that's about the only item I don't stock in my wagon. I, well, I, I guess you can make do with the shoes you're wearing, can't you? Oh, oh I don't see how... I... Well, well, look at him yourself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no. No, wait, wait. I am carrying one pair of fancy slippers. They're part of the Davis girls' wedding outfit. Well? Uh, oh, no, no. I, I couldn't loan them to Cindy, though. I, I got to leave for the Davis ranch as soon as you two start off for the dance. I, I promised I'd be there first thing in the morning, and it's a good eight hours drive in that wagon of mine. Oh, I see, yeah. Well, it... It was real nice of you both, anyhow. I'll never forget what you tried to do for me and how I felt when I put on this dress. 
How wonderful. Now, hold on, Cindy. Hold on, hold on. It's all right. I, I, just let me do some figuring here. Uh, let's see. If I was, if I was to leave here by midnight, I, I could be at the Davis place long about 8 a.m. Mm, that ought to be early enough. There ain't no reason why you both couldn't be back here before 12 o'clock, is no, there? No, no, no reason at all. Well, then I guess the next thing to do is to find out whether them slippers will fit or not. I'll bring them right in. Well, I just don't know what to say, Mr. Ponce. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. It, well, it, it all seems like something out of a storybook. You know, Cindy, I was just thinking the same thing. Well, here you are, Cindy. Try them on. Gee, they sure do look small, don't they? Mm. Yeah. You oh. think you can make it? Oh, I don't... Oh, there. Oh, it is kind of tight, but I... Well, well, try the other one. Uh. <laughs> if you can get one on, uh, the other ought to go, too. Uh. There. Good, good. <laughs> uh, now, you going to be able to walk all right? Oh, I'll be able to walk all right, Mr. Dewey. The way I feel, I could almost fly. Well, <laughs> then you better get started. You won't have too long of the dance, you know. And don't forget, Britt. You got to have her back here by midnight. Don't worry, friendly. I won't forget. You are listening to James Stewart as the Six Shooter. The story of Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman whose name has become legend throughout the great Southwest. Now, act two of the story called When the Shoe Doesn't Fit. Cindy Lou up on Scar, and she managed to seat herself in front of the saddle. I kind of held on to her, keep her from falling off, and we started off for the Crown Ranch. It took us about 45 minutes to get there, and that party was in full swing when we walked into the parlor. Broke your cow and brand your calf. Bring your honey out. Lloyd Prince came over to the door when he saw us and told me we're more than welcome. He's real nice, considering I'd invited myself. I sort of managed to avoid mentioning Cindy Lou's name, and what with all the hubbub, Floyd didn't seem to notice that I hadn't introduced her properly. But Floyd's son, Monty, well, he didn't wait for any introduction. He just took one look at Cindy, and that was the last I saw of her. As far as I could tell, the other girls at the party were just completely out of the picture from then on. I waited until there was an intermission and the dancing, and then I moseyed over to the punch bowl. Oh, can I help you, Mr. Ponces? Uh, oh, why, yes, ma'am, thank you. I'm Mrs. Ames, Patty Ames. Oh, how do, Miss Ames? Oh, third, third, over here, dear. I want you to meet somebody. Oh, this is my daughter, Fern, Mr. Ponces. I'm pleased to meet you, Fern. Well, speak up, speak up. <laughs> Oh, uh, Fern, sort of shy. I uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, by the way, um, that young lady that you brought to the party, she doesn't seem to be spending much time with you, does she? Oh, that's the trouble when a man brings a pretty girl to a dance. He's apt to find himself all alone. Fern, stop the fidgeting. <coughs> Of course, now, some girls have character as well as look. All right, I now, say, yeah. grab your partners for the next dance. Oh, 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 my goodness, they're starting another dance. Now, Mr. Ponsett, don't think that you have to ask my permission to dance with Fern. You just go right ahead. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, Fern? <laughs> Like I said, I'm not much of a square dancer, but there just didn't seem to be any way of turning Fern down. Well, I guess I should say there wasn't any way of turning her mother down. So, we did our best. Whoop! Oh, sorry, Fern. As the evening wore on, it didn't look like she had any other part lined up. Well... I figured it was up to me to sort of fill in. Whoop, whoop. Oh, my. 
I sure didn't mean to kick you, Fern. <laughs> There's one thing about her, though. She sure didn't talk a man to death. And somehow the time passed, and the next thing I knew it was after 11 o'clock. Now, that meant Cindy and I had to be starting home, so I looked around for her, but she wasn't in sight. I excused myself from Fern and headed out the front porch. Yeah, yeah, Cindy was there all right, but the thing that surprised me was she was all alone. Looked like she'd been crying. Uh, <clears throat> Cindy. Oh, Oh, Mr. Ponson. What, are you all right? Oh, I'm fine, just fine. Where's Marty? I don't know. Uh-huh. Well, maybe you'd better find him and say good night. I never want to see him again. Not as long as I live. Oh. Well, what happened? I thought you two were hitting off real good. Uh... I... I thought so, too, at first. While we were inside dancing, everything was just wonderful. And then... All of a sudden, he started acting like he didn't care about me at all. Said he couldn't be spending all his time with one girl. He had to dance with some of the others. Mm-hmm. Well, after all, the party is in his honor. And that ain't all, Mr. Ponsett. He, he didn't even know who I was. Well, didn't you tell him? Well, I thought, sure, he'd know. I, I, I never... I figured he'd forget me, not in just a few years. Mm, well, you've changed, Cindy, and the way you're all fixed up tonight. Oh, that and... wouldn't matter. Not if Monty really liked me. I, I'd never forget him. I'd know him no matter how much he changed or, or how he dressed. Well, all you had to do was just tell him who you were, you know. No, I, I just couldn't. And you mustn't tell him either. You've got to promise me you won't. Now, please, Mr. Ponson. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what you want. Well, I, I think maybe we'd better leave. Yeah. Well, I, I'm ready. Uh, you, uh, you got everything? I guess so. Why? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I just thought maybe you'd lost one of your slippers or... My slippers? Whatever gave you that idea? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, don't, I just sort of crossed my mind somehow. <laughs> Never mind. I, I, I'll get scarred. <laughs> Well, it just goes to show you that stories in real life don't work out the same way. Instead of falling in love, Cindy and Monty Prince were just far away as ever, and even farther. And there didn't seem to be any way of getting them together, either. At least ways he wasn't going to be able to do it by finding one of her slippers at the dance, that's for sure. As a matter of fact, she couldn't have lost a shoe at the dance if she'd wanted to. When we got her home, we found out she couldn't even get them off. Doggone it, Cindy, you must not be trying. Well, you didn't have as much trouble getting them on. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. DeWitt. I, I'm doing my best. My feet must have swelled up from the dancing or something. The yeah, here, to... here, let me do it. Oh, sure. <coughs> Why, they're, they're just plain stuck fast. I know. Maybe in the morning my feet will go back to normal. And yeah. then you... Hey, look out the window there, friendly. Isn't that a buggy out there? Holy smoke. Fern and Hattie. So long, Cindy. Bye, Britt. Oh, wait a minute, friendly. I don't want them catching me here either. But but what about the slippers in the wedding tomorrow? The bride's wearing a long dress, reaches clear down to the floor. She can get married in a bare feet if she has to. Well, well thanks for everything. Good night, Cindy. I'm, I'm sorry things didn't work out better for you, but... Good night. <laughs> Well, along about noontime, the next day, I was in my hotel room, washing up Sunday dinner. They were uh, planning to serve fried chicken and corn fritters and apple pie. The Castle Hotel always put the food on family style, so I figured I'd better be real prompt or there wouldn't be any... Yeah? Yeah, come in. Oh. Oh, Marty. Oh. What are you doing in town? I, uh... I came to see you, Mr. Ponsett. No, oh, is that so? It's about, um... About that girl you brought out to the Crown last night. Well, I sort of had the impression you weren't too interested in her. Oh, I'm interested, all right. I wish I wasn't, but I am. How's that? Well, you see, Mr. Ponsett, before I went back east, I was, um... Well, I was real fond of another girl. Cindy Lou Ames, her name is. Oh. 
And we sort of uh, promised that we'd wait for each other. But last night, that girl with you... Well, she sort of made me forget Cindy. She did, huh? For a while, anyway. And then I remembered, and I, I felt real bad, because it, it didn't seem like I was being fair to Cindy. So I went inside, and I left the other girl to herself. But doggone it, all night long, I kept thinking about both girls, and they, they sort of got mixed up in my mind. I couldn't even keep them straight. Uh-huh. Uh, you've got quite a problem there, haven't you? Yeah. Excuse me. Good morning, Mr. Ponsett. I finally managed to go... Oh. Cindy Lou. Hello, Monty. Golly, it's good to see you. I was hoping you'd be at the dance last night. Were you? You know, you haven't changed a bit. No. No, I guess I haven't. They're in this paper bag, Mr. Ponsett. Those things I borrowed last night. Oh. I, I thought I... maybe you could return them to Mr. DeWitt for me. Well, I'm not sure I'll be running into him again, Cindy. Here, Mr. Ponsett. Now, be careful. Don't... Oh, oh, oh. oh Mr. Ponsett. Oh, doggone it, Cindy. I just, just sort of slipped out of my fingers. I'm... Well, here, I'll put these party shoes back in the sack. There. Well, goodbye and thanks. Goodbye, Monty. Uh, Cindy, wait a minute. Where'd you get those shoes? I, I don't know what you mean. Why, they're the same ones that... They're exactly the same. Cindy Lou, you were at the square dance last night. You and that other girl... Why, there wasn't any other girl. It, it was you. No wonder I couldn't get you straightened out in my... What are you talking about? Uh, tell her, Mr. Ponsett, what I told you just before she came in. Well, I think maybe you'd better tell her yourself, Monty. As a matter of fact, I'm kind of anxious to get downstairs while there's still some fried chicken left, so... Now, you listen to me, really Cindy. Cute, I've been in love with you ever since I can remember. I don't believe you. Well, it's true. And it doesn't matter what kind of a dress you wear or how your hair is fixed or... or... <laughs> Well, there wasn't much point in my hanging around to see if Cindy and Monty would finally get together. There's only one way a story like this can end. I guess you know as well as I do. They were just bound to live happily ever after. Six Shooter is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. It is written by Frank Burt and is based on a character created by him. Suspense. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. Dan Daly in Six Feet Under, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Harlow, did you know that in the springtime, a young man's fancy turns to... The world-famous quality and performance of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs? Well... Autolite, you know, is the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. And when you come right down to it, who knows more about the best spark plugs for your car than Autolite ignition engineers? The men who design coils, distributors, and all the other important parts that go to make up the complete automotive electrical system. Why, it's the skill of the same Autolite ignition engineers that made possible the practical development of the Autolite resistor spark plug, the greatest advancement in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. Have you no sentiments about spring? Sure, Hap. Spring into your car tomorrow and see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car. Because you're always right with Autolite. And now, with Six Feet Under and the performance of Dan Daly, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. You'll never know what it's like down there. 
You're six feet under ten hours a day without food or water. With that light on your face so the yokels can pay their dimes and stare down at you. It's like being dead, only you know what's going on. The pump that feeds the air down to you seems to be keeping time with your heartbeat. And you can't help thinking that if it ever stops, the heartbeat will stop with it. You get a lot of time to think down there. To think of all the things that can happen. And when the show closes for the night and they dig you up, you head for the nearest bar to forget all the crazy things you've been thinking. Yeah, what'll it be? Double whiskey beer chaser. Hey, you with the carnival? Yeah. Must be interesting. What do you do? Got a sideshow. Fill this up, will you? Sure. What's your trick? Sword swallower? No, I roll over and play dead. Oh, you're the guy that's buried alive. Yeah, I saw you this afternoon at the matinee. Took the kids over. Yeah. What are you raising, a couple of undertakers? Oh, I didn't take them into your tent. Seemed kind of a morbid thing for kids. But not for you. Huh? What do you mean? Skip it. How about hitting this glass again? Okay. Now that people see that act of yours, the tent was crowded. I kind of thought it'd be different. How different? Well, paying a dime ahead just to look down at you through that glass. It's not a bad racket you got there. Yeah, big, fat, happy racket. Not tough like standing behind a bar and breathing and eating and moving whenever you want to. Well, if you think it's so hot, dig yourself a hole and pull up a cough and nobody's stopping you. When you want another drink, call me. Just leave the bottle. I'm still alive. I can pour my own. Suit yourself, friend. They were all the same. They paid a dime to look at you down there. But if they saw you later above the ground, they acted like you were cheating them. Like you owed it to them to stay buried or they want getting their money's worth. I used to do another act. A juggling act. An act that took me years of sweat and practice to learn. But nobody came to see that. You had to learn a dog's trick to make a living. You had to trust people. People you wondered about. Hello, Jack. Get I'm lo- looking for you. Come on, get lost, Cliff. Don't follow me around. Miriam sent me out to find you. She knows where I am ten hours a day. That's more than most wives know. If Miriam was my wife, I'd spend a little time with her. You spend quite a little time with her as it is, Cliff. Quite a little time. Now you're talking through that bottle, Jack. Miriam and I are old friends. Yeah, I heard about it lots of times. You were a stage door Johnny when she worked on burlesque, weren't you? I used to laugh about you. That was before you came to work for us. But now I don't laugh anymore, Cliff. Now I wonder. You're drunk. Am I? What's a guy like you doing around a carnival, Cliff? You were a big shot accountant with a good business. And all of a sudden, you chuck everything to learn to be a barker for a pitch like mine. And to dig me out of that hole every night. I'm not complaining. Why should you? Because I figure you gotta have a reason, Cliff. I figure that maybe some night you're gonna forget to dig. Oh, you're being ridiculous, Jack. Sure. Only you still haven't told me why you joined the show, Cliff. That's my business. Well, never mind. I'll tell you. Because you're in love with Miriam and it's killing you to see her married to me. All right, Jack. That's part of it. Sure, I love Miriam, but that isn't what's killing me. A bad heart is the thing that's killing me. What do you mean? I chucked my business and joined the show because I've only got about a year to live. Miriam is the only thing in the world I care about. And I wanted to be near her. That's a very touching story, pal. What am I supposed to do, break down and cry? Jack, I'd do anything to see Miriam happy. And if it meant killing you, I could do it without batting an eye. Because I've got nothing to lose. I want you to know that. That's good, Cliff. Now we understand each other. Have a drink. I don't want one. Oh, well, this ain't just an ordinary drink, Cliff. This is a toast to one of us. To the guy who buries the other one. For good. It was a fool thing to do. A mistake. Because he'd play his cards closer now. If I told him to pack up and get out, he might take Miriam with him. And I was crazy about Miriam. Something was wrong between us, but I was still crazy about her. I had to know I had to wait and find out if he could take her from me. And that meant I had to keep him around. And every day, he'd have me helpless down there in that hole like a baby. I didn't want to drink anymore. I went back to the tent and tried to sleep, but I kept having that same dream over and over again. Not a picture dream, but a dream in sound. The sound of that air pump that kept me alive down there. It got slower and slower, and then it stopped. And I woke up choking, I jumped out of bed. Jack! Yeah. Jack, Jack, is that you? Yeah, yeah, Miriam. 
You go back to sleep. Is something wrong, dear? Oh, I had a dream, that's all. Go back to sleep. Oh, well, maybe if I may just... I don't want any hot milk. I'm going out for a while. Jack, I hope you're not... Where would I get it this time of night? I'm not going to drink to save the lecture. You don't have to snap at me like that. That's all you've been doing lately. Have I? Well, nobody's died from it so far. I don't get you at all. Don't you? Well, maybe you're not trying hard enough. I'm going for a walk. Jack! Jack! I walked around the grounds. The moon was doing trick things with the shadows around the tents and the pitch signs along the midway. I loved it. A cheap two-bit carnival, but I loved it. When Miriam and I were first married, I used to dream about owning the works someday. Yeah, I was going to do big things. Clean up with a juggling act, then write the Becker brothers and offer to buy them out. The Ferris wheel, the rides, the whole show. I was going to own the world. But instead, I wound up with six feet of it. They could dig me up out of that hole every night, but I couldn't dig my dreams up anymore. Finally, I went back to my own tent and slept until showtime. Miriam was gone when I woke up, so I walked over to our pitch. I was going to pull the flap and go in, but then I heard her talk on the cliff. So I listened. Again last night. I hate it when he's like that. I can't stand it much longer. You won't have to stand it after tomorrow night. You'll be away from here. Things will be different. You're sure you want to do this for me, Cliff? I want you to be happy. He suspects something. I know him. If he finds out... He won't find out. Not until tomorrow night. And when he does, it'll be too late. He won't be able to do anything about it. You love your wife and you stand outside a tent and hear her planning to murder you. It wasn't only Cliff. It was her, too. And I knew right then what I had to do. I had to kill them. I had to kill the both of them. And tonight, right away. Autolite is bringing you Dan Daly in Six Feet Under. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Hap, who knows more about law than a lawyer? You sure got me this time, Harlow. Well, then, who knows more about the best spark plug for your car than Autolite ignition engineers? The men who designed the complete electrical system for many makes of America's finest cars. They engineer spark plugs just as they engineer coils, distributors, and all other ignition parts to work together as a perfect team. Go on, go on, Harlow. Well, it's the skill of the same Autolite ignition engineers that made possible the practical development of the Autolite resistor spark plug. The greatest advancement in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. And the newest addition to a complete line of transport, aviation, marine, and regular automotive spark plugs engineered by Autolite in sizes and heat ranges for every purpose. I guess I've learned my lesson. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car because you're always right with Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Dan Daly, in Six Feet Under, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Now I knew. It wasn't only Cliff, it was Miriam, too. It was like getting hit in the stomach when you didn't expect it. You love your wife and you stand outside a tent and hear her planning to murder you. I walked around the grounds in a daze. I tried to tell myself that I was wrong, but your own ears can't lie to you. Jack! Oh. Hey, Jack! Oh, uh, hello, Bonnie. Hey, I've been screaming my head off at you. You hypnotized or something? Sorry, Bonnie, I was thinking. Oh, call for Cliff on the phone in the office wagon. You want to take it for him? All right. Oh, 
Hello? Uh, this is Morton at Transcountry Airlines. I have your reservations confirmed. Oh, oh, good. <laughs> Two seats on the midnight plane to Chicago tomorrow night. Th- thanks a lot. I know you said you'd come in to pick up the tickets this afternoon, but I wanted to call and let you know it was confirmed. I'm glad you did. You'll never know how glad. <laughs> Just part of our service, sir. I'll hold the tickets for you. Now, you're going to enough trouble. You can cancel the tickets. <laughs> but I thought I'm you're... changing somebody's mind. Nobody's going to Chicago tomorrow night. Nobody. When you see something coming and you know it's too late to stop it, you get calm. You watch it like it was happening to somebody else. I had to kill them. I had to kill the both of them. Tonight, after the show. After they brought me up. I'd have ten hours down there to think of a way. I went into the tent and watched Cliff getting the hole ready for me. I wanted to laugh. Is this all right now? Yeah, that's deep enough. Cliff, I want that speaking tube hooked up today. What's the matter? Getting lonesome down there? I thought you didn't like to talk to the customers. Today I feel sociable. I had a glimpse into the bright and cheery future. Hook it up. You're the boss. Where's Miriam? Getting a new roll of tickets from the wagon. When there's a crowd out there on the midway cliff, Calliope going on the merry-go-round and all, can she hear my buzzer? Well, why wouldn't she? It's hooked up right from the box to the ticket cage. But you never use it, so what difference does it make? It could make a big difference if nobody was in the tent and the air shut off on me. A big difference. Let's check it. All right, there's a button in the box. Press it. Counter's just outside the flap. We can hear it from here. Are you pressing it? You see me, don't you, Cliff? I, I don't hear anything out there. Neither do I. Uh, it must be a, a loose wire or something. No, Cliff. It's the batteries. Because I checked while you were digging and the batteries are gone. Uh, oh, that's right. I, I forgot. When we were moving from the last town, my flashlight went dead. I, I borrowed the buzzer battery. But you forgot to put them back. Oh, I'm sorry, Jack. It slipped my mind. You never used a buzzer, so I didn't think of it. You thought of it when we needed the batteries. Jack, I tell you it was a mistake. That's all. Look, the, the, the midway's opening up. There's no time to start an argument. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be time for that later, tonight. We can talk it over tonight, Cliff. That suits me. Come on. Let's lower the box. All right. I'll go get a new set of batteries. You might as well climb down, slide into the box. I'll cover you when I get back. I lit a cigarette. My hands were wet and shaking. Suppose he didn't wait until tomorrow night. Suppose this was it. I couldn't tip my hand by refusing to go down, but I had to make sure I'd come up again. Just this once. He'd be gone a couple of minutes, long enough. I ducked out of the tent and across the midway to the pitch of old Anna, the fortune teller. Oh! Why are you so jumpy about Anna? You like, act like you've been seeing ghosts. I was communing with other world. Save that for the suckers. I want you to do something for me. I want you to promise and I don't want you to forget. Is it evil thing? No, no, Anna, it isn't evil. When we shut down at night, I want you to come over to the tent, that's all. I want you to hang around there until Cliff digs me up, understand? Beware of lower world, Jack. Evil things lurk there. Promise me, Anna. I promise. But let me read your fortune in the cards. It only takes a minute. There's no time. Besides, you read them for me on the train the other night. Was there something there you didn't tell me? Are you trying to frighten me with a sucker pitch? There was evil. The death cards were around you. They were all around you. Shut up, you old fool. Just come over to the tent tonight. That's all I want from you. That's all. I had to grab a hold of myself. A crazy old woman with a deck of greasy cards. I'd been with tent shows too long to let a thing like that get me. I went back to the tent, got down into the hole and slid into the box. Cliff lowered the narrow view shaft that the customers looked through. I fastened it to the hole just above my face. Then he started to shovel the dirt in on top of me. I could hear it hitting the box. There isn't another sound like it in the whole world. Then it was all done. Cliff looked down at me through the glass, and the smile on his face made me cold. Then he was gone, and I was alone with the sound of the air pump. In a few minutes, the customers started to come in, and it wasn't so bad. If anything went wrong, they'd be able to hear me through the speaking tube, just as I could hear them. Come on, Mother. 
Come on, look at him. Oh, you look. It gives me the creeping whistle, Dizzle. Well, you're the one who wanted to come in. Come on, it can't hurt you. Look, you can talk to him right through this here hoop, Nanny. Well, can you hear me down there? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, is it... Uh, well, I... I... Are you all right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> see, just like I told you, there's nothing to it. That's all we see for our money? Sure, the whole darn thing's a gyp. Well, so long down there. We'll all join you someday, sooner or later. <laughs> oh, Dad, what a thing to say. I think they give you a little more for your money, though. That's the way it was. Hour after hour, face after face, until all the faces blurred and ran together. Their voices came down with the same questions and the same disappointed wisecracks. But they kept paying and they kept coming. It was getting on to late afternoon because the crowd was beginning to thin out. Everybody would be headed home for dinner by 5.30 and the gang working on the midway would knock off and go to the commissary tent for chow. At 6.30, the crowd would drift back again. The big crowd with the men home from work. And by the time they were gone, old Anna the fortune teller, my insurance policy would be standing by, and Cliff would have to dig me out whether he wanted to or not. I was glad to see the crowd go for a while. It gave me the next hour alone to think and plan things out. Then it hit me. The next hour alone. I'd forgotten that part of it. I looked up. There were no faces in the viewing glass. I felt around with my hand, and I found a buzzer button in the ticket cage. I pressed it again and again, but Miriam didn't come. Sure. This was it. They were up there now, getting ready to do whatever they were going to do. Then they'd walk away over to the commissary tent. And they'd eat and laugh. Nobody'd suspect them. It'd be an accident. I tried to think of something else. They wouldn't have the nerve to go through with it. And then I knew I was wrong. Because all of a sudden, there was complete silence. Somebody had cut off the air pump. I twisted and turned, and I pushed against the lid of the box like a madman. But it didn't budge. There was more, a, more than a ton of earth on top of me. The pressure on my chest increased, and I couldn't breathe. Flashes of red and blue color were whirling around in my head. I looked up, gasping for air. And there was a face staring down at me, a child's face. See my baby turtle, mister? What are you doing down there, mister? Kid, kid, get somebody quick. Go outside and get some help. I'm smothering. Don't just stare at me. Call somebody. You hear me? Stop looking at me. Get somebody. He kept staring at me, his eyes wide and frightened. He moved his mouth once, but he was frozen with fear. And all of a sudden, his face was gone. He was gone. I made one last hopeless try at the lid, and then suddenly I didn't care anymore. I relaxed. All the colors in the world exploded in my head. Then they all ran together. There was a roaring sound. Everything went black. I came out of it slowly. The pump was going again. The beat of it keeping time with the throbbing in my head. And they were digging for me. I could hear the sounds of the shovels in the earth. And then finally, against the wooden top of the box. There we are. Give me a hand. Hey, you all right, Jack? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay now. All right, I'll boost you. Come on, pull uh, it up there. It's all right, all right. Lay me on. I'm, uh, I'm all right. Hey, Jack. I'm, uh, come over to my tent and sit down. There is evil here. I don't want to sit down. Where's Miriam? Where's Cliff? Somebody went for them to the commissary tent. They will be here soon. Yeah, soon. But it wouldn't have been soon enough. Lucky thing I spotted that kid running out of here. He's been sneaking into shows. He saw the air pump motor out and back and turned it off while he was fooling around with it. You figure that's the way it happened, huh? Come in. What's the matter here? Jack, what are you on top for? What happened? Take a guess, Miriam. There was an accident. Some kid shut off the motor for the air pump. <laughs> See, Miriam, that's all it was. Just an accident. Nobody to blame. Jack, I should have been here. Yeah, maybe you should have. You could have kept that kid out of the tent. It would have worked out better. Where's Cliff? Around, I don't know. You could have been killed down there. That's what I figured, too. I could have been, but I wasn't. Don't worry about it, baby. It won't happen again. It won't happen to me again. It was my game now. I was up walking and breathing. It was my game. I played the tender husband. 
I wasn't going to show her my cards now. That came later. When she calmed down, I kissed her. Then I went looking for my last answer. The kid who had turned off the motor. There were kids all over the place, all looking the same, the way kids do. But I'd remember his face. You're bound to remember a face when it might have been the last one you'd ever see. Then I spotted him going into the house of fun. I nodded to the ticket taker and went in after him. I caught him in the room with the tilted floors and grabbed him. Take it easy, kid. You won't get hurt. I didn't do nothing honest. Why'd you turn that motor off? I was just fooling with it, and it stopped, that's all. I didn't know what it was. Who told you to turn it off? Nobody. Let me go. Stop, kick. Tell me the truth, or I'll... Uh, and I'll give you a buck. I am telling the truth. Tell me. Tell me who told you. Stop biting me and tell me. Let you go when you answer me. What do you want me to say, mister? A man told you to turn that motor off, didn't he? No, no. I, I mean, yes. All right, yes. kid. All right. Here's your dollar. I don't want no dollar. I want to go home. I went into town and drank until the show closed down, until I was sure they'd all be asleep. Then I went to the first aid wagon and nosed around until I found what I wanted. A can of ether. Cliff was bigger than I, much bigger, and I had to be sure. I soaked a handkerchief in the stuff, and then I let myself into Cliff's tent. He was lying there, quietly. He was sleeping. He wasn't making a sound. I crept over to him and pushed the handkerchief over his mouth and nose. I held it there. Held his face right into it. He didn't even murmur. And when I let go after a while, his head dropped back. He was out. I picked him up and carried him to the pitch tent. I put him down in a box, and then I shoveled the dirt in on top of him. I left the air pump running. I wanted Miriam to see him down there, him instead of me. Then I could stop it waiting up for me when I went back together. Well, well, it's about time you got back. I've been worried sick about you. Worried about me, baby? That's silly. I can take care of myself. That accident this afternoon. I'm still shaky. Yeah, I can see why you would be. Jack, there's been something wrong with us. Maybe it's my fault. I want to straighten it out. Everything will be straightened out all right real soon. Come on. Let's go for a little walk. But it, it's after midnight. I know, but I got a surprise for you. Something I want you to see. What is it? Over at the pitch tent. Come on. She came. I had to hand it to her. She was playing the act of the hilt, just like nothing was wrong. I took her arm and held it tight. Good and tight. So she couldn't turn and run. And we went into the pitch tent. Well, what's the surprise? It's kind of dark in here. There's enough light down in the box. Go ahead. Take a look. Well, the, the hole, it, it's filled in. Yeah. The show has a new star for a one-night stand. Go ahead. Look. Jack, what? Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Yeah. How do you like it now? That's the way I was today when that motor cut off. Get him out. Get him out. Oh, it's my turn to cut the pump off. Only nobody will be able to fix it this time. Oh, no, don't you crazy. Sure. I just ripped these wires out and he gets what I, I almost got. What are you killing him for? Why? I knew, I knew what you were up to. You'll ever take that midnight plane tomorrow. You'll ever run away with him now. I wasn't running away with him. The tickets were for us, you hear me, for you and me. Well, there you forgot to tell me about it, baby. I couldn't. Cliff was lending us the money to buy the show. He said he'd be mine any else someday. I wanted to do it for you because I loved you. Because I hated what's been happening to you down there. Why would he want to help me? Because he loved me, that's why. And he knew you're all I care about. He sent the money for the show to Becker Brothers yesterday, and we were supposed to fly up tomorrow night to sign the papers in Chicago. You're lying. No. Yeah, you're, no, you're lying. No. You're lying or you'd have told me. Would you believe me? Would you believe anybody? Do something! Do something! The shovels. The shovels, Miriam. Where are they? Quick. Quick. Wait, help me. Wait. Miriam, dig. Dig. Help me. Dig. Dig. And that's it, Sheriff. You'll never know what it's like down there. 
You have nothing to do but thinking. Well, you get to thinking crazy things. That's why it happened. And when we got to him, he was dead. I see. Mm -hmm. If you want to have that typed up as a confession, I'll sign it. There's much good that'd do. That deputy that came in a while ago gave me a copy of the coroner's report. Cause of death, coronary thrombosis. His heart, no strangulation. He was already dead when you stopped that air pump. He was dead even before that, before you give him the ether. You, you mean Jack didn't kill him? Now, according to the coroner, death from natural causes. Uh, then you're not, you're not going to charge me with murder? You can't murder a dead man, mister. Just like you can't lock a man up for being a fool. Oh, Jack. Jack. It's all right, baby. You heard him. They can't do anything to me for being a fool. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Dan Daly. Hey, Harlow, here's a poem for you. All right. Summer, winter, spring, or fall, Harlow doesn't change at all. Be it day or be it night, Wilcox thinks of auto light. (laughs) Well, you're right there, Hap. Any season is the right season to talk about the more than 400 products made by auto light for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, electric windshield wipers, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Ray Milland. The play is called Pearls Are a Nuisance, and it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Six Feet Under is an original play written for radio by Joel Murcott. Dan Daly will soon be seen with Ann Baxter in the 20th Century Fox Technicolor production, Ticket to Tomahawk. You can buy world-famous Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite stay-full batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Jack Benny and Mary Livingston in Seven Keys to Baldpate. Lux presents Hollywood. Tonight, the dauntless Jack Benny and the laconic Mary Livingston lead us into paths of peril and adventure. Laughs, chills, crooks, treasure, a damsel in distress, a mad hermit. This is only part of what Jack Benny encounters tonight in that grand comedy mystery by George M. Cohan, Seven Keys to Baldface, adapted from the novel by Earl Durr Vickers. You'll hear also, as special guest, the world-renowned violinist Ephraim Zimbalist. Conducting our orchestra is Louis Silvers. Tonight's play is brought to you by the makers of Lux Flakes. Before I introduce our producer, let me remind you that it's thrifty to buy several big boxes of Lux Flakes at a time, so you'll always have it handy in bathroom and kitchen. Every box of Lux Flakes means longer life for your washable nice things, kind care for your hands. You're thrifty every time you use these gentler, finer flakes. And now, our producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. (laughs) Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. 
Before we raise our curtain, we wish to advise our listeners that if any important news bulletins on the European situation are received at the Columbia Broadcasting System headquarters, they'll be given you at the intermission during our program. Now to our play and personalities. When George M. Cohen adapted Seven Keys to Ballpate for the stage, he had no intention of starring in it. But just before the opening, he and the leading man met with an accident. The leading man was too seriously injured to go on, so Mr. Cohen, broken collarbone and all, stepped into the breach. When I related these facts to Mary Livingston, she threw back her head bravely and declared that if Mr. Cohen could carry on with such a handicap, she could carry on with Jack Benny. <laughs> Mr. Livingston, uh, uh, Mr. Benny, is not, however, without some talent. He often, often entertains the guests at his home with his debonair violin playing and witty sayings. He's quite a familiar figure on the streets of Beverly Hills, whizzing past the admiring spectators in his flashy Maxwell town car. <laughs> uh, and I almost forgot. Mary always brings Jack to her radio program. And when she goes back on the air next Sunday, she'll once again try and have a place for him. <laughs> for tonight, we've made a special treatment of Seven Keys to Ballpate, which finds Mr. Benny tackling one of the most difficult roles in his career, the role of Jack Benny. And Miss Livingston comes to you in her own interpretation of Mary Livingston. There's another character in our adaptation called Cecil B. DeMille. 1,400 actors in Hollywood have refused my generous bribes to play the part. So there's nothing left for me to do but to play myself. This being the case, my customary duties for the evening will be assumed in part by the highly capable Melville Ruick. And now we light the stage. It's curtain time and star time, as the Lux Radio Theater presents Jack Benny and Mary Livingston in Seven Keys to Ball Pate with um, uh, Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Mr. Ruick, will you set our scene? <laughs> On the lot of Paramount Studios in Hollywood, a building stands apart from the rest. On its door, the legend, Cecil B. DeMille Productions, Incorporated. The door has just opened, and C.B. himself strides quickly across the reception room toward his private office. A small army of assistants and secretaries hinder his progress with innumerable requests. Good morning, Mr. DeMille. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, darling. Oh, Mr. DeMille, I had that set See me later, now. will you, Joe? Hello, C.B. Here's that script you asked Thanks, for. I'll read it tonight. Mr. DeMille, would you see Mr. Nelson? I can't see anyone this morning. Ask him to uh, come Mr. back. Mr. DeMille, this Not now, here. Harry. Sorry. Or Bill, come into my office, will you? Okay, C.B. But, no, Mr. Mr. DeMille, about all that right, set. All right, all right. I'll boy, take I care of everything. See me later. Really. Sit down, Bill. Morning, Miss Cole. Good morning, Mr. DeMille. Anything happen? Nothing much. Mr. Henry called about that script. Frank Donnelly has a new star for you, and... Uh, oh, yes, Mr. Benny called again. Uh, who? Mr. Benny. Jack well, Benny. What did he want? The usual thing. What did you tell him? The usual thing. I said you were out to lunch. Ah, uh, I'm beginning to feel a little guilty about Jack. Well, what's it all about, C.B.? Well, uh, I was a little tired one night, and I... I have promised I'd make a picture with him. No. Yes. And he calls me every, up every once in a while to remind me of it. Well, he isn't serious, is he? And that's just the trouble. He gave me a long talk about how his soul is starved in comedy. He wants to branch out into drama, heavy acting parts. Well, he must be crazy. What'd you tell him? Well, I couldn't tell him the truth. It would have broken his heart, not to mention Paramount. So I, I just keep telling him I'm still looking for the right story. But it's becoming very embarrassing. He seemed pretty discouraged this morning, Mr. DeMille. I really think you ought to call him. He said you could reach him at Mary Livingston's house. Well, I'm not looking for trouble, but if he calls again, I suppose I'll have to speak to him. Yes, Mary. <laughs> Jack, why don't you give that cigar box a rest? You've been scratching on it for the last two hours. In the first place, it's not a cigar box. In the second place, I wasn't scratching. That was music, whether you like it or not. Thanks for the choice. Oh, well. If that's the way you feel, I'll put it away. Oh, Jack, I didn't mean it like that. Gee, you certainly are getting cranky lately. Come over well. here to say hello, and every time I open my mouth, it gets sore. 
What's the matter with you anyway? Oh, I don't know. I guess I'm in one of those moods again. I'm sorry, Mary. Uh, gosh, why doesn't DeMille call? Oh, so that's it. I knew there was a reason for that long jaw you're wearing. I'm not wearing a long jaw. You are, too. Well, I saw it in Esquire. <laughs> Gee, I've called DeMille about 20 times. I'll bet that secretary never gave him the message. Jack, I hate to be a wet rag, but did you ever think that maybe Mr. DeMille doesn't want to speak to you? Oh, don't be silly. What makes you say that? Well, he certainly goes out to lunch at funny hours. Well, that doesn't prove anything. He told me himself he wanted to make a picture with me, and he wasn't lying. Yeah, I'll bet he looked you right square in the chest when he said it. <laughs> oh, no, he didn't. Listen, Mary, Mr. DeMille knows how I feel about comedies. We're going to make a serious picture, something that'll give me a real chance. See, the only thing that's holding it up is the story, and we'll have one if I have to sit down and write it myself. I'll write something I can sink my teeth into. With my ideas, all I need is paper and pencil. And teeth. <laughs> See, you don't, you don't give me credit for anything, do you? Oh, Jack, why don't you come down to Earth? You're a comedian. You made your name in comedy, and you ought to stick to it. This other stuff isn't for you. What do you mean it isn't? I'm an actor, ain't I? Aren't I? First, lost, and always, I'm an actor. And here I am laying around wasting my talents because nobody will give me a chance. DeMille makes the Plainsman and he uses Gary Cooper. Then he turns around and makes the Buccaneer and uses Frederick March. What they want with me at Paramount, I don't know. If I were you, I wouldn't even ask. That's so. Uh... <laughs> and I certainly wouldn't keep pestering Mr. DeMille all the time. I'm not pestering him. He's just as anxious to do this as I am. I'll give him a ring right now. Hello? Uh, give me Hollywood, 06746, please. It's probably out, but I'll take a chance. Hmm. Hello? Mr. DeMille's office? Uh, well, this is Jack Benny speaking. Is, uh, Mr. DeMille back from lunch yet? Oh, he is? Well, can I speak to him? Thank you. There you are, Mary. Yeah, I told you he was just as anxious. Hello? Well, how are you, Mr. DeMille? This is Jack Benny. Oh, I'm pretty good. Uh, say, listen, I just called... Mary? Oh, she's fine. She's fine. Say, Mr. DeMille, I've been thinking about that story. What's that? Why, no. No, I haven't got a cold. Well, maybe just a little cold. Uh, look, Mr. DeMille, I've been thinking about that story. Uh, huh? Oh, hot lemonade, huh? Yes, yes, I'll do that. Say, Mr. DeMille, I've been thinking about... Quinine? <laughs> well, I don't think it's that bad. I. Oh, is that so? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. No, no sneezing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Ask him what's good for falling hair. Quiet. Uh-huh. Well, thanks, Mr. DeMille, but look, what I called you up about... What... Oh, it did, eh? Fixed you right up, huh? Well, thanks very much, Mr. DeMille. Yeah, goodbye. No, wait! Wait, what I wanted... Hello? Hello? Can you imagine that? We were cut off. Good morning, Cecil B. DeMille Productions. I'm sorry, Mr. DeMille is in conference. Mr. DeMille is in conference. Call later, please. I'm still not satisfied. Before I start casting a picture, I want to know that the story is right. And this story certainly isn't. Well, it's a perfect part for Gary Cooper, Mr. DeMille. And the character's all right, yes, but he doesn't do anything. What is it, Miss Cole? I hate to disturb you, but Jack Benny is here. Jack Benny? Didn't you tell him I was in a story conference? Yes, sir, but it didn't do much good. He thinks it's about a story for him. Oh, I was afraid of that. Well, send him in. Yes, sir. Come in, Mr. Benning. Oh, thanks, thanks. Well, hello, C.B., how are you? No, I'll pull through. Sit down, Jack. Thanks. You know Mary, don't you? Of course I do. Glad to see you, Mary. I just want you to know, Mr. DeMille, that I'm not here of my own free will. He dragged me. <laughs> oh, stop it, Mary. You know, uh, C.B., Mary thinks I'm making a pest out of myself. You better tell her. I, I don't think that's necessary. Oh. Well, uh, how's it going, C.V.? Uh, Miss Cole told me you were having a story conference. That sounds like pretty good news. It might be if we had a story to confer about. Nothing doing yet, Jack. Oh. Oh, I see. Well, that's too bad. You know, Jack, I've been thinking. Here, you and I have been stalling around, wasting all your time, and we're not getting any place. Maybe you ought to try some other producer. What? You mean walk out on you? I'm not built that way, Mr. DeMille. I'm not a quitter. I'm the kind of an actor who sticks. 
What? I said sticks. <laughs> now, look, Mr. DeMille, I don't care what happens. I'm with you right to the end. Well, that's, that's very kind of you, Jack. Yeah, I'm not going to let a little thing like a story lick us. Not if I have to write one myself. Just like that, huh? Well, sure, I can do it all right. After all, I've had some experience, you know. Well, it'll take you quite a while. Say, maybe it's not such a bad idea at that. Well, of course it isn't. No. No, now you run along and write that story, Jack, and I'll give you plenty of time to do it. Okay. Well, I'm going out to lunch. I'll see you in a couple of months. What are you going to eat, a whale? Mary. (laughs) Now, look. Look, C.B., now, look at here. I don't need a couple of months to write a story. When I get started on it, I'll probably knock it out in a couple of days. One day, if I'm in the mood. <laughs> well, what's the matter? You don't believe I could do it, huh? A complete scenario in 24 hours? I don't believe anyone could do it. Oh, you don't? All right, Mr. DeMille, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll start a story tonight. If I finish it in 24 hours, will you produce it? Well, it'd have to be good. Oh, I'll take care of that. Will you produce it? If it's a good story, why not? Now, I'll tell you something else. If you can write a complete and original story in 24 hours, I'll let you play the lead in it. Mary, you heard that. You heard what he said. You're letting yourself in for it, Mr. DeMille. I don't think so. It's a mental and physical impossibility. That's Jack, all right. (laughs) (laughs) You'll find out, C.B. (laughs) So will you, J.B. Well, all I need is a quiet place to work in. I may have to go out of town. That's all right with me. Any place you want. Okay, now, let's see. If see I can... As a matter of fact, Jack, if you really want a quiet place, you can you could use my place up on Ballpate. Where? Ballpate Mountain. It's an old house I picked up a couple of years ago. But I've never lived there. And no one can bother you because no one else can get in. Oh. There's only one key in existence, and I'll give that to you. Only one key, eh? Hey, that sounds great. Oh, here it is. Yeah, that's the only key to Ballpate. Well, say, where uh, where is this place? I mean, how do I get there? Well, it's it's on top of Ballpate Mountain, about 17 miles from the village of Ballpate. You'll probably have to cut your way through the snow drifts, but once you get there, you'll love it. The only thing you'll hear is a couple of hoot owls and the moaning of the wind. What, no radio? <laughs> no one ever goes near there. It's an ideal place to work. All right, the bet's on. I'll go pack now, and I'll leave for Ballpate in an hour. Good. But remember, Jack... A complete and original scenario in 24 hours. Listen, Mr. DeMille, if I don't bring you back a complete and original story in 24 hours, my name ain't Jack Benny. Confidentially, Mr. DeMille, it ain't. Oh, come on. Well, this is it, Mr. Benny. This is Ball Pete. You got that key? Right here. Say, it's... Kind of dark up this way, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. Belinda and me is the caretakers of this place. But we don't get over more than two or three times a year. If you ask me, that's two or three times too much. Now, you hash, Belinda. Hash up. Go on in, Mr. Benny. I'll make a light for you. Ought to be an old oil lamp around here somewhere. Well, yeah. hurry, Jed. It's black as pitch. Say, Mr. Benny, you ain't really set on staying here all night, are you? I certainly am, Mrs. Waller. Oh, but you don't have to stay, do you? Well, in a way, I... Why not? Why not? Jed, he asked why not. I'll tell you why not, Mr. Benny. Hesha, up, Belinda, hesha. up. No need to go worrying him with all those tales. Why, it's 20 years or more since old man Crummett passed away. Uh, I never did believe in ghosts anyway. Say, uh, who was this old Crummett? He owned this place. May heaven help him. Hmm. But he's dead now. Dead and gone in his grave these 20 years. In his grave when he ain't out of it. Now, hesh, Belinda, hesh up. <laughs> oh, it's all right, Mr. Waller. I'm, I'm not very much afraid of ghosts. Oh, of course you ain't. Of course you ain't. <laughs> I never would have believed a word of it myself. Except for what happened to the last fellow that stayed here. Would you like to hear about it? Well, not particularly. I'm... Well, it was a night just like this. Black as a crow's feather, with the wind a howling and a moaning through the trees, just like now. Yes, I guess that's why no one ever heard his screams. You see, here, it... here, stop it, stop it! I don't want to hear any more about it. I got a story to write here, and by heaven, I'll write it, or my name ain't. Now get out of here, both of you. Go on, scat. Then, then, then you set on staying, huh? Yes, I'm set on staying, huh? Come on, then, Jed. We can go. Our conscience is clear. Yep. 
Well, goodbye, mister. Goodbye. Well, goodbye. Hmm. Let's see. The scene is in the library at night. The girl walks in, suddenly discovers it. Yeah, that's it, I think. Who's that? Who's out there? Who's outside that door? Hi, you, Morgan. She is talking here. Who are you? It's okay, Morgan. I'm Cookie Bland. That's fine, but I'm not Morgan. How'd you get in here anyway? Why, well, come to the door. Yeah, I noticed that, but I happen to have the only key to that door. Oh, is that so? What do you think this thing is, a crochet needle? Oh, so you've got one, too. What are you doing here? Well, I can't let chatter. You know I was supposed to meet you here. You come for the dough, didn't you? The dough? Well, sure. Hey, uh, you cracked the safe yet? Why, no. no. Say, what is it? Now, listen here, Morgan. My name isn't Morgan. I'm Jack Benny. What? You heard me, Jack Benny. Oh, I'm dealing with a screwball, huh? Oh, listen, go away, will you? I've got a story to write. I'm, I'm right in the middle of a plot. Yeah? Well, if you ain't Morgan, you're going to be in the middle of another kind of a plot. And it don't have no happy ending. Why, what are you talking about? Stick them up, pal. Stick them up? Stick them up or I'll blow you to the wall. Hey, hey, listen. What's that? Somebody else is trying to get in. They told me there was only one key to this Shut place. up, shut up. Look here, screwball. I'm going to hide in the next room, see? And you get him out of here. And don't mention nothing about me being here, see? Because if you do, it's curtains. You understand? Curtains. Curtains. Right. Good evening. Well, good evening. Who are you? Who are you? Now, now, I asked first. Oh, never mind that. How did you get in here? Well, no trouble at all. I had a key. You lie. There is only one key to ball. Peyton, I have it. Well, it sure gets around. Now, listen, miss, I'm a very busy man. I came here what to write What is your a... name? My name is Jack Benny, I think. Please, this is no time for jokes. All right, then have it your own way. My name isn't Jack Benny, it's Morgan. Morgan? Yes, Morgan. Put up your hands. Put them up. Say, this is getting a little bit monotonous. I am going to kill you, Mr. Morgan. Hey, wait a minute, don't shoot. I'm not Morgan. I only said that because the other fellow told me if I wasn't Morgan... What other it... fellow? Uh, huh? What other fellow... Are we someone else here? Oh, no. No, no. It's a fellow I met last week. He's, a, uh, He's in the curtain business. He's... <laughs> but I'm... Really, I'm, I'm, I'm not Morgan. you got to believe me. Very well. It is good for you that you spoke in time. Well, thank you. Wow. Well, maybe you'll tell me what this is all about. I mean, why do you want to shoot Mr. Morgan? Why? Because he is a beast. Because he is planning to rob me of my inheritance. Listen. Do you know who I am? My name is Crummet. Rita Crummet. Not one of the grave-walking Crummets. No, no, no. Oh, I see someone has told you about my grandfather. Yes, casually. Twenty years ago, my grandfather died very mysteriously. Mm. When he died, he left Aubert a hundred thousand dollars. No one ever received a penny of it. Do you know why? He forgot to put stamps on the envelopes. No. No one knew where it was. But recently, some new facts have come to light. Facts which prove definitely that the money is still in existence. That it is buried. Buried here. Here in this very house. A hundred thousand dollars in this house? Yes. And it is all mine. All mine, do you hear? Faintly. <laughs> but a man named Morgan knows of this too. He is planning to come here. To take the money. To rob me. Oh, you must help me. Well, I'd like to, yes. I, but I have a story to write, and I've only got about three minutes. Ah! Listen. <laughs> Who is that? I don't know, and don't introduce me. <laughs> look. Look, there is someone coming down these stairs. He is carrying a lantern. Who's down there? Who's down there? Shall we answer him? Uh, uh, Miss Crummett, did your grandfather carry a lantern? Never. Was he a tall, thin man, all bent over with a long gray beard? No. Hmm, then there's a stranger in the house. <laughs> Who's there, I say? It's, it's us. What are you doing here? Who's that woman? I don't like women. 
Now, just a minute, my friend. If you'll come out from behind that beard, I'd like to ask a couple of questions myself. I mean, how did you get in here? I came through the back door. There is no back door. I made one. <laughs> it wasn't that funny. I know who he is now. He, he is the hermit of Bald Pig Mountain. He is crazy. A maniac. Oh, so you're a hermit, eh? Yes, I am. I live alone. I live alone, but I don't like it. <laughs> Get that woman out of here. I can't stand women. I hate women. I hate all women. How about Hedy Lamar? I don't like her either. Boy, you are nuts. <laughs> Mr. Benny, please, do not joke with him. Shh. They're coming. Do you hear the drum? Rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat. They're coming. Legions upon legions. Mark. Marching, marching, closer and closer, legions upon legions, and they're all dead. <laughs> that man, I have heard of him. He is very dangerous. There's no telling what he will do. If he comes back, we must humor him. Yeah, if I come back, humor me. Oh, no. No, do not go, please. You must not leave me alone now. Look, look, I came here to write a story. Listen. To... Oh, he's someone at the door again. Someone is trying to get in. It's about time somebody tried to get out. I must not be seen here. I will be up in the attic. Do not breathe a word. Hello, Jack. Marry you. Who'd you expect, Corrigan? Why not? How'd you open that door? With a key, why? That's ridiculous. Don't you know there's only one, only four keys in existence? Well, mine makes five. I didn't want to disturb you, so when I came to the village, I borrowed it from the grocer. In a fine place that DeMille sent me to. Wait till I see him again. What'd you come up here for, anyway? Well, don't look so annoyed. I got worried about you. I thought of you up here all alone, and, well, I thought you might like some company. Company? Got more company now than a sweepstake winner. <laughs> Mary, this is no place for you. You gotta leave right now. What do you mean, leave? I just got here. I know, but you gotta go. Now, don't ask questions, please. Are you trying to get rid of me? Oh, for... Pe yes, I'm trying to get rid of you. Why? Mary, will you please do what I say? Not until I know what's behind all this. What's going on here anyway? There's nothing going on here. Nothing. <laughs> well, well, boy meets girl. <laughs> Here, here, what's the matter oh, now? Man, that man, he tried to kill me. He's mad. Oh, you've got to help me. Stay near me. I can't stand it. Here, now, now, stop, me. stop. It's all right. It's all right. I'll take care of you. Just calm yourself. Now, every, every, everything's going to be all right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Jack. What? Who's the foreigner? Her name is Rita Crummett, and she's in a lot of trouble. I'm trying to help her out. Miss Crummett, this is Mary Livingston. Oh, how do you do? I, I am very pleased to meet you. I'll bet you are. So this is the story you were going to write, eh? Well, I started it. I you. thought there was some reason why you wanted to get rid of me. Now, listen, Mary. Oh, don't try to make excuses. Oh, it's too bad I happened to come up here, isn't it? But I'm glad I did. Glad I found out about you before it's too late. Mary, are you crazy? I never saw this woman before in my life. Then what is she doing here? I'll tell you what she's doing. She came here after, after $100,000. Oh, bank night. Now, look, Mary, this money oh, was... Oh, you can't pull the wool over my eyes. It's all off between us, Jack. This is the end. Take Miss Crumpet and go. It's not Crumpet, it's Crumpet. Well, she certainly looks it. Mary, look, this is silly. It's her money and she came here to get it. Now, there's a man named Morgan who's trying to take it away from her, and there's a fellow named Cokey Bland who's hiding in the other room and he's trying All to get right, it. Why don't I stick him up? Hey, now, wait a minute, Bland. Wait a second. I didn't mean to tell her, really. I didn't. It just slips up. Stack them up. Come on, all of you. Now, look what you've done, Mary. I hope you're satisfied. I warned you not to squeal, didn't I? Uh -huh. I warned you, pal. But you double crossed me, see? And now I'm going to lump your dumplings. You're going to what? Lump your dumplings. You're going to lump my dumplings? Jack. Jack, what does he mean? I'm not sure, but if it's what I think it is, you better shake the mothballs out of your old black dress. <laughs> We return in just a moment to the second act of Seven Keys to Bald Faith, starring Jack Benny, Mary Livingston, and Cecil B. DeMille. Now for a brief intermission, during which we overhear your friends, the Browning family. In their living room, Mr. Browning is discovered checking over the month's bills. Dot sits by the window sewing. Betty has the radio tuned in to Flatfoot Flugey, while Dad is vainly trying to add a column of Flatfoot figures. Flatfoot Flugey and 
26 and 43 years. And quiet, quiet. Is it enough that I have to pay the bills? Or do I have to add them up in a madhouse, too? What bills, Dad? What bills? These bills. What on earth does this family do with stockings? We hang them up at Christmas and wait for Santa Claus. Well, you're looking at Santa Claus right now. But I can't be Santa Claus on stockings much longer. In fact, I don't think I'll buy another pair until you tell me why you can't make them last. Why, Dad, stockings just wear out. They pop runs and... Oh, Betty, if you'd only wash your stockings the way I told you. Yeah, Dot, I know. Every night in Lux. Don't forget the Lux. It does make a difference, Beth. My stockings last lots longer than yours. On account of this elasticity you're always talking about, I suppose. Stockings should stretch and then spring back. Oh, I wish this budget would. Honestly, Betty, it's dopey to wash stockings the way you do. Come on, be a good egg. Use Lux and help Dad out with the bill. Is somebody in this family actually going to do something to help me? Mother! Mother! Come quick! It's a miracle. That's what it is. A miracle. Yes, the girl who wears the stockings and the man who pays the bills are both thankful for Lux Flakes. They cut down on costly runs and protect the beauty and fit of your stockings, too. Wash your stockings after every wearing in gentle Lux Flakes. To save money, buy the big box. We continue with Seven Keys to Baldpate, starring Jack Benny, Mary Livingston, and Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> A few minutes have passed. In the old house on Baldpate Mountain, the situation remains unchanged, and Jack is still unshot. Rita Crummett, Mary, and Jack are seated in a row against the wall. Bland covers them with an automatic. And I don't want nobody to make any false moves, see? If anybody bats an eyelash, I'll... Uh, you know what? You'll lump his dumplings. Right. Keep quiet, Mary. Well, that's what he said he'd do, didn't he? He was going to lump your dumplings. Well, you don't have to remind him of it. Oh, worry, screwball. I changed my mind about that. I'm going to wait here for Morgan. Well, I can wait if you can. Morgan is a beast. Nobody asks you, sister. He's trying to steal my money, but he won't. He won't, I tell you. I'll get that money tonight if it's the last thing I do. You lay one finger on it and I will be. Hey, what is all this about money? What's everyone doing up here anyway? Oh, she came up here for some money and this guy came up ahead of her. I came up to write a story. You came to keep me company. Not one of us had sense enough to bring sandwiches. Shut up. Well, why don't you all go home and leave me alone? Shut up, I tell you. I won't shut up. You can't intimidate me. Anyway, not until Morgan gets here. Well, maybe I won't wait for Morgan, see? Maybe I'll break the rules for once and let you have it right now. Here, stop! Put that gun down. Put it down. Everybody stay where you are. I've got you covered. Look, it's the hermit. Stop the gun. Stop the gun, see? Oh, nuts. There, smarty pants. Hey, Jack. Who's the guy with the long beard? That's the hermit, Mary. Hiya, Hermie. Wonder what he looks like. I'm not going to get a lawnmower just for that. Who's this woman? Why is she here? Now, now, Hermie, control yourself. You certainly showed up at the right time. Where'd you get that gun? That's none of your business. I heard what you said. Up here after old Crummit's money, huh? Well, you won't get it. None of you will get it. <laughs> Listen, look, look. I don't even want the money. All I want is to be left alone, that's all. And this guy here was going to shoot me. Oh, he was, eh? Well, he won't. There. You see, Mr. Bland? But I'm going to shoot you myself. What? There. You see, Mr. Bland? Quiet. Listen, Hermie, look. Be reasonable. What did I ever do to you? You brought these women here. Oh, he did, eh? I did not. He did, too. Listen here, Hermie. I heard the whole thing. This dame came here for the dough. And this here guy promised he'd get it. There were a couple of crooks. And if I was you, I'd give it to him right now. Hermie, don't listen to him. He's crazy. He is, eh? Sure he is. He's stark raving mad. So am I. Shake, brother. Shake. <laughs> Gosh. Stop shaking, Jack. You're not in it. Go on, Hermie. Let the rat have it. Right now? Sure, right now. Why not? Hey, you keep out of this. If he wants to wait a little, that's his business. Go on, Hermie. Give it to him. No. We must wait. That's right. We got to wait for Morgan. No, not for Morgan. We wait until midnight. I'll sit here and watch you squirm. Then... Then when we hear the old village clock striking the hour, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven... Stop! Hours. Stop! Hermie, you can't do that! You can't put a man down in cold blood! Why, you don't know me! You don't even know who I am! You can't do it, Hermie! I tell you, you can't do it! Take up your hand. Come on! Up with him! Now I know somebody's selling keys outside. 
Put that gun down, Santa Claus. I'm taking charge here. Now, don't move. Anybody. Brother, I don't know who you are, but you certainly are a lifesaver. Yeah? Hello, Bland. Hi, uh, Morgan. Morgan? <laughs> what are you laughing at? Hello, Morgan. Mary. What's going on here, Bland? Well, I don't know, boss. I come up here like you told me to, and I, I find this guy punning a typewriter, and this here dame walks in and she... Peter. So you're here, eh? Well, what of it? You double-crossing little snake. Say, you can't talk to Miss Crummett like that. Crummett? <laughs> That's a laugh. Do you know who this dame is? If she's Miss America, I'll scream. <laughs> Quiet. Her name is Nolan. Rita Nolan. She's the slickest little crook in the business. What do you mean, crook? That money belongs to anyone who finds it. Nobody will find it, because it's mine. Every penny of it mine. Keep your mouth shut. Put up your hands, everybody. Me too? Yeah, you too. Keep him there, you hear? Yes, sir. Come here, Blant. I want to speak to you. Okay, boy. The rest of you, sit tight. I got my eyes on all of you. Phew. Gee, Mary, I guess we're in a tough spot. I wish I had a gun. What for? You wouldn't shoot anybody. No, but I could commit suicide. <laughs> Mary. Hey, Mary. Don't make a move, but listen to me. We gotta get that gun away from Morgan. I got a plan. What is it? When Morgan comes over here and starts to talk... You look behind him, see? And then you yell, look out behind you. Then when he turns around, I'll grab his gun. How do you like that for an idea? I think it's corny. What do you mean, corny? Shh, here he comes. All right, Blaine, let's get after that door. It's in the house somewhere. We've got to find it tonight. Here, you take the upstairs, and I'll search down here. All right, Mary, remember the plan? Oh, yeah. Uh, say, Mr. Morgan, will you come here a minute? Huh? What do you want? Well, personally, I don't think this is going to work, but look out behind you. Eh, hey, what? Hey, give me that gun. Hey, you Stand right where you are, Mr. Morgan. Now, put up your hands, everybody. You didn't think it would work, eh, Mary? <laughs> See, I guess I'm not a scenario writer for nothing. Everybody line up against that wall, see? I'm after this situation, see? I got you all in the palm of me hand. If anybody moves, I'll, I'll dump his lumplings. The telephone. Who had that phone connected? I'll answer it. Oh, no, you don't. Get away from that phone. That call from No, it isn't. Stand back, all of you. Yep. I'll take care of this. See? Be careful what you say, Jack. You can't tell who it might be. Don't worry. I guess I can handle it. I guess. Go ahead, Jack. All right, all right. Don't push me. Hello? Hello? What? No, madam. This is not Sam's delicatessen. Can you imagine that? Now, what are we going to do? Anyway, I've still got the gun. We're going to stay here until I can reach the police. Police? Yes, and we have to wait here all night. Jack, why do we have to sit around waiting for the police? Why? Because nobody knows we're here, because I'm not a mental telepathist, because we haven't got a shortwave radio. Well, we have a telephone. Why don't we call them? Hmm. Well, I'd have thought of that, too. Hmm. I'll call them right now. Now, don't move, anybody. Hello? Hello, operator. Give me the police department and hurry. You're making a mistake there, buddy. You don't say, huh? Well, you made a mistake when you walked in here and tried to push me around. Hello? Is this the Ballpate Village Police Station? Well, this is Jack Benny, and I'm up on Ballpate Mountain. Yes, Jack Benny. What do you mean, a gag? I tell you... What? All right, then. You can be the king of Bulgaria. I'm still Jack Benny. Hmm, the king of Bulgaria. Let me talk to him, Jack. Okay. Now, listen, Your Majesty. Give me that phone. <laughs> now, get this. I'm up here on Ballpate Mountain. I've got a... Yes. Yeah, I know that. Look, I know no one lives on Ballpate. That's why I'm here. No, I'm not crazy. Hello? Hello? Hello, listen. Hello? You beat that. He hung up. I'd like to go down there and stuff that phone down his throat. Why don't you? And let all these crooks walk out on me? Oh, no. Don't worry about them. You leave the gun with me, and I'll keep school till you get back with the cops. Now, don't be ridiculous. You couldn't handle this mob. All alone and everything? Sure I could. If anybody try to get out, I'll do that stuff for the dumplings. Give me the gun. Oh, I don't like this. Suppose something happens. Nothing's going to happen. Go ahead, Jack, and get back here as soon as you can. Well, all right, but keep your eye on them. I'll be back in an hour, and I'll have the whole police force with me. Hey, open this door. Hey. Hey, what kind of a police station is this? Open up, will you? Hey, what goes on here? Hey, let me in. Is this the Ballpate Village Police Station? It ain't the morgue. Well, you can't prove it by you. Where is everybody? Oh, well, we close early on Mondays. Oh, you do, eh? Well, I want to see the chief constable. Where is he? Chief constable? You'll find him in cell number six. 
He's playing draw poker with the three prisoners. Playing with the prisoners? Isn't he taking a chance? No, they're his cards. Oh. Just go right through that door. The chief is the guy without the stripes. Thank you. Okay, Chief, I'll raise that bid. It'll cost you a dime to see him, Chief. And it'll cost him another dime to see me. Hey, say, Chief, Chief, I, can I interrupt you for a minute? I'm the guy that called you up about an hour ago from Ballpate Mountain. Oh, yeah? yeah? I came down here to tell you there's a gang of desperate crooks up there, and you got to do something about it. Crooks, eh? Yeah. Uh, what do you got, Joe? Three kings. Hey, will you wait a minute? I just left I them I got there. three aces. Your pot, Chief. Look, look, I just left them up there. They're being held by Mary Livingston. They're dangerous, Chief. you got to come right away. Uh... Whose deal is it? My deal, Chief. Look, will you listen? One of them's going to kill me at 12 o'clock on the dot. He's a maniac. And if he misses me, there's three others who won't. Well, I can't quit winners, can I? Oh. I'll open a new deck. Uh, take out the twos and threes. Look, look, Chief, I hate to be a kibitzer, but this is a matter of life and death. Uh, who opened? You did. I did not. You did, too. Now, look, Chief, look, Chief, all I want is... Ten cents blind, Joe. I'll see that and raise it a dime. Look, all I want is... Up a, a nickel. All I want a is... A nickel and one better. Chief, it's a matter of life and death. And a nickel again. It's $100,000. What? Well, that's too high for me. I pass. Wait a minute. What did you say? $100,000 on Ballpate Mountain. Well, what are we sitting around here for? That's what I've been trying to tell you. There's a whole gang of crooks there after the money. Not well. Kennedy is chief constable. Can you show me the way? Follow me. Then let's go. I've kept this county clean of crooks for ten years. And by heaven, it'll stay clean. Now, come on. Wait. Where's my holster? Here it is, chief, hanging on your chair. Hurry up. Is my gun in it? Yes, and two aces. Let's go. <laughs> Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the Lux Radio Theater, ladies and gentlemen, brought to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes. And now, before bringing you the third act of our play, starring Jack Benny, Mary Livingston, and Cecil B. DeMille, we have a little intermission. During the week, one of the most distinguished violinists in the world, Mr. Ephraim Zimbalist, boarded a plane and headed west just to be with us tonight, a tribute for which we're most grateful. Due to the insidious machinations of Jack Benny, all violinists have fallen into a mild sort of disrepute and especially a certain composition for the violin, written by Schubert. A composition spelt B, as in Benny, E, E. Like a knight of old, aglow with the fierce flame of vengeance, Mr. Zimbalist is here to right ancient wrongs and to play the B with some regard for Mr. Schubert and the sensibilities of listening America. At last, Mr. Benny is cornered. Mr. Zimbalist, are you ready? Thank you, Mr. Wick, but there's no hurry. Let him suffer for a while longer. Well, why not? Oh, by the way, Mr. Zimblist, what do you think of Jack as an actor? I find a remarkable similarity, Mr. Wick, between Mr. Benny the actor and Mr. Benny the violinist. <laughs> Even as an actor, he insists on playing in seven keys. Uh, Mr. Zimblist, uh, I... Uh, well, shucks, I play the violin, too. Maybe you heard me in The Buccaneer. I was the pirate who played the violin for Frederick March to soothe his nerves. Oh, is that so? May I suggest, Mr. Rui, that next time you give him a nice cup of hot milk? Oh. Don't you like anything around here, Mr. Zimblist? Oh, of course. I'm just trying to be funny, Mr. Rui. When a violinist tries to be a comedian, or when a comedian tries to be a violinist, heaven help the audience. <laughs> I think I better play the beat. <laughs> Fine. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ephraim Zimblist, accompanied at the piano by Theodore Seidenberg. <laughs>
Parker thanks you, Mr. Simplest. And we all trust Mr. Benny's musical dumplings are at long last properly lumped. We hear him now with Mary Livingston and Cecil B. DeMille in Act Three of Seven Keys to Baltic. <laughs> An hour later, Jack Benny has enlisted the aid of the Baldpate Village Police. A car containing our hero and the chief constable pulls up the rugged mountain road. It comes to a stop just outside of the old house. There's the house, Chief Kennedy. All right, all right. Now, don't get excited. We're around the whole bunch of them up. Come on. Wait. Gosh, I forgot. We can't get in. I came out without the key. Oh, don't worry about that. I got one. Oh, you have? Hmm. Well, don't lose it. They're awfully scarce. Hey, look. Huh? What's the matter now? Gee, I left the light burning in that room. Now it's dark. All right, all right. Take it easy. I've got a flashlight. We'll break in on them and take them by surprise. Ready? Right. Now. Put them up, everybody. Wait a minute. Why, there's nobody here. Hey, Mary. Mary. Why, they've all gone. They can't be gone. We just seen them coming down the mountain. Say, I thought there was something screwy about you. But I'm not screwy. They must be somewhere in the house. You look upstairs and I'll take the cellar. Okay. Here, take this other gun out of my hip pocket. And if you see anybody, shoot first. Gee, I hope nothing happened to Mary. Mary. Mary, are you in the cellar? Mary, if you're down here, turn on a light. I can't see a thing. Mary. Mary. Hello, Jack. Oh, Mary, you're safe. Where are you? I can't see. I'm over here, Jack, sitting in a rocking chair. Oh, I thought something happened to you. Well, get out of that chair and come over here. Okay, but you'll have to untie these ropes first. What ropes? You mean you're tied to that chair? I couldn't help it, Jack. Really, I couldn't. Hmm. I might have known this would happen. Let me get those ropes. Who did this? Mr. Morgan. Oh, Morgan, eh? Yeah, right after I dropped the gun. Oh, you dropped the gun. Well, I couldn't help it. I was standing there covering him just like you told me. And all of a sudden, Morgan yelled... Look out behind you. And when I turned around, there There was was nobody nobody there. there. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that trick is better than I thought it was. Oh, shut up. (laughs) Hey, listen, they're all upstairs again. Come on, slip out of those rows. I'm ready. Up the stairs, quick. Jack, uh, maybe we better not go up there. Well, what are you talking about? I brought the law back with me. Kennedy's taking charge. He'll have those crooks in jail in an hour. They don't end up in a card game. Come on. Shut up, shut up, shut up, everybody. Shut up or I'll plug somebody. Now, what goes on, Chief? You got the whole crowd, huh? And I got the money, too. It's in that big bag on the floor. That's my money. It's mine. Quiet, Hermes. You. I'll get you at 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock, eh? (laughs) You got to get free first. Where'd you find the money, Chief? That hermit dug it up. This woman took it from him. Bland took it from her. Morgan took it from him. And I'm taking it from all of you. Put that bag down. Give me that bag. It's mine. Don't let her take that. Keep your hands off. Put down that bag, Drop that bag, all of you. Drop that bag. The law's here now. The law will take care of that dough in its own way. That's telling them, Chief. Where's the phone? Right over there on the desk. Put that money up here next to me. Hey, you are, Chief. Now, everybody stay nice and quiet. Hello, operator. I want Village 826. Yeah. Who are you calling, Chief? The riot squad? <laughs> I guess all you crooks will have a lot of time to think this over. Hello, Village 826. Is this Joe's pool room? Pool room? This is Chief Constable Kennedy. Let me speak to my wife, will you? Hmm. What? You don't see her around. Maybe she's behind the eight ball. Mary. <laughs> oh, you did, eh? Well, put her on the phone. Look, Chief, I don't want to interfere with your business, but why don't you call up the station? Hello. Eh? Is that you, Agnes? How's the game tonight, honey? That's good. Listen, honey, get this clear. I want you to get some clothes together in a hurry and catch the next train for Canada. Now, don't ask questions. I'll meet you there Wednesday morning. Yeah. With $100,000. Say, what are you trying Shut up! You got that straight, honey? Okay. Goodbye, sweetheart. What? <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Goodbye, dear. Now, everybody, stay where you are. Say, what do you think you're going to do? You heard me, buddy. I'm going to Canada. Oh. This is a fine time to visit the quintuplets. Shut up. Why can't you can't get away with this? I'll have the law on your trail in three minutes. No, no, you won't. I took care of that. There's four of my boys guarding the mountain road right now. With orders to shoot anybody trying to leave. You're all going to stay right here until I get a head start. Then you can do what you want. You certainly are a fine cop stealing that money. Yeah. Why don't we divvy up, even Stephen? You keep out of this. Why shouldn't I steal it from a gang of crooks like you? It's one chance in a lifetime to get this much dough, and I'm going to grab it. Yeah. 
I'm going to live in a marble hall and eat off gold plates oh. and send my two boys to college. What do you think of that? You won't get away with it. I'll shoot you dead. You're sticking on my list right now. Come back here, you. Shoot. Go on, shoot. <laughs> Missed me. <laughs> He's gone. He's loose again. A fine mace. Mess you made out of this, Mr. You Kennedy. You keep quiet. Why, that man's a maniac. He's crazy. He's going to kill me at 12 o'clock on the dock. If he bumps you off, he's not as crazy as I thought. Listen, Kennedy, you'll never get away with this. Hand over that door. Stand back, you. Oh, no, you don't. Get, get away from me. Get, get away or I'll plug the whole bunch of you. Get away. Come on, everybody. Grab him. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. No. No. Everybody. Stand right where you are. Put up your hands. Go on. Put them up, everybody. Mary. Mary, look who it is. Look. Who are you? I'm Cecil B. DeMille, the owner of Baldpate. Two policemen refused to let me pass, and I shot them dead. Oh, this... this isn't true. Why, it can't be true. What's the matter here, Jack? Who are these people? How'd they get in here? Gee, I don't know. Have they disturbed you in your work? How are you getting on with your story? How am I getting on? It's a nice question. Fine place you sent me to. Nothing but ghosts, crooks, murderers, maniacs, and now a director. You told me there was only one key. This place has more keys than a grand piano. But, Jack... You win, I lose. 24 hours. I couldn't write a story in this joint in 24 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the matter with you? What are you all laughing at? Hey, what goes on here, anyway? I, I just want to tell you, Jack, I, I, I hope you're not going to be mad, but the whole thing was a joke. What was a joke? I sent all these people up here just for a gag. Gag. That's right. This girl you thought was Rita Crummett. Her real name is Eve Forsyth. I used her in my last picture. <laughs> How do you do, Mr. Benny? <laughs> well, I'll, this is the darndest thing. <laughs> Cokey Bland isn't a crook. He isn't even Cokey. He's my old prop man. <laughs> How are you, Mr. Benny? <laughs> well, this is very funny. Huh? Morgan here is an actor I've been using for years. His name is Jones. Jones? Well, what an odd name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kennedy isn't a real chief constable, but he's a real actor. Well, thanks, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> I'd say he's a real actor. He certainly had me going. Well, this is quite a surprise. And, of course, Mary was in on the whole thing from the start. Oh, she was. Hello, Jack. Mary. Well, gosh darn you. <laughs> oh, this is very funny. Say, Mr. DeVille, who was the hermit? Huh? You know, the hermit. The guy you sent up here to act like a crazy man. Oh, he had me scared for a while. Who was he? I don't know what you're talking about. You know, the crazy guy. The guy who said he was going to shoot me at 12 o'clock sharp. You know anything about this, Kennedy? Well, not me. I figured he was one of the actors. Well, I didn't send him. What? You mean you... You mean you... You mean you... There must be some mistake. I don't know anything about a hermit. Well, neither do I. I thought that... The... Wait a minute. Do you mean this hermit is on the level? Well, he must be. But he's going to shoot me. He's going to kill me at 12 o'clock. Now, keep calm, Jack. There must be something we can do. But he's a maniac. He's crazy. He's roaming around loose. Listen. What time is it? What time is it now? It's exactly two minutes of 12. Two minutes of... Oh. Jack! 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 Jack, look at me. Are you all right? He got me, Mary. He got me. Mary. Yes, Jack? Tell DeMille. Yes, yes. Tell DeMille. What, Jack? Tell DeMille what? Tell DeMille his watch is two minutes slow. <laughs> Mr. DeMille's office. I'm sorry, Mr. DeMille is in conference. I'm sorry, Mr. DeMille is in a story conference with Mr. Benny. Mr. DeMille is in a story conference. And there's your story, Mr. DeMille. At the finish, the hermit shoots me and I fall to the floor. Mary leans over to me and says, Jack, look at me, are you all right? And I look up at her and say, tell DeMille, tell DeMille his watch is two minutes slow. Finish. There's your story, Mr. DeMille, and I finished it in 24 hours. Gee, Jack, that's swell. What do you think of it, C.V.? Did you write all this since you were in this office yesterday? I certainly did. Did you work at my place on Ballpage? Yes, and you were right. I never heard a sound. But I used it for the locale of my story and brought in a lot of crooks and things. Well, I even put you in it. I had you come in at the finish to tell me it was all a gag. Yeah, I know. And I wrote a part for Mary, too. Well, how do you like it? It's very good, Jack. Thanks. Now, you remember your promise, C.V. You said you'd produce it. I certainly will. There you are, Mary, you see? Gee. And Gary Cooper is just the man for it. Gary Cooper? Now, wait a minute, Mr. DeMille. You said I could play the lead in it. I said you could play the lead if it was an original story. Well, it is original. And it's good, too. Yes, but it was also good in 1910 when Earl Durr Biggers wrote the novel. 
Oh, he did? Yeah, and in 1913, when George M. Cohen produced the play. Oh, what a coincidence. Yeah, and in 1925, when Paramount produced the silent picture. Oh, they got in it. Yeah, and in 1929, when RKO made it as a talkie. Well, Yeah, and I believe they all called it Seven Keys to Baldpate. They did? Uh. (laughs) Gee, and I was so proud of it. God, I thought it was my own brainchild, didn't you? (laughs) And it turned out to be an orphan. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I guess I'm licked. So the picture's off, ACB. I'm sorry, Jack. Gee, and I wanted to play the lead in it. Well, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Come on, Mary, let's go home. Wait a minute, Jack. You've still got a chance. Grab that script. What for? We'll take it over to Walt Disney. He'll produce it. Gee, Walt Disney. Say, there's an idea. Come on, let's go. Walt Disney. So long, Jack. Quack, 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 quack. Quack, 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 quack. That's the end of our Lux Radio Theater version of Seven Keys to Baldfate. But not the end of Jack Benny. He'll be back in a moment with Mary Livingston to be put on the spot again, I'm sure, by Mr. DeMille. Meantime, may I ask you, our listeners, a question. Have you ever been put on the spot by embarrassingly red, rough hands? If you have, if you want the smooth, white hands everyone admires, try changing to Lux Flakes for washing your dishes. Your hands may spend as much as 500 hours in the dishpan every year. Think of the damage a harsh soap may do. Such soaps are drying. They rob your skin of its natural oils. But Lux Flakes have none of the harmful alkali so drying to the skin. They leave your hands lovely. Do as so many clever women do nowadays. Use Lux for dishes. Buy the thrifty big box tomorrow. And now, Mr. DeMille, the actor, surrenders to Mr. DeMille, your host and producer, as he brings Jack Benny and Mary Livingston back to our microphone. Thank you for that word, actor, Mr. Rick. And now a brief exchange of opinions with the man of the hour. Oh, Jack, Mr. Benny. Mary, where's Jack? He's in the next room taking off his makeup. Makeup? But, Mary, does he use makeup on radio? Well, Jack has to on account of mic fright. Mic fright? What's that got to do with it? When he doesn't put on makeup, he frightens the mic. (laughs) I see. Here he comes now. Hey, Jack, Mr. DeMille wants you. Oh, yes, Mr. DeMille. Well, Jack... Now that it's all over, I, I've got to admit that tonight's acting was superb. Really great. Gee, Mr. DeMille, you mean that? I certainly do. It was brilliant. Well, and there's no room for an argument there. <laughs> Thanks. I thought I was pretty good. You? Of course. Who did you mean? Oh, well, yes. Yes, Mr. DeMille. I thought your acting was all right. Yes, sir, all right. You mean uh, you didn't think it was good? Well, I didn't think it was bad, But you didn't say it was good. No, no, I said it was all right, all right. Yeah, but you said it like Major Bowes. (laughs) No, I really thought you were swell. And speaking of histrionic ability, I wasn't exactly a sound effect on this program myself, (laughs) you know. I agree with you, Jack. I thought you did a great job. Thank you. Hey, Gable. What? (laughs) What is it, Mary? As long as it's a matter of personal opinion, I thought I was pretty good, too. Mary, you were excellent. I don't know what we'd have done without you. It's got me stumped, too. Hmm. <laughs> By the way, Jack, what did you think of the way uh, Mr. Zimbalist played the bee? Oh, I thought it was quite good, Mr. DeMille. Of course, his pizzicato was a bit strong. And when it came to the andante, I thought he was slightly razzmatazz. In there. <laughs> oh, he was? Oh, yeah, but when it came to the allegro, why, nobody can question that. They better not question you, either. Yeah, tough. They'll do a little good, either. They're not question you, either. <laughs> now, look. <laughs> Always come thin with their little two cents. Now, look, Mr. DeMille. Now that it's all over, let's be serious. How about my playing the leading role in your next picture? I've been looking forward to it, and I know I can do it. Well, I've been riding a horse eight hours a day just to get in shape for the part. Well, you've been practicing on the wrong kind of a horse, Jack. Union Pacific is the story of an iron horse. The thing I rode wasn't made of feathers, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> but, Jack, you, you've got it all wrong. An iron horse is a locomotive. Union Pacific is a railroad story. Oh, a railroad story, Mr. DeMille. Railroads are right down my alley. That was before you moved to the new house. <laughs> well, if it means a part in the picture, I'll move right back. How about it, Mr. DeMille? He'll think it over. You stay out of this. What do you say? Mary's right. I, I, I'll think it over. Okay, that's good enough for me. By the way, 
I want to wish you good luck on the opening of your new Jell-O series next Sunday night. You too, Mary. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Thank you. Oh, Mr. DeMille, I still think you're right about my trying to be a dramatic actor. I'll wash my hands of the whole thing. And to show you there's no hard feelings, I'll do it with Lux. Well, I guess we'll be running along. Come on, Mary. Okay. Say, Jack, didn't it seem strange working tonight after our long vacation? It sure did. But I got a lot of laughs tonight, didn't I, Mary? Yeah, tuck in your shirt tail and let's go home. Oh, good night. <laughs> See you Sunday. Good night, Hamlet. Good night, Mary. Our stars in play for next Monday night are announced very shortly by Mr. DeMille. Heard in tonight's cast were Margaret Brayton as Rita, Ted Osborne as Hermie, Ross Forrester as Bland, Gail Gordon as Morgan, Lou Merrill as Kennedy, John Fee as Sergeant, Eddie Waller as Jed, Martha Wentworth as Belinda, Joe Kearns as a prisoner, Victor Rodman as Ballister, Mary Lansing as telephone operator, Frank Nelson as Oakley, Dorothy Grewatz as Miss Cole, and Catherine Carlton as a girl. Jack Benny and Mary Livingston return to the air on the Jell-O program next Sunday night. Mr. Benny's new Paramount film is Artists and Models Abroad. Louis Silvers, our musical director, appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studio, where he directed music for the new picture, Straight, Place, and Show. Here's Mr. DeMille. Believing with Disraeli that variety is the mother of enjoyment, we turn from the comedy of tonight's play and bring you next Monday night to more dramatic and romantic feels in presenting our adaptation of the recent hit picture, Another Dawn. This tense play carries us to Arabia, where in the heat and mystery of the desert, a handful of soldiers hold aloft their country's flag, and a beautiful girl picks up the fragments of her lost happiness. Our stars, a trio of Hollywood's most popular celebrities, Madeline Carroll, Francho Tone, and George Brent. <laughs> Sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Madeline Carroll, Francho Tone, and George Brent in Another Dawn. This is Cecil B. DeMille, the, the former actor, saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> In Melville Road. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. of Campbell Soups present the Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Our offering tonight, the celebrated dinner at eight is among other things an object lesson for the overwhelming number of people who believe that dinner, preferably to be called supper, and primarily a meal to be eaten at the close of day for the purpose of sustenance against hunger, is to be shared, except on rare occasions, only with the members of their intimate family. George S. Kaufman and Edna Ferber, however, setting their play in the semi-rarefied atmosphere of the semi-upper circles of New York society, preferred to deal with dinner as an almost unimportant part of a weird social proceeding that has come to be known as a dinner party. Actually, we're never shown the dinner in Dinner at Eight. But we are shown the highly involved maneuverings necessary to bring the Dinner at Eight dinner party into existence, along with the colorful incidents and the intertwining lives of those who finally participate in it, including Mr. Larry Renault, the once so great film star who made the greatest appearance of his life in the long run 
by not appearing at all at the dinner party at which he would have been at least a featured player. Our guest stars tonight are three. Marjorie Rambo, Hedda Hopper, and Lucille Ball. Miss Hopper, of course, was a distinguished actress before ever she branched out into her present combination career of acting and columning. Miss Lucille Ball is the beautiful and talented young lady whose position in Hollywood is becoming increasingly more important. And Marjorie Rambeau, certainly one of the first talents of the theater, is now carving out for herself a new career in motion pictures, recently cemented by her thoroughly brilliant performance in Primrose Pack. But before tonight's story, dinner at eight, Mr. Ernest Chappell has a seasonal reminder for the ladies, Mr. Chappell. Thank you, Orson Welles. And that reminder is this. Whether you at your house have dinner at eight or supper at six, I hope you're not forgetting the good health rule, hot soup for cold days. Certainly these February days are real soup weather. And there's just nothing more heartwarming than piping hot plates of vegetable soup, the good old-fashioned homey kind. A Campbell's vegetable soup is just that kind, and that's why more and more women are giving up making vegetable soup and turning to Campbell's. You see, you can tell instantly that Campbell's vegetable soup is made the good old-fashioned home way. You can tell it in the deep flavor of the rich, slow-simmered beef stock. You can tell it in the taste of the garden vegetables, 15 different vegetables all told. And most of all, you can tell it by the way everybody all around the table enjoys this stout, nourishing vegetable soup of Campbell's. So my cold weather reminder is this. Serve Campbell's vegetable soup just once, and I believe your family will enjoy it so much that they'll suggest you let Campbell's make your vegetable soup for you from then on. You will try it, won't you? And now Orson Welles in Dinner at Eight with Hedda Hopper, Marjorie Rambo, and Lucille Ball. Hello? Is this Dr. Talbot's home? This is Miss Jordan, Miss Oliver Jordan. Oh, hello, Lucy. This is Millicent. How are you, darling? Listen, Lucy, dear, I'm giving a little dinner for Lord and Lady Ferncliffe. You know they're on here from England. I want you and the doctor to come. A week from tonight, Friday. I'm only asking a few people whom I know they'd like. I'm inviting you informally like this because the time's so short, and anyway, it's only a small dinner. Yes, that's right. Friday, the 23rd at 8 o'clock. Oh, that'll be fine. Goodbye. Oh, Gustav. Yes, madam. Mr. Jordan, I will be out to dinner. I don't know about Miss Paul. I'll have to ask her. Hello, darling. You're up early. Hey, Gustav, you must see that my coffee's warmer than this. Ah, very good, madam. Uh, we could have had breakfast together if I'd known, <clears throat> unless you think people might talk. Hmm. You'll be home early, won't you, dear? Uh, the way business is, I might just as well not leave home at all. Oh, Oliver, did I tell you? I've got the phone clip. What? Lord and Lady Ferncliffe, they get in this morning on the Aquitania. I sent them a radio last night, and they're coming to dinner Friday. Wasn't that bright of me? Yes, if you want the Ferncliffe's. I know, just a small dinner. What do you think? Ten's a nice number. Oh, fascinating number. Of course, it's terribly short notice. I thought I'd ask the Torbits, the Doctor and Lucy, the Ferncliffe's, and you and I. That's six. And your precious Carlotta Van. Carlotta? Would you like me to ask well, I haven't seen her since she came back. Now, let me see. I'll need just one more couple and an extra man. I think maybe uh, Look I'll here, have... dear. I if you're looking for another couple, I wish you'd ask Dan Packard and his wife. Ask that woman to my house with the Millicent, Ferncliff? Millicent, dear, believe me. I wouldn't ask this if it weren't important to me. You know that. Packard's become a big man the last year or so. I don't want to go into details, but it's, uh, it's very important. Oh, Oliver. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Paula. What are you doing lolling about in boudoirs? What's become of the shipping business? Yeah, what indeed. I won't be home for dinner, Mother. Paula, what about this afternoon? I've got to go to the office. Uh, Paula, where will we meet? Uh, Millicent, uh, you will invite the package, won't you? Oh, well, if it's as important as you say. Believe me, it is. Oh, well. Thanks, thanks. Uh, drop your Paula. Walking. Uh, Paula? Goodbye. Yes, Mother. Paula, I'm lunching at the colony, but I can meet you. Oh, Mother, I can meet you this afternoon. I, I simply can't. Well, for a girl that's being married in three months, you're certainly casual. When do you expect to get things? If Ernest had any idea... What Ernest says I'm a flawless fiancé. Oh, by the way, uh, what was all that about last night? What? Ernest called up this morning in a perfect dither. When you weren't up, he asked to talk to me. Oh, yes? Did I know how you were feeling and were you any better? He said he brought you home at ten last night with a terrible headache. Oh, yes, I did have, but I'm quite all right now. I distinctly heard you come in at four this morning. Well, I, uh, I went out again. I took three aspirin and my headache vanished and there was only eleven o'clock and, uh, Liz called up and said there was a marvelous party going on. So I went out again. Well, I hope you've got charm enough to explain that to Ernest. 
Where was the party? Oh, around. Uh, we went over to 21. 21. Always 21. Hello, Aunt Hattie. Someday I'm going to find out what goes on at 20. Yes, and at 22, too. Mother, I've just got to run. Well, all right, but I insist that tomorrow you'll all take... All right, tomorrow. Bye, Mother. Bye, Aunt Hattie. Did Bye. The... Did the phone clips accept? Oh, I got that cable this morning. How many are you having? Only ten. Ten's a good number. Oliver insists upon asking those packets, those awful packets. Oh, some business thing or other. Oh, he's bad enough, but his wife, she, she's his second wife, you know, years younger. Nobody knows where she came from. Of course, with his money. Nobody I... marries for money anymore, Millicent, because there isn't any. Well, there's one good thing. I've got the Talbots. Oh, but what am I going to do about Carlotta Van? When did she come back to America? A few days ago, I ran into her at the colony, of course. I think she's poisonous. Oh, but I've got to have her here sometime. When I think of the way she behaved that summer at Aunt Eve, oh, you'd think a woman that had been on the stage as long as she had, a woman of her age. Oh, but I've simply got to have her. Have her by all means, if you're sure you don't like her. She just fits in. I don't suppose that packet woman will be up at this hour. Oh, dear, when I think of that voice. Hello? Could I speak to Mrs. Packet, please? This is Mrs. Oliver Jordan. Isn't this packet up yet? Well, I've got to run, Millie. If you're not at those 14th Street sales by 10, you might as well be dead. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, Miss Packard? Oh, how do you do, Miss Packard? This is Miss Oliver Jordan. Yes, Mrs. Oliver Jordan. Um, Mrs. Packard, Mr. Jordan and I are giving a small dinner for Lord and Lady Ferncliff, two very dear friends of ours, and I'd like... <laughs> I'm so pleased. You see, I've been meaning for quite a while... <sighs> <laughs> excuse me, please excuse me, but don't you want to know the date? It's a week from tonight, Friday, the 23rd. Uh, dinner at eight. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Jordan. I, uh, uh... Oh, goodbye. Tina. Tina! Yes, Miss Packard? Oh, what time is it now? Half past four. Oh, when a person has to lie in bed like this, a person forgets all about the time... What did Dr. Talbot say? Is he coming right away? Well, he asked, were there any symptoms? And I said, no, I didn't think so. So he said, all right, then, sometime this afternoon. Sometime this afternoon. Nobody cares what happens to a person around here. Get me that other box of candy, the big one. Yeah. Hmm. Not that big one. You dope the other big one. Yes, Miss Packard. Ah. Hmm. I used to like candy wrapped in different colors. You didn't know what was in each color until you bit into it. Now I know what's in each color. Just as bad as if it weren't wrapped at all. It's worse. You have to take this paper off. Get me the other box, Tina. Yes, Miss Packer. And leave this one here, too. Mm. You take a big piece like this. It looks like it's filled with cream. You bite into it. And what is it? Nuts. Jordan, I. Jordan, I. Yes, Mr. Fawcett. Just a minute. Young woman, where's Mr. Jordan? I'm sorry, have you an appointment? I don't need an appointment. I'm Carlotta Vance. If you'll sit down, madam, I'll tell him you're here. And don't call me, madam. Hey, you can't go in there. No, no, no. no. Oh, Oliver, yes, darling. Well, Carlotta, this you. is a surprise. Excuse me just a minute, dear. This is pretty really important. Uh, once again, Fosdick, the Castilian isn't sailing tomorrow. There's no use sending her out when she hasn't got enough cargo to keep her down in the water. She can go next week. Ducky. I don't care about the Santa Clara. She'll have to wait, too. Ducky, you're handsome. I don't ever. care if no Jordan boat has missed us sailing in 60 years. They're going to miss them now. What distinguished gray at the temples. Oh, uh, Oliver, you do look uh, sweet. Excuse me, Fosdick. My I'll have to call you later. You Lotta, well, you're looking marvelous. Do I? Really, do I? Do uh, I? Sit down. Let me look at you. Uh, what are you doing over here? I'm trying to mend the shattered fortune. <laughs> you picked a good day for it. And the right part of town, too. If you look out at the window, you can see all our financiers sitting on those benches. Now, come on. Who did you come all the way down to the battery to see? Not me. Well, not to deceive you. I came down to see a Mr. Nosy Pants that calls himself a customs inspector. Why shouldn't I own six fur coats? Perfectly reasonable. And then, having straightened out Mr. United States cu uh, Customs Inspector Gestapo, what did I sight but the Jordan line? Huh. And I says to myself, maybe the old gent is in. And here you are. I'm delighted, Carlotta. But why really did you... Uh, Oliver, <laughs> darling, I'm as flat as a mill pond. I happen to sue... Oh, come now, Carlotta. How about all those gilt-edged securities? A and your theater. My theater. Why, that theater alone ought to bring you enough to live on. Mm. That's my chief reason for coming over. To try to get rid of that rat trap. <laughs> oh, what's the matter with it? May I take you for a stroll down 42nd Street and a little look at the Carlotta Vance Theater? It's between the Flea Circus and the Chili Bowl. <laughs> it's had six weeks of booking in the last two years. Special matinees of a Greek actress named Maria Coriopolis paying Sophocles, How Are You, in the original Greek. <laughs> that filled a long felt want. Uh, Five months later, they sucked in a little gem entitled Papa Love Mama. Three days. Mm. This season, they haven't taken the lock off the door. 
It's now known as the Spider's Rendezvous, but you can't collect rent from them. You know, when he gave me that theater, I thought it was a pretty magnificent thing of the old boy. I wish now I'd taken a sandwich. Oh, oh now, Carlotta, you always exaggerate. I'll bet you're just rolling in wealth. And the kind of wealth that I have, that isn't worth a nickel today. What have I got? Railroad, oil, cotton? That's what they gave you in my day. I could only take what they had. Well, I wish there was something I could do to straighten your tangle out for you. I don't think any of my friends needs a theater now. But as far as your stocks are concerned, those things are certainly good. So is your Jordan stock. You're not thinking of selling that? Well, I don't know. Should I? Much rather you wouldn't just at this time. We've been hit as everybody else has. If you sold it now, I'm afraid you wouldn't get what it's worth. Well, I'd expect to do something on it. You wouldn't want to buy it back yourself, would you? I'd uh, like to, but uh, it'll be pretty difficult just now. Well, I've always thought of you as having all the money in the world. Yeah, I thought so, too, for a few years. Why, when I was a young man... You I... were so sweet, dear Oliver, and so serious and respectable. I was very fond of you, dear. I was very much in love with you, Carlotta. I was something, wasn't I? Remember, they named everything after me. Cigars, racehorses, perfume, battleships. I'll never forget the day you were 21, Oliver, and you asked me to marry you. Uh, what a young fool you must have thought me. I thought it was sweet of you. I even went home and wept a little. They didn't often ask me to marry them. Yes? Mr. Packard is here now, Mr. Jordan. Oh, send him right in. Hey, you won't mind, Carlotta. Dan Packard, quite a fellow. Big Western stuff. Used to be a miner. Oh, I'm just going. I want to know I'm in that birdcage. Hey, Jordan, what kind of a... I beg your pardon. Uh, Lotta, this is Dan Packard, Miss Carlotta Vance. How do you do? Uh, Carlotta Vance? Wait a minute, you don't... Well, I knew you. I saw you... Uh... Yes, I know. I know what you're going to say. You saw me when you were a little boy. Well, I say you're a liar. Way back when I was a punk in Montana, bunches rode 40 miles into Butte just to see you. Something's yes. Opera House. So what was that piece you was in? You wore pants, I remember. Yes, well, we had to have something more than just talent to be an actress in those days. Nice to have seen you, Mr. Packard. I'll be running along before you remember seeing me in a bath. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll call you, Carlotta. Look here, you're dining with us next week. Uh, Friday, isn't it? Am I? Well, of course you are. So are you, Dan. Uh, but I'll see you before that, Carlotta. All right, oh, goodbye. Goodbye, Luckin' Bar. Uh, what'd she call me? <laughs> Sit down, Dan. How have you been? I can only stay a minute. I'm running down to Washington at 5.30. Got to drop up home, pick up a bag. Bunch of us going down. The president needs a little straightening out, looks like. Uh, Dan, the reason I asked you to come in, uh, I want to put up something to you. Uh, sure, go right ahead. It's about the uh, Jordan line. We find ourselves facing, uh, well, it's it's like this. Go on, what's bothering you? Kind of up against it? Well, you probably know about our business. We're strictly freight carriers. New York, Southern Coast, Havana, Port-au-Prince. I needn't tell you what's happened to trade down there. Of course, it isn't going to last forever. But what, what I want to know is, uh, if it does take a little longer than we figure, would you be in a position, you and your associates, to uh, sort of uh, tide us well, over? tell you the truth, Jordan. I don't think you've got much to offer. Best thing you now, can do... Now, just a minute, Packard. The Jordan line is one of the best known in the shipping world. I know Our that. boats have traveled the ocean for a century. We started with clipper ships, and we, we're not going to stop now. I'll uh, you... tell you what I'll do. You get together some figures on this thing, and you do that balance sheets, assets, total tonnage, what the... Boats cost when Bill lists the stockholders. How about that? Pretty widely held? No, it's uh, held quite closely. Half a dozen people in all. Well, let me have a list of them. All right. You understand, Packard? This is confidential. Sure, sure. I just want a list. And uh, it's got to be... You quick. give me that dope, and I'll let you have an answer in 48 hours. Oh, that's, uh, that's very kind of you. I'll do what I can for you, Jordan. Uh, everything I can. So long. You in bed again? What's the matter? I don't feel good. And take off your hat when you come into my bedroom. Anyway, tip it. Look at me. Never sick a day in my life. I go out and do things. Tina, yes, Mr. tell Packard. Charles to pack me yes. for overnight. Yes, Mr. Packard. Yes, sir, I go out and do things. Well, that's because you're an extrovert and I'm an introvert. Now what? Dr. Talbot says you're an extrovert and I'm an introvert. And that's why I have to be quiet a good deal and have time to reflect in. Reflect it. What do you got to reflect about? I got to think and act at the same time. That's what... You know why I'm going to Washington tonight? Because the president wants to consult me about the affairs of the nation. That's why. What's the matter with him? Everything's the matter with him. That's why he's standing for me. And I'll tell you something else if you want to know. It wouldn't surprise me a bit if he offered me a cabinet job. And what do you know about that? Well, there was a dinner in New York once and... All the girls got candies full of diamonds. Yeah, we ought to be married to some of the guys that I see. You learned to preach. Well, I went into an office this afternoon. Fellow baked me. Got uh, turns out he can't even keep a little little business going. I juggle fifty things, and he can't handle one. Here's the blow off. 
I've been trying to get hold of just his kind of layout for the past two years, and the sap hands it to me. What do you, only he don't know it. Going to send me a full list of stockholders. I buy up what I need, and it's all over but the shooting. Little Dan Parker owns the best shipping line between here and the tropics, and Mr. Oliver Jordan is out on his ear. Oh, we're going there for dinner next Friday, and yeah. I'm going to wear my new pink. What? Mrs. Oliver Jordan called me up, and they're giving a swell dinner, and we're invited. Well, we're not going. Oh, yes, we are. Now, he's a sucker. That's his funeral. Business is business. I can't go walking into the man's house President and eating. President in Washington and all those rummies, but you can't go anywhere with me. His bre- we're not going. Once in our life, we get asked to a classy house, and I got a new dress that'll knock their eye out, and we're going. We are not going. We are so, you big crook. You pull a dirty deal, and it ruins my social chances when you can't get away with I'll it. I'll go lay down. I won't. We're not going, and that's all there is to it. Oh, Danny, please, Danny. No, we Kitty aren't wants going. to go. Kitty wants to no, see all the great big lords and no. ladies in the beautiful house. Danny Wanny, it's for Lord Ferncliff and Lady Lord Ferncliff. Lord Ferncliff? Yeah, please, Danny Wanny. What'd you say? It's for Lord and Lady Ferncliff from Ferncliff. England. They're an English Ferncliff. lord and lady. You know who it is, don't you? It's one of the richest men in England. Is that rich? I've been trying to meet him for years. He and I Ferncliff. did it. You know what I'll do? I'll buy up that Jordan stock through dummies. I'll use Baldridge and Whitestone. Fellas like that keep mine name out of it. Out of what? Out of getting control of his line, I told you. You did not. You never tell me anything. All right, all right. I gotta be going first. I want to break. Bye, kitten. Uh, uh, Tell Charles to meet me with my bag and be at the office at 11 o'clock. So long, kitten. Goodbye. Tina, quick. Get me the other jacket with the feathers. Yes, Miss Packard. And get my pearls out of the case and clear those things off the bed. Fix it up a little. Give me that atomizer. Oh, give me that book, the big one. Where yeah, is it? Look around. It fell down. Hurry up. It's there someplace. Is this it? Murder, Macy's window, Harvey. No, 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 no. The one Dr. Talbot gave me. It's a big, thick one. It says aspects of the adult mind. I got it. It was under the Marabou hot water bag. Well, give it to me. All right. Now, get out. Get out. Yes, ma'am. All right, Dr. Talbot. Thank you, Tina. Well, hello. What's all this? Hello, doctor. Let's have your pulse. Wayne. You don't ever come anymore unless I send for you. Well, I'm very busy, Kitty. You know how busy I am. Oh, but I'm so lonely, Wayne. You've got to develop your inner resources. Did you read that book? I tried, but just to read, a a girl could go crazy. You've got to take it easy. You're tired of me. No, I'm not, dear, but I'm... Well, then put your arms around me. You can let go of my wrist. Yes, I guess so. No sense taking your pulse now. Nonsense, Hattie. A cup of tea will be good for you. And me, too. What's this, I wonder? It's watercress, Billy, with mayonnaise. The two things I hate most in the world, together. Oh, I'm simply dead. Mrs. Johnson. Yes, Gustav. Uh, Mr. Johnson's phone. He regrets very much that he cannot come to dinner on Friday the 23rd. He will be out of town. Oh, Please. well, I think I've got to begin all over again. I bet if I called one man this morning, I called ten. Would you believe it? There just isn't an extra man in all New York. You. Who would you expect? The Chase National Bank? You're pretty fresh for a bellboy. Why have you been so long? I come as quick as I could. You're so particular with that 20-year-old stuff. I had to go several places. Hey, wait a minute. Where's my change? I told you I had to go to a new place. Cost a half a dollar more. I told you. You had to go to a new place. Nobody, nobody did. Then you can go out and buy your own liquor from now on. Excuse me, miss. Oh. Hello, uh, Miss Jordan. Close the door, boy. Okay. Right you are, Mr. Reynolds. It is Mr. Reynolds, isn't it? Mr. Reynolds, the great motion picture actor. <laughs> you crazy little fool. <laughs> Kiss me, Mr. Reynolds. Now, Hattie, who can I get? Oh, I'd love to have somebody exciting. That is if it'd fit in with the fern cliffs. Nothing exciting fits in with the fern cliffs. Get somebody that'll go with Carlotta. Give her a little fun. Get her an actor or something. An actor? Let me see. I I know. A movie star. Oh, I don't know any movie stars. Not about Larry Renault. Was he still in town? He was yesterday. How do you know? I read it in Lenny Lyons' column. Oh, it's a marvelous idea. We met him three years ago in on TV. He was simply a 
a sensation. I read two interviews with him yesterday. He was wearing a black moray lounging robe with a white monogram, and he's staying at the Dewar Plaza. I'll put him next to Carlotta, and then give her a Dr. Tolbert on the other side. Yes, see if you can get him first, and then let nature take its course. do. Well, I just thought I'd ask. Oh, Larry, darling, let's go somewhere tonight, you and I. Let's get a car and drive up the river and have dinner. Huh? You crazy little fool. That's a, tonight's the night I'm having dinner at your mother's, don't you know that? Oh, Larry. You know, if she ever find, finds out I know you, oh, Larry, don't go. I have to. Larry. What? Will you promise me something? What? Don't drink tonight. That mother's Oh, alone. Paula, don't get maternal. I know, but I want them to see you at your best. A man can take a drink or two and That's so... That's just it, Larry. If you take one, you always take another. Oh, no, stop it, Paul. I won't All have right, you. All right, my darling. Don't let's quarrel. Please don't let What about the plan? Larry, when do you start the rehearsal? Monday? I think so. I just had a call from Max Kane. He's coming right over. I suppose everything's settled. You have a drink? No. Well, here's to us. Yeah, I suppose the show's all right. Max seems to think so anyway. You know how these agents are. They run you practically. He may be right a season and the legitimate before I go back to pictures. Let them see me. They like that sort of thing. It's such a romantic part. I think you'll be more... It's the only I've read that I thought was worth doing. The play's not much, but the part is very interesting. It's practically the only male part in the play. But there's that beach club. It doesn't amount to anything. Here's one little scene, and I dominate that. Oh, Larry. You know, it's so funny. Less than a month ago, I thought I was in love with Ernest. You were just one of those million-dollar movie stars. Huh. Only a month ago. But that was another person, a very young person. Hey, Paula, listen to me. I want to tell you something. I know, I know. Ernest is just the sort of young man I ought to marry. That's right. You're the sort of girls are always warned against. Well, I don't care who what people say. I know your life is different from mine. I know all the things you've been. I know all the times you've been married. But I'm still married. You think I could still love Ernest after all this? After all we've been to each other? Paula. Oh, that. You don't know anything about me. All right. Tell me you murdered a man in a life. That's what I mean. You're not even grown up. You're a kid of 19. You're 19 and I'm 40. Uh, almost 40. Darling, I hate college boys. Oh, darling, it isn't your age. It's everything. You never know anything but Park Avenue and Butler's and Pierre's. That's not true. I've got a job. Oh, I go to work every day. It's the fashion to have a job in your crowd. You don't know what it means to be up against it, to be fighting them every second, to pull yourself up hand over hand and have them waiting up there with a knife to cut the rope. Well, I'm not through yet. I'll show them if they think I've finished. But, Larry, what's that got to do with it? What's that got to do with our love? Love. Love. You want to know the truth? I love you. Yeah, as much as I can love any woman. But at my age, it isn't real love anymore. There's been too many. I've been in love a hundred times. I've had three wives. Would you like to know about my three wives? Well, there was Violet. She was a vaudeville hooker and still is. I bet she hasn't changed her act in 20 years. Rooming houses and dirty kimonos and fried egg sandwiches. It was that kind of a marriage. We used to fight like wild cats. And I broke into pictures and I left her. Then there was Edith. She was crazy about my profile, always talking about it. She was society. Goody like you, Paula. <laughs> Funny, I never thought of that before. Anyhow, we were happy for about six months. And Hollywood got her. Parties, drinks, pretty rough in those days. And one night, you know the rest of it. On a car loan. Drunk. Over the cliff. You were really in love with her, weren't you, Larry? As for Diana, well, you know Diana. She's at the top of the heap now. She's the biggest draw of any woman in pictures. Ambitious? I never saw a woman like her. Anything to get on and knife me to get there. Always saying someday she'd be bigger than I was. And now... Well, there they are, the three of them. Pretty picture, isn't it? I won't tell you about the others. Ah. They swarmed on me, every kind, age, and description. I, Paula, listen to me. Larry, I love you. Don't you see that nothing else matters in the whole Paula, world? Paula, don't say that. Larry, it's no use. Nothing you can say will make any Paula. difference. Paula. I'm going to tell them now, tonight. Paula, you mustn't. I'm going to tell everybody. You can't do a thing like that. I won't let you understand. I won't let you smash up your I'll life. I'll shut up if I want to. I'm going to. straight home and tell Mother and Dad. And tonight I'm going to tell Ernest. Ah, oh, that's my age and that Mac. Paula, I want you to promise no. me. Paula, you've got to promise. My mind is made up, Larry. It's no use. All right. Hey, don't you ever get up? Ooh. You, uh, know Mr. Kane, Miss Jordan? Oh, sure. How's the little lady? I'm splendid. And you? Top of the bottle. 
I'll telephone you, Larry, later. Please think of what I said. And my uh, button? No, I was just saying goodbye. Pearls and your oysters. Goodbye, Larry. Goodbye. Well, how's the great profile? Been out today or just sticking around here? No, I wasn't feeling well. I slept kind of late. I'm going out to dinner. What's that straight whiskey you're drinking? Uh, cocktail? If you want to call it that. All right, no offense. It's none of my business. Only why didn't you go up to McDermott's and get a workout every day? I'm all right. Take some of that blubber Once off Once I here. get into rehearsal, I'll get in shape. Yeah, just keep on up to drink that size. That'll fix you. What's up? You see Bauman? I thought maybe he might come up with you. Bauman? No, he didn't come up. Uh, look, Larry, I got a little disappointing news for you, kind of. What's the matter? Well, I go in there this afternoon, he's sitting there. A face like a gargoyle. I start talking to him about the play, and what does he do? He says he's got to go south next month. He's sick. He can't do the play. Well, he's got to do it. Everything's settled. Well, it was talked over, but uh, it wasn't really. You see, Larry, unless you got it down in black and white... What are you white, talking about? Well, and, and then sometimes... That's you take away from him. He's not the only producer, the cheap crook. Oh, sure, sure. Bomber's no good. That's right. That's how we got where he is. But look, that ain't the point. What does he do? He goes and turns the play over to Joe Stengel. Joe Stengel. Yes. Yeah. I don't like the idea of going with Stengel, you know, Max. They tell me he's quite a character. Yeah. He understands I'm going to be starred, of course. And then well, be that's my, uh... just it. What? Got... Look, Larry, I don't want you to blame me for this. I've been plugging for you for months. What are you trying to tell me? Now, don't go up in the air about it, because there's sure to be something You else. mean I'm out, you double... You mean I'm out? Larry, could I help it? Help it? Why, you dirty little oh, now, swine. Wait, now, hold on. All right. I'm a this, I'm a that. But there wasn't anything I could do to stop it. It was all done before I knew anything about it's it. It's your business to know. That's what you're hired for. Who's going to play the part? Cecil Bellamy. Cecil Bellamy. Ah, that piffle English. Why, he's English in the first place. Well, the part says English explorer. All right, I can be English. I can be as English as anybody. I've waited for this play for six weeks. I've had a million things. I've well, turned sure, down. Sure, you know that. Sure, you could. Uh, you can get him yet, Larry. Only, Only think... what? Well, you've been away a long time, see? And, uh, and you know the public. Besides, there's a bunch of them who want to work on the stage again. Them picture names. You're not going to compare me with them. No, not with them. Look, but you see, you're not a talking name. I was in talkies. I made some of the first talking pictures that were made. Yeah, I remember. But the trouble is they forget. See, they forget overnight. You've got to get to work again. Go out there and act. Let them see you. Yeah, that's the way they want it. It's a vehicle. Well, now don't jump down my throat again. But I've got an idea. What kind of an idea? Well, I was thinking about this play again. You know, Larry, I never said anything, but I never did think that that was such a hard part for you. Do you know the part that I would be crazy to play if I was an actor? What? The beachcomber. Oh, beachcomber? Yeah. You're asking me to go on and play a part that is... Get out of here. Go on. Get out. Get oh, out, Larry. you miserable... Get out! Uh, Larry, Get please. out before please. I kick I you know, out! Don't make a mistake. Wait a minute. All right. What Have makes it. you think the other part isn't right for me? Well, it, think it's no good. They'll get tired of them. But the other fella comes on once. But a once, that's a once. He goes off. They keep waiting for him to come back, and he never does. Oh, Larry, what a part. Of course, his one scene is very gratifying. It's the high spot of the show. You know what'll happen? At the finish, this said, uh, uh, what's his name? Cecil Bellamy. Yeah, that mug there. That, uh, he'd be trying to take bow, see? You know what'll happen? They'll be yelling, Renault, yeah, Renault. Of course, I'd be uh, featured. Well, maybe it'd be smart not to. You yeah, know, you should sneak up on him. But I'd get my regular salary. I mean, what Bauman was going to give me. Well, but, but you can't think of this as salary. Suppose you only get two. Uh, look, I'll tell you what. It's quarter to five. I'll run right down to Stengel's office, fix up an appointment to get you to see him before Hold he on. leaves there. Wait, he mustn't think I'm after this spot. Make uh, Stengel come to me. Larry, it isn't done that way. You're the actor. I'm Larry Renault. I don't go to managers with my hat in my hand and expect me to come for nothing. Comes up here, sees the luxury. Well, look, look, you know, you don't, you don't make things very easy for me, bringing managers to act this. Well, maybe he'll do it as a favor to me, who knows. You know, I used to be Joe's office boy. Look, how long are you going to be here? Oh, a long time. I'm not dining till late. Well, if I can do it, I'm good. But look, Larry, darling, if he comes up here, you want to watch his step. We can't afford to let this part get away from us. Ah, Max, I must say you've got a funny slant on this whole thing. It's not I that can't afford it. Stingle. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, well, goodbye. Goodbye, anyway. Max. Yeah? Here's a, a funny thing. I wonder if you could let me have $5 a taxi fare. I didn't get out the bank. I'm going uh, this dinner. <laughs> what do you think? I've got 17 cents. Yeah, I see. Very funny. But look, I, I, I only got enough to get back to the uh, office. Max. I'll, I'll bring it to you when I come back. When I come back, Larry, everything will be all right when I come back. Oh, 
Charlotta, dear. I just popped in. I thought Oliver might be home. Well, but there's everything I could tell him for you. No, it's business. Uh, these just came, madame. Oh, how lovely. Talisman roses color. Good, it. It's my favorite rose. Aren't you going to read the card? That's more important than the flowers, I always think. From the Ferncliffs. Lord and Lady Ferncliff. Oh, how thoughtful of them. Not stinky. Flowers from Stinky? Stinky? Yes. Stinky Ferncliff. All his friends call him Stinky. Oh, I didn't know you even knew them. I think of Stinky loosening up for flowers. Why, <laughs> nobody in London will believe it. Once he dropped a shilling down the grating and he made them dig up Piccadilly to get at it. Why, How uh, amusing. Uh, hello, dear. Hello, darling. Carlotta wants to talk to you, Oliver. I'll be tactful and vanish. <laughs> uh, what's the matter, Carlotta? Something wrong? Oliver Ducky, you won't be cross with Carlotta, will you? I told the man I want to ask you first, but he said it had to be today. There was some sort of meeting, so... Well, and then I got uh, some what, worried uh, about it. What are you trying to tell me? Well, Oliver, sweet... Poor Carlotta was so stony broken and with such a chance, so I sold my Jordan soap. Yeah. I hope you don't mind. Uh, who'd you sell it to? His name was, uh, well, he was really quite a sweet fellow, such a charming manner. The name's right here on the check, Mr. Baldridge, James K. Baldridge. Baldridge, eh? Somebody bought the Jordan stock from the Satterley sisters this afternoon. Only it was a fellow by the name of Whitestone bought theirs. Hmm, your stock must really be worthwhile if all these people want to buy it. I do hope I haven't caused you any trouble, Oliver. No. An answer it there is probably for me. See you later, Carlotta. No, Oliver, you shouldn't take business so serious. Smile, dear. Yes? Yes, this is Miss Jordan. Lord Thurnton, secretary. Yes. Yes. What's that? Oh, but you must be... Oh, but they can't. Oh, but they can't go to Florida. They're coming here to dinner. Oh, but it's not possible. I'm giving the dinner for them. They've gone. When? Oh, but people don't do things like that. But letting me know at this hour. Oh, I don't care how sudden it was. You should have let... Well, all I can say is I never heard of such a thing in all my life. Never. Mother. What do you want? Mother, I must talk to you. What? It's about Ernest and me. I must talk to you. I, I can't... Oh, Paul, don't bother me now. For pity's sake, don't bother me. I don't want to listen well, to you. Mother, you don't understand. This is terribly important. Tell her, shut up. Shut up. No, listen, I tell you, let me think. No, listen, dear. Huh? Uh, do you think it, if, I, if I don't come down to dinner, uh, I'm uh, feeling pretty rotten. If I could just go to bed. What's that you're saying? I say I'm feeling pretty rotten, and I, uh, I'm i up against a business thing oh, that... Oh, that's a shame. Business thing. At a time like this, you talk about a business thing and feeling rotten. Oh, this is a nice time for you to say you're feeling rotten. You come to me Mother. with your... And you whimpering about Ernest. Some little lovers quarrel. I'm expected to listen to Ernest and business and headaches when I'm half out of my mind. Do you know what's happened to me? I've had the most dreadful day that any woman ever had. Lucy Talbot suddenly found out she was so ill she couldn't come, but Wayne Talbot is coming anyway. So I had to bribe Hattie to come, and it's costing me half my wardrobe to get her to come and eat my dinner. And the dinner's gone wrong. Only you wouldn't care about that. But if you think getting crab meat when you've ordered lobster and... And that fast woman coming in, and now, on top of everything, do you know what's happened? The film clips on coming to dinner. They call up at this hour, those miserable cockneys. They call up and say they've gone to Florida. Florida! And who can I get at this hour? Nobody. I've only got eight people, eight people, eight people. Isn't it dinner oh, party? Mother. And you come to me with your idiotic little... I'm the one who ought to be in bed. I'm the one who's in trouble. You don't know what trouble is. listening to Orson Welles in the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Dinner at Eight with Hedda Hopper, Marjorie Rambo, and Lucille Ball. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Ernest Chappell, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse. In a moment, we will resume our presentation of Dinner at Eight. See that your child gets a quart of milk a day. So counsels the doctor. Yet many a mother of growing children I know finds that easier said than done. So tonight, I have a pleasant and practical suggestion for every mother listening. Have you tried soup as a means of giving your child more of the milk he needs? Let me tell you about four soups in particular that mothers everywhere are choosing for this. 
They are Campbell's tomato soup, Campbell's pea soup, Campbell's celery soup, and Campbell's asparagus soup. Nearly every youngster likes these soups, and when you prepare any one of them as a cream soup by adding milk instead of water, your child gets the double benefit of the good vegetable nourishment of the soup and the high nutritional value of the milk. Now, let me repeat the Campbell soups I mentioned before. They are tomato, pea, celery, and asparagus. I wish I had the time to describe each soup to you, but I urge you to serve them in turn and find out for yourself how good they are for both the children and the grown-ups in your family, especially when prepared with milk. And now Orson Welles resumes our Campbell Playhouse presentation of Dinner at Eight with Hedda Hopper, Marjorie Rambo, and Lucille Ball. Hello. What time is it? Time, time, what time is it? 7.45. Thank you. Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Renault. Yes, I got it. Your man brought it up to me. Listen, my good fellow, I'm not accustomed to being done for hotel bills. I'm a very busy man. My secretary usually attends these things in California at the moment. You get your money, you get it when it suits my convenience. Come in, the door's open. Liberty Hall, huh? Where have you been? You're late. I told you take, I was Take waiting. it easy, take it easy. Um, I brought up Mr. Stingle. Meet Larry Renault, Mr. Stingle. How are you, Mr. Stingle? Mr. Renault. Forgive my formal attire, Mr. Sting. I just finished dressing. It's a frightful Mr. Ball, Renault's got a date with some of his Park Avenue friends. Those big picture people, they're pretty social. You know? Yes, I've heard. Well, yeah, wait. Sit down, Mr. Stingle. Don't you uh, want to take your coat oh, off? Oh, sure he does. Take off your coat, Mr. Stingle. We've got a minute. Uh, yeah, Larry, suppose we get right down to brass tacks, huh? All right, my good fellow. Well, Stingle, you've got to produce this play. Hmm? You want me to act in it? Well, I'm... Th well, this is just getting acquainted, Larry. Uh, you see, he's crazy to play the part, Mr. Just Stengel. a minute, let's get this straight. I understand, Mr. Kane here, that you wanted to know if you'd be willing to portray the beachcomber in this thing. Wait, 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 he wants to do it, and you want him to do it. So what's the difference? A lot of difference. Larry, please. In the first place, if I decide to accept this part, and I don't say I will, it'll have to be built up. <laughs> There's an actor for you. No matter how good the part is, right away they want it built up. <laughs> built up. The fellow's got one scene, they find him dead on the beach. This ain't a spiritualism play. No. Well, you're forgetting one thing, Stengel. Don't forget I'm Larry Renault. Larry, please. Shut up. Now listen, Stengel. I'm a name. And I know it, and so do you, and I'm not going to go on and play second fiddle in any cheap English ham. Larry, Eight thousand a week, that's what I got. And I was going to get ten, only... Well, don't think you're doing me a favor, giving me a part in your ratty little play, because I'm doing you one. I think maybe we're keeping you from your dinner, Mr. Now, Rose. listen, Joe, he doesn't mean... I mean, what do you mean? You're doing a second-rate show. You don't want real artists. Well, your English ham will give you what you want. Larry, you don't know what you're doing. All right, Max. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll take you to the office. I wouldn't be in your office. I didn't come to your office, did I? Not Larry Renault. You came to see me. And you know why? Because I'm an important artist. And you're a cheap push cart producer. Push cart! So with all of you. What is it? What do you want? Why don't you and your push cart friend let me alone? Oh, Larry, you drunken fool. I bring him up here. I got down on my hands and knees to do it, and you... I, I, I can't believe that any man would throw... Well, that's better. Just a minute. I've got something to say to you, too. You know what I think? It's you. You that got the play away from Bauman and gave it to Stengel. It's you did me out of that part, you double-dealing rat. I've been suspicious of you all along. You're in with the managers. You've been taking my money and working for them. You don't say. Working for the managers, huh? And taking your money. Me, that you're ready for 500 bucks in touches. All right. If you think I've been lying to you all this time, you're going to get the truth now. Renault, you're through. Get out! I'll get out, yes, and stay out. But get this first. I never worked so hard to put over anybody as I did you. You think I told you all the things I tried? No. Because I couldn't come to you and tell you what they said. I was too sorry for you. You were sorry for me. Vaudeville, why, right? every time I walked into the booking office, they leaned back and roared. Called me Maxie the Grave Snatcher. And the radio. Remember I told you I hadn't seen the right fella? I saw him. Only he saw me first. Trying to throw a scare into me, well, let me tell you. Uh, yeah, you never was an actor. But you did have looks. 
Now, they're gone. You don't have to take my word for it. Look in the mirror. They don't lie. Take a good look. Look at those pouches under your eyes. Take a look at those creases. You got rattles under your chin. You sagged like an old woman. Get a load of yourself. What's the matter? Afraid? You ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till you start tramping around the offices looking for a job. No agent will handle you. Wait till you start sitting in the ante rooms hours and hours, giving your name to office boys who never heard of you. Get through, Renault. Get through in pictures and plays and vaudeville and radio and, and everything. You're a corpse and you don't know it. Go get yourself buried. That's impossible. That gold and silver. The association value. All right, you take them out. And when they have pawn shop on 6th Avenue. You're a little liar. You never took them anyplace. Say, who are you calling a liar? What do I get out of all this? You down and out ham? Filthy little rat. How dare you talk to me like that? Okay. Oh, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I didn't mean that, son. I didn't mean to call you. <laughs> Sorry. Listen, son, I've got to have some liquor. I'm sick. You lay it out for me and I'll pay it back to you. Uh, what kind of sucker do you think I've I got to have it. I've got to. I'll pay you back. Pay back tomorrow. No, nah, you won't be here tomorrow. What? You like me. Hey, you look swell sleeping in the park in that monkey suit. Oh, Patty, if you had any idea what I've been going through. If you knew what I'm going through right now, I've been planning to see that Heedy Lamore picture for two months, and now I... Isn't I'm... Larry Renault in person better than going to a movie? No, he's a has-been. And Carlos a band? She's a has-been, has-been. All right, all right. I'd have let you off if I could, but who was I going to get at a quarter to seven but relative? All right, all right. I'm a relative and I'm here. Who's that? Uh, how do you do, Mr. Note? Uh, how do you do? Uh, how do you do? Mr. Note, uh, the hotel finds itself in an awkward predicament. We've just had a communication from some very old clients of ours, Mr. and Mrs. Sherman Montgomery. Possibly you know them. Uh, they've been making this their home for many years, every winter, and have always occupied this particular suite, uh, 39C. Well, you, you know how people are. Nothing will do with these rooms. They say it's like home to them. Now, uh, we've just been notified that they're coming in tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, just like that. Tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, under the circumstances, I, I'm afraid we must ask you for these rooms. Oh? Well, uh, what are the other rooms have you got for me? Well, uh, that's just the trouble. Uh, there, there isn't any place we can put you. There isn't anything that uh, isn't taken, you know, old customers. That's uh, uh, all right, sir. Funny, I was about to tell your office I was leaving. I, uh, friends of mine uh, from Palm Beach, uh, private car. Well, when do you want me to get uh, out? Oh, no, hurry. Uh, shall we say uh, tomorrow morning? All right. We'd be very glad to have one of our people come in and pack your things that's tonight. Right. You're probably pretty busy. Then I'll tend to it. Uh, well, shall we say... Uh, Moon tomorrow, then, Mr. Renault? Yeah. Ah, thank you very much. So sorry to have inconvenienced you in this way. If I only had another drink. Just one more drink. Hello. This is Mr. Lawrence Renault. Look, uh, whatever calls there are, don't connect anybody. I'm, uh, busy. Hmm? That's right, don't connect anybody until you hear from me. I'm gonna wait until they hear from me. <laughs> they got gas in this room, too. Hmm? Gas. I never noticed. A really high-class background, I must say. Electric lights and gas. A situation like this, what is the name of that show? I remember you. Turn a little? No, I'd like... All right. Lucky it isn't one of those where you have to put a quarter in the meter. Hmm? Ah, that's good. Should have been a writer, I think, then I could have... Use that somewhere or other. I guess 
Yes, I'll... I'll show him. You can't do this to me. You were close. I'm pinch hitting for her. Huh? Yes, isn't it too bad Lord Fentcliffe was taking desperately ill late this afternoon? Oh, that's too bad. You're right. Oh, so the doctor said he must go to hell for the sunshine. You mean he's not coming? Oh, impossible. They rushed him right down to Florida on a special train. Oh, 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 oh Dr. Oh, Talbot. Oh, hello, Wayne. So glad to see you. How's it, Well, uh, she just felt a little under the weather. And oh, I understand. I knew you would. You're looking very lovely, Millicent. Thanks. Uh, let me see now, Mr. Packard. I don't believe you've met Dr. Talbot and Mrs. Packard. Oh, we've met. How do you do? I know Dr. Talbot. She sure does. Uh, he's her father confessor. <laughs> How's old medical? Haven't seen you around the house lately, Doc. I think she gets along very well without me. Don't you, Mrs. Packard? I get along better when you're looking after me. <laughs> I oh. guess that's right, Doc. <laughs> Millicent, Lucy said to remember her to the phone clips. By the way, where are they? Oh, didn't I tell you? Poor dear Stinky. You know, that's what we call Fencliffe. Was taken desperately ill this afternoon, and they had to whirl him down south to save his life. Isn't that a dark day, though? Mm. I don't know hello, why. hello, everybody. Oh, oh, hello, hello. Oh, Millicent, dear, do forgive me. I'm so sorry. He wouldn't stay home. I cried and cried. I just had to bring him. He's so spoiled him since I brought him to America. Aren't you, Avalon? He won't be a bit of trouble. He's as good as gold. He just sit under my chair as quiet as a mouse. You never know he's there. Just throw him a bit of lobster. Isn't he so sweet? <laughs> Carlotta, have you met all my... Isn't stinky a swine running off to Florida and ruining your whole dinner party? You know, I left here and I went straight to my hotel. And there was his telegram. Off on a fishing trip. Can't you come down? I love your America. Never felt so well in all my life. Molly and I expect you. Telegraphers, Palm Beach. Stinky. I guess he was just kidding in that wire he sent you, Mrs. Jordan. <laughs> Oliver, darling, you haven't said a word to me. Aren't you glad to see me? You know I love you, Carlotta. Then you're not cross with me, dear. You'd have thought I'd done something terrible, Mr. Packard, just because I sold my Jordan stock. I was totally broke, and a man came along and made me the most wonderful offer right out of the blue. Well, I grabbed it. That wasn't so terrible, was it? What do you think, Packard? Was that so terrible? Well, business is business. Every fellow's got to look out for himself. The, uh, that kind of a world it is, you know. Oh, Dan's no, always sure. known how many beans made five, haven't you, Dan? It's That's right. So mm -hmm. nice to know Dan's always taking care of things. Sure. Oh, it must be wonderful to be a sheltered woman, Mrs. Packard. A man to look after you, so you never have to worry for yourself. Say, I think that ought to be a cinch for you, Mrs. I think, uh, well, there's one trouble. A man uh, gets you into a shelter, and he thinks you ought to spend the rest of your life thanking him. What good's a shelter to a girl if that's all there is? And most of the time, she's alone in the shelter. <laughs> now, let me see. We're all here except Mr. Renault. Oh, I do hope he hasn't forgotten you. Oh, he'll be Star. here. He'll be here. He's just staging an entrance. Oh, I'm crazy to see Larry Renault. Oh, good evening, Mother. I Paula, I thought you were gone. You all know my daughter, Paula. Sure. Well, well, Paula, how do you do? the future bride? When are you going to get married? Oh, I... Uh, Oh, where's, Dr. where's Mr. Reynolds? Wasn't he going to be here? He said he was. Yes, 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 yes. He's coming. He's just not here yet. Oh. And I don't think we'll wait for Mr. Reynolds. Oh, Gustav, you may serve dinner. Last Hello. come, last serve. That's the way we used to do out in Montana. I think oh, Avalon is oh, so cute. Avalon? Oh, yes, maybe that is better than Avalon. I've had a lot of cheeks, but I don't have any luck with really? them. They just don't like me. You know, like onions. Don't, don't. Like Half past eight. Katie hey, Lamar was just going on, Millicent. <laughs> Uh, what's uh, the matter, Paula? Is something wrong? Oh, no, no. I'm just going, Dad. If uh, something's bothering you, dear... Oh, no, no. You go on into dinner. I'll rest here a minute, and then I'll go down and join in. Well, whatever you say. Good night, Paula. Good night, Dad. Well, Mr. Packard, what are you doing here? Oh, I don't know. Nothing much. Hello? Hello? Is this the Dior Plaza? I want to talk to Mr. Larry Renault. Oh, sure, 
I go to all the shows. You worked out? But I've been with some calls, and you've got to connect me. Oh, never mind my name, just... What? Yes? The police. I saw it twice. My name is, is Paula Jordan. I'm sure Mr. Renault hasn't done anything to... What? You... I've been listening to Orson Welles in the Campbell Playoffs presentation of Dinner at Eight with Hedda Hopper, Marjorie Rambo, and Lucille Ball. Mr. Wells will be back in a moment to continue our broadcast. Meanwhile, having talked more especially to the ladies earlier this evening, I'd like to take just a handful of seconds now to talk to the men. After a hard day's work, there's something specially comforting and restful to a man in sitting down to an evening meal that includes a good plate of soup. <laughs> Isn't that so? Somehow, soup warms and cheers you all the way down. Now, let's say it's a piping hot plate full of Campbell's vegetable soup. An inviting aroma drifts up from it that sharpens your appetite. And tender, luscious vegetables abound in its rich, rugged beef stock. You dip your spoon again and again, and when you've finished the last delicious spoonful, you somehow feel that all's right with the world, that, well, here's an evening well begun. And so, just a hint for you and for your wife. Wouldn't a plate of Campbell's vegetable soup taste good at, uh, say, supper tomorrow night? And now, if you please, Mr. Wells. Ladies and gentlemen, no more appropriate theme song could usher in our interview. Please permit me to present at this time our three guest stars of the evening. Miss Marjorie Rambeau. Good evening. Hedda Hopper. Good evening. And Miss Lucille Ball. Good evening. I know, Hedda, I'm making an awful mistake in being polite to you because it is perfectly certain that this will lead to uh, something uh, vile in your column, but I'm sincerely glad to see you tonight. Well, now comes the but, am I right? Well, in a way, I was wondering whether you're aware of how much time you spent on the telephone in our broadcast this evening. It seemed to me, Heather, that... Well, no uh, matter how long you thought I was on the telephone as Millicent Jordan, I assure you it was really a vacation from phoning for me. You try running a column sometime and see how long you can stay away from the telephone. There's the thought. I suppose, but it's probably not a coincidence that uh, since the invention of the telephone by Don Amici... Uh, the modern column as we know it uh, has been born, or inversely. If I may say a few words, there's a lot of events, Mr. Wells. Uh, please, Miss Rambo. Things are so much nicer in those days when there were no columns. I remember... Oh, do tell us what you remember, Miss Vance, when there were no columns and no railroads and no steamboats and no... Now, just one moment. Just because I'm willing to remember my memories and not uh, forget them as you... Ladies, ladies, will you... Uh, Say something, Miss Lucille Ball, to get things more peaceful. Oh, I'd be glad to. On behalf of Kitty Packard, I think Mrs. Jordan and Miss Vance ought to make up their minds to call it a day, yes. both of them. Just because a girl Thank wants you. to have a little fun and not sit around all the time like a piece of furniture or something, you'd uh, think butter wouldn't melt in their mouths the way those old... Uh, thank you very are. much, Lucille. You managed to straighten everything out just beautifully. If I may, however, and seriously and truly, I'd like to thank all three of you ladies very much in your own persons, head opera, Marjorie Rambeau, and Lucille Ball. Thank, Thank you, you very good much. Night. Good night, and please come back again, ladies and gentlemen. Carl Otto Vance was Marjorie Rambeau. Millicent Jordan was head of Hopper. Two sponsors of her program, Head of Hopper's Hollywood, were indebted for their kind permission in permitting her to be with us tonight. Kitty Packard was Lucille Ball. Oliver Jordan was played by Charles Trowbridge, who first created the part in the Broadway production. Hattie Loomis was played by Clara Blandick, Paula by Mary Taylor, Dr. Talbot was Edgar Berrier, 
And Max, the agent, was none other than the inimitable Mr. Benny Rubin. Mr. Packard and Mr. Marot, or Renault, excuse me, were played and were probably all too recognizably your obedient servant. Music is always was composed and conducted by Signor Bernard Herman. Next Sunday night, we bring you, ladies and gentlemen, Only Angels Have Wings, a merry chronicle of the goings-on in the Central American tropics when a serious young lady of the chorus engaged in the frivolous business of cafe entertaining finds herself in the midst of some frivolous young gentlemen engaged in the serious business of flying the mail. Our guest star will be one of Hollywood's gayest and most attractive young women, Miss Joan Blondell. Miss Blondell, you may recall, was prevented by illness from being with us last Sunday when we presented Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. Uh, incidentally, the comedy uh, based on Clarence Buddington Kellen's story, Opera Hat. And uh, so, until then, till next Sunday night, and only angels have wings, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us on the Campbell Playhouse remain, as always, obedient to yours. <laughs> Makers of Campbell Soups join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us in the Campbell Playhouse again next Sunday evening when we present the recent Columbia Pictures Corporation success, Only Angels Have Wings, with Miss Joan Blondell as our guest. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed tonight's Playhouse presentation, won't you tell your grocery store tomorrow when you order Campbell's vegetable soup? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, the Lux Radio Theatre proudly presents Vincent Price as Winston Smith in 1984. Nineteen eighty-four. The world is one world, divided into three parts: East Asia, Eurasia, Oceania. Religion is abolished. God is rooted out. There is only Big Brother. Big Brother is the head of the party. Big Brother is one, indivisible, unassailable. Oceania is good because Big Brother is good. Oceania is one because Big Brother is one. Big Brother sees everything, knows everything. Everyone exists by the clemency of Big Brother. Big Brother. Big Brother. Big Brother. In Oceania, there are the proles. The proles, like the animals, are free. They have no telescreens in their houses. They have no numbers. They wear no uniform. The proles are the primitives, the early inferior people. Subdued by the party, subject to the party... They are the lost and the forgotten. Between the proles and the party, there is a great gulf fixed. A prole cannot join the party. No party member can retreat to the proles. The party is one, as Big Brother is one. Big Brother! Every member of the party wears a uniform, a suit of overalls. Every member of the party has a telescreen in his house. Every member of the party 
has a number. You there. Stand up. In front of the screen. What is your number? 6079. Your name? Winston Smith. Where do you live? Third floor, Victory Mansions. Employment in the party? Records Department, Ministry of Truth. Repeat the slogans of the party with fervor. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. Now, how is Oceania governed? By Big Brother, through the Ministry of Truth, the Ministry of Peace, the Ministry of Plenty, the Ministry of Love. Describe their functions. The Ministry of Truth, News, Entertainment, Education, the Ministry of Peace, Conduct of War, the Ministry of Plenty, Economics. Well, go on. The Ministry of Love, what does that do? I don't know. I have never been there. Let us hope, for your sake, that you never do. The Ministry of Love is where people who do not love Big Brother are taught to love him. Do you love Big Brother, Winston Smith? I love Big Brother. Repeat it. I love Big Brother. I love Big Brother. Your tour of duty at the records office begins at 900 hours. Be there on time. 6079, Winston Smith. Dismissed. That was an unexpected call, wasn't it? Oh, they do it sometimes, part of the quarterly brush-up discipline, you know. Perhaps. But that fellow on the screen was probably from the thought police. They can cut in on anybody's screen, you know. They do. How do you think so many comrades have been vaporized? Thought police, of course. And the home telly screen. They can see you and hear you all the time. But I've got nothing to worry about. I stick to the party rules. I do my job. But I... you don't think the way the party thinks, do you? More important, you don't want to think the way the party thinks, the way Big Brother wants you to think, do you? I just couldn't face the telescreen any longer. I had to get out and get away. You and I. You? Well, you. I'm you, Winston. I'm the other you who looks out of your eyes. Yes, yes, you twitch my lips and tingle in my fingertips at the most inconvenient times. But they know nothing about you. They control me like they control everybody else. Then why do you do the silly things you do? What silly things? That book you bought. But it's just an old book with blank pages. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Except they don't make books like that anymore. And if they ask you where you got it, you'd have to tell them at an antique shop in the Proley Quarter. But I just wanted to keep a diary. Nothing wrong in that, is there? No, except you'd find it hard to explain why you wanted to keep a diary. And remember... You're not supposed to go into the Proley Quarter anyway. I know, I know. The Proleys aren't members of the party. They're just slaves. But will you stop it? I've got enough to worry about as it is. Yes. It's the girl, isn't it? The girl in the fiction department. Yes. Yes, the way she looks at me. The way she stays near me. She's rather pretty. What if you like that sort of thing? A lot of good it is when she wears the red sash of the anti-sex league and could be a police spy into the bargain. You're rattled this morning. You mustn't get rattled, you know. It shows. That's the way they get onto you first. Pull yourself together. There's where you work. There's the Ministry of Truth straight ahead. Smile now, Winston. Smile! <laughs> Comrade Smith. What? Oh, oh, good morning, Comrade O'Brien. Not often we meet like this. No, no, Comrade. Of course, I've often wanted to. I wanted? What, Comrade? Well, I, I don't know. It's probably foolish. You are known as a great man in the party. I've admired you from a distance. I hear good reports of your work, Smith. Well, I've often hoped I, I might discuss it with you. A pity we have no time now. Never mind. We'll meet again one day in the place where there is no darkness. In the place where there is no... I, I, I beg your pardon, comrade. Uh, good morning, comrade. Don't let me keep you from your work. A place where there is no darkness. He, he said... Never mind that now, you fool. Compose yourself. You're at work. Everybody watches. Everybody listens for Big Brother. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. But O'Brien understands. Yes. Yes, O'Brien understands. You know now that you're not alone. But smile, smile... There's that girl again. Don't let her see. Don't let her guess. Above all, not her. 
6079, Comrade Smith. Present for duty. Repeat the slogan of the Ministry of Proof. Who controls the past, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. Does the past exist? Yes. Where? In records and in memories. Which is the more important? The records. Why? The records endure, but memories fade. So? Who controls the records, controls the memory of the people. Are you impressed with the greatness of your task? I am. Then begin, Comrade Smith. This is urgent. Big Brother's Order of the Day, 17th of the 3rd, 84, contains references to unpersons. Rewrite completely. Unpersons? Oh, I have to be careful about this. Unpersons are always tricky. Even Big Brother can't refer to them. Unpersons don't exist. Oh, let's be frank. Unpersons are persons who have been liquidated, destroyed. Your job is to see that all record of them is destroyed as well. Are they mentioned in the press? Delete their names. Are they shown in photographs? Make a new photograph. Are their voices recorded? Destroy their records. And presto, they do not exist. They never existed. They have no place in memory or history. That could happen to you, too. All personnel will lay aside their work and face the telescreen for the one-minute hate. You're out of luck. The girl's sitting right next to you. Watch your step now. Make it a convincing hate. Thought police are very shrewd. You are here to hate. You are here to loathe, to despise, to detest with all your being. Whom do you hate? Goldstein. 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 Goldstein is what? Enemy of the people. Saboteur. Traitor. Whom else do you hate? The, the Brotherhood. Goldstein, Goldstein and his Brotherhood. And the penalty for traitors like these? Death. 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 We hate traitors. We love Big Brother. We, we hate traitors. We, we love Big Brother. Speak to us, big brother. My comrades, my brothers, we live in times of great peril. We are exposed to the attacks of enemies without and traitors within. But have no fear. I am with you always. The one minute hate is concluded. All personnel will return to work. <laughs> Are you eating with anyone, oh, Smith? Hello, sir. I'm, well, no. Good. I'll join you. <laughs> I don't know what they put in this victory gin, but it always makes me do that. Yes, it is rather strong, isn't it? Excellent product, though. Excellent. You seem rather distracted, Smith. Something on your mind? What's that? Oh, oh no. Nothing on my mind. I, I was just looking at that girl over there. Yes, she's been looking at you, too. Do you know her? No. Wouldn't help you if you did, would it? She wears that red sash like a banner. It's an odd thing to say. Comes of working in the poetry department. We're editing Kipling now, you know. Quite a lot of banners in Kipling. I understand the Junior Anti-Sex League is one of the favoured institutions of the party. Oh, yes, yes, I believe so. Uh, you're married, aren't you? I was. Oh. Divorced? Separated. Oh. With the consent of the party. It was apparent we would have no children. The party takes a very wise view of these matters. Of all matters. As you say. Funny, that girl's still looking at you. But I can't help it if she has nothing better to do. Oh, here comes Parsons. Hmm. He lives near you, doesn't he? Yes, next floor down. He's got a wife and children. You'd better talk to him. I don't think I could. Oh, hello. Hello, comrades. Hello, hello comrades. Oh, I've been chasing you, Smith. What? Yes, it's about that subscription you forgot to pay me. 
Oh, which one is that? Eight week. The house by house fund. We're going to decorate Victory Mansions. And two dollars you promised me. Oh, well, here you are. Thanks. Uh, I say, did I tell you about what my little girl did last Saturday? Yeah, well, she was out with the junior spies troop near Birkenstead. They spent the whole of the afternoon following a strange man. They kept on his tail for two hours and then handed him over to the patrols. Clever, eh? <laughs> what was the man doing? Nothing, he says. But my little Millie was smart. She spotted him chipping pieces off the rocks with a hammer. Must have been a saboteur. Well, uh, what happened to the man? Well, I don't know. But I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know? <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> of course, we can't afford to take chances. I mean, not with subversive agents everywhere. No, no, of course. Of course. Well, I've got a few more subscriptions to chase up. I'll um, see you later. Tell me, Smith, hmm. did you ever regret not having any children? Well, I can't say I've thought much about it. Why? I was just wondering. Parsons seems very happy with his little brood, doesn't he? You see what I mean about being careful? Watch that fellow, Syme. Oh, he's clever and he never says a word out of place, but he's marked... One day he just won't come to work, mark my words. Why should I worry about Syme? He can look after himself. I'm worried about me, about that that girl. Oh, working in the same building, people are bound to see each other frequently. But for some reason, she's interested in me. She keeps turning, and why, why? It can't be sex. She's a member of the Junior Anti-Sex League. I doubt if she's from the Thought Police. Except for that diary you keep, you haven't given too much away. Well, anyway, she's not important. The important thing is O'Brien. He spoke to me today. He understands. He knows. Knows you're guilty of thought crime, that you hate Big Brother, that you... All of that and more. Everything. Don't you see? If O'Brien knows, there is hope then. There oh. is hope. Oh, I'm sorry, I Comrade. Come I, I was looking, looking where I... I was. Wait a minute. You're the girl from the Ministry of Truth, aren't you? That's right. You've been watching me for days. Yes. But Why? I'm a good party member. Why do you have to spy on me? I'm not spying on you. All I wanted to do was to tell you... I love you. You love me? Wait. Wait a moment. She... She loves me. She said she loves me. Good evening, Mr. Smith. Oh, hello, Millie Parsons. What are you doing out so late? Mr. Smith? Yes, Millie. You're a traitor. What? I've been watching you. You're a thought criminal. Millie. Millie, get out. Go home. I'll tell your father about this. Smith's a traitor. Smith's a spy. Catch him first and let him die. <laughs> the way she said love made it sound completely personal, private, indestructible. It isn't, you know. It can't be. Not now in the year of Big Brother. Love involves an alienation of something that belongs to Big Brother and to the party. Love is betrayal. Love is thought crime. It's hopeless. I refuse to believe that. It is not hopeless. There is a chance. There is O'Brien. He understands. He is in revolt, too. Yes, there is O'Brien. Hello, you've walked a long way. Remember that shop? Yes. That is where I bought the book for my diary. It's a junk shop. It's old and musty and full of useless things. But it proves something, don't you see? It proves that things were different once in spite of what the records say. And if they were different once, they could be different again. Go on. In you go. Good evening. Good evening. What, what can I... Oh, why, of course. You're the gentleman that bought the ladies' keepsake album. Is there anything special I can do for you? I was passing. I just looked in. I, I don't want anything in particular. It's just as well. The shop's nearly empty. Between you and me, the antique trade's just about finished. No demand, no stock either. That's a pretty thing. What is that? Then, no, it's a glass paperweight. Uh, what's that inside of it? That's coral. Coral? Hmm. Must have come from the Indian Ocean. They used to melt the glass onto it. More than a hundred years old, that is. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yes, indeed it is. Now, there's another room upstairs you might care to take a look at. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> there's not much in it. It's just a few pieces. Well, we could do with the light if we're going up. Yeah. Yes, the room. 
We used to live here till my wife died. Now I'm selling the furniture off little by little. See, that's a beautiful mahogany bed. There's, there's no telescreen. Ah, oh, I never had one of those things. It was too expensive. I never really felt the need of it. You, you don't live here now. Oh dear me, no! I live with my daughter. Oh. She's quite a nice apartment. In the worst of days, uh. you know, I lock up at night and leave all my memories here. Well, now, if you happen to be interested in old prints at all, there's quite a nice one over here. And the frame's screwed to the wall, but but I dare say I could fix it for you if you wanted it. I, I know that building. Hmm? It's a ruin now. It's in the middle of the street, outside of the Palace of Justice. That's right. It's outside the law courts. It was bombed in um, oh, many years ago. It was a church at one time. A church? Oh, yes, yes. St. Clement Danes. <laughs> Winston, what? stop. Don't look round. Just light a cigarette. Oh, this is madness. Do you they... want us to meet? Yes, of course, but... Next Sunday, are you free? Yes. Then listen carefully. Now, you'll have to remember this. Go to Paddington Station. Take the train to Ilborne. Yes. Now, when you get there, turn left outside the station. Oh. Walk two kilometres till you come to a gate with the top rail missing. Now, follow the path and wait for me by the fallen tree. Have you got that? Yes, wait. I'll be there at 1,500 hours. I must go now. Now, don't follow me. Just finish your cigarette. But listen, you... I love you. I love you. You're picking bluebells in the country while you're waiting for a girl. You know you've taken the first step on a road that has only one end, death. And yet you're picking bluebells. I don't remember picking bluebells before. It's not in the party syllabus. Well, to hell with the party, to hell with... Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, do you always talk to yourself? Usually. It's safer. Uh -uh. It isn't really. It becomes a habit. The habit gives you away. Oh, I suppose it does. You can put your arms around me, you know. I don't bite. Uh. I don't even know your name. <laughs> Mine is Julia. Yours is... Winston Smith. I know. I found out. Now put your arms around me. Kiss me. Oh, Julia. Julia. Till this moment I didn't know what color your eyes were. I'd forgotten what a pair of lips tasted like. I'd forgotten how it felt to hold a woman. It didn't take you long to remember. Look, before we go any further... I'm 39. I've got a wife I can't get rid of. I've got a varicose ulcer and five false teeth and... and... I couldn't care less. Julia, are we safe here? Safer than anywhere. Now relax. Oh. Hold me in your arms. Mm. Mm. Now just let's be ourselves. Tell me, what did you think the night I told you that I loved you? I hated the sight of you. You must know I thought you belonged to the thought police. <laughs> Police. Oh, not really. Well, if not that, at least it's a good one... party member, pure in word and deed. Banners, processions, games, community hikes. <laughs> and you thought if I had half a chance, I'd denounce you to the police and get you killed well, off? More or less, I. I... <laughs> it's this blasted sash that does it. The Junior Anti Sex League. Let's get rid of it for the afternoon, huh? Oh, Junior, you're a perpetual surprise. <laughs> <laughs> not really. It's just that I've got the right appearance. I'm good at games. I was a troop leader in the Junior Spies. I do voluntary work three evenings a week for the Junior Anti-Sexers. I spend hours and hours placing their silly posters all over London. I always look cheerful and I always yell with the crowd. That is the only way to be safe. Why did you pick me? Something in your face. I knew you could be one of theirs, but... I thought I'd take a chance. Julia, I've got a place... A room and furniture. We can be there whenever we like. Mm -mm. Whenever we can, darling. It's not quite the same thing. I still have to stick up posters and you still have to go to discussion groups. But there'll be times. Where is this place? In the old part of the city where the Proleys live. It's over an antique shop. Well, we have ourselves a love nest. Mm. Oh, but we'll have to be careful. Very careful not to give a sign. Not a flicker of recognition. We will be. Julia, have you ever done this before? Of course. Dozens of times. With dozens of men. Was it the same as with me? Not quite. You see, darling, I love you. But the others? Two reasons, darling. I like it. The party doesn't like it. You make it sound like a political act. That's why they'd arrest us if they ever found out. 
Love is a political act. Yes, darling. Do you think it was ever like this for everybody? Like what? Being in your own room on a summer evening, talking about things you wanted to talk about. Not worrying about telescreens or thought police. Mm, I don't know. I know it's nice now, and we've got another hour to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Um, that's <laughs> all. Oh. <laughs> Would you like me to make some tea? Yes, please. I like this room. I like... Oh! Get out, you filthy brute! What was that? Oh, only a rat. A rat! Oh, he's a big, ugly fellow. I gave him a good fright, though. Oh. Darling. Oh. Darling, what's the matter? Of all the horrible things in the world, I... I hate rats most of all. But, darling, there's oh. no need to be upset. Oh. They're, they're ugly things, unclean things, no, but that's no. all. No, no, they're more than that. They're much more than that. Now, darling, darling, get rid of it, please. Darling, just lie please. back. I'll make tea and then I'll oh, plug no. the hole. No, 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 plug up the hole first. Please, Julia, Julia. All right, darling, of course. Julia, when I, I was a child lying lonely and awake in the dark, they were voices gibbering in the darkness. Their feet sc scurried closer, closer, and then... Retreated only to come again. They touched my face. It was more horrible than the, than the touch of a dead hand. I've never got over that feeling. Ever since that night, I've laid awake and screamed soundlessly for hours. Whenever I heard the small, pattering feet of a rat. I'm all right now. Uh, darling. Yeah. Uh, darling, what's this picture? I've seen it somewhere before. Oh, it's... It's a church, or at least it used to be. St. Clement Danes. Mr. Charrington taught me a, a rhyme about it. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin. Julia, you know it. Go on, please, go on. <laughs> when will what? you pay me, say the bells <laughs> of Old Bailey? Bailey. I da, forget da, the da, next da, line, but then it says, Here, comes, here comes a candle, candle to light you, you to bed, bed and, and here, here comes, comes a chopper to chop off your, your head. <laughs> <laughs> Julia? Yes, darling? You know, I have the strangest feeling about that silly little rhyme. What sort of a feeling? As if everybody connected with it were someone who could make us happy. As if... as if I hoped the next person to recite it would be... O'Brien. O'Brien? Yes. I told you he spoke to me again in the lift yesterday. He wants us to go up to his flat. Oh, darling, must we really? But he's one of us. No. He may hate Big Brother and the party and all the rest. But, darling, that doesn't make him one of us. Oh, Winston, we're two people. We make love together and we talk together and we drink tea together. O'Brien has no part in that. But don't you see, as we are now, we're alone. If we join O'Brien and his brotherhood, we won't be alone. We'll still be arrested in the long run. But that's not the important thing. The important thing to me is this room and what we do here and how we live here yes. and the joy we have. We don't need O'Brien to keep us alive. It's not being alive that counts. It's being human. And being human means you share your living and your hoping and your fearing with other people. The party is only too happy to have you share. But not the human things. Only the inhuman ones. I want to think there's a hope we could all be as human as we two are now. That's why I want to see O'Brien. <laughs> I know your names, you know mine. I'm O'Brien. We may dispense with introductions. Pardon me while I switch off the telescreen. Can you really switch it off? Members of the inner party have that privilege. We... we are... are... we are... Alone? Yes, yes, we are quite alone. I... well, Julia and I believe that there is some kind of a secret organization working against the party. We believe that you are involved in it. We want to join it and work for it. We are enemies of the party. We are living together... We are thought criminals. I tell you this because it puts us at your mercy and you will know that we are telling the truth. If you wish, we will sign a statement. There is such an organization. Its leader is Emmanuel Goldstein, whom you know of. Yes, but we thought we were afraid that Goldstein and the, and the conspiracy were invented by the thought police. No, they exist. 
But what are you both prepared to do to help the conspiracy? Anything we are capable of. You're prepared to give your lives? Yes. yes. To commit murder? Yes. yes. To betray your country? Yes. yes. To cheat, forge, blackmail, corrupt the minds of children? Yes. yes. You're prepared to commit suicide if ordered to do so? Yes. yes. You're prepared to separate and never see each other again? No! It's just as well to understand these things right at the beginning. You understand you'll be fighting in the dark. You'll receive orders and obey them without knowing why. Sooner or later, you'll be caught and tortured and you will die. You will never know whether your work has served a single good purpose. We and you now are the dead. Our only true life is in the future. A thousand years away, perhaps. But if in that thousand years we extend the frontiers of sanity even a little, we shall have done well. Eh, uh, eh. Uh. You have a hiding place? Yes, in the old quarter, a room over an antique shop. The proprietor is called Charrington. That will do for the moment. Later, we shall make other arrangements, give you more definite instructions. Now it is time for you to leave. Then we are accepted? Yes, you are accepted. Have you any more questions? Only one. Do you know an old rhyme called The Bells of St. Clements? Yes, I think so. Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clements. You owe me three farings, say the bells of St. Martin. <laughs> when will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey? When I grow rich, say the bells of Shardy. You know it, you know it, you know all of it. I told you he'd know it, Julia, didn't I? Oh, Julia. Oh, what, darling? Is there any time to get up? Oh, I don't want to get up. Oh, neither do I. <laughs> you know what I was remembering just then? Mm, no. You remember that thrush that sang to us the first day in the wood? No, he wasn't singing for us, just for himself. <laughs> Not even that, he was just singing. That's what I mean. I wonder if we will ever see the day when we'll be just, just singing. No, oh, I doubt it. What did O'Brien say? We are the dead. We are the dead. You are the dead. It, what? it came from behind the picture. What? Behind the picture. Yes. <laughs> oh. Now you can be seen. You are the dead. The telescreen behind the picture. Julia! Stay where you are. What? Don't touch each other. Clasp your hands behind your heads. Now stand back to back. Oh. I suppose we may as well say goodbye. You may as well. Say goodbye. And while we're on the subject, here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Mr. Charrington. No! Nineteen eighty-four, the year of the revolt of Winston Smith against Big Brother and the party of Big Brother. It had been a bloodless revolt, bloodless and small and secret in a mahogany bed in a fusty upstairs room. The issue had been decided before the thought was conceived or the act begun. But even now, Winston Smith had no certainty where he was. His world was a windowless room with walls of white porcelain flooded with light from hidden lamps, stark under the scrutiny of four telescreens from which every motion was visible. He was more lonely than he had ever been in his life. And yet, he was not alone. Can I talk? There are still the telescreens, Parsons. Oh, I don't mind those. I have, I have nothing to hide, nothing at all. What are you in for? Thought crime. You wouldn't think it possible, would you? You don't think they'll shoot me, do you, old chap? I, I mean, they don't shoot you if you haven't actually done anything. I know they give you a fair hearing. They'll know my record, won't they? You know what kind of a chap I was. Not brainy, of course, but keen. I'll get off with five years, don't you think? Or ten? A chap like me could make himself pretty useful in a labour camp. Are you guilty? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I'm guilty. You don't think the party would arrest an innocent man, do you? Thought crime is a dreadful thing, old man. It's insidious. Do you know how it got hold of me? In my sleep. Yes, that's a fact. Never knew I had a bad streak in me, and yet 
There it was. How did you find out? I started talking in my sleep. <laughs> they heard me shouting down with Big Brother. Who denounced you? Well, actually, it was my little daughter. She listened at the keyhole and heard it, nipped off and told the patrols next day. Pretty smart, eh? And she's only seven. But that's the sort of thing I mean. They'll understand that I train my children properly. They'll take that into consideration, won't they? Parsons? Yes. Yes, just tell me what you want done. I'll cooperate. You won't have any trouble Room with me. Room 101. Oh. Yes. So, you're alone again. <laughs> alone except for that whimpering thing in this gleaming, aseptic world of the Ministry of Love. It's not a new experience, this solitude. You're not too afraid, are you? Yes, I am afraid. I am afraid of this procession of frightened men with broken bodies and terrified eyes. I don't know whether that's part of the treatment, too. Yes, it's all part of the treatment. Keep reminding yourself of that. The lightest word, the least calculated gesture is all part of the treatment. There is no mercy, there is no kindness, there is no intermission of misery. It is all part of the treatment. Come on, you. We can't wait any longer. Me? No, not you. This. Come on. On your feet. Where are you taking me? Room 101. No, no. Don't do anything but that. You've been starving me for weeks. Finish it off and let me die. Shoot me. Hang me. Take my family in and cut their throats. But don't take me there. Room 101. No. No. Mm. Mm. Smith. Mm. Take your hands away from your face. Oh. It's forbidden to cover your face in the cells. Take hold of yourself now. That's part of the treatment, too. Everything's part of the treatment. Mm. But so long as you still have those few cubic centimeters inside your skull, you're still a man. You're still stronger than they. Hello, Smith. O'Brien. Oh, That's right. So they got you, too. Oh, they got me a long time ago. You mean you are one of them? Don't deceive yourself, Winston. You knew this a long time ago now, didn't you? You've always known it. I, I, I... I told you myself we should meet like this. In the place where there is no darkness. Now that we have met... We are going to make a new man of you, Winston. A new man. Take him! You see how it is, Winston. Pain itself and suffering is no longer a chance or accident. It is a calculated process, a thing measured and graduated and controlled. We are not medieval butchers probing for the nerve roots. We are masters of this most subtle of sciences. Look, there is a dial upon which your agony is measured. There is a lever by which I can increase or diminish it. But it is not I who inflict this pain on you, Winston. It is you yourself. You understand that, don't you? You have always understood that. Winston, you are suffering the pain of birth, the rebirth of sanity. You must be born again. You know that, don't you? Look at my hand, Winston. How many fingers do you see? Two. And on this hand, two. put them together, two and two. What does that make? Four. And if the party says two and two, make not four, but five. What then? There is still four. How many fingers, Winston? Four, four. What else can I say? Four. How many fingers, Winston? Four. Stop it, I'll tell you four. Four. How many fingers, Winston? Five. Five. Do you know where you are, Winston? I don't know. I can guess. In the Ministry of Love. Do you know how long you've been here? I don't know. Days, months, years. Why did we bring you here? To punish me, to make me... Confess. No, Winston, not that. Yeah. Not the small tasks of punishment and confession. What could you tell us that we don't, don't know already? What satisfaction do we draw from your stricken flesh? Shall I tell you why we brought you here? 
to cure you. Cure me of love for a woman. Love. Love is a word, an obsolete word. There is no love, only a biological act. Cure me of what, then? Of false and foolish thinking. Yeah. We don't want martyrs, Winston. We want disciples, yeah. willing disciples. Uh. And when we've made you a willing disciple, then we shall destroy you. Uh. And why do you go to do the trouble to torture me? Because you are a flaw in a pattern, Winston. You are a stain that must be removed. But you've not told me why. Why? No, Winston, you uh. must tell me why. The answer to that question is the measure of my whole success with you. It may be the key to your release from this small prison of great agony. You tell me why, Winston. Why do we do all these things? You, you are ruling over us for our own good. You believe that human beings are not fit to... Ah, stupid, 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 Winston! You deserve an eternity of pain for a folly like that. Now I will tell you why. The party seeks power for its own sake. We are not interested in the good of others. We are interested only in power. Not wealth or luxury or long life. Only in power. Pure power. No one ever seizes power with the intention of giving it up. Power is not a means. It is an end in itself. The object of persecution is persecution. The object of torture is torture. Each is an exercise of power, a pressing upon the nerve of agony, until one after another, all men are converted to our discipline. All men are submissive to a universal power. You'll never do it. You'll never do it. Never. 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 We did it to you, Winston. Shall I show you in a mirror? Just what we have done to you. <laughs> Shall I tell you that you're just a bag of bones? <laughs> that you've lost all semblance of a man? <laughs> that your hair and your teeth are falling out? <laughs> that you are an offense to sight and to smell? <laughs> we did that to you, Winston. <laughs> now, two and two may cry, but I'll never betray you. You failed there. You couldn't make me betray her. Could you? You failed, O'Brien. You failed. You, 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 you failed. No, we never yes, fail, you Winston. Yes, never. Yes, we cannot yes, afford yes, to fail. Yes, Take him to room 101. <laughs> This is the end of horror. This small room down in the bowels of the earth. I'm strapped to a chair. Tightly, so tightly that I cannot move. I cannot retreat inside my skull case. That does not belong to me anymore. It has been entered and possessed and garrisoned by O'Brien. There is no retreat left anymore. I am faced now with the ultimate agony. I am in room one, oh, one. You asked me once, Winston, what was in room 101. Mm -hmm. You knew the answer, though. You wouldn't admit it. No. Everybody knows it, really. Mm. The thing that is in room 101... Mm is the worst thing in the world. Mm -hmm. The worst thing in the world, of course, varies from person to person. Mm -hmm. For some, it is burial alive. Mm -hmm. For some, it is death by fire. Mm -hmm. For some, it is quite a mm -hmm. trivial thing. Mm -hmm. In your case, Winston, mm -hmm. it is... Rats! Oh, oh no. Oh, 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 take them away. Keep them away from me. You, you can't do this to me. You can't do you this. You have not yet surrendered to me, Winston. How can I surrender if I don't know what you want? I've answered all the questions, haven't I? I I've learned all your lessons, haven't I? Take them away. Please, take them away. The rats Please. are starved, take Winston. They will eat a man alive. I, stand, I, I can I never, use them I on you, to, or I can please. use them on Julia. <laughs> you have your choice now. Which? Use them on Julia. I don't care. I don't care what you 
don't. But don't let them near me. Don't. 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 Let Julia suffer now. Let her. Yeah, now, Winston. It's over now. There isn't any more. It's all over now. <laughs> is a calm, a great pervasive calm. You sit at your corner table in the cafe and fumble with the chessboard and sip your victory gin and scan the newspapers. You look out the window and watch the people go by. One day, Julia passed and something stirred in your mind for a moment and then died again. There are so many people, and this small corner which they keep for you is warm and comfortable. When you finish the newspaper, you watch the telly screen. Strange that, in a life without struggles, without any hint of climax, that is the moment that comes nearest to emotion. The face of Big Brother flashes on the screen. You hear his rich, Full voice. My comrades, my brothers, we live in times of great peril, but have no fear. I am with you always. My care and my love reach out to you, wherever you are. And we love you, big brother. We love you. We have erred. We have been punished. And you have taken us back. We love you, big brother. Love you. Love you. Love you. The Lux Radio Theatre is produced by Sterling McAvoy. 1984 was adapted from George Orwell's novel by Morris West. Tonight's play was directed by Paul Jackman. Heard in our cast were Lionel Stevens as O'Brien, Alexander Archdale as Charrington, Guy Dolman as Parsons, and Dorothea Dunstan, Gordon Chater, Rupert Chance, Murray Powell, Leonard Bullen, and Alan Herbert. David Netheim was heard as the narrator. Margot Lee played the role of Julia, and as Winston Smith, you heard our distinguished Hollywood star, Vincent Price. <laughs> One week from tonight, Accent on Youth, starring Hollywood star Melvin Douglas in person. Until then, this is the Lux Radio Theatre signing off from 50 stations throughout the Commonwealth of Australia. That concludes this week's broadcast of Echoes of a Century. This program was an independent production by Doll Shoe Radio Creations, copyright 2005, produced in the studios of WLSU La Crosse, an affiliate of Wisconsin Public Radio on the La Crosse campus of the University of Wisconsin. I'm King David McKenzie. Thanks for listening. I hope that you'll join us again at the same time next week. Until then, remember, fear and God do not inhabit the same space.